Seattle here and our road to the international continues. We've got day three of the group stages. Yesterday we saw four teams go home. We're down to 16 teams. I'm excited to see where they all place up in the upper or lower bracket. I'm going to be your host, Nat T, and I've got Winter. I've got Gods joining me. Winter, you were watching those tiebreakers, those eliminations firsthand. So give me a bit of a recap if, uh, you know, I wasn't paying attention or if I wasn't tuning in. I mean, at first the first series was what, the SMG the SMG series. They mm -hmm. they kind of got uh, destroyed in the in the match against EG. They were clearly the the weaker team there, like not really working well as a unit. So just unfortunate for them. One less SEA team. Yeah, I mean, we only had uh, two SEA teams, so we're down. Got all the SEA hope in talent, but a lot of other teams sort of scraping through. Gods are doing well, and, and now they get to have their fight for uh, if they're going to be in the upper or lower bracket. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, I think these two days are a big deal. You know, we're still kind of at the, the group stage portion, but these mm -hmm. one BO3 can really determine a lot. Uh, you win this, you're you know, starting up a bracket. It just gives you so much more wiggle room when it comes to the main event. So um, this is the series that so many teams have been prepping for, um, you know, over the last two days it's really just been about make sure you don't get last place obviously t you're in a great position you get to finish first pick your opponent but um now it's like okay now you're fighting to get into that good position for the the main event at the international yeah it was a uh, smg thunder awaken beast coast and quest that we said goodbye to but the remaining teams they got to have their matchups let's have a look at the bracket to see which opponent was picked who will be facing off in the next two days to be in that upper or lower so spirit picking themselves rebelling there liquid went for evil geniuses LGD for Keed Stars, Tundra, uh, they went for Nounce. So the first place got to pick and everyone else remaining did their matchups. Do you think any second places got shorthand change between their matchups and they might have a bit of a tougher opponent and a tougher road to get to that upper bracket? Uh, looking at this one, I, I think possibly, I mean, Bet Boom Nine Pandas is a really spicy matchup into regional. Um, yeah, definitely don't like that. Feels like one that could really go either way 50 50. And also, Gaming Gladiators versus Talon. Like, you know, Gaming didn't get a yeah. pick, they finished second. Those are two teams a lot of people would have had in there, like maybe top four, top six of this event. So, that's a brutal matchup. Yeah, Entity against Azure as well. I feel like yeah. Azure is not a <laughs> team that you want to play early. You know, they are pretty unpredictable. They are a strong team. You have FY back, you know, with Somnus. It's not an opponent I want to play in a first BO3 match, you know, for sure. Yeah, a lot of pressure for themselves there. Anything that you feel is very one-sided in the matchups where you can feel or you're pretty confident in being like, okay, this team we will probably be seeing in the upper bracket. I mean, the first series, I would say. <laughs> I mean, I feel yeah, like Shopify, Shopify, is, yeah. Shopify is going to storm today. <laughs> all the all the doubters out there, you know, just you guys wait, you know, RTZ is going to carry the game. This is his year. All right, so that's your one. You, you, I don't even think he believes that. <laughs> I believe it, you know. Okay. I believe it. And we can pick your brain a little bit more. Uh, you guys it should be all following Dota 2 socials as well because if this is all new information for you, then it was already updated on the socials. The secret shop is also open if you want to get yourselves some TI goodies, some Dota 2 goodies there. Do you guys have a, a special, uh, like a favorite in the secret shop? Have you looked at it? Honestly, no. Okay, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll okay. talk about something that you, I, you I, know I, that. I've been yeah, here, but uh, when, as soon as group stage ends, I'm, I'm hopping on. So I, I will be getting, getting something. Yeah, but you now. I feel like this is something you, yeah. you've done your research on. Yeah, the mouse pad. Okay. Oh, for sure, the mouse yeah. pad. Yeah. Oh, I love the mouse pad. <laughs> it's so good. I really want to get that one. Uh, but we'll look at something you, I do know that you know, Gods. It is going to be the schedule for today. What matchups we will be seeing out of those seeding matches. Starting off with Team Spirit up against Shopify Rebellion, the one you alluded to just then, Winter. TSM versus a VP. Then it's Liquid up against EG. And that game in that Gladiator's Talon being the final best of three matchup. Yeah, a lot of a lot of really great series today. Um, you know, it's the number one seed, so it, on paper, some of these should be more one-sided than the games tomorrow, where it's the the two seats playing against. Well, they're not. You know, obviously they pick their opponents, so sometimes the, the first seed chose the third place team. But um, you know, I'm really looking forward to that game in Gladiators versus, versus Talent matchup later today. Um, and also even this first series, I think you know, as Winter said, you know, I don't think Shopify Rebellion the team that's just gonna roll over. If anything, you asked about teams that got the short end of the straw. Team Spirit, like yeah, you. you 
you pick Rebellion, they've looked like the worst team um, in that group of death, Group B, but they're still a very tough opponent. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of pressure. You pick the team, and if you lose the first game, and you're like, oh, yeah. no, oh, no, we did, did we make a mistake? And a lot of uh, negative thoughts come to your head, and yeah. adds a lot of pressure, you know, so... Mm -hmm. And it's the underdog thing. It's like, oh, these guys picked us because they think we're, you know, bad. That's that's locker room material. That's the stuff you pin up on your wall. Like these guys think they can beat us. We're going to take them down. It, it really motivates you as a team when when you get chosen as the opponent because people like you know you're you seen as the weak guy. Yeah, yeah. And I think that like, you get that underdog mentality where it's like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna stick it to them. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that could really work in Shopify's favor. Although you know, at the end of the day, you still gotta play a game of Dota and, uh, yeah. and Shopify need to play better than they did in the group stage. Yeah, we were also talking about you know it's it's kind of difficult. There's four teams in your group trying to prep for that maybe have a look at it and we also didn't know what the meta was going to be coming into this it's a new draft for us 7.34 d so we didn't know what heroes were going to be uh sticking out which ones were going to have those better win rates but we got a little bit of a graphic we're going to have a look at what heroes really have shown themselves in this road to the international group stage dazzle so minimum uh, the the conditions for this graphic were that they had to have over 10 picks dazzle is in number one 75 percent win rate for himself primal 72 naga 70 chaos knight 65 Five, and then uh, Murata on 60% there. Yeah, the Morita being the most picked hero of the tournament, and it's a hero that's getting like first pick, first ban, like in, so, in a lot of games, and I think we'll continue to do so. And still at 60% is really impressive. It seems to just be this hero that everyone's like, we're going to pick this and flex it, but still, some of these other heroes really successful with her. Yeah, Morita and Dazzle kind of feels like very similar in a way where you pick the hero early, you can flex it as uh, different roles, and it gives you a lot of uh, a wiggle room in the drop. I, I would say that it's especially more important when you're in the first pick phase, where you don't have the overall last pick, so you kind of need uh, heroes like this to kind of make it hard for the opponents to predict your lanes and it gives you a lot more room, you know, since you don't have the overall last pick. Yeah, the Primal one is probably one that I question mark because we didn't see too much of him on stream A. The only one that comes to mind is Keen Spirit picking up yesterday and they had a bit of a rough game. It was a big comeback for themselves. So he's got a high win rate for himself. Very interesting. I do want to turn our eyes to the other hero. We talked about him a lot yesterday. It's Bristleback, right? We saw him picked up a little bit. We had, what was it, 50 games, I believe, on day one, and he was only picked up 13 times. And then we had 32 games yesterday, and he was picked up 14. So lower game game number to be picked up in, but still picked as many times. And his win rate is an interesting one, because I thought being picked up that much, maybe it's because he has a high win rate. It is overall 48%, so just under 50%, but he's being flexed and changed between a carry and an offlane winter. Yeah, I, I think the stats tell you that uh, you need another DPS, like another carry in a game. You, you don't want to pick uh, uh, Bristol as your, your lone carry. So I think some of the teams that have a lot of success, they were picking him offlane and safe lane Chaos Knight. Because the, the safe laner, you can't pick too greedy of a safe laner, like a, for example, like a Faces Void or a Terra Blade. You need like a, an active safe laner. I think if you want to make it work as a carry, your offlaner has to be some somewhat of a, another carry as well to kind of compensate the fact you don't want Bristol back to be your lone carry. <laughs> I think what's really, I think it's a good choice of words here with the impact choice because the bristle really, it, the impact of this here is it just changes the entire dynamic of the game. It reminds me in some ways of like what Brood used to do. And there's suddenly this here in the game where you kind of either have to completely avoid it or all the attention is on it because this hero just gets so strong so quickly in the mid game um, where you know if you don't have an answer for a way of dealing with it suddenly you can find yourself in a lot of trouble so it's one of these picks that every team has to be ready to either like address and deal with or just ban out yeah some of the games yesterday we've seen like what uh, primal beast or phantom assassin picked as a counter to the hero but they just have another call you know you can yeah. counter the bristle all you want but as long as you have another call in the game bristle is not uh, your only call, then you don't really care, you know, and he's a hero that you can open the draft with, it gives you a lot of flexibility, and even if he gets countered, I would say that there's still ways for you to play the game. Yeah, so a massive contingency plan, and that is why that high win rate is seen when he is that offlane at pick, but, you know, the, the other thing that's changed today, we're down to, to one stream, but did you guys feel a little bit of a shift in the hotel? A little bit of a shift in the energy and the environment? I didn't sleep as well. What, yeah. I don't know. What, well, look, I, I might have a little bit of an answer for you hey. because <laughs> I do know that Slax has joined us now and we're going to hear from him right now. Anytime. Thank you. Yes, it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I am outside right now. Every 20 years, a celestial event happens. 
the grand eclipse. It's not puppy not making it to TI. No, my friends, this is the eclipse. The sun will be covered by the moon or something. I don't quite know how it works. Now, what causes the eclipse here? No one knows. Perhaps it is a normal celestial body. Perhaps the Earth is round. <laughs> no, the real answer is with our combined hope that Shopify Rebellion can beat the team spirit and Arteezy can win TI, we have summoned the curse of Ra. The god of the sun has come. Behold, give your eyes to Ra. Look at the sun. The eclipse is happening right now. Look, Myron, look, I'm telling. Oh, oh, Ra's coming here. Win TI, Arteezy. Back to you guys. Thank you. <laughs> I was expecting like a blood sacrifice at the end of that or something there. Oh my goodness. Is that the uh, cosmic shift that needs to happen though for Shopify? It's a sign. Pick Luna win game for RTZ. Oh, that's it. Just That's the drafting. That's the whole pick Luna build around there. You win. Yeah, Luna plus what? Uh, Dawnbreaker, <laughs> Solar Guardian, <laughs> Eclipse. <laughs> Everything celestial, moon, sun themed. You need a Night Stalker in there to block out this. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So Phoenix, they have to ban Phoenix. Yeah. Phoenix oh, is the counter. It's actually ban Phoenix, ban yeah. Dawnbreaker, and then uh, and then pick up the Night Stalker <laughs> and the Luna itself. <laughs> I love it. Uh, it's great to hear from Slax, though. I'm a little bit... My train of thought I, is kind of diverted from I, that. Also, do not go look at the sun uh, 12 years out there. Yeah. For your I think it's over now. Okay, good. Yeah, the, the, the solar eclipse is over now, so it's just back to normal sun. Still don't look at that, though. Still don't yeah. look at that. <laughs> Yeah, same rule applies. <laughs> the same rule does we apply. We don't have to worry. Go to play as gamers. They're not going outside. Oh, no. I mean, I'm not. I, I, I mean, what, what I did in school was we had a, a pool of like water on the on, on the ground and we would just look. Oh, so you watched the reflection Yeah, we, of we, we looked oh. at the reflection. We were, um, isn't it like a certain shade of glass is what you can look through to be able to perceive yeah, the sun? Yeah, that, yeah, that is true as well. Yeah, we had those ones, so and we we had the high budget way to look at the solar eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> the new technology, but let's talk about this first series, Shopify up against Teen Spirit here. Teen Spirit coming in as seed number one for group A, paired with group B. So they picked uh, the fourth seed, Shopify who only got two wins for themselves, but enough to avoid elimination winter. Yeah, Team Spirit's gonna learn that they made a mistake today, you know. <laughs> My boy Artizi, you know, Avet. He's going to show them, you know, we still have some SEA power in this team, you know. Mm -hmm. Since we only have talent now, I have to try to adopt as many <laughs> other teams as possible, you know, to take SEA banner. So today I'm going to be adopting Shopify Rebellion. I'm, I'm going to give you the, the reasons why you should bank on Shopify winning today. Okay, I'm, I'm listening. I'm all ears. Let's go. Let's, they're let's gonna not listen to They're going to first pick the carry right now. They've seen the sign, you know, the sign from Ra. Mm -hmm. Pick Luna and make sure that RTZ gets uh, the, the hero and everybody's just going to play around him and they're going to be able to wait for the victory at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know how well that Luna's worked out for them so far? They have picked, picked it. it. It's one of the few heroes they picked more than once. Because um, Shopify, interestingly, like, they're a hard team to prep for because nothing's really stuck or worked for them. They've actually picked 31 different heroes. I know, Sableite in the like, offlane. It just feels like a new hero every time yeah. I look. And that can, you know, be like, obviously we talk about Spirit. You're Tora playing new heroes every game and, you know, that's it's a strength of a player and a team when you can be super versatile. But when you're losing lots of games, it can also feel like you're not sure it's working, so you're yeah. trying to try something new every game. Um, you know, Luna, I mentioned one of the few heroes they picked more than once. There's zero and two on it. Um, but, I mean, they've lost with a lot of heroes because they went to yeah, I was gonna say, the group stage. So zero percent on a lot you of can't take away too much from, like, how what heroes they've won and lost with, but it's more the fact they've picked so many heroes. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like they're still struggling to find what they want to play in this patch because yeah. historically they're a team that... Ha like just sticks to their same drafts and they're predictable like but that's obviously not the case here so far yeah i mean i, I mentioned about how i feel like they should try to pick uh, the carry hero out early because when i look at their games in dream league where they had a lot of success they were picking artesis hero early and trying to build the draft around it and whereas the last two days it feels like they weren't really sure what hero to put rtz on so they were picking mm -hmm. saber lights hero early out and sometimes it feels like uh, their, their draft doesn't really come together very well it gets countered and at the last uh, pick when you're going to pick rtz's hero a lot of his good heroes are banned out because people are just targeting him you know right. they, they know he's the important player on the team so what i'm thinking is they should try to pick his hero out early so he doesn't get banned out okay so i mean there's some of the issues that they're facing in the draft and then obviously when it comes to playstyle or execution team spirit have shown that they have that versatility they're able to close out games really fast they're able to uh, be have those comebacks right they're able to take games to 60 minutes and still win them themselves so let's focus on, on spirit and 
being 100% right now, not having lost a single game, how comfortable are you feeling and how... I don't know if wacky is the right word, but how experimental are you going to go knowing that it's a best of three now, even though there is a lot of weight for upper or lower? I, I think it's like no experimenting time. Yeah. You just go full in, like, hard. In some ways, I mean, this is... <laughs> Maybe one game. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It's the best of three, right? We, yeah. Like, if you want to do something funny, it's going to be the first game and you want to try something, you know, you want to catch your opponents off guard. But unfortunately, I feel like in this position, there should just be, you know, doing what works for them. And it's an important game, you know, winning this best of three. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to mess around with this game. Yeah. yeah, you get to stay in the upper bracket or go down to the lower bracket. It's, you know, in some ways the start of the bracket um, here. So it's a huge series. Um, and I, I think Spirit, yeah, they want to stick with what's kind of worked for them unless they have some, you know, stuff they've tried in scrims that, um, you know, they want to plot now because this is a big series. So yeah. it may be something new, but it's not going to be something new for the sake of experimenting or like, hey, we're, we we're just want to see if this is good. That's going to be, hey, we know this is good. We can beat Shopify with this strat. Well, what has been working for them exactly? Because they've picked a bunch of different things. Yotoro only, again, doubling up one game when it comes to carries that he's picked up for themselves. So what exactly is it? Or is it so hard to define it in a small amount of time of what is working? I mean, they have some kind of, I think, player characteristics. Like Mira loves his ranged fours. He's um, he's been playing the Morita a couple games. He he's been playing some Skyrath Mage. They like these high damage fours paired with Collapse playing some of his like, signature kind of initiating tanky off laners. He's looked really good on the Primal Beast. Mm -hmm. um, and then Laurel's just been kind of owning mid lane as well. So I, I think with Spirit, when you say what's well, look good, it's like really every player. I don't think this is a team with like no weaknesses. Mm. Um, and every player understands their role, plays incredibly well, and. Yeah, they, I, I just don't think they have weaknesses. I mean, even the Enchantress, you know, me, me yeah. he was carrying <laughs> he was carrying the game yesterday, even yep. on on position five. You know, I feel like yep. every every single one of uh, their players are they are doing a lot in the game, so it's really hard to pinpoint. Oh, I need to ban out this guy, you know. Whereas for Shopify, it's quite uh, easy from the draft that you need to make sure that RTZ doesn't get his comfortable hero, and you you can always use your target bans against him. Mm -hmm. So for Spirit, it's, it's hard, you know. You you can just look at the stats. Okay, they did work the best with this hero, and then maybe try to ban those you know, based on the numbers. Do you want to put out any predictions for heroes that we could be seeing in this game one before we get into it? Uh, I think we'll see some Invoker, some Primal Beast. Uh, primal, yeah, Primal. Yeah, true. I think Primal will be maybe first face here for either team. I think maybe some Grimstrike, that's a support. That seems like teams are... Team, I think the supports are kind of interesting because teams came in with like, oh, the Shadow Demon, the Venge, these are the supports, mm -hmm. and these supports have just kind of sucked. Mm -hmm. So now everyone's like trying to find, okay, which are actually the good supports? Is Train still good? Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think Grimstrike seems to be pretty solid, like especially because supports, you just kind of kind of blindly pick at the start of the draft. So huh? you want to just pick ones that are solid that don't have weaknesses. I mean, I would say like Grimstroke is a bit different from the other supports compared to like uh, like the Skyrath or the, the Dark Willow. I would say that when you pick the Grimstroke, you really need to have like a pairing, like Primal, you said it would be... It pairs with Collapse's heroes. He yeah. plays like the Spirit Breaker, the Primal. Like you, you, you need to pick the hero and have a pairing. You can't just pick the hero, oh, I want to open my draft with, with a support, you know, I'm just yeah. picking the support. Grimstroke doesn't really work like that. All right, well, we'll see how accurate you guys are because game one is already, our cast is already, so we're going to head on over to the now. Thank you very much, Nat, Gods, and Winter. Yes, indeed, it is time for the battle for the upper bracket here at the road to the International Shopify Rebellion versus a Team Spirit. And these two teams, you know, they've had some similarities throughout the year and also some differences as well. I mean, I think it's fair to say uh, Shopify have been pretty inconsistent throughout this year, landing some top fours here and there, Lima, Dream League 19, Dream League 21, but then knocked out first round at the Berlin Major and at the Bali Major as well. So really don't want to see this team in the lower bracket, T. Yeah, and on top of that, you've got this, the head-to-head -head between the two teams, right? Like Spirit and Shopify Rebellion. When you go back to when Spirit won TI, they never competed against each other. And then this year, it's been quite a one-sided affair. Like, you're talking about that top four at Lima. That was the only, that was the last time that Shopify actually beat Spirit. The rest of the time, it's been Spirit win, Spirit win, Spirit win, and then maybe one other draw in the mix. So... Yeah, this is going to be quite an uphill battle for Shopify, for sure. And uh, if there ever was a series to win, this is the one, right? Get yourself that ticket to the upper bracket. Sneak your way into a position where, with the old uh, format of TI, you wouldn't even be discussing upper bracket. But yeah, this is a, a, a kind of last lifeline for Shopify to get there, for sure. It is, it is. It could end up with a very good start for them if they can pull it off here. But uh, Team Spirit, you know, you're talking about how strong they are. And, you know, they had a pretty bad start to the year. You know, we weren't seeing much from them. But then they just started knocking it out of the park and all of a sudden yeah. getting some huge wins under their belt and, and winning the last two major tournaments. Why did they decide to get good in, like, the last, like, two months? 
They're, of course, they're very good the entire time. <laughs> they're just but chilling. They would like just big chilling, and then suddenly they, they rock up to a couple of tournaments. And oh my god, they're back! This is the spirit. And I feel, of course, the beauty of competitive Dota is it does take some time for things to click. Maybe heroes just aren't really meshing. Some philosophies aren't clicking. But yeah, right now, of hey, course, spirit are arguably some of the favorites, right? Of uh, of this TI run and uh, yeah, Everything, they're putting on yeah. an absolute show so far. I think yeah, they were the only team to go undefeated in all the other groups. Liquid yeah. seven and one, LGD seven and one, Tundra seven and one, but Team Spirit eight and zero, oh, completely undefeated, leaving Ten the groups. And that has to be like some sort of psychological consideration for Shop Spirit Betty. Like, sure, you're, you're you're trying not to think about it. You're trying not to be like these guys haven't lost yet, but. You know, you know in the back of your mind, but mm -hmm. maybe they can unlock something within themselves to uh, really bring the fight here to Team Spirit and prove that they can be the team to bring them down. Because if you can just get one win in the best of three series, it's going to send you up uh, on, on a real high, I reckon. So there's always that um, kind of counter spin. It just depends on, on how good the mentality is coming into this. And we shall see. So we have a draft in front of us right now. We have some interesting heroes coming out. First thing to mention, I would say, is probably this Enchantress coming out for Team Spirit. You kind of got to expect it if you let it through that first phase. And yeah, we're going to see Maposhka's Ench. And this is a very exciting pick for him. Yeah, I think it's also a little bit of respect towards Shopify. I think this is a hero that they themselves would love to pick up. And uh, because Spirit utilizes this hero really nicely, I think when they are first pick, they love to second phase this Enchantress because then Shopify need to respond with two heroes, and then you get this like ultimate last pick in the phase that gives Yataru the comfort of, okay, I see four heroes, what's my carry? I know my lane's always going to be good because Enchantress is there, either healing me up or taking over the jungle to just offset that lane. And I feel like Spirit pushed the priority of this Enchantress all the way up to the first phase just because of the opponent that they are up against. Yeah, definitely. And we saw the potency of it in their last series as well, you know, like he can go for the kind of, you know, normal enchantress build where you kind of like get some treads and maybe what your team needs and and go for like the the the, the hurricane pike or you can just go hard farm as well sometimes both just decides hey this one's going late i need my money i'm gonna get a moon shard you know <laughs> that's is what we saw from him last time and it was crazy but it worked it's what they needed in that game and uh, did help them come back and secure yet another win versus eg from fire rebellion meanwhile they've got this earth spirit this hero, it's very strong. It does a lot of damage. It gives you a lot of rotational ability. Like, sure, we don't see him really stomp mid lanes very often, but it's not about that. It's about being active on the map. Do you think that's something which Shopify play well with? Uh, I feel like they need to, I'd say, improve at this. They are the uh, team that finished yeah. the groups two and six, right? So I don't really want to be going, yeah, they're playing well because they haven't had the best start. So, um, but I think the heroes that they are drafting themselves will kind of lean into how the, their overall playstyle, right? It's Arteezy has been playing a lot of these slightly greedier carries compared to other carries right now in the tournament. Think not like Terrorblades, Naga, Void, even the Muerta. So having heroes like Phoenix and Earth Spirit who like to make a lot of moves and action in the early game, either through Ph Phoenix's reactionary moves or like you've already mentioned, Earth Spirit being at the forefront of every engagement, that does buy time for some of the greedier carries to kind of sit behind that team fight that he knows is uh, reliably occurring in front of him. Um, I think, of course, just Earth Spirit should just be the mid here. Having Crit on your team, there is that flexibility, but in recent time, I feel like Earth Spirit has just looked so strong on the mid lane, being able to go Vessel, uh, Midas, or the Blade Mail Heart builds, and just take over the game for the damage that you have with Magnetize. I would be surprised if it did go to a four position, um, but still, very solid openings, and I think Spirit's response with the Kunku, it's very nice to deal with Shopify. Like, Earth Spirit, if he he looks to take the damage to the fight, and if he can't actually get the kills, then the hero can feel quite lost. And I think Kunker, damage mitigation with your run buff, Enchantress already with the heal, like these are quite tanky heroes to try and survive from Earth Spirit. And you can match the team fight now. Phoenix has X, you have X, Torrent Storm, Tidal Wave, both like you're kind of uh, keeping toe to toe right now. Shopify yeah, yeah, definitely. Both teams kind of matching each other in terms of tempo and aggression, but and they're even turning it up now as well. Skyrath and Tusk, respectively. I mean, Tusk, not here we've seen that much off. Not as, pre as popular as it's been previously, but still coming up around. And now a Dawnbreaker comes out from Shopify as well. So, what are you thinking for the roles here? Is this a uh, offlane Dawn? I guess. Yeah, it's an offlane Dawn. So Saberlight coming into this series, he's played eight matches. He played eight different offlaners. 
So now he's actually going to play the sec uh, hero for a second time. So pretty impressive stat. Again, it's impressive until you see the scoreline, but it's fine. Just ignore that. Just enjoy the stat for what it is. Um, but no, I think for Shopify, at least, it really just goes down to they find a hero, they will execute. And I think for uh, Crit on this task, he's going to be that kind of blink buying four position that will marry up with the Earth Spirit and just look to do anything on the in the fight. And then at any point, Phoenix or Dawn can just join in to help you out. And for Spirit, we haven't seen a lot of Troll Warlord, but this hero is very good in this game because of the lane, right? Like, if you just look at yeah. what lane he's playing into, it's a lot of physical damage through the tag team of Tusk, the right clicks of Dawn. You throw in some Whirling Axes, that is going to offset the laning threat that a Tusk plus one can provide. And with an edge as well, like, that's a very potent lane. It really is, yeah. They're looking to win this safe lane, that's for sure. And, you know, Dawn, she can do stuff when she's not ahead. She can still pop that ultimate, you know, throw out stuns in the fight, etc. But you want her to be a little bit ahead. You want her to have a decent amount of farm so you can pack some punches, you know, really deal damage with that Starbreaker. That's when you see the hero come into its own. So being able to shut it down a little bit and ruin the aggressive potential of the Dawnbreaker and maybe even the Tusk as well is certainly going to be a big thing to think about for Shopify Rebellion. Also puts a lot of pressure on Arbed to do well out of this mid lane. How does that mid lane go versus the Kunker? Mm, it's pretty much a trade of farm between the two. Like, Kunker can get a couple more denies with the... Just the fact that he's just has better base damage and then you look towards earth spirit making the rotations it's always going to be earth spirit seeks to fight first and then kunker will see okay can i tp in and take that fight and i think for earth spirit just rotate when the fight's further away from his opponent's tower just so that kunker can't just copy every move that he makes and of course six minute runes are pretty impactful in this uh, matchup because both heroes if they pick up a haste or a dd they're suddenly going to be looking to side lanes even more but yeah, should be relatively even in that regard. Draft-wise, though, I think for Spirit, I like the Faces Void ban. I think for Troll Warlord, Ten seconds like a lot of the carries that we're seeing RTZ play so far in the tournament aren't looking too Five good. If you throw in the Faces Void, of course, you can stop that Battle Trance getting uh, kind of put into mix. And I think you kind of want RTZ to have some impact on stopping Troll from free casting. Yeah. You don't have the most reliable of stuns. Like, it's what? Snowball punch from a tusk, a roll from Ursper, and that's about it. So, Troll should be pretty unkillable. And there, we see there the go, Spirit Breaker come in as well. <laughs> this is a really right. aggressive lineup from Spirit. It really is, yeah. They've got a lot, <laughs> of and they're going to put Terror Blade on Shop's Fine. No big surprise there. <laughs> Laughter coming out from Collapse, even as, uh, you know, you could have seen this one coming a mile off. The writing's on the walls. So, Shop Flight going back to the old favorite, the RTZ Terror Blade. It has come in clutch with them many times before. Let's see how it goes. He pushes off the hug from Bulba. <laughs> oh, I'm just denied. I, I need to double check the stats on this, uh, on this Terror Blade real quick. Okay. All right, what do you think its win rate was for the entire year of DPC? Bloody hell, uh, I'm going to go 45%. 45.45%? Congratulations, you are a winner. Yes! <laughs> Let's <Yeah>. go. <laughs> Stats God over here. I Let's mean, you it. get the same document open. <laughs> or are I, you a I, god? Who knows? No, I just, I just, I just, I just eyeballed it. I'm a, <sighs> I'm a gamer, T. You've got to remember You that. are a gamer. And we have yeah. 10 gamers here seeking to lift the Aegis. Mm-hmm. Which draft is going to help them do it? I mean, from what we've seen from Team Spirit, it's very hard to count them out. However, I can see holes in this draft. Like, I can see them not being able to put the pressure on in the early mid as much as they'd like to. You know, like, Shopify Rebellion, these four heroes, they can fight. And they can fight without Arteezy for a pretty long time, I would say. That is my concern, is that um, they're not going to be able to find what they need on the map. And Shopify should be able to answer as well. They've got three heroes, maybe even four if you count Phoenix who can respond to the aggression from Team Spirit. And that's what I like to see versus the Spirit Break, you know, versus the Kunker, that kind of thing. So I don't know if you kind of echo that sentiment. Um, I, I don't think I do, really, to be honest. I think Spirit are actually in a pretty good spot for this draft. I think Shopify, there's a lot of pressure on them to be able to get to a point where they can dictate the game because a lot of their heroes, if they don't cleanly use their first round of spells, the secondary fight gets even harder, right? Like a Terrible with meta, you want the fight to, to be contained during it. The Dawnbreaker Solar Guardian, the Phoenix with the Egg, and of course, Earth Spirit with Magnetize. Like, all of these heroes are somewhat locked into needing that one key spell uh, to get themselves into the fight. And then for Team Spirit, 
it's kind of the opposite story, right? It's a lot of poke. It's Spirit Breaker charging in, baiting the spells. It's Enchantress can walk up the high ground, see what's up, tank a couple spells, and then Kunkka doesn't really care too much. So I feel like for Shopify, their draft does look quite nice. Items are going to be their best friend, and also just yeah. being very methodical of how they use their spells. But if the games get scrappy, sure. Spirit will be able to just exploit some of uh, their timings. Yeah, I'm definitely looking at like, you know, the BKB from RTZ, you know, when are you going to use that? Can you hold out long enough to not kind of have it just kited out by Team Spirit and yet also use it at the right time where you're not just going to die due to chain lockdown, which is possible. But then you've got the saves coming into the mix as well, right? You've got a Snowball, you've got a Solar Guardian. So it's a very interesting game when it comes down to it. And yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of nuances in this draft we're going to see played out by both of these teams. Yeah, of course, uh, Team Spirit, they've been so scary recently, and when they pull out something aggressive, you've you, you got to be ready to, to, to weather the storm, that's for sure. Batten down the hatches. It's also, you're picking the Terrorblade into the Troll Warlord, where if Troll can get on top of the Terrorblade in those like late game clutch 1v1 duels, it's not the easiest matchup for Troll to, you know, oh, let me just sunder that Troll real quick. It's, he's going to have that BKV, he's going to have ways to disjoint that, and yeah, positioning is going to be super key for Shopify, and it all kind of stems back down to the Earth Spirit on the mid lane. I think Crit and Arbed, these two players are going to be very pivotal for Shopify's entry into this game. They're definitely the guys we're looking at, for sure. Crit and Arbed, the Tusk and the Earth Spirit, they're the ones who need to make the moves, need to respond. Like, they just need to match, like, the five hero tempo of, of Team Spirit as two heroes. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, you've got that uh, that lovely Solar Guardian coming down as well. But that one's a little easier to land. So, what kind of build are we expecting from Collapse this game on the Spirit Breaker? Because we've seen a lot of variations on the Spirit Breaker throughout the Road to TI. Ooh, I think probably they'll go for Phase Boots Midas. Octarine is like the, currently the favorite because you always just become you know, top two, top three net worth in the game with this build. And I think if the game gets difficult, you can maybe change it up a bit, but. Yeah, I think just Phase Boots Midas is just the most stable entry, and then he can just kind of feel out the game. Interestingly enough, yeah. actually, in the top lane, so when the creeps met, Poshka and uh, Yotaro just double right click the range creep down straight away, just trying to get as much XP as possible from the lane. But now they're kind of pulling it back. So the lane's pushing into Shopify, but they should be able to hit level two uh, earlier and just give themselves kill threat because of that play. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, just trying to rush the level twos is down at bottom as well, Mirror and Fly just constantly trading with each other, and Fly honestly doing pretty good at just putting the fight towards the Skyrath Mage, who's usually kind of favored in these uh, these trading situations. He's already buying more salves. <laughs> that is going to be the key thing in this lane for, for Fly. As soon as you use one salve, get another one coming out. Like, Do not allow yourself to have any downtime in this lane without any regen. Yeah, he just needs to keep himself healthy until RTZ can go to the junglers in the top lane. They just run him down. The damage from the tag team plus the Starbreaker was way too much for the Enchantress to handle. My goodness, 512 damage dealt in just a short space of time there. Yeah, Team Spirit, they tried to go for a cool play to get level two, but yeah, just, they didn't get it in the end. And Tusk and the Dawnbreaker, if they get it before you, they are going to be getting the kills. Yeah, it kind of seems like that's what Team Spirit were avoiding as Mira. Getting cooked a little bit hard, but here by Fly won't end up dropping quite to the Blood Grenade and to those uh, Fire Spirits, but very close indeed. Meta being used in lane as well by RTZ just to secure the CS, lay a bit of harassment onto Collapse. Again, just trying to survive through these early levels. Oh, Mira, he comes back in for Fly. My goodness, <laughs> need to keep your distance from this Phoenix. He's just bullying the Scarath Mage at the moment. Mirror is just going to TP back to base, get his health and mana back. Yeah, I think the start of this game, just going to be a, quite a nice little trade of farm there. Arteezy is going to be complete free farm. Fly, he did a lot of just early damage soak onto that Scarif Mage, and ooh, so far, no real concerns getting generated by either side, right? Everyone's hitting the creeps quite healthily. Of course, Spirit Breaker, he's one of the offlanders that scales into the game, like his early first three, four minutes not very strong. It's why it is potentially an exploitable minute for three minutes, and then it's relatively broken for, you know, 57 minutes. And one thing I like which Mira did there as well is um, he kind of 
he knew where the ward was. He got out of range of the ward, hit behind a tree, and then TP'd out. It's up in the top lane. This time, they're going on to Yatoro. They're trying to bait to take down the Troll Warlord. They don't quite have the damage to finish off the job here. And with Maposhka just kind of harassing them down, they can't chase them down. But still, I'm very impressed at this lane. You know, Tusk, Dawnbreaker, apparently, it's enough to fight up into a Troll and an Enchantress. Yeah, you see Maposhka go for that enchant and heal build so he's not being able to punch from a distance but in doing so a lot of sustain coming out from the spirit safe lane shopify i was about to say spotify shopify are trying to whittle down as much as possible we haven't really had to talk about mid lane this is very much just a as expected the trader farm between the kunker and the earth spirit our bed that's kind of level though. five what's what was cute yeah uh, Lal just uh, fortified just as our bed tried to uh, combo down the range creep and was able to deny it from him and mm -hmm. give him a little bit of an advantage here, at least for the time being. <laughs> like how the observers really locked onto Terra. We know our RTD Terra Blades. At any minute, <laughs> things could go south. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You're never sure. I mean, last time last time we cast that TZ game, he somehow ended up giving first blood next to the enemy ancient down this lane. So, Lost yeah, don't, don't take your eyes off him. Oh, our bed though. Making a rotation in, yeah, but actually just getting rotated upon. He needs to get away from this right now. Fairy fire comes oh, out. Why come swooping on in, but the bat is there. The right click. It won't come in in time for collapse. The bolt's coming he's in. He's going to be able to escape on the Earth Spirit. It looks like Mira might be trading his life. Yes, he will. Fly takes oh. down one. Collapse also being right click to death here. He needs to get away. Can't do it. Fly gets a double kill on the Phoenix. An unconventional rotation for sure, but it worked. Hmm, I'm annoyed because because medically it looked like the bolt yeah, should have... Yeah, I guess it already hit him and it just looked like it hit him. But yeah, fair enough. So Spirit, they look like they're going to get a free kill on our bed. They get the bash as well, but rolls away. Invulnerable. Lives the dream and yeah. What could have just been an absolute disaster for our bed? <laughs> just turns it around? Yeah. I mean, you, 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 the bait rotation where you just run at low health into the bottom lane, force two heroes to try and run you down and get out of position so that your side, line, side lanes can kill them. It's uh probably wasn't the plan, but if it works out, it works out. And crit immediately goes towards mid lane as well to uh, sponge up some XP for himself. Very important for the Tusk to just try and stay ahead on uh, on XP. And also give Saberlight a chance to uh, get a bit of solo up on the top side because they know he's going to be all right in the position he's in. I just checked the combat log. So Earthbrook went to 7 HP from the Spirit Breaker right click and then 13 HP from then the Arcane Bolt. Whew! Just two instances of near death for our bed. Mira coming in, sees crit. It's all about the minute six rooms, but up on the top side, they're chasing down Saberlight under the tower. Saberlight turns it around with the Starbreak Maposhka. He's got to be careful. He has got the nature attendants healing him up, but Yotaro, he's just gone down to fly. He's just found three kills in a matter of instance, and Saberlight is just hammering Maposhka to death. See you later. God, Saberlight tenderizing his venison up here. Yeah, very nice tip as well coming out. What a die from Team Spirit in the fight. Now back into mid lane as well. It's non-stop right now. The tempo is very high, but they managed to catch out Crit, but Crit, he's got the wand, gets himself up to the high ground with the kickback from our bet. A little bit of nice two play there from the two of them. Yeah, Spirit. Looking to be the aggressors, right? They're making the moves. They're the ones going for our bet, going for the dive on Dawnbreaker, just giving away these kills when they don't connect on the spells. And Shopify, they're of course, they're gonna happily take up these freebies. Sitting back, continue to farm. We mentioned that Shopify, their draft is exploitable if the game gets chaotic and spirit that they, they were trying to get you know the chaos to uh to begin but yeah shopify doing a very good job just rebuttaling that now making the stacks up in position to go for a wisdom rune crit unable to steal away team spirit so it should just be a one for one for one trade and how do you feel as team spirit drafting this troll warlord and then honestly just not doing that great in the top lane hmm. so Troll Warlord is going to be a very strong laner for sure because you have the Welling Axes both aggressive and defensively used and I think this hero after lane it can feel a little bit lost but then you just can come back into the game just like oh how do we kill him off we don't have enough stuns he's locked onto our carry and maybe you could argue the lane could have been a bit better but he's still CSing perfectly fine his game other than his dive is good 
very patient here in the, uh, in the top side, waiting for Sableye to do exactly that. The moment Celestial Hammer comes down, Maposhka makes his move, but he hits level six. He could actually get away from this with the Soul Ring. And they realize that on Team Spirit, and they'll back themselves away, especially with Arbez rotation as well. That got read out, and that's going to be enough to Team Spirit to back themselves away. But yeah, kind of the wasting of rotation there from Arbed. Arbed has been incredibly active on the map, and that will be the, the key difference here. A Kunker on mid lane, halfway through towards level eight, just farming up constantly, whilst Arbed, eight CS down, just making so many moves, nearly died bottom, just rotated top, not really able to connect anything too much in the game so far, but. These are the natural moves that you expect from an Earthspirit. He is one of the more active mid laners right now in the meta. And meanwhile, yeah, and I think with the state he's in at the moment as well, it's it's not like you can really stop him being an impact for hero in fights. You know, even even if you do stomp him down a bit, even if he fails some early rotations, you know, he's, he's not like other mid heroes where he just won't have a game after that. But Pushka, he's getting run down again here, and that combination is so damn good. Tag team into the star break of Yatoro. Looking for a bit of revenge, and Sableye just gone. He's just going to TP across to Mr. Terrorblade over on the other side of the map. I was hoping he'd instantly go back into the twin gate and then just go back <laughs> to farming top. But <laughs> come no. back to top. Trying yeah. to get on the collapse here. Collapse now does have the charge of darkness, but the damage is there. The damage is more than there. They take him down anyway. And even a little okay. thing coming out from Sableye mm -hmm. as well. It begins. It is kind of like Sableye like, versus the world in regards to the tip game. Like, he's tipping Yataro, he's tipping Collapse. And um, uh, yeah. using that charisma, using that energy, Shopify. In the context of this best of three, you win the best of three, you're in the upper bracket for the playoffs. You lose the best of three, you go into the lower bracket. So even though Spirit yeah. topped the group, this best of three, it really can dictate the rest of their TI journey. It's a very important, you know, step. It is essentially like everybody starting in a seeded upper bracket run, right? Yeah, pretty much. We got cool. Yeah, the without the crowd upper bracket games right now. <laughs> but group stage. Yes. All right. Well, the farm walls do continue, and Artizi is definitely in the lead in that regard. It's on Terra Blade farm in the lane with the illusions, farming down the creep avenue in the bottom side. It's a very straightforward game for him, and exactly what we expected from this Terra Blade. Collapse, not really playing a hero that can super pressure. Um, the real question is, was it too good of a game for RTZ? Some may say. Because he's going for a Midas. Oh my god. <laughs> Which is, to be fair, on Terra Blade, carry players have been dipping in and out of going for the Midas and Terra Blade. Um, and if he sees this game going later, Buying it at this point after such a free lane is going to be perfectly fine. Um, the question is, he could have gone for, say, Dragon Lance Manta, go for the Hurricane Pike, then you have kind of mid game tools to deal with the Troll plus the Spirit Breaker combos and tanky enough to survive through the Scarf. But instead, he is going for Midas, which will delay his ability to join the rest of his team. This will be something that yeah. we'll have to reference in 15, 20 minutes' time, most likely. Roll into the middle lane. Oh my goodness, everything is being thrown at Lal here. And uh, I mean, it's going to work, but. They throw an egg, they throw a solar guardian, and down he goes. Fair enough. Job's done. Mira, also going to be the next target. Ah, then moved on in here. He's got the magnetize. He's got the double damage rune as well. Mira does not stand a chance of surviving this one. He's going to go down as well. Nice shots from Crit helping out with that one. Middle tower is likely going to be sacrificed here. I can't see Team Spirit mounting a defense. Yeah, just shop him Shopify, sorry, making all the right moves. And on top of that, I like the fact Cyber Light is looking to go for this Desolator. He's not just going for a casual blade mile like you see from most off laners. His game is very good. He's 3-0-3, yeah. 62 CS, get that Desolator, and then he will become a really big ticket core. He can easily kill Sky Orange the entire game just with one blink into Starbreaker. And I like the fact that Cyber Light has decided that he can also become a really big core in Arbed with the blade mill. Yeah, they're hitting a sweet spot. Key thing here is RTZ will just be AFK in the jungle. Like every move that we see from <laughs> yeah. Shopify will just be everyone without RTZ. And maybe Spirit looks to try and exploit that. It will be quite difficult as the troll also kind of wants to just AFK farm right now. Looking to complete that Battle Fury. About half a Claymore away from it. And we'll need to play a little bit of catch up. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to be an okay timing, of course. You know, Yatoro doesn't really matter how his lanes go. He always hits decent timings on his items. And to be fair, no one's really gone to find him in the jungle or anything like that. But 
Yeah, like Arteza is just having such a such a freebie right now, but you won't see the impact of that until much later on. So still going to be the kind of four man fighting from the side of Shopify, but. You know, as we mentioned earlier on in the draft, if these four heroes can get their money, which they absolutely have, then they are a formidable fighting force. They don't really need a Terror Blade until they start going for objectives. And are they really looking for the heart as a second item? Blade Mail Heart. This is the build which um, I think you mentioned, and yeah, it's uh, pretty sick when you have a start like this. Yeah, I think Shopify just kind of reading the fact that Spirit, because their lanes didn't go well, you know Spirit Broker naturally wants to go for a Midas. You know that. Troll needs to go for a Battle Fury. You have two side lane cores who kind of farm backwards, right? Like all of their items look towards going to the jungle, look towards their own economy compared to let's smoke with my team. So I think Shopify, that's why they are being a little bit greedier themselves because they have this breathing, uh, this window of breathing. And on top of that, they do just have nine kills oh, to God. no death. <laughs> well, farewell, Maposhka. Yeah, I thought he could get away with throwing a few toothpicks at Fly. Um, but unfortunately, the boys turn up, crit in our bed. The rotating duo. Who has got to be ready for that one with an arcane rune on Earth Spirit as well. They want to make something more happen here. And an instant smoke up as well. Did you expect mm -hmm. the first game of the day just to be a 10 0 kill lead to, 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 to Shopify? Like, yeah, not to Shopify, that's for sure. And now they move on. They found Lal in the middle lane who just walks into them and gets absolutely shredded. I mean, Team Spirit, they are just getting picked off one by one across the map. This is Be such careful, a you know, whatever we say right now could technically jinx Shopify. There's a lot of NA fans right now who are very excited to see what's happening. But can they keep up the same amount of pressures? Spirit have maybe, been that team to always find re-entry to games. Maybe that's it, the Eclipse hit and everything turned backwards and now all the lower teams are, are just going to stomp their best of threes. I'm here for some upsets, for sure, for sure. So what real timings are we looking for Arteezy to hit to really get involved in this game? I've already mentioned Hurricane Pike being pretty good. I think having that way of cancelling charge yourself is always helpful. Providing that distance from the troll, also very good. On top of that, it's always going to be Manta just to be able to continue farming. And then I think most likely Scardy after. And then that will be your big timing of let me go play yeah. with the team. But because your Dawnbreaker has gone for Desolator, you can now just go for Rosha. You have the tag team as well. You have the medallion. And then, yeah, nice reads coming out from Shipify once again. Yeah, they're just going to look towards Roshan, as mentioned, even use the meta. Just take it away. Taking away all That's the mini objectives to... Throw in a tag team as well. I like how you well, said that, yeah. they got real slow. <laughs> it's going down really quick, and then they just stop dying for a second. Yeah, the, the uh, tag team runs off, one of the illusion dies, and all of a sudden, it's, uh, it's not so hot, but... Yeah, we'll be, uh, we'll be uncontested here. Team Spirit, not in any situation to go and deal with this. You know, they're still farming on their troll. Their Spirit Break's got this Midas, so he's not really looking to get involved too much. I'm just going to give this one away. And Sableite's going to be the one to take it as well. I mean, you're not exactly giving it to your Midas Terror Blade with a single Dragon Lance, right? Bottom side, though. They're moving on to fly a little bit, but Crit's here. He's ready to respond. They're checking the cliff, making sure there's no wards around. Mira, he's kind of moved into no man's land. Oh, Radiant crit. Tower is under Did he see him? Scan connect. He's... Yeah, he saw him. And he's just going to be able to get on top of Mira and should be able to do this all by himself. Although Mystic Flare comes down, not going to be enough though to turn that one around. <laughs> yeah. Is Mira okay? No, he's not. <laughs> Mavosh is farming so deep at the enemy side of the map at the moment. They're just trying to split the map and... Yeah. That's kind of going to be Spirit's game, right? When you don't have a single kill to your side, when your cores can't really make any plays, it is just kind of throw bodies in, right? So you're going to be seeing the Enchantress, the Skyrath Mage, just make these weirder plays. Spirit Breaker, of course, one of the best heroes at just getting in, poking, press bulldoze. Now I've wasted a little bit of time, and that is the key thing for Spirit. Buy as much time as possible. Wait for your troll to pick up the BKB, and then hope that Shopify crossed the river with a bit too much confidence and maybe fall flat in a fight. But right now for Spirit, they are farming in the hope that uh, Shopify put themselves in a bad position. There isn't really opportunities right now that they can just dictate the game. And... Uh... Potentially with the Octarine on Spirit Breaker, once he picks that up, should be tanky enough maybe to also look for a fight, but 
if you're going into a level a level two solar guardian, the level two magnetized with blade mill, like it is not going to be an easy fight for Spirit, and that's why they Absolutely are going to be delaying as much as possible. Yeah, as uh, Thor does make his way up the net worth charts, looking for that BKB, which is actually coming out pretty damn soon. But yeah, it's hard to see a fight going well for him at the moment, for sure. I think, I mean, ultimately, we've seen Team Spirit in these situations before. Like, it's not like every single game they've played, all eight of their victories have been complete stomps. They've been down, and they've been down bad but they've always found a way back into the game. They're so good at playing the map in the late game situation, and even in the mid game situation when they're when they're really far behind. But once again, Lal looks like he's gonna get caught out here and it will be him dropping. Are you seeing similarities in this game to the game we saw with uh, against EG where they had that PA? It does kind of have the same kind of tune to it, which is Yataru is telling team, guys, just play your game, push out, do what you need to do, and they actually go, oh, did they find Terra Blade? That is massive. Collapse. Brings him down. <laughs> well, sweat. I mean, they get a kill on some Boshka, sure, but Yataru, he's just farming whilst the, whilst the Terra Blade is dead. This is what it took. Scarath Mage and the Spirit Breaker. Yeah, you take those victories if you're Spirit, your first kill of the game, it's going to be on the Arteezy Terra Blade. And he hasn't really got any streaks or anything, so it's not too crazy of a death to have, right? It's not like he's giving away five, 600 gold, right? But still for Spirit, you were asking what's going to be happening, and this was kind of what I was going to be hinting at. Yotaru, he needs to hit the creeps, play away from that pocket of aggression, and for Spirit, get those combos in play. Get the Scarf behind the Spirit Breaker. Hope to find maybe just one pick off to give yourself, yourself some confidence. And probably the best hero that they could pick off, <laughs> they got it. Mm. Absolutely. That's crazy. Well, um, that, that changes things a little good. bit. A little yeah. bit, sure. But well, they are still 15 for one. It is still a 5k lead. I think it's if anything... One <laughs> yeah. And also, it's not as if Arteezy has done anything different. He's been very predictable so far, right? He's been farming the spot side of the map, pushing out. Then he came top, took a Roshan, and then he instantly scurried his way back down to the Radiant safe aim, right? Like, he's basically been here for 20 minutes of the game. Yeah. It is just wild to have your carry die when you're 15 and 0, and you have an Aegis, and then the only target they ever kill in the entire game has, has been your big max net worth Terra Blade, but that is the kind of the draft thing of, of Team Spirit, though. You know, you have a Spirit Breaker and you have a Skyrath Mage, so these two heroes will always be able to make this happen. But the gold went to the Spirit Breaker, you know, it, it was a bit, it was a bit, but it's just going to make him more and more annoying, so he's going to pick up the Shard, get the Planar Pocket for the next engagement. And on top of that, it's 15 and 0 for Sh Shopify, but look at the hero levels. The Troll and the Spirit Breaker are actually top of the levels right now, both level 15, Earth Spirit and Dawnbreaker 14, and Arteez is only level 13 with a Midas and complete free farm. And of course, it does help that Spirit Breaker got the kill on the Terror Blade, helping out a little bit more. But... Ooh, crit! Catches him out! Oh my god, what a field coming in from him as he catches the long ball collapse. That was cute. I like that. Oh, very nice. And the key thing there is they get the kill on the Spirit Breaker and they're all here ready to start progressing the map, right? Arteezy, he's left the jungle, he's with the boys, he's taken the tier two, and that's now kind of what you expect, right? With the lead that they have, you want to see some metas actually kind of just converging on the map, pressuring Spirit a little bit, because like I mentioned, their levels for Spirit are looking very healthy. The item timings are slowly kicking in for Spirit. This isn't a game where if you like, if you just ignored everything and just looked at the kill feed, you'd go, wow, okay, Shopify, they're insane. Like, they're going to win the game, right? But the motions aren't really hitting right now. Like, you're not feeling the momentum and the pressure that should choke out a team with this type of kill score. Spirit yeah. are doing a very good job at continuing to just stick throughout this game. So I wonder what we're looking at for Team Spirit here. We've got a BKB up on the Troll Warlord. He's moving in to the Sanjin Yasha soon as well. Perhaps that's his fighting item back there. Oh, yeah, Spirit here. 
That's fair. I mean, he's got no BKB, so the Mystic Flare is just going to be able to rip through him, and they'll lose him. No Solar Guardian to come down and help him out there, but Grit is actually going for the play with Fly onto Collapse, and in comes Saberlight sliding in from the sidelines. But Team Spirit, they smell blood in the water, and they want to chase this one. They know there's also no meta available for a little bit. Fly needs to get himself out of this one, but there is no way out. He's used his egg, he's used his dive, and he will go down as well. And that is a kill streak going the way of Nira here. So these little wins are pretty impactful to the Team Spirit lineup. Yeah, I think you're now going to have to start asking the questions. Shopify, they got that first Aegis so freely. They had Desolator, they had some pretty big items available, but they weren't really making the moves. They kind of made the game a little bit more stagnant. And now Maposhka, is he misclicking a tip? Is he throwing out an Arteezy? You bought Midas on Terrorblade and haven't really done anything on the map type tip? Like, I don't know. But Shopify for sure. Thing. Interesting, but oh, down, down to the bottom side, they catch out Yatoro. It looks like things are coming back together for Team Spirit. But Sableite and Crit make sure they stay on top. Mm -hmm. And there it is again. You, you tip my carry, I tip yours. I mean, they needed to get some type of kill, right? Like the fact that Spirit have had freedom to do any, anything they wanted now. Sableite, throwing a bit of attention here. And again, that Mystic Flare coming on through. Arbed comes in to share the damage. Make sure he's going to be OK. And now once again, Crit jumps in, throws in the punch, Collapse. They're looking to take him down here. Miposhka doing a decent amount of damage from the sidelines. Might not be enough to get Collapse out of danger. That said, he's going to ulti across. Very cute, not cute enough. He does still drop. Miposhka and Mira don't commit to this one. They just back away. Now the tower starts to drop. Arteezy not here to drop the Metamorphosis and help out with this push. No real commitment coming out from Shopify, especially when Roshan could be respawning anytime soon. They don't know that it's coming in two minutes' time. Yeah. I think Shopify are refinding their footing, though, in regards to the aggression that they can can bring to the game. And on top of that, Arteezy is close to his Skadi. Potentially, this next Roshan, the Skadi, the Aegis, like, this has to be the window for Shopify to try and build up this lead. The entire time it's been what? The bouncing between 4 to 6k gold. It's now finally getting to the 7k part. I think both teams, Roshan needs to be the next call they're both making here. Whoever is able to obtain that second Aegis most likely should be able to take over the entire map and dictate how the game is to be played in the next 5 minutes. And yep, it is respawning in back. 1 minute and 10 seconds time. Yeah, it's a quick stop off for the Shard. So we'll get that on our bed. <laughs> can have some uses, maybe not the one which they were super looking for, probably wanted that demon zeal, depending on, uh, yeah, I think just about everyone else has a shard, so could have happened, but alas, smoke up now from Shopify, looking to go and contest this Roshan area, which Team Spirit have already cemented themselves in. How do they approach this engagement? But be careful, Kunkka does have his Aghanims. Torrent Storm is available. Oh, Crit jumps in, doesn't find anybody though, immediately getting silenced up, and he's just gonna get taken down. The Smash Casualty of Fight on the back lines. Mira's gone down to Sableite straight away. And Sableite trying to look for more here as RTZ pops the ultimate, bashes down into Lull. He's getting controlled up a little bit by Spirit Break. He's coming in though. Top of RTZ silenced up and pushed away by Arbet. Arbet trying to keep him alive here and may have just done it, staying upon him and now uses him to Sunder and Snowballs out, but it's not gonna be enough. He's surrounded by Team Spirit heroes arteezy will fall and now sableite's going down as well team spirit they just stayed upon him so cute from our bed to try and get him away from that one using the pull using the push but it didn't make a difference team spirit never lost sight of their prey and now they're in the pit spirit a farm for that perfect fight and it has happened time and time in the group stage and now we're seeing it here in game one they were down by so many kills they were given room to hit their timings and Shopify, they smoke deep into the spirit side of the map. And in their attempt to do it, Crit, he wildly blinks in, doesn't find anyone. And at this point already, the fight is somewhat over, right? Collapse instantly helps heals off the task. Terrorblade's trying to run in, but the egg is instantly killed off. And Terrorblade by himself, sure, Arbed, he's making some impeccable plays to try and keep him alive. But this isn't a fight construct for Shopify to ever really win with that botched initiation. Spirit, super disciplined and punishing Shopify so damn well oh just watching that again it's 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 so tragic like you know again if these kind of plays it, it it's it's great from our man like it's super sick to try and pull this one out but unfortunately you know two two of your teammates are dead already oh god <laughs> put that away <laughs> that graph was jesus <laughs> oh. 
Oh my god, if you've got any Shopify supporting friends, now might be the time for a uh, supportive phone call, maybe a message or two. This is uh, this is a tough watch at the moment. Such a massive, massive lead from them now completely gone. Team Spirit, you can just never count them out. They'll be doing it again and again and again this road to TI. Yeah, the key thing for Shopify is they need to get through this Aegis, and the next time they take a big team fight, they need to provide their heroes to la like layer themselves in to defend each other correctly, right? Keep the egg alive. Allow for Terrorblade to enter that 1v1 duel, but with a Solar Guardian on top. Keep the Tusk in position to maybe provide snowball saves. Like when it was so just kind of loosely thrown in, right? Like a Tusk over here, a Phoenix over there, or TZ, oh, he's running in. Like there's no way you're going to be able to beat the previous TI champions like Spirit like that. And of course, they're going to have about five minutes to kind of refine their footing, decide how they want to approach the fight, but they do have it in them. Their heroes are able to slaughter some of these engagements. Just needs to be under their vision, under their control. And for Spirit, on the other hand, with this Aegis, take the top tower, move towards mid, sweeping throughout the map, and already Yataro looking to go for that MKB. Often Terrorblade likes to buy a Butterfly to deal with these big physical damage carries, and Troll, one of the few position ones that likes and actually enjoys buying an MKB. This is an item that's a little bit lost nowadays. Yeah, Troll, happy to go for it. And happy to continue applying that threat to Arteezy. Yeah, it's a big like off. At this rate, for Arteezy, he kind of needs too many items, right? It's like, you want the Silver Bridge to maybe position nicely. You want the Hurricane Pike to push them back, but also at 35 minutes, doesn't feel too great. Maybe a Lincoln's to deal with a charge. But then you're lacking damage. A Daedalus and a Satanic. Like, I'm listing so many items for him to feel comfortable in an engagement. And you're also playing against Torrent Storm and Boat and all this yep. stuff coming out from Tonka Kunker, you know, the, 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 the tidal wave. Surely a BKB is necessary here as well. And <laughs> all of those items are coming after that on the shopping list right now. Oh, it's very, very awkward for him to, uh, to efficientize properly as Fly has been seen. Does get out. Nice TP from him. Gets himself to safety. And drags back a bunch of Team Spirit heroes in the process. Claps. Got the BKB complete. Wow. Already halfway the towards side. the Agnums. Okay, uh, they're lucky. Almost timed that very nice on Sableye. In fact, he is still going to be able to get off the X mark, so it's going to have to be a BKB Solar Guardian used from Sableye. So many resources to get away from that one. It was required, but man, it hurts. Oh, Spirit just sticking together, right? Like Spirit Raking, he can play on the sides of the map. How quickly he just pushed out the lane. It's why this hero is going to be so, so powerful throughout the later stages of this TI. You have Bulldoze, you have Plane Up Pocket, you've got Magic Resistance, Status Resistance. You kill Creep Waves in a split second. The rest of his team can then just play together as four. And... There's another wave. Are they going to try and go on him? Yes, they are. Crit jumps in, stun comes out. BKB immediately responded to by Collapse. And Crit, well, he's just going to see if he can play his way out of this one. He's got an Ogre Seal totem, he's got a full staff, but it's not going to be enough. Snowball shall delay the inevitable and full staff away, but the clicks are there and Collapse will bring him down. But decent amount of time wasted, I suppose. He nearly had Blink, though. Like, with that four staff disengage, without the uh, the type ring hit, he would have been able to Blink out. No. Well timed. Blink to shot the fight. Playing into an Aegis, just taking away a BKB, you probably take that as a win. Once again, <laughs> Shopify just trying to leave this area. Trying to just uh, keep away from Team Spirit. They don't want to give them anything. And that's kind of the difference between the way these two teams are playing from behind. And like Team Spirit never really care about giving away a couple of kills or so. You know, as long as they're out on the map getting stuff whilst they're behind, they seem to be fine with it. Shopify, meanwhile, you know, that sure they, they, they dropped the tusk, but Sableye just using everything to get away. No one really brave enough to show on the other side of the map or anything like that. I know, is that something you're thinking about this game? Yes, I just did that. It's a little bit of a difficult one. I'm just trying to think, though, more for Shopify. It's like, what realistically can they do? I think once they're in the open map, it's so hard to position. And it's obviously the strength of Spirit Breaker, right? And now the whole script's turned, where Shopify now need to wait for Spirit to play into them, come into the high ground. And 
Uh, maybe with the boards. Crit jumps in. They find Lull. He's going to be the target. Will collapse immediately getting on the Martizi and stopping that damage coming through. The do cheese. they have enough? No, they do not. The cheese is there from Lull. It's going to heal him right the way up again. He's just going to run himself away. BKB is gone from him, sure. But collapse is continuously running at Artizi in this fight, not letting him stand his ground whatsoever. Sableye, he's going to be left behind and just taken down by a billion spears. As collapse finds another. Collapses onto Fly. Our bed all alone all of a sudden needs to escape this one. Needs to dodge the X marks. And it looks like he was able to do so inside that rolling boulder. The one and two will survive, but three, four, and five are dead. I didn't expect Shopify to go and seek the fight like that. Sure, the Aegis was uh, expiring, but I just wasn't expecting Shopify to be the be the aggressors, especially with how the, the fight's been going. And yeah, they they kind of did a good job. They kept the egg alive, but they weren't able to contain within that egg space. And yeah, Spirit just beautifully disengaging, waiting for those key spells to get used. And then upon the the finish, boom, go for that second fight. Shopify, they can't take multiple engagements. Solar Guardian, Egg, if they're down, it's going to be quite a struggle to deal with Spirit. And yeah, they Spirit are just see, seeing through the Shopify draft beautifully. Probably not taking Rex unless Maposhka wants to just uh, stay here by himself. Already leaving now. Lyle just kind of... Starting off that fight wonderfully as well, just kind of being the big bait and holding that cheese, ready to get it off. And of course, that was made possible. They, they would have had the damage to bring him down, but Collapse was just there, charging in on Arteezy over and over again, stopping him from just being able to stand there, use his metamorphosis, and, and kill off that, that Tonka in the stun duration. And that really was a difference maker. Like, Shopify weren't wrong. They, they could have killed the Tonka, but Spirit Breaker just constantly disabling their damage dealer. It's ridiculous. So hard to play into now, Rat easy. It kind of feels like Shopify already are talking about, okay, so where's our big comeback play? And of course, I think when a task's in the game, Aghanims will be maybe the saving grace here. If you can get it in, what, maybe 10, 15 minutes time, you don't lose a lane of racks, you kick someone deep, it could be enough. But yeah, right now, they're going to have to play a little bit more of a farm game, get the waves pushed out and just respect the Spirit Breaker doing so much. He has Octarine, Yashakaya, Aghanims, BKB. He's nearly level 25 at the 35 minute mark. This is insane. Ah, he is just right. taking over this game. <laughs> that was really cool as well. I'm watching him here. Um, so he was charging for Vision, right? Yep. The team weren't really in position to follow up. He was moving his phase boots and his Kaya and Yasha out of his inventory to slow exactly, himself yep. down in the charge. No, it's a really good play. Yeah, I think some uh -oh. of the best plays from Spirit Breakers are backpacking move speed. And he's Jane. It's Toro just scattering the pigeons right now. Shovel by just being forced back. And Artizi is trying to load onto an enchantment for people. Can't get off the damage at all. Sableye already taken out of the fight. He's going to buy back into this one. Has the Solar Guardian if needed. As Fly just playing a bit of Dance Dance Revolution over here, trying to get out of the water park and does survive it. <laughs> Shopify, they need to find something right now. Arteezy, he popped a metamorphosis. It's going to be on cooldown for two minutes and ten. And... But Spirit, they see it. They're like, okay, just disengage, guys. Get back to our high ground. And that's why Shopify have smoked up. They, they can feel the desperation. They found your tower. It's all right. It's a still. great target. He has got that butterfly, so they're not really dealing damage him right now. He's going to put the BKB to get on to fly, but he manages to get off the supernova in time. But Yatoro just Exit. takes it down anyway. They've got Nera stunned up in the back lines here, but look at the damage coming out from Team Spirit here at the moment. Yatoro is unstopped. Terrorblade getting low. Needs a Sunder target. Does find it. Takes out Lal, but doesn't kill him off. Stunned up by Collapse once again. Collapse will not leave him alone. And Maposhka comes in with the damage from the Impetus. Gets the kill onto RTZ. It was a very, very close engagement, but in the end, Team Spirit are the victors once again. Just the damage done in the fight as well. Spirit Breaker, 6,500 damage, and sure, okay. Fly goes down as well, but Troran did 5,000 damage in the fight compared to Spirit Breaker's 6,500. Like, who is the carry in this game? Collapse, he's played Bristleback, he's played Spirit Breaker, like, he's making these heroes just completely demolish these mid-game fights and sure use all your resources to kill off your Toro, but it just just isn't enough shopify I, do, I just don't see how they can take a fight at all they're gonna lose top racks most likely mid as well yep and uh by the way a little moon shot of a poshka as well so team Standard. spirit you know we're, we're all carries on this joyous day <laughs> 
This is disgusting. Middle barracks is starting to fall. Bottom barracks being hit by collapse as well. Still working on that tower. Toshka and Lyle dealing with the middle lane. Feeling like Shopify don't have much left in the tank. They can't find a win. I mean, you know the game's rough when your, your opponent offlaner is charging from bot lane to top through your tier fours. To kill off the creep wave. <laughs> Yeah, but we are going to see the damage. replay of the fight here. Like, they do see a tower at the start. It looks like, okay, maybe it's something, but just look at Spirit's positioning already. They're just hugging the northern side of the fight. And for the Shopify fight to even get close to the engagement, they're kind of having to scramble in. The egg's not in a very good position. The Solar Guardian has already been used. And the rest of the Shopify just aren't able to help get in and do any of the damage needed to potentially have a comeback fight. And yeah, Spirit, they are just so incredibly tanky. Like, Collapse is still more than half HP in this fight. Just charge after charge after charge. And you can see on RTG's face, they're just not finding the fights. They are not connecting on the damage. Doesn't know what to do at this fall. point. And I can hardly yeah. blame him. These fights just feel so damn difficult. Like, how do you play as this Terrorblade with this Spirit Breaker on you the entire time? That's really it. Like, you get all this farm, and it just doesn't matter. <laughs> and uh, talking about having all the farm, Spirit Breaker is now net worth, top of net worth, just from taking Where down he all belongs. these lanes. Yeah. He's got the Wind Waker. Oh. So what now, if I do find a hero, he can just charge in. Oh, sorry, Toro, are you dying? Let me just Wind Waker you, you real quick. Like, oh, It's so good to have TI back in, uh, not TI back in the meta, Spirit Breaker back in the meta. As a Spirit Breaker player myself. Yeah, I think you're probably, well, you, you and Team Spirit and Team Spirit fans, probably only ones in that camp at the moment. Oh, P uh, sorry, yeah, LGD, sorry, I keep saying PSG. Uh, LGD, um, they enjoy it too. The, the thing with Spirit Breaker though is like, he's not a first, uh, I mean, he could be a first pick hero. Like he's in that territory. The only issue with him is there are certain lanes that completely demolish him. Like we saw how Nine Pandas picked an Undying Morphling to deal with Spirit Breaker. Um, but I think how Spirit's drafting it, especially with like the Spirit Breaker and the Bristleback, they draft it way later down the line. So there's no room to kind of pivot your draft and to stop him just free farming. Arteezy, he is now charged as well from Black. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Surely he's punished for this one at Nat Wind Waker. See you later. The punch is there, but the BKB Water is out. The Poshka's in the area as well. And Fly, he's gone. No egg able to come down. And Terrorblade stuck in the air. He does get off the Thunder, but what difference is it going to make? He's just being beaten backwards and forwards like a ragdoll through the fight. Oh, my goodness. It is just a beat down now from Team Spirit. No chance of taking any fight for Shopify Rebellion. GG's probably in the chat line right now, not quite entered yep. into the chat, there but there we it. go. There it comes. Game number one goes to Team Spirit. It was looking so good, and you can see it in their faces. You know, everything was going their way until it wasn't. A yeah. little bit of despair currently uh, floating around the Shopify camp, and it does boil down to when you have such an impeccable start to the game, double-digit kills to the zero on Spirit, Every item you buy needs to further punish your opponents. And I kind of feel like Shopify maybe missed a beat on how to close out the map a little bit more. They got that first stage just really nicely. The Desolator on the Dawnbreaker, of course, the tag team, the medallion from the Tusk, but there wasn't that little bit of conviction after the fact. And in doing so, you give Spirit Breaker, who bought a Midas, freedom to full farm. You buy the Battle for your control, also able to free farm. And I think, yeah, if you are Shopify, you need to be more aggressive on the map. You can't spend 25 minutes just farming your own side, enjoying the fact that you're getting kills. You need to play with a bit more conviction and spirit. Just time and time again, even when they are spacked against the wall, they just find that moment. So guys, this is our minute. We win at this time. We're going to crush the game from here. And they are just so ruthless. And yeah, you're seeing it here again, especially in this game. This is probably one of the... The, the nicer games for how Spirit can just come back into any type of game. So, so sick. Team Spirit breaking spirits with the Spirit Breaker in game number one. We're going to throw it back to the panel to break this one down a little bit further. Yet another fantastic showing from Team Spirit there. They do take out game number one. It is a best of three, so there is still hope for Shopify, for the Shopify fans. And Winter, I know you're one of them. And uh, this game one didn't, didn't go exactly how you thought it was, especially not in the first 15, 20 minutes that we were watching. <sighs> I don't think there's much hope remaining. You know, if you lose a game like this, it's very demoralizing. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like if you have such a perfect setup for you as a carry and you can't carry this game as Terrorblade, it's very, very bad, you know, like 
you can't ask for a better start. The four of uh, his teammates uh, made so much space. They had a free lane. He was free farming all the way. And when when they got the A gaze about 15 minutes, the first A gaze they put it on the dawn. Then after that, the terror blade went bot. I, I felt like that was a really huge mistake. Uh, he went bot and he pushed out the wave uh, with his real hero. Like mm -hmm. why would you ever do that with terror blade? You're always gonna push out with the illusions. Why are you taking a risk? And he died there and. It sort of messed up their momentum so much because they couldn't do anything with the first Aegis where you would feel like they started the game 14 or 15 0, no deaths, and then you should be taking the whole map. You take the Roshan, you should be controlling the whole map. But it wasn't feel, feeling like the game, they were extending their lead, you know. Yeah. Everything was stagnating, like the casters mentioned, they were playing on their side. They weren't really aggressive enough. So you think they could have uh, shut down Team Spirit a little bit more if they had have after that Aegis run together as a five and kept pushing on that way? Maybe the, the fight that they had. Uh, that kind of changed a lot around that 20, 25 minute mark wouldn't have happened? Yeah, I, I feel like there are a couple of reasons why. Uh, I think the fight you were talking about when they were smoking towards the top yep. uh, top Roshan area and they went into, a, uh, they jumped with the Tusk without vision because they were kind of like uh, maybe a, a little bit affected by the Terabit's death on the bot lane. And if they made that smoke and Terabit has a BKB, I feel like it would maybe make a lot more sense. But at the same time, it was kind of the touch jumping in without vision that also made them lose the fight, you know. But it, it's a lot of reasons why the fight went wrong. But your carry not having a BKB and then he died when they were leading so much, it makes it very uh, weird for the other players too. They feel like, why are we you know, yep. not taking the map, so they decided to make a smoke. And the following fight as well, again, Artizi went to, he built a uh, Silver Edge instead of BKB, and in the whole fight, he, he got stunned by the Torrent, Torrent Storm, everything, he just got control, and he didn't do anything at all in, in the whole fight. And you have a Dawnbreaker that wants to cast Solar Guardian, so he wants the carry to sit in one spot and right-click hero so that you can jump and support him, you know, but your carry has no BKB there. Then what is the Dawnbreaker going to Everyone's cast? Everyone's just his... on the outside. Yeah, he, every time he casts his ulti, he's like running around because he can't stand on one spot because he's getting stunned, he's getting controlled. Yeah, I mean, look, everyone's uh, prone to mistakes. We were able to have a bit of a chat to Sableight and he was reminiscent of some of the mistakes that he had made in the past. I see like being a competitor, it kind of, you have like very high highs and very low lows. If I could change one match, one that comes to mind is uh, probably Berlin, the first round of playoffs against Nine Pandas. I was playing Tidehunter against Ramses Void, and the reason for it is I just feel like that was like a really easy match, like we're so much better than them actually. And uh, like I was destroying my lane and then I just, I just played so bad the, the rest of the game. That, that was supposed to be a free win, and then we win that one and then, you know, there is no more instant lose after that, so we would probably do well at, well at Berlin. Yeah, I don't know. I just made some like silly mistakes. That's my that's my specialty. So you know, just don't make silly mistakes. Do you think he was uh, making silly mistakes in that game, that God? I don't think he was. I, I think as a team they were making because I know Winter Fox on our teasing. I think he had a pretty dismal performance. I'll kind of uh, yeah. second that. But as a team, I think they just didn't understand how to play from ahead. Maybe mm -hmm. w for whatever reason. I mean, I mentioned how uh, when the Tusk no. went in that top five. No, 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 no. You have last pick, and this is a carry draft. Everything's revolving <laughs> support around you. Player talk. You, you are support everything player is revolving talk. around the carry. And if the carry is not <laughs> doing anything in the game after having like a free farm game. Something is wrong, you know. Mm. Like sometimes I feel like the way he's farming, he's prioritizing his own farming pattern a lot, like efficient farming, and then he doesn't farm near his team. Like some terrible players where you see the way they are farming, they're always farming around their team, so he can use meta to push towers, you know. And you would expect the terabit to take all the towers after the start that he got in the game. Yeah, if you watch some of these other TB players, they are really making even early rotations and not having a BKB. The to be inexcusable. This game, like you mentioned, the Tunker, but the Spirit Break in charge constantly. You cannot play this game without BKB. Um, but I, I think that's that's obviously one big thing they have to look at. But like when it came to like you mentioned, they're, they're running in with Tusk with no no vision. Like why don't they have map control? They yeah. have this huge lead. They're up like 13 kills to zero, 5k gold lead. Mm -hmm. They're in control. Trolls just got like Battle Fury only. He, there's, this troll can't do anything except keep farm. That's like what but they were really out. good to stick on top of Utoro yeah. and yeah. shut him down. Like he really had to come back into this. Like something that Utoro has done many times. But you're 
you're right. This this troll should have been a non-factor. Yeah. So at this point, like, why why can't Shopify play the map the way other teams do, where you get yeah. that complete map vision control, you hunt down these heroes. Obviously, Artiz needs to be a part of that. Needs to go BKB, but it's not just on him. Like as a team, they failed this game. This this like kind of funny. We saw Sable like, talk about these some of the, some of these games that should be like the free wins. This felt like a game that should have been a free win with the start yeah. they had, and they threw away. We, we're not even talking about how well Spirit played. They played amazing to come back, but. The talk is on Shopify because they really did. They this let game. them ca yeah. come back into the game. Yeah. Yeah. Like if they played, uh, they tightened the nose, they played the map properly. They, uh, I feel like it's going to be so hard for Spirit to uh, get to the stage where the Spirit Breaker could have done so much in the team fights. You know, like it's just it's just difficult. You know, in a game like this, you're losing a game like this, and when you have almost close to perfect, I would say maybe perfect start, how are you going to play the next game? You know, like yeah. it, it's so difficult mentally. Yeah, try and aim for it, but there could have been a little bit of a flashback for you, Toro, because we had a similar chat with him, asking him about something that he might still be pretty reminiscent of. Ну, я думаю, когда я пришел в команду в 2020 году, я был слишком юн, я поддавался эмоциям во время игр, во время тренировок. Я был очень вспыльчивый. Со временем это у меня ушло, я как-то это перерос. Я больше начал понимать, что в принципе такое командная игра, командная коммуникация, как нужно коммуницировать, как не нужно. Я был ну, таким средним аварейш игроком, без опыта. Но спустя года, я думаю, я стал очень хорошим игроком, как именно тиммейт. Мне один момент запомнился. Это была третья карта Лима Мейджера, когда я играл на линии против. Мы играли против Shopify Rebellion, где я играл на линии и я не нажал там БКБ, я помню. И мы из-за этого проиграли в принципе карту. А это была третья карта за топ-6. Я думаю, если бы мы ее выиграли, мы бы скорее всего прошли дальше или выиграли турнир. У меня до сих пор возникают флешбеки с этого момента, когда в меня катится Тускар, я не нажимаю, и мы проигрываем. Я тогда был в тильте после этого момента. We could have been seeing uh, almost the same reaction from you, Toro, but he was on point. He made sure he had that BKB. He was making sure he was popping at all the right times. <laughs> he bought one. <laughs> That's the key point. Even in that loss, he still knew to buy one. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was something he was really aware of uh, when they pulled out the Tusk again, picking Shopify, seeing it all run back from himself. He's like, I need to redeem myself. That's the real reason he picked Shopify, I reckon. He's like, I need to redeem myself from Lima. Yeah, and they've had some <laughs> redemption series at least since then. If anything, I feel like Spirit's kind of had Shopify's number. Um, yeah. You know, really, yeah, throughout the year since Lima Major, so. Yeah, because they uh, faced up in the finals for Dream League Season 21 leading into this one, and they had a very nice win for themselves there. But Game 2, it's uh, able to bounce back for Shopify. We talked about all of their issues there, but I actually want to highlight more on Team Spirit, right? They were able to capitalize. So you, you lose one fight as, as Shopify, but a team to be able to capitalize as much as they did on that. Team Spirit looking amazing. So again, what are you guys taking from this in light of Shopify, how they're able, sorry, Team Spirit, and how they're able to utilize the map. Yeah. In some ways, it feels like a game that Spirit can actually learn a lot from because they had such a bad start yep. and against a stronger team, they would have lost. So I think they need to maybe look at um, the way they drafted, set up the Trolls lane. I think particularly they picked this Troll yep. after seeing Dawnbreaker and that lane didn't go particularly well. Mm -hmm. um, the TB wasn't really being contested either. So, you know, I think there's a lot that Spirit need to look at when it comes to how the early game and the lanes are set up. Yeah, you would expect a troll plus what Enchantress to beat a double melee, Tuss and mm -hmm. Dawnbreaker. But somehow, I mean, the Dawn kind of still farmed less than the, the troll, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't good enough for them to, to say, oh, we picked this troll at 18 and he won his lane. Enough to the point where he, he makes a one call from the enemy team kind of useless. But that didn't happen, you know. So they have to go back to the drawing board and maybe the Spirit Breaker as well. Because he, he didn't really pressure his lane mm -hmm. a lot, but because he's an SB, right, you don't see the carry's lane. So I feel like whenever, in this kind of scenario, I would say that you might want to prioritize picking an offlaner uh, with a stronger laning phase. So you don't give the enemy carry such a free time. Okay, and when it comes to Shopify, you were very um, hands-on winter on how you wanted to pick. We saw RTZ getting that priority again. Do you think that they're going to run it back? That's something they need to do. Or do you still double down on let's pick him early, uh, let's change it up? I think they have a, a good plan there with opening up with our bets here. In the past, they've also done it you know, with his Storm opening pick. Uh, I, I feel very like the Earth, <laughs> the Earth Spirit was kind of like a similar idea, and they kind of managed to build a draft with... Uh, with uh, 
when it comes to the 24 pick, it allows RTZ a lot of options. I think that's a, a very, very good thing when you have an overall last pick. Because sometimes you see drafts progress, the first four picks uh, kind of feel like a bit uh, meh when you go to the 24 and you're trying to figure out the overall last pick, but you don't have options, you know. But they had a lot of options there, so I felt like they did a really good job in the first four picks. And it's about the mental part, you know. How, how are you going to overcome this barrier when you had a perfect start and you still couldn't win the game? Yeah, I feel like Bulba did his job perfectly as a drafter. Now he's going to do his job as like a motivator, a as a yeah, coach, mental coach, because um, you could see it after the game. Like when it showed all the player cameras, everyone was just kind of looking at their screen, not looking at each other, not communicating. Um, yep. that they, they looked like a team that was just shocked from that loss. Mm. I mean, obviously, they come in maybe knowing they're the underdogs and that spirit's going to be tough. But when you have that kind of a start and you lose, um, you just see it on the faces where they, you know, they're, they're not necessarily look like they're in full despair mode, but they're, they're not communicating and looking at each other the way you'd expect a team to be looking at each Bulba other. Bulba has a lot to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, look, it, it's going to be an uphill battle for them, but all the teams are back there. The players are sitting down. They're ready. We do have our second game in this best of three. Let's see if Team Spirit can close it out. If Shopify can come back, all I know, though, is that we have TGov and Nomad ready. Thank you very much, panel. Yes, indeed, it is time for game number two. Can Shopify Rebellion come back against that one, T? I'm not sure, because we saw a very similar opening to them in the Dream League Season 21 Grand Finals, which is, of course, a best of five against Team Spirit. And almost the same thing happened. Shopify Rebellion were ahead pretty much the entire game. And, uh, well... Team Spirit, they found a way back into it, and every single game after that was a complete stomp. So I am worried. Shopify, they really need to find Team some TI Spirit magic here. Shopify, yeah, and uh, I think Winter shared the same sentiment with me a little bit. There is a lot of points for Shopify to look back in that first game, right? So this time in between game one and game two, it's going to be a little bit of readjustment, understanding quickly what went wrong, because the start of their game, it was exceptional. It just, they lacked, remaining. clearly they lacked a voice entering that mid game. Maybe it was just Five too much of the remaining. go kill. No, like, this is how we win the game. Just, ah, oh, this is good. We're doing great, guys. We're at the road to international. We're, we're 15 and 0 up, right? But this time around, it should be a little bit different. And already, I would like to think that it, this is occurring because once you pick up an AA, you need the rest of your team to want to find the kills, to want to find the ways to close out the map because AA loves throwing out ice blasts and killing off heroes. And sure. Okay. Spirit, of course, get that inch once it once again. Such a such a great area for this team. It really is. It really is. Yeah, a little surprised they let it through, but then again, what do you substitute? You know, give them the brew, give them the tree, and that doesn't really seem like a good option, so they will let it through. Please, please ban the spirit breaker. I don't want to see it again, T. I think we are gonna be entering a phase where teams will need to Team either pick to, to counter a Bristleback and then ban Spirit Breaker, or pick a really strong lane and then ban the Bristle, ba uh, Bristle, Bristle Breaker. Jesus. Bristle Back. There we go. <laughs> yes, ban Bristle Breaker. Get two yeah, ban the Bristle Breaker. Go. Do it. Perfect. But no, I think already with the AA first pick, Ten they're looking at, okay, remaining. Bristleback's answered. So now we can, if we want to ban Spirit Breaker, Five that is an option. But additionally, Shopify, they have to first pick exiting this phase. If they have Ancient Apparition and Spirit Breaker in their lineup, that in itself is a very good combination because you have Vortexes to throw additional damage into the mix for that Magic Amp on the Bash. You then have easy Ice Blast setups. So this could just be Shopify's way of going, we've Shopify got rid of the Bristleback and we've stole the Spirit Breaker because of uh, our draft opening. Maybe it's a route they're going down, but these are the two key heroes, at least in the last couple games that we've got to cast a Spirit that have allowed them to demolish games. Collapse is just yeah. on another level right now in his uh, performance. Ten yeah, seconds. always finds a way into the game. But uh, that is the thing to mention about the hero. You know, we saw it just absolutely Five owning in the late seconds. game, but it doesn't really do much for the first kind of 20 minutes of the game. You know, gets the Midas, just kind of farms a bit. I mean, sure, he killed off RTZ with the help of the uh, Skyrath Mage, but if you don't make a play like that happen, then the hero can be very impotent for the first kind of 20 minutes of the game until you start yeah. getting those Octarines, those Ags, those Shards. So. Um, that is some, that's kind of like the flip side, which we didn't really see exploited too much in the last game. Like, sure, Shopify Rebellion were moving around the map, getting some objectives, pushing their objectives and getting a lot of kills, but um, they, they never really threatened for the jugular of Team Spirits. They never, you never really had to see the Spirit Breaker come into play too much early on, and that mm -hmm. was a difference maker.
So we'll see if, uh, if Shopify Rebellion do pick it up. We'll see maybe Team Spirit go for a very aggressive draft, which can take advantage of that fact. Yeah. It's also one of those things where, like, Spirit Broker has, like, a 54% win rate right now at the Road to the International. So it's not as if this hero is, like, winning every single game. There's a lot of, like, information about how the hero loses. You kind of touched on it there with that first 20 minutes, and I would like to see teams not be so afraid of the hero, and they ban out the Invoker. The question is, it's now got through the phase. Will Shopify go for it for themselves? Does Spirit care? They already have the Enchantress for a little bit of Dispel in the laning phase. Spirit Breaker normally doesn't go for Bulldoze in the early levels anyways, so that's not really a counter that you need to think about, but throughout the game it could be something. Can, okay, ignored for now. Shopify, go for the Earth Spirit. Um, everything that I've said about Spirit Breaker and AA, identical for an Earth Spirit, right? You have the same logic of you have magic damage built into your hero, you have initiation, you have that ability to control and facilitate where the fight is taking place, remaining. and then AA gets to free cast his spells behind. Yeah, Five and you know, Albert absolutely did his job last game for the most part, at least in the, uh, the early stages of the game. You know, he rolled around, he made plays happen, he linked up with crit, and found the pressure. It was just in the late mm -hmm. game where he didn't really have much impact, but the whole thing fell apart for Shopify. One bad fight and all of a sudden they couldn't play the game anymore. So yeah, part of me is 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 worried. They got two picks here. Um, but you know, I do respect that Shopify is sticking to their ideas. No team has ever won TI by abandoning their ideas and entirely adjusting to the meta in front of them. You have to about Shopify right now, no mad. <laughs> 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 they stick to it no matter what, through thick and thin. True, true, absolutely. We all remember. I'm not even going to mention the hero because I'm sure it's uh, it's it's flying through pages of it in Twitch chat right now. But yes. yeah. we all remember. Yeah, Team Spirit. This is where they always always stall out the draft a bit. They always use their reserve time here. This is when I'm pretty sure they just plan out the rest of their uh, their, their their picks throughout. Yeah, because like normally right now for them, they in this phase it's going to be the Spirit Breakers, the Bristlebacks for them. They've already got the Edge picked in their draft. And supporting wise, it's the Scarf Mage or the Grimstroke is kind of the natural look of their lineups. So if they do want to go down that route, they could potentially still go for a Sky or a Grim plus any of these big offlaners. Um, the question is, you already see the Earth Rate mid, so you could just go for that. And yeah, they just go for Spirit Breaker. I would like to see Sky or Grimstroke with this pairing because it just gives your lane better purpose. Dark Willow as well, a perfectly fine option if Mira wants to play it. Um, whenever you pick Spirit Breaker, the key thing for this hero is make sure that your lane, you have a little bit of punch in it. Like if that support steps up the lane, charge into spells, get the kills. And all right, fair enough. I didn't expect them to double pick the, the cause, maybe. I'm gonna say maybe, but like a one percent maybe. Maybe Spirit Breaker is a four position here. Maybe, but Collapse okay. ninety nine percent probably okay. playing it. But that's where the puck could come into the mix here, where it's like, okay, let's not show our hand too early. Let's keep the Spirit Breaker a little bit ambiguous if we have to, and that's why we'll go for the puck because we will see our mid match up. Yeah, I feel like Sky I, yeah. and Grim still so powerful for for Spirit if they were to be able to get it into their lineups. Yeah, definitely. And perhaps one of those for Shopify, they've still got a support hero to uh, pick up here. I mean, it, again, the 1% the, the applies to Earth Spirit as well. Shopify Maybe Crit Earth Spirit could come out, but more or less it's, it's just going to be a mid laner and uh, there's going to be a centaur for the position three. And might just pick up their full off lane here and uh, once again save that last pick for RTZ. They don't have that perfect hard lockdown, right? Centaur, a very slow hero to blink hoof stomp. Same thing with Earth Spirit, you have a roll, and then you can't rely on the, the cold feet as well. So is Crit going to step Willow. up into the game and pick up that extra bit of stun? Because Puck right now is kind of a free game for Puck. Same thing for Spirit Breaker. When it, once he gets Bulldoze, there's not a lot of continuous control. It's very much like they kill one hero. Maybe Crit can uh, fill that void a little bit with his pick. What do you feel about the Crit Willow? One of the best Willow players for sure uh, across yeah. the world. I think Willow or Grim also fits pretty well for them. Uh, the only issue with that is Willow is exceptional against Spirit Breaker because he can't freely charge through the fights. He's always going to accidentally yeah. hit a root, and that does pretty well. But when I was mentioning okay. instant lockdown, they don't go for lockdown. They just go for the silence aspect. And the heroes that we were talking about, all of them would have... Like, I think Willow is probably the best out of the options, but they go for the uh, Scarif Mage just for that burst potential. You know, if you see a hero right now, 
Vortex, Ancient Seal, Stomp, Double Edge. That hero is going to die no matter who you are yeah. on the map, right? <laughs> For a nice blast on yeah. top. And of course, Puck doesn't like playing into Ancient Seal. And uh, yeah, and sure, as expected, there's the Grimstroke for Team Spirit that we were mentioning earlier in the draft. Ooh. Yeah, well, you thought a Spirit Breaker was scary last game. How about a Spirit Breaker with an Ink Swell upon him as well? That is going to be quite the thing to play into. I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm worried, T. I'm worried, T. That there's no answer for the Spirit Breaker again. If he gets to that point in the late game where Five he's got all his items, remaining. he's got all his net worth, then Collapse is just going to absolutely roll them again. I'm, I'm shaken. I, right now, I want to see a Life Stealer for, for Team Spirit. Um, I think people might go, well, he can't regen. But no, he just infests during the Ice Blast. He can also buy Agnums to further hide um, offensively in that regard. Um... You don't really care about the initiations because you can always hit Rage. And then you can jump into Puck or Spirit Breaker and get the old school uh, infest bombs going into it as well. Mm. They're already banning out Void. So I think, yeah, Life Stealer for me is one that instantly comes to mind for Team Spirit. Um, Shopify will have ultimate last pick in the draft though. So Arteezy will get to see absolutely everything to then lock in his carry. So a lot of pressure on him to execute in this game. Yeah, Spectre, pretty cool ban. We, uh, we saw a little bit in the group stage. Um, very low cooldown now on his ultimate. 60 seconds level 1, scaling down to 40 seconds at level 3. Uh, loves to play in a pickoff game, and yeah, of course, crazy. Team Spirit is pickoff central right now with their draft. Remaining. Yeah, so we'll expect something similar uh, along Five those lines. Remaining. A killing hero. I, I, I don't want to see a TB Midas again, and thankfully it's banned out, so we won't, but <laughs> they I'd like to see something active, <laughs> something they can pressure with. You know, utilize this Spirit Breaker's weak period, and... Yeah. Uh, Maybe get some more objectives on the board and Team put a bit of a chokehold on Team Spirit because you need oh, to find a way to lock them in the base. Like these guys okay. don't like staying in their base. Is Spirit going to steal the PA away from Shopify? It is available, and Shopify their entire draft is about finding the hero to burst them down. If you then have a PA who's inside Blur with the chaos of a Spirit Breaker puck really in front of you, they might never be able to fully kill off that hero. And five seconds. Yeah, I think remaining. stealing PA could be a pretty good option here. Just trying to think if there's any major counters in play for Shopify to then go back with, but... Okay, they go Wraith King. I guess it kind of... I leaned on the point of... Yeah, I leaned on the point of if you can't find the hero, you can't kill them. Imagine the point of, okay, you find the hero, but you can't kill him twice. And What will Arteezy go for? Like, I think PA is like an ob not an obvious choice, but like it's just a casual Arteezy hero, right? Do I think it's yeah. the best hero for the game? Not really, so, okay. Chaos Knight. All right. Well, it's active. It gets stuff done. Yeah. It gets onto the map. I think this will... I mean, it, it completes the draft. I'm, I, again, after last game, I'm so worried that they won't be able to, uh, to put the pressure on, but this is everything they need, right? It's good for their own draft, not great for their opponent. I think for their own team, they need constant fight, that like constant go. So now Earth Spirit, when he looks to a side lane, he should get a kill no matter what. It's a Centaur Sky lane or a CKAA. Like there it is. You should expect Shopify to find double digit kills again very quickly in the start of this game. But on the flip side for Spirit, the longer this game goes, just the easier it will get for them. Wraith King will be able to survive that burst. Ice Blast, he doesn't really care about. He has a second life. If CK uses Phantasm and his illusions die off over that burst, Again, you're never killing off the Wraith King twice. So I think for Spirit, we're going to be looking at an identical game one where they will play out their lanes, sit back for a second, evaluate if they can be aggressive. If they can't, they will then delay until all the items kick in and the damage and the pickoff potential from Shopify will start slowly falling off as the game progresses. But for Shopify, so they execute really well in game one, right? So they just need to copy that. Yeah. I say game one, first 10 minutes. Let me just clarify. Yeah, sorry. I mean, that's what I'm saying, right? Like, they didn't just have a good first 10 minutes of the game. They had a fantastic first 10 minutes of the game last game. They were killing off every single lane. Like, they, they basically came out of the laning phase, like, I think 2k gold ahead, which is all right, and a bunch of kills. And yeah, like, do you think they can repeat that again with this draft? I mean, surely you can't rely on that. It, I mean, it feels like they're kind of looking to rely on that in some regard because of how they've drafted, right? They've... Yeah. They've looked at the, the positives from the previous game and gone, how can we take these few positives that we did find from that game one, how can we use that to our advantage in this second game? And they have drafted pretty much on the beat of that logic. And 
it's on them to execute now, I think. Of course, it does help this time around that uh, Arteezy's playing an illusion hero that uses his illusions across the map rather than to his own jungle. He naturally needs to be part of the team in the fight. Um, but I just cannot emphasize how important it is. If you are a Shopify fan, you're looking at them executing cleanly and closing out the map methodically through constant pickoffs and smokes. All right, let's see if they can put it together here in game number two. It is, of course, Shopify Rebellion versus Team Spirit. The winner of this series will be going through to the upper bracket of TI. The loser will be stuck down in the lower bracket. And neither of these teams have much success when they do start a tournament in the lower bracket. It's important to mention that. Yeah, not only that, you get to the upper bracket, you're ever so close to getting to that, you know, that position to play in the Climate Pledge on the final uh, weekend of TI, right? That, that's the arena that you want to be in. That's the arena with the nostalgia, the fans and everything. And yeah, getting into upper bracket just makes you one step closer to, to being able to play in such a, you know, prestigious uh, arena. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, mate. I was like, well, how do I want to okay. close that one out? Yeah, it's all good. I'll let you finish it. <laughs> I like how you finish my sentences. It's all good. We finish each other's, yeah. But yeah, both of these guys, I mean, you know, you look back at the Berlin Major, you look back at the Bali Major, both of them went through the group stages in the lower bracket, both of them knocked out in the first round of it, so... Kind of crazy oh, is. Napoleon just takes a face full of damage here, trying to heal up with the nature's attendance. It's not going to be enough, though. First blood goes to Arteezy. Some nice Midas money right there. Yeah, so he's already put in his quick buy. No, he's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So middle lane, it will be the Arbeda Spirit versus the Lal Puck. I don't know how many times we're going to cast a uh, Spirit mid-games. It feels like a lot, but yeah, this hero, you know, kind of doesn't do amazingly. It just kind of trades in lane, uses the, uh, the Boulder Smash to secure CS, and then runs around the map and bonks people. Yeah, the key thing is uh, the run around the map, right? This time, as we meant, sorry, as I mentioned during the draft, it's so easy for him to be able to go to a side lane and net kills. You've got Centaur Stomp, Double Edge, Mystic Flare on the off lane. In the other side, you've got Chaos Bolts into Cold Feats and Vortex. Like This is should be such an active laning phase for Shopify if they can get the levels. Level 2 advantage is going to be critical as well. I think Spirit need to respect that. The Spirit Breaker and Wraith King, these side lane calls don't really pressure too much. Uh, again, uh, as you mentioned, with, uh, it should be a pretty good laning phase, although not if Arteezy gets bashed this much. I mean, it's been like five hits and two bashes. He's getting low, Collapse will die. Arteezy survives. No, he will not. Mira finds him with the Stroke of Fate. Now Fly, he's trying to finish the job onto Mira here, but Mira has turned around upon him with the Inkswell. Fly fighting up right now. What do they have in terms of regen? The answer is Mira has more. And he will be able to take him down and get the double kill on the Grim Stroke. Really nice set of kills there, and it all started because Clamps are to get a couple clutch bashes, and oh, Arteezy getting a freebie. All right, all right, comes back in, gets a kill. That feels pretty damn good, honestly. Yeah, that's nice. Just drop a couple more items, allow his AA to bring them back in. Resources should be pretty healthy for uh, Shopify, but again, Spirit. The pros are packing a little bit more of a punch in the lane that, than expected. Collapse. He's going to have to charge away from this one, just enough to uh, break the cold feet and then uh, come straight back to lane. Again, look at the harassment coming out from these two in the bottom side. They just want to use all their abilities, all their spells. They are getting a bit of revenge for game number one, I feel, on Collapse, just taking out their frustrations on him. Yeah, I mean, Spirit also being very vocal with their voice lines, right? They're spamming this, like, goodbye clowns line. They're, you know, they're doing a lot of just... Like a psychological warfare that you often see from the teams that really are you know, finding their groove at the uh, in, in some of these tournaments. But yeah, for Shopify, I'm surprised they actually didn't bring a couple mangoes back down to this bot lane. With how uh, spammy they are being, it could have helped out. And Sableight has eight sticks, so should be fine. Uh, a lot of toothpicks coming his way, but thank you, boy. You can take it. A lot of trading going on right now. So far, big one is the laning phase, honestly. Are they? He's kind of just owning the middle lane on CS. Lal. It's, it's pretty impressive. And uh, he's going to try and race Lal over for the bounty rune here. Sees that Lal's actually on him as well, so gives up on the idea. 
Yeah, pretty nice move there from Arbed, right? And if he can push this wave in a little bit, and then go stand back on that high ground, potentially Puck might miss a CS, but okay. Doesn't opt to uh, use the boulder smash there, so yeah, lol. Not missing out on any of that XP or creeps. Yeah, very good start, start for Arbed. Yeah, he's doing great. All in all, no one's really suffering except for the cow in the bottom side, who we've seen every time we click on him, he's just being blasted with spells. Top side stun comes out onto Sableite, but immediately just returns with the hoof stomp. They realize that Crit just isn't here at the moment, and Sableite might be Ooh. suffering for it. He's got the Ring of Health and two Rings of Protection. Will it be enough to keep him alive? No, it will not. This was Crit. a disaster of a four-minute room, by the way, because not only does Sableite die top, but Crit comes to the secure top room, Arbid then rolls for the bottom rune, but as he rolls, Lal, he face shifts, dodges it, so then Arbid just goes super far past the water rune, and Lal takes it for himself. Oh no, bottom side Mira should be dying here to the combination of Fly and Arteezy. That's something, but yeah, I mean, your support rotates for the water rune and doesn't even help Arbid secure it. That is pretty brutal, especially when your offlaner dies for it. Yeah. Natara going to be thoroughly enjoying the start of this one. I think this game, the build for Wraith King, oh, collapse is going to be charging up here. No mana for the Chaos Bolt just yet. Very close to it, though. Were you watching? Collapse is continuing to be hammered every time he comes near the creep wave, so he really is going to have a slow start. Like, he's not even got the Midas queued up at the moment. He realize, he's realizing just how grim things are. Boshka, he's oh, rotating in. Yeah, certainly is. Stun out onto Arteezy. Charge comes in. Voshka from behind. The damage is there to take down Collapse before Arteezy does fall. Fly, can he get Fly himself up. back to the tower? Yeah, but Voshka saying, no, sir, you will not. The right clicks are there. Mira gets the double. Sure, they take down Collapse once again, but two deaths in the bottom lane does not make it worth. But over towards mid, this might, Marl. He could be in some trouble, but there is no roll available, and Lull has the phase shift and all back. Not enough damage coming out from Crit or Abed. It's a really nice rotation there from the Enchantress. You know that the CK and AA are stepping up so far down the lane to apply that pressure, and yeah, Mikoska rotates in, gets the double. Grimstroke, with his two double kills, already has the mana boots as well. The spam from this lane will just slowly increase up. Oh, but rolls into Mira. Mira already has the Inksoil going, pops it early to try and get himself away, going for the TP out here. They don't have the damage to bring him down here, and the Grimstroke narrowly escapes with his life. Team Spirit kind of stopped playing him at the charge. moment. Yep, see you later. Heads back towards the middle lane, we'll be fine. And this is one of the uh, top tower better ways to shut down the Spirit Breaker, right? Like, even though you're trading alive a couple of times, he's only just hit level four. Like, compare that to Saberlight, he's quite healthily on the way to level six and net worth. He's about to get overtaken by the Enchantress, right? So this Spirit Breaker doesn't really have a place on the map right now, compared to last game where he was just fully free farming up, getting the Midas, existing in bot lane, doing everything he needed to do. Top lane, Rome. In on to your Yatorim. He's going to be going for the first time here. Does hit level six just in time before they're able to catch him. And now he's TPing out. Do they, they don't stuns? have it. They don't have the roll. There's nothing. Oh my god. Who's and not like a cooldown yet. Yeah. Just TPing out. I mean, sure, I have to walk back to lane, but I mean, Yatorim doesn't care about that. He stays alive, and that's the big deal. The fact that he also had ultimate, right? Some of these Wraithing players, they're incredibly greedy with how they uh, level up their hero, but yeah, he keeps that point, has the ultimate in play, and Elspeth also doesn't have four points in Rolling Boulder yet to always have that TP cancel in play with the four second cooldown. I'm not sure so when. Uh, Tori literally hit level six during that gank as well. Like, they were going on him at level five. Mm -hmm. So, very fortunate that he was able to uh, get that up in time as a movement. Once again, on to Collapse. Collapse moving aggressively with the Inkswell, though. Forward onto Fly. I don't think he's going to be surviving this one, though. Moving to the tree That's line. Cool. It's not enough. Although, in comes a Puck. Breaks the coil on Fly. Fly just trying to get away. Crit will get beaten down by the supports. Fly duking through the tree lines, but it's not enough. Lull gets upon him regardless. Now, Maposhka and Mira helping out their Puck. Making sure he's okay. So, it's just kind of the off lane of the two supports down here in the bottom lane. Arteezy absolutely fine for now. Collapse is potentially about to be bottom net worth of all the spirit players, by the way. <laughs> it's like a hundred gold difference. Well, officially we can confirm that Shopify have shut down the spirit breaker. 
That is at least one checkbox ticked on the road to getting a game three. Yeah, they they eaten steak tonight, that's for sure. So Rick is very with muscly, double damage. It's not gonna be the nicest of steaks. It's quite You'd have to do like a quite a slow cooked dish for them. Dyer's middle tower has fallen. Yeah, yeah. But middle lane, are they just use the double damage rune to just take the tier one tower at mid whilst the puck is rotating? They're trying to get a bit of a revenge for that now, though. This team spirit, the three man squad comes rotating in. Arbed, has he read it? He could roll away if he moves now. He does stand a chance of getting out of this one. In fact, he just walks in the opposite direction. That's an effective strategy. Yeah, fogged uh, drew on the. Well, say fogged. <laughs> Fly through. <sorry. laughs> sorry, fogged lives right through my head. Nice roll. Nice roll. Doesn't make a difference. The sun's a little bit late there from Crit, meaning that the coil was able to come off. Magnetize coming down with the supports are in. They've got the damage to bring down our bed. Crit also taking some heavy Soulbind. hits here. Mira just throws down the Soulbind, holding him next to Sableye. But Sableye wants to kill Lal. He wants to get the damage off, but Crit running the other direction means he can't get the right click off. Crit's gonna die. Goes down as well. Yatoro coming across as well. Sableye going for the TP out. Yatoro from the low That's ground done. gets the Wraith by a blast. Beautiful movements from him as the Inkswell onto the Hellbear. Smasher brings down Saberlight as well. The slaughter across the map as Team Spirit take down three. Just, yeah, really nice moves there from uh, from Spirit. What I was trying to say was Fly had on the minimap, he's like, guys, they're smoked, they're rotating to the mid, and that's why, you know, Shopify, they're moving towards the top side of the map, but for Spirit, they just continued making that move. They never let it off, and in doing so, yeah, just, just get punished. All five heroes from Spirit ready to take that engagement. Compared to the, the few that Shopify did bring. Now Mira. Mira. Hey, we'll get out How many times are people just gonna TP out against these two? We need to be careful, Shopify. Like they're the ones who should be getting all the kills right now. They're just not really connecting that perfectly on some of their moves. They do need to get some levels as well. Like Fly, he's got level six, crit. No, basically a whole level away. Once that comes in with the Mystic Flare, it will simplify a lot of these engagements. But until then, they are victim to Spirit. Just moving a little bit better on the map right now. Yeah, you don't really need net worth on your Spirit Breaker when he's just kind of providing vision with the Charge of Darkness and kind of getting into the fights using his ulti. Like, sure. He's not having the most impact. He's not having the same amount of impact as other offlaners might be at this point, but He's there, and he's going to have his miners very soon as well, so we're going to start to get that XP coming on in. Yeah, Spirit Breaker's game is soon going to return. I'd say he's, he's got about nine more minutes of Spirit Breaker not being the, the busted hero that we've seen, and the miners will need to kick in. This will be the perfect example, though. Does he still go for the Octarine, knowing that his game is difficult? Or will he just mm. rush towards the sh uh, the Shadow Blade or the BKB or something else instead? And depends on the on the vision of the game for the whole team, really. What yeah. they want him to be providing and when. Seems for it have been throwing greed as a recent. Meanwhile, fly caught out in the river, an ancient apparition, unfortunately. Radiance top tower is under attack. Oh, oh, it the charge. No. Does get away? Oh, a little close on the coil there. Coil, if the uh, sorry, if the orb did connect, Radiance he might have just been jumping in and coiling attack. him to get the kill, but. Right, somehow survives that, and oh, jump in from Arbed. Arbed gets on top of the puck, but once again, puck might just survive through it. No, the silence is there. Surely they bring him down this time around. Surely they can get the kill, and Frostite comes up, and they do get the kill. Collapse moves in onto Fly, throws down the ultimate. He just wants to bring him down. Does he survive though? Crit. They're all chasing him at the moment. Silence is there. Stuns are out. Damage is in, and Collapse is down. Two cores dead on the side of Team Spirit. Shopify, do they finally get a chance to take a breath here? Yeah. Nice couple of kills for them. And also, Shopify, these are the kills that they need to help accelerate their early game timings. Earthsprit about to complete that blade mail. You've got uh, CK completing the Echo Saber. And Central about a thousand gold away from his uh, Blink. Like, once these three items come in for Shopify, you expect them to be made crossing that river and making the bigger plays. And for Spirit, of course, continuing to poke. They go from mid straight back into bot lane, using that twin gate. Yeah. Sableite should just be going down for free now. Sableite trying to get away. Not going to happen. Too much damage coming out from Yutoro in the first current while. Four points already on the Enchantress with that impetus. Level eight. Do it the Jesus, the cool thing about drafting Enchantress is just making sure that you have a couple heroes to frontline for you. 
because you know that you'll always be able to scale. Right, like time and time again, Maposhka, he's not changing his build. You're not seeing him go for some like holy locket, glimmer cape style enchantress. He's consistently going for Treads Drum, Dragon Lance, Hurricane Pike into Moonshard. Because the way that they draft it, you've got Spirit Breaker, Rave King, even Puck to some degree, a lot of heroes to facilitate yeah. the fight and give Ench that scaling uh, potential. And like, sure, you can make the argument that Shopify can just destroy an enchantress if they want to, but. Using resources to kill this enchantress is never going to feel good, especially when there's a puck in the game who just thrives. But okay, there's no longer a puck in the game. <laughs> that, was, that was consistent. Oh, no, Spirit. On to mid lane. Yeah. He's locking, but he's not cooking just yet. Mira trying to sidestep it, but unfortunately moves into Arteezy. And Arteezy starting to make moves on the Mac with this Echo Saber, with this armlet. They want to start taking some names and maybe some towers this game as well. What they failed to do last game was get objectives. Yeah, I feel like if you, if Shopify was able just to see the big picture of the game right now, like if they click on Wraith King and see Midas with a Radiance queued up and a Spirit Breaker with a Midas into Octarine queued up, like this is like the most alarming moment. Guys, we need to fight. We need to punish this. Like the last game, they got an Aegis and then they just sat back, continued farming. But you cannot allow Spirit to itemize like this and then to farm for 20 minutes. And already, Abed, he's hearing these calls. He's constantly trying to make something happen. Oh, Ooh. missed. The pressure is There's being that applied. change to rolling boulder. He's got an arcane rune as well. Abed, there's no coil. He's got an arcane. Surely he wants to fight here. Team, not quite behind him at the moment. Artizi moving around to the bottom side of the map. Of course, still looking to keep these lanes pushed out and get farm where he can. A little bit over aggressive, but. I know, are we looking for another early rush here from Shop 5 to get a couple more kills and secure this top side of the map? That's potentially the biggest downside for Shopify right now is... Let's just watch them execute Bambi real quick. They can't execute Roshan that quick, right? It's, they're going to have a solo crest on AA, which will help cushion their lack of Roshan damage, but they will need to probably get a couple team wipes before they really look to entertain it, because of the time spent doing it will give Spirit so much freedom on the map. Centaur? You jumped by Lava there a little bit. Wow. It's kind of clicking the dude. It's like, all right, buddy. But meanwhile, elsewhere, they're going for the kills. They managed to find Mira. Mira tries to get the full stuff away. Not going to make a difference, though. Still gets bought down. And now, well, Collapse going to charge in onto Flight. That will be at least one return kill going the way. Collapse trying to TP up at Arbet. He's got a billion rolling boulders in his pocket with his arcane rune. No chance of getting out of this one. Arteezy comes in to help out as well. Collapse does fall. Shopify responding well to what Team Spirit are trying to do here. Yeah, you can have some pretty important kills. Spirit, that I'm... It's fun to see them, even when they're in like kind of a farm state, still look to entertain that potential pickoff. But yeah, for Shopify right now, just sweeping around. I think, of course, Arbid is leading the charge on pretty much every engagement right now. Part soon to be complete as well. This is going to be one incredibly tanky Earth Spirit. The blink is complete on Centaur. Do they have smokes available on Shopify? Yeah, they got, okay, they got one on Crypt. This will be the important, I think, window for Shopify. How do they utilize this smoke? Do they get taken off Raking two times? Stop him from freely farming up to his Radiance? Like, what is their, kind of, their big plan to enter the mid-game? Shopify, they're looking for something here. Arteezy TP bottom, but he's not interested in the Crete Wave just yet. Looking to see if anybody comes down to deal with his bottom wave. Maybe he does, so we'll look to farm it and probably take this tier one tower, which is already pretty darn low. Wondering what the fight conditions look like for Team Spirit. They've got themselves this Midas on this Wraith King. He's going for the Radiance. Maybe Radiance Blink is what we look for uh, an engagement from your tour. I think just having level two ultimate, which he's already got, plus Radiance is enough for him to entertain joining, uh, joining a fight. So they're pretty close to being able to actually want to engage onto Shopify. But the lack of building damage, lack of Roshan right now for Shopify is going to constantly cause them some concern. Collapse. And they're trying to get collapsed, but he got the charge oh, and he's quicker than the bolt. It's quicker than the bolt, but it doesn't oh. matter. Arbed's got the reach, he's got the catch, and they're still able to bring him down. Unfortunately, only charging across the nearby creep wave was not enough to save his life. Yeah. Unfortunately, didn't charge to mid or top. There, there were some creeps in vision if he wanted to, yeah. but yeah, opted to go for the shorter range charge. 
just had to be quick to about it, but it. yeah, ultimately ends up costing him, and they go on to Earth Spirit here. He does have the Blade Nail, so it's gonna hurt them. They need to get this one done quick, and it does look like they're gonna be able to bring him down, and Mapajka once again just firing out the impetus is obliterating crit. He needs to run right now, because he does not have the health to keep this one going. Arteezy nowhere near in the neighborhood as well. There is no chance Shopify taking this one, and they will leave Fly for dead. Shopify just aren't able to connect on the kills that you kind of expect them to look for. And on top of that, in the river, Earthbrit gets hit by the Soulbind. Crit then walks into it, connecting, preventing Earthbrit then to disengage. And yeah, Spirit, the Radiance is complete for Wraith King. You can see that instant shift of their logic in the game. You get this item, they group up around him, and they start moving him towards the buildings. If I think if Shopify are to try and fight this Wraith King, can they kill him two times now? This mischance really does hurt CK. Has yeah, it's all about the Chaos Knight, you know, can he keep those illusions up for two times in a row and kind of enable his team to, to, to keep on pounding away into the into the Wraith King? Or can they just kill off everybody else? You know, that's that's going to be the big key. I think Lal, there's a lot of pressure on him to be surviving these engagements, at least for the first life of the Wraith King. I think CK right now is still in that window of able to execute pretty much every hero. And he is trying to do it with that Shadow Blade. Sorry, I mean silver is yep. even better. <laughs> there you go. Collapse does get taken on down, but... That's been a pretty staple of this game. With this Midas, you know, like, you, you can kill him, sure, but he's always going to just be Midasing stuff and keep progressing in the game. Still a good pickoff. What do they do with it, though? That is the big question. Radiance Middle Tower is under attack. They're looking to potentially try and steal away our Tormentor here. They are four heroes positioned on the dire side. They're doing it under a watcher though, so... Sorry, he's gonna watch him do it then. Well, they don't have the vision. And that was quick, Jesus. I mean, Fly almost got blasted in the process as well, but... There we go. Yeah, it's a pretty nice shot to pick up, right? Yep, very nice shard for, for Ancient Apparition. It's also one of the reasons why the hero is more viable. They pushed the damage into the spell for Ice Vortex, then reworking the shard so it applies a stun on Ice Blast Connect based on your current level in Cold Feet. And uh, yeah, just giving just more stun, more purpose to AA. Very, very useful. Spirit, though, they are currently smoked up in the mid lane. They have drawn a perfect line to find Arteezy. And they have one sentry, so they do have detection for the Silver Edge. Oh, he just used, used it as well. Anyway, oh. they won't even need to. Here they go, on to Arteezy, the rest of the team. They need to get here fast. I mean, the Stampede comes down, but it's not going to make a difference. Arteezy is dead. Shopify, nowhere to be found. Crit gets caught up by a coil on the sideline. Just going to get back up onto the high ground and get themselves away from this. Wow, Toro. <laughs> Very aggressive. Blink up onto the high ground there. They have zero respect for Shopify if they don't have their CK. Uh, just don't misclick your Silver Edge, guys. He's using it to... F I I'm sure it was an accident on that Ancient Camp. And then in doing... I don't so, know. I've seen him do it a couple of times, T. Well, either way, whatever he just did there, sealed his death. If he had it in play, there was no detection. He could just walk south. The Ench wasn't in position, but using the Silver Edge like that... Yeah, got him killed off. And yeah, Spirit, they are just making all the moves here. Equally kind of awkward for them to go Roshan. Like, neither team wants to do this, right? A very quick kill. Yeah. No, no team has, like, the, the huge Roshan lineup, and it's more about going on the map and finding stuff rather than trying to set up for the big 5v5s. Like, I think either team does that particularly well in terms of draft, but... Yeah. Our bad, you know, he's, he's kind of just... There's been a lot of the aggression, really, from Shopify. Like, it feels like... I mean, they're not that far behind. In fact, they're barely far behind at all, but it feels like they're just so afraid to go out and make moves on the map. Mm -hmm. Are we about to potentially see three hearts in the game? Centaur's got one queued up. Earthfruit already has a heart, and CK's just buying a Reaver. Seems that way, that's, yeah. That's a lot Triple of heart, heart to put into a game. Minute. Yeah. Good item. Bottom lane, there's a Shopify hunting at the moment. They don't have their Scarab Mage with them. They see Lal, but they don't get the silence off Lal. Predicts it, gets off the Rage Shift, and instead they're just going to go for Collapse. Collapse will get brought down. 
Well, hang on for a pretty big call here. We'll do it onto Arteezy and Sableye. Yatoro jumping in now, throws out the stun onto the Centaur. Centaur, happy to turn around Tangus. Actually, they're turning around to Yatoro's first life goes very quickly indeed. But there comes a Grimstroke once again, leashing them together. But Yatoro is dead. They have the damage, but down goes Arteezy as well. The toothpicks do the work. Puck silenced up a thousand times over. Apparently, he's going to die as well. Lull out of the fight. And Shopify, they grab a few of them. And what the hell? Apparently, there's a Grimstroke here. I, I don't know how he ended up in this situation, but nevertheless, will be another hero taken out by Shopify Rebellion. And that's four heroes dead. A successful engagement. Yeah, a really successful engagement. The smoke wraparound, they instantly find the puck, but Lau, beautiful reaction to disengage and then collapse. He's kind of in just in no man's land. And in doing so, Spirit like, well, I guess we should take the fight. And yeah, crit, showcasing how much damage you can do on this Scarf Mage. And it was really nice positioning from uh, Fly as well. He was holding that high ground position underneath the cover of his ward, holding his ultimate until that second life of the Wraith King. And as soon as the uh, reincarnation came into play, pops the Ice Bloods, prevent Wraith King from really feeling too good on that second life. And yeah, Spirit, a rare moment where they're not truly ready as a full five. A nice smoke from Shopify. It's, it's been something we've been looking for, I think in the last like eight or so minutes. But it does finally connect and instantly, they go in again. They're smoked up. Earth for AA and Scarif Mage. Incredibly short cooldowns on their kill spells. And they would love to find Wraith King right now without his ultimate, but he's on the other side of the map. So potentially Lal is the target of choice here. Uh, move in. Vision shall be placed down. Oh, okay. Mirror. See mirror. And that will be an easy pick off for them. Not particularly high value kill, but might set up for them to look towards Roshan now. It has just turned nighttime, and uh, this pit is kind of free for them at the moment. <laughs> Do oh. Team Spirit mount contest. Okay. Arteezy scared me for a second. He just misclicked, put a second Reaver in his quick buy, and I was like, do not try and make me talk about double reaver build on CK. Okay, that is not a thing. <laughs> Don't make me justify that one, Arteezy, please. <laughs> no, I'm here to flame if he does it, but no, he, he does not go for the heart. So we are going to see Shopify Rebellion by maybe the 30 minute mark with a triple heart on Centaur, Earthbrit, and CK. They are going to be incredibly beefy boys with an Aegis to boot. There you go. Aegis into the hands of the Chaos Knight. Now, what can they get done with it? And Team Spirit, how well can you move around this map? I'm almost excited to watch Team Spirit be in the losing position again because they play it so well then. Immediately they're going on to Arteezy here. They want to take this Aegis out the moment they have it. And they might just do it. Oh, invisibility. Just keep them alive. <laughs> Don't do Shopify like that, man. The previous game, they used their Aegis to not do a lot. And this game, if you take it away instantly, come on, give them, a, give them something, Spirit. Let them have a moment, please. <laughs> this time, Arteezy spies through it all. They kind of got him up to the high ground. The, the Impetus is starting missing, and that's when they realized, like, they respect the damage output from this Enchantress so much that the moment he got onto the high ground, they were just like, no, it's not happening anymore. Radiant's bottom tower is under attack. Wraith King completes the BKB, so this time, when he enters the fight, he isn't going to be annoyed by any of these cheap stuns that Shopify have. He will be able to freely get off his right clicks. Cancel the TP. That one could have been a bit disastrous. They have the damage there to bring down pretty much anyone who TPs oh, in on so many careers. If they do it, yes. <laughs> that will help the heart game for sure. Yep. For sure. And uh, yeah, Arteezy has his coming out to him now. Team Spirit is still waiting to see if anybody shows on this bottom side. The Skeletons are just going to town on this tier 3 tower. Shopify just not willing to send anybody back to deal with it right now. They want to find something on this map, but they're just not going to. They're looking for Sableye, though. Oh my god, yeah. Here we go. Someone comes back to defend. Sableye gets called out, uses the Stampede, trying to get away. Stunned forever. Will the Impetuses land? Yes, they will. Maposhka gets him. And the tower's still falling. I mean, they've almost got it. They're playing the into an Aegis, and they've so almost work. broken the high ground. Dark Troll Summoner plus the Skeletons? That's a lot of damage. It's the Bone Zone down here. Arteezy running out, looking for a target. Doesn't quite seem a Poshka due to the nighttime vision. It was unfortunate. And he's seen on a ward now as well. Radiant Team Spirit, they want to they get behind. They want to see who is behind the big boy. 
and they've completely cut him up. Look at the mini map right now. They're just going for the targets, which RTC cannot help with at the moment. Crit, he's just going to get obliterated. Fly trying to hide on the high ground. Ooh, so Arvin just says, see you later, buddy, and rolls himself away. Doesn't want anything to do with this one. Collapse comes in under the tier fours, even. Oh, CK, just he, in. he is in here. He's, he's trying to take the fight. Buyback comes out from the Skyrath Mage, but the once Poshka? again, the Poshka just blasting away from the back lines. This Enchantress, who's the real carry? She's doing so much work. Arteezy comes back immediately. Look at the Yatoro. Yatoro with the beacon. He tried to get his way out of this one. A Centaur goes in deep. Yatoro, though, still standing his ground. The Inkswell heals him up to full charge through the both of them. They're being controlled heavily here. Arteezy needs to get off his damage. He needs to find a target, but Poshka could be the perfect target for it. Playing our pocket, though, going to redirect the stun and keep a Poshka alive for the time being charged in though onto Arteezy he's BMP and down he doesn't have the help and he is gonna fall two lives taken care of Saberlight TP's away another game another tragedy for Drop of Rebellion and Team Spirit just playing so damn well jumping on the park at the very least they might be able to catch out Lal here Space Shift not gonna save him Saberlight and Fly find something for themselves Radiant structures are fortified. Aposhka's doing so much work in this fight. <laughs> I've kind of left a little bit of space. Thousand just, damage. Like Shopify, they got all this heart, but like there's an enchantress. Impedus just boom, just hitting through them. See, like Arteezy, he starts to fight by himself, trying to get into the middle of the speed, Team Spirit's lineup, but he just lost the Aegis. And at that point, Maposhka just free casting his spells. He wishes he had a little bit more mana. He ran out at the very end because he'd used, what, like 20, 30 plus impedances across that? But yeah, Shopify, they are struggling a little bit here. I think now they got to think about this Enchantress first. If they don't shut down Maposhka, he's just going to rip through the entire lineup. Just Hurricane Pike sitting on the back line. <laughs> and he's got Moonshot. He's already got a Moonshot he's available. He's already got if the money for buy it. it. Maposhka is, is a ridiculous. crazy bastard. I cannot believe he gets away with this every single game. No drums even this time. Just every single game, he just pushes it further. Oh my god. So sick. Uh, team Spirit, man. Like, it's every time, every single time they're behind, I'm just like, all right, sweet. Like, we get to watch them find some crazy way back into this game. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Not only do they play exceptionally well, but they find their opponent's mistakes so easily, so cleanly, right? And I think for Shopify now, Arteezy, he has the Silver Edge, he has the Break Mechanic. Maybe he needs to think about finding Enchantress first, instantly kill her off, and then force her to lose out well, a little there bit. There you and go. Yatoro, he's dead as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fly God, kills two heroes. <laughs> Oh. That's what they needed. Sh what now Shopify, in charge just of needed fans? The man. They've already brought Tormentor into their roster, and that's how they're going to do it. We've seen it before in the history of Dota. Six-man rosters do relatively well, and yeah, the Tormentor pulling an absolute shift with combination and fly. That's Jesus. how you kill off the Poshka. <laughs> how do they even see that? Like, I don't know. Don't ask Super questions, sick. just enjoy the fact. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, have just... to witness the, the magic. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have a replay for it very shortly as well, because that was uh, absolutely unhinged. All right, Shopify, they're back in a reasonable position then. <laughs> Take a bottom tier two tower, easy as that. Great King can't fight for the time being until his reincarnation is back. Collapse, running in the bottom lane there. Oh, what easy shows. Could have maybe been caught out, but actually a CK alone isn't enough to take down a Bulldoze Spirit Breaker, I think. Pretty silly hero. All right, well, now it's time to wait until Roshan respawns. Both teams going to uh, kind of play a little bit more carefully now, I would imagine, whilst they wait for the Aegis to be back in play. Now, the interesting thing here is that it could be a daytime or a nighttime Roshan due to when it's respawning, and that always oh, makes it a little bit fuzzy. This here is way go. more... Oh, oh. Jesus. <laughs> and then the skeletons the come The skeletons, <laughs> no! Stop! Sorry, I take it back. It wasn't a six-man roster. It was like a 22-man roster. 20-man roster. <laughs> Shopify really pulling everything to get the win. <laughs> Stop, my children. You're killing your father. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. That's oh, fucking God. hilarious. Shopify. Yeah. They are smoked up around the bottom area of the map, seeing if the Spirit Break wants to come charging them through. Team Spirit. Well, camping on the middle lane at the moment. 
course, it is kind of on Team Spirit to make their way back to the bottom side over towards this Roche pit. But at the moment, the base is being pushed in pretty damn hard. Yatoro, he doesn't care about smoking. He is he's not a subtle man. He's going to take down a tier two tower. He knows that Shopify ain't going to do anything about it. Middle tower is under attack. Dyer are scanning. Skeletons, they're, they're hitting mid. <laughs> they're yeah, going for once the redemption. again. <laughs> Making up Sorry, for, Sorry for getting you. We'll take mid tower instead. Look at Team Spirit, such a good position here. They're going on to the Chaos Knight. They want to start the fight onto Artesia Taurus on top of him. The damage is there. Where is the help? Where is the help? Artesia's all alone and he is going to die. 100 to 0 with nothing to say about it. Three heroes dead. This wasn't a fight. This was a murder. And now they come for the barracks on the bottom side. Team Spirit. They make it look so damn easy. So Shopify just weren't in position. The skeletons were hitting mid racks. Like, Spirit knew that they were out of base, so to even try and entertain that engagement, but yeah, Spirit, utilizing this race team beautifully, pressuring bot, pressuring mid, always forcing the map out, and they're just looking to even hit the tier fours here. There's uh -oh. no buyback on the sky. There's no buyback on the CK. They're forcing out the glyph. Tier two in top lane is protecting Shopify from getting mega creeps right now. And that is going to be the issue for Shopify's lineup. They don't really push out the creeps that well. They don't really deal with the skeletons that well throughout the game. And it's why you see Spirit. They're not really playing that traditional form of Dota, which is smoke, get kills, and pick offs. It's a lot of just that kind of macro play, death by a thousand cuts, a lot of skeleton gameplay, helping Spirit just ignore how strong um, Shopify can be in the fights. Yeah, so we're already moving up to the top side to. Uh set up for this next Roshan as well. Yeah, it's just crazy. Like, Yatoro just feels like a master on every hero he plays. Like, every single time, he's just yeah. utilizing every factor of the hero he plays beautifully, and then will do this exact same thing on the next one. Spirit already positioned in top side of the map. Triple fight are smoked up. This could be the deciding they fight of the fight. game. It could be game, yeah. I want to come back into this series. It is now. Lalo gonna pop everything, give them all the vision they need to start this one off. And once again, they're looking forwards. RTZ collapses on him once again, just like game one. Staying on top of the CK, but they found a beautiful jump in the back lines. Your supports are just gone. Double buybacks from them straight off the bat. Your Taurus taking hits as well. Lalo just jumping around the fight. They're waiting for their supports to come back into this engagement. So Shopify, they will give them the space. They'll back themselves away and wave their resources to recover. Yatoro did die though, he did get picked off and actually Sableye, he's just back in on Maposhka, he wants to find the big targets. The rest of the team, they're rallying around him, jumping in, they've managed to catch up Lala as well, Lala stunned Silas for the time being, but the follow-up stun is not there. They see Arteezy here, he's stunned up once he again the by the Spirit Breaker, who's on top of him, Bash comes out, Arteezy is dead, no buyback. They need to find a way to make this fight work without him, but I'm not sure it's possible. Sure, the Enchantress is getting low, but the Sintel's dead as well. A look all towards Crit, Crit is basically gone already, and once again, three dead they do have the buybacks on the centaur on the skyrath mage but meanwhile flies desperately trying to defend the base Ooh, for shopify there they felt pressured they lost two lanes of racks they knew that roshan was available so with the double support buyback on spirit for sure, like, if maybe if they waited for the ck ultimate to come back in that's when you can take the fight but without those big spells in play spirit are easily able to capitalize on that and arteezy walks back into the fight just to instantly die off yeah spirit Great positioning once again, reading the map so beautifully, keeping the lanes pushed, never really allowing Shopify that entry to an engagement. And now they're going to get the second Roshan, Aegis and Cheese. This does feel like Spirit should be able to walk down top lane, take that tier two and try and close out this game with at least the Mega Creeps in the next, uh, within this Aegis window. <laughs> Lal moving down up the top lane, collapse, leading the charge. Radiance top tower is under attack. Team Spirit. I mean, how do you defend against this now? Enchantress picked up the Aegis for God's sakes. Maposhka, <laughs> the real carry of it's Team fair. Spirit. Now won't even be going down if you kill her. Oh man, I mean, I I don't know how Shopify can do this. Radiance top tower is under attack. They gotta hope, hope that spirit dies deep past the tier twos, tier threes. Oh, sorry, tier three, sorry, tier fours. Yep. Into the fountain. <laughs> Into the fountain. Oh, claps are trying. 
Nice catch from uh, from Arteezy. They managed to actually get their hands on the Spirit Breaker and stop him really connecting here. Arteezy moving to the sidelines. I mean, they are bound up together, so they know the real one. Meanwhile, they're just trying to actually deal with the Barracks, leaving Itoro up front as a tasty piece of fate. Whilst they'll go for the buildings, Arbed they getting controlled up, but they have brought down Yatora the twice, but Arbed's dead as well. They can't get their hands on that part. They'll let him get away and move across towards Collapse. Chaos Knight doing the damage. It's very hard for the Enchantress to get off the damage from this low ground here. The Mist Chance is going to be coming into effect here. Sans up into the Sentinel. Sentinel taking hits. The Barracks kind of exposed at the moment. Shopify, they're taking a few seconds just to get their resources back and then get back to defending this, but the Mega Creeps are on the way. Maposhka is making sure of it right now. The real carry of Team Spirit doing their work. Four staffs away, dodging out the CK. Stuns out from Collapse with the Inkswell as well. They're chaining it perfectly right now, and a Bash comes through as well. Another charge. Arteezy can't press his buttons. They're trying to just bring down this, this damn Enchantress, and they'll do it for the first time, but the Dust Nine is out onto Arteezy again. He's dead. No buyback. No C. K upper bracket bound team spirit taking out heroes left right and center shopify trying their hardest to stay in this game but i'm just not sure there's a chance of five right now coming out from the race king save a light on the back ones just trying to bring down collapse but he's gone charge across the map he's out of here crit taking damage from the enchanters as well she stands up so she can't use the impetus once again just using that hurricane pike save like trying to bring her down surely she will fall yatoro comes in from the side to bring down crit stampede used but poshka is dead the game might not be over yet, T. You take that as a massive victory for Shopify, right? Like, Yatoro just bought back. You didn't really progress the game. You oh, didn't get shit. Mega Creeps, right? Like, you're one game, like, you're one ancient falling away from being in the lower bracket for the international. So, you, you take this if you're Shopify, but yeah, for Spirit. 17k damage dealt from the Central Wall Runner. 12 yeah. inches off the double edge. <laughs> what the hell? I mean, with the shard as well, it builds up over time. And, uh, this Enchantress, what's his scoreline? 13, 5, and 13 on Maposhka. Truly the carry in this game, 14 Spirit. This is the nuisance of Collapse on the Spirit Breaker, the damage from Enchantress, the survivability of Yatara. So many layers built into this lineup. And yeah, they've got to be careful because there is going to be a window where Wraith King doesn't have buyback. And this does feel like the type of game that Shopify. Get a kill, run it down mid, hope to keep taking the fight in one great charge to get themselves out of this game. It doesn't sound promising, but it's maybe the only way Shopify can do it. Say like, just uh, stepping it up here in the final moments of this game and making them no longer the final moments of the game, giving Shopify a second chance. I think as well, like, once you get a team that's really good with Spirit Breaker, it does annoy you a lot throughout the game because how do you buy BKB in this game and feel good? Because there's this Aghanim Spirit Breaker of Octarine with a six second charge who's just bashing throughout the fight, never striking you as well. Like, it, it's one of those items where I wish I had it to deal with everything else, but then Spirit Breaker. And obviously some games you're going to have to just ignore the fact and go for it. And it's not, I don't think it's too important right now anyway, but Spirit Breaker just really hurts his opponent's cause and how they want to itemize in the game. Just becomes very I feel like awkward. if anything, this is probably, I think CK kind of needed a blink in this game. Like to be able to find that Grimstroke, to find that Enchantress, to stop them from free casting the spells, that could have probably been the key item difference in, in this game for me. But yeah, so far, Shopify, they are smoked up. Yeah, I would say smoked up, they have Ninja Gears. But hoping to find a pick. No. Breaking the smoke quite nicely. Yeah, as a spirit though. How do they approach the next window of the game? Five minutes now, Wraith King doesn't have buyback. Roshan might respawn in three minutes or so. Of course, yeah, he plus doesn't have his either, though. He's just buying out every single time. This man has mm -hmm. no cares about his buybacks. At this stage of the game, you need to just play for that one fight, and they're going for it. Maposhka has been seen. Sans is out. The chase, it doesn't connect. Top of fire, they're not willing to overextend. And there is just an army of skeletons pouring into the triangle right now. <laughs> Day of the dead around here. Chip was like, guys, didn't you help us at the Tormentor? Why are you now running at us? Come on. Yeah. Whose side are they on? We don't know. Lol, by the way, looking to uh, repurpose his build for the late game here. Picking up the Aghanim Scepter, going for mm -hmm. Mjolnir. So going to be... Uh, 
doing a bit of damage to these dream coils as well. I mean, this is an excellent cool tool for just killing supports. You jump in the back lines, drop a coil, get out, and your coil will just do the work for you. Also helps with just additional procs of your Mjolnir down the line. Wraith King's already got one as well, so now you've got two Mjolnirs, the Radiance, the CK Illusions, just passively gonna go down in the fight if it lasts a little bit too long. Yeah, and for Team Spirit, they are dodging Shopify here. They just moved to the top side of the map. They don't want to give Shopify this opportunity to take a fight outside of their base, give them the time to instantly knock on the Tier 2 and the Tier 3. And now they, they themselves smoke up, running deep here to maybe contest this uh, Tormentor. Team Tormentor at this point in the game, <laughs> pretty damn tough. They'll get Critter Shard. Jump in though, onto, onto Saberlight. The Saberlight is just taken out of the equation straight away. You get the Tormentor, you lose your Centaur. That is a trade which Shopify has been forced into. He does have the buyback. As Arteezy just continually buying more and more items, grabs the Harpoon now as well. Just buying anything the he can for this fight. The final barrack under attack, and now the Chaos Knight being thrown up at the moment. They've got the coil coming out to them. Yutora also taking a lot of damage in this at the moment. Once again, Saberlight in on the back lines, knows his job to clean up Maposhka here. They want to try and bring down the edge. He's even got a BKB now at the moment, so he's fighting through it for now. Big Sun with the Ink Swell coming up through Yutora, jumping on in, looking for Arteezy. Arteezy backs himself away under the cover of the Silver Edge, but they'll move on to Saberlight. Saberlight, he survives for the time being, turns around with the stun there on top of Yutora. They might be able to take him down. They have! Yutora is dead without buyback. A real opportunity here for Shopify. They found it, but they need to take out the rest, and the rest are going down. Arbeds on top of them as well. The damage is going to be there. Saberlight fighting up into they everybody. Edge. They take down the Poshka. No buyback on the edge. They'll get nearer as well. They needed a miracle, and they may have just found it. Saberlight continuing to chase, but they are on the run. How much can the Puck and the can Spirit they Breaker do to delay things right now? It might just be a Spirit Breaker. Lyle's still trying to they play with them at the moment. Trying to move, jumping across, coil, blink, orb, everything being used from the puck in these fights just to be annoying. But they just need to get down the middle lane right now. Finally, Shopify able to collect on their spells. They found Maposhka. Sableight had to buy back, but it was the perfect buyback. And on top of that, just the damage came out. Spirit, not really able to connect. And there's a window of 70 seconds without Wraith King buyback. We're not going to be expecting a lot from Shopify here, but it's a start of a potential comeback. They are able to win fights if they can execute and for Spirit. Maybe getting a little bit too carried away, a little bit too comfortable. Man, they, How much yeah. can they get here? The answer seems to be not a whole lot. I mean... Oh, Wind Waker on collapse? Okay. Oh, yeah, nice he's Wind Waker. Dancing around them. Top tower Middle tower is, is gone. Top tower also going to be falling Dyer's as well. They're opening themselves up for their own possibility of, of getting Mega Creeps at some point in the game. <laughs> oh, okay. My god, collapse. <laughs> so they're not going to get really anything from this. Like, I felt like that fight from Shopify was as soon as your Taro died without buyback, like, how quickly can they conclude the fight with enough resources to then run it down the lane and get a little bit of map pressure themselves? But because you have Puck, because you have Spirit Breaker, even when you do yeah. win the fight and have, like, oh, wait, we're doing it. There's so many things you have to do. And Mega it's, Creeps, of course, were taken honestly, from Team Spirit there. The worst two heroes to be left alive after a fight. <laughs> yeah. Well, hold on. There's a TP coming in here from Yutoro. They might go for this. They're definitely going to go for this. Throwing everything they've got onto the Wraith King. They're going to be able to take him down for the first time. He's coming back, though. The TP's coming through thick and fast. Beautiful call coming out from the puck as well. Yatora, the second life. He's got a BKB and walk away. So he will be fine for the time being. But Lull, he's caught in the middle of it. He's going to go down. Has the flyback available. Huge Ice Blast going to come on through as well. There's still plenty of health left available on the Shopify heroes as they try and get on top of Maposhka. Enchantress might be falling here. She is dead. Arbed, looking for more, probably not going to find it. Roshan is now available. Flight, meanwhile, trying all by himself to defend this base. <laughs> He's really Spirit. struggling. Spirit are making the end of this game quite spicy. You know, they get the Mega Creeps, lose a lot. Then they just, you're trying to TP him blindly by himself into the Roshan area. And, okay, Shopify, they're against Mega Creeps. The net worth isn't too crazy, but they're going to get the third Aegis. This is an Aegis cheese and refresher. This is going to be a game of buybacks now. Can? Can they do it? We've already seen a Mega Creeps comeback so far at the Rotary International. Governor, are you starting to believe this is possible? 
For the sake of the show, yes, I do believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm contractually obliged to say yes. Uh, yes. Still, very, very, very... I do believe this is the beginning. They will win. No, um, but if anything, I think for Shopify, like. they will be kicking themselves a little bit because they could have done all of these actions 25 minutes ago, you know? Like the fact it took them nearly 40 minutes to get to these types of fights, this construct of engagement, it's just a little bit too slow. And it's why Spirit are in such a dominating position. And you'd expect for Spirit now, okay, you know what? We're kind of getting a little bit volatile with our gameplay. Let's sit back for a second. You've got an Aegis, congratulations. They'll probably farm the map and just keep Shopify in their base, keep the Mega Creeps running towards their side of the, uh, the map. Yep. And then we'll see a, a fresh new round of engagement. But... All right, so what you're telling and... me is we've got about four and a half minutes to burn. Yeah. Pretty How's much. How's it going? How you feeling? Doing good? Yeah, I'm all right, yeah. Don't really know what Shopify's cooking yet, but they are cooking something. Or trying to cook something. Collapse is now warding duty as well. So if anybody misclicked and accidentally put Collapse in as wards placed on their fancy, you'll be happy about this. I'm oh, just doing it like that. Yes, okay, I accidentally put Nisha ward placed, okay? I forgot to change it, I did my tech check for TI, I then started casting and then it was like a game too late where I click on Nisha and was like, oh no. Collapse. I've actually no. found him here, he's got the bulldoze of course, so very hard to actually bring him down. And yeah, he's just gone. So balanced. Mm -hmm. Worst hero in the super late game is just something else, man. <laughs> Is this the 25 talent you expected to see? Plus 20% greater bash chance versus the Bulldoze 500 all damage barrier? Yeah, I mean, bashing is very good. And Bulldoze, all, like, it's basically just like a block of cheese. And we know how bad that is. So uh, there True. could be some games where the left talent's warranted, but just getting that extra bash chance, especially when you've already got so many opportunities just to click through. Get some swift, uh, what, 37%? Yeah, I'll take those odds. Not as good as 17, but we'll take it. Yeah, no, 17, of course, is the superior number. But lol. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> it's a scary time, especially with the double damage RTZ sniffing you out. Well, you can tell he's thinking about it. He's always thinking about dropping the coil here, seeing if you can set up for something. And that's the thing, Spirit. Their communication is so crisp. They seem to be able to just be like yes or no as a team within like 0.5 seconds. If it's yes, you know, everyone will be there. They oh, found, they they found the silence, Lull's dead. They get him. 100 seconds without the park could be something. He doesn't actually have the money for buyback at the moment, of course. They won't know that on Shopify. And it is very difficult to commit to a fight and then disengage if that, if you see that buyback coming through. So we'll see what the call is here from Shopify. Of course, Mega Creeps as well, going to create extra pressure. And they're actually clicking on Saberlight right now. He is the Aegis Carrier. Yeah, and the important thing here, the reason why Shopify are finding so many opportunities, but actually, wait, they're going to try and jump Saber Light. They will find them. it, get the gun is there, and oh my goodness, the damage is there as well. The potion is going to blast through him. Life number one is gone. Arbed stuns up, collapse. Managed to get the roll on him before he gets the charge, but they can't chase any further forward because guess what? There it is. The Salt is coming in. through once again. And Arteezy gets thrown into the air, so no stun from you. No way they will make it out of this one. Ooh. Yeah, they they did. See you later. So, so close to Shopify getting another kill to then be able to turn it around, but of course they trade the Aegis for that. And Shopify just utilizing the Ninja Gear so perfectly, right? CK plus Skyroth Mage. Arteezy goes for a, like a 50 minute Orchid to help with that Lincoln's Pop to help try and control that puck. And if there ever was a time where neutral items are really helping their team stay in a game, it is right now. Because this Ninja sure. Gear item, even with a nerf in 7.34D, is giving them. Just enough opportunities, and now Maposhka, he stepped up. He this wants is to a get a really big target. They can bring it yeah. down. Crit. He sees him. What does he? There he is. Science is out. BKB immediately popped from Maposhka. So damn fast. Arteezy, yeah. he's not even doing any damage to him. <laughs> what is this? Arbed comes through though. BKB's over. They should finish it up with the A blast coming through as well, and that will be done. But in comes the Soul Blind once again from the Grimstone, controlling up the two of them. Arteezy taking damage here. He is going to drop. And Arbed, he needs to get out. He can't either. Turn to stone and taken down. Two dead on the side of Shopify. Buyback's going to be forced, and they come out immediately. Oh, this hurts. This hurts for sure. 
The fact they were trying to go for that pick off in Enchantress and Maposhka, beautiful positioning. He hugs the tree line, throws up the Observer Sentry, and in doing so, getting that BKB off, preventing the break, and then it just took too long. Spirit instantly able to get back into that area. And we saw the value of the Dream Coil Agnims with Mjolnir. CK just instantly going down. Shopify using three buybacks just in response for one edge pickoff. Their play style was keeping them against the Mega Creeps. It was very refreshing, but one mistake, and of course you were then instantly shoved back into your base. If you can keep chaining the pickoffs, you can keep playing the map. But as soon as it doesn't work out, and you don't have the buybacks, that confidence to leave your base is going to you know, slowly disappear. And for Spirit, it does feel like they are just farming up, waiting for that next Aegis, and then hoping to try and close out the game that way. But yeah, Shopify shouldn't, in theory, be too confident now. I say that, they're now smoked. You say that. <laughs> the crit's already <laughs> hunting. I mean, they know they're not going to be let back into this game, so... The opportunities need to come from them. Okay, another charge. Arteezy, moving on to the Spirit Breaker here. Very scary for Arteezy here, don't forget. No buyback available on him. The charge through once again. Collapse, he is taking damage here, but they managed to get the connection on onto Arteezy. The damage, though, is not really massive, and now they're refreshing a Taurus one, kind of losing that. Oh my god, the post from the sidelines. Arteezy is gone. Team Spirit, they get the carry. Can they do it without him? They've taken down Crit as well. Collapse trying to fight up with Arbed here, but Postka from the sidelines just blasting out the impetuses. Lal with the ultra kill. Moving on to Saberlight. Saberlight trying to do what he can, but there's nothing left in the tank. Centaur's gonna drop a rampage for Lal to finish off this game. Sure, the buybacks are there, but they can't defend against this. There is no chance. Team Spirit running into the base to finish off Shopify Rebellion and send them down to the lower bracket. Sableye jumping in, trying to do what he can, trying to fight up. I mean, he's got the cheese, they've got the damage onto Lal, maybe finishing him off with the Ice Blast, but look at the them just taking through Sableye. His cheese doing absolutely nothing, and they will be able to finish on the Centaur. And there it is, GG called game number two. It goes to Team Spirit. Yeah, what a victory as well. Such a clean performance from Spirit. Shopify, unfortunately, not able to put the pieces together and will be playing in the lower bracket. Absolutely, and we can throw it over to, straight over to Sir Action Slack, who's going to be with the winning team. Hey guys, thank you so much. We just had Team Spirit win this game. In fact, their managers are here and they have their victory bobas. Please get the victory bobas, everyone. Let's deliver them to the team. Come on, let's go into the room. Congratulations, boys. Your victory bobas. Well done, well done. How are we feeling? How's the game? How you doing? I'm doing good. good. Great. It was a great game. Yeah. Opponents was really strong. Now I feel that we should uh, took other opponents, actually. All right, all right. But we won. What are you guys drinking for the victory boba? What do we have there? Mango strawberry. Mango strawberry, the, the drink of champions. Uh, do you know how tormentors work, guys? No. No. We do not know how tormentors work? No, we don't. Yeah? Yeah, because like after uh, this game, we know that we can die. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, that was for the first time for them, but not for me. So I just like run away when I see that I'm low because I died like a couple of times on techies and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now, yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, as from one tormentor to another, thank you guys so much for coming in. Congratulations on your series and the energy is good in here. Your victory bobas, gentlemen. Congratulations. Back to you on the panel. Woo! <laughs> Thank you so much, Slacks. A lot of information we wouldn't have known otherwise. Uh, Team Spirit did get something out of that, except for you know going up a bracket. They now know how Tormentors work. Who'd have thought? Yeah. <laughs> I have died a couple of times to Tormentor, so I know. <laughs> I was surprised how many times we saw your Tora die to the Tormentor in there. It was a long game, though. They put in the effort. Shopify definitely holding on. They didn't give up. They were fighting it till the end to try and get into that upper bracket. But ultimately, we see Team Spirit. They didn't need all three games in this best of three. It was a 2-0. And a great one for that. This Spirit Breaker, I want to have a big chat about because he had a rough lane. We didn't really know this idea behind the Spirit Breaker Grimstroke when we saw the lane going as tough as it was. But when it comes to late game fighting in that manner, it was a duo, a combo that you could not uh, stand against. Yeah, the hero, once it comes online, just seems to be a complete beast. I think there's a question, because even Maposhka said right at the end, it's like, oh, I'm not so sure about the opener. I, I wonder if they're going to keep first phasing the Spirit Breaker, because it, it did create some openings and weaknesses in the Spirit Draft, because you can't just...
just lose all these lanes and expect to just consistently win Dota games. Um, I think they're much better than Shopify, so they were able to kind of drag this game out and scale really well with Spirit Breaker, with the Grim's eventually getting an Aghanim Scepter. You know, they bought time for Wraith King to get all his items, but um, it was, you know, it was just another game where I think Shopify, their draft, they got off to a strong start. They had their ways to win this game. They were just a bit too passive, which was kind of the similar story to last game in the mid game. Yeah, and the last game they had like uh, a better late game draft, like in terms of the carry to carry matchup, terribly against Troll. This game they had Chaos Knight against uh, against the Rave King, which uh, doesn't really favor the Chaos Knight as much if uh, the game gets dragged out uh, a long time. You know, and I felt like the early game was kind of fifty fifty. They they kind of won their bot lane a lot. Uh, top lane was not not as great as uh, they were expected but i think overall the early game went well for shopify they were able to run around with the other four heroes but uh, again you know like uh Arteezy, he was like uh, really passive in the game like he mm -hmm. was i wouldn't say he lost them the game but he also didn't win them the game you know he was like really focused on his own farm like er you could see his farming pattern every time he goes to the ancients he makes sure that he clears the ancients by the minute and he goes to the left ancients then he moves back to the right ancients but uh it's costing his team uh op opportunities to push towers you know because right. we saw that i think it was the first one where he, he he came off his lane he tp top he farmed ancients and the earth spirit plus the aa were smoking they were trying to make a move skyroth was taking levels mid and they had nothing to do because nobody was pushing the top lane up so those are the kind of small little things that i feel like affected uh, the way the team could have a uh, push the advantage forward you know if he just decided to go top maybe it would have affected his own mm -hmm. uh, net worth a lot but it would have helped his team make moves and progress on the map you know yeah, well, what is that uh, fine balance then for Chaos Knight? Because we originally were really happy to see him on that active carry, but you're saying he wasn't active enough. So where is that fine line of wanting to, to farm up and be more proactive? Very simple. If the okay. anime yeah. Rave King with <laughs> Midas is coming to the fights more... If you see two Midases on two Yeah, and pores, he's fighting more than the, the Chaos Knight, which has gone normal items, armlet, you know, Echo Saber, then something is wrong. You know, I feel like he only started to fight when he finished his Echo Saber. But I feel like... As a as a chaos knight with armlet, you're you're like the strongest hero on the map. Like mm -hmm. who's gonna who's gonna touch you in in the map? And you're not utilizing that window of opportunity to make uh, the game easy for your team. Mm. Like I always uh, talk about when you look at carry players farm, you should also look at when they are farming, are they helping their team at the same time? Or are they just focusing on, I need to have this uh, GPM at this point of time, you know? Or they are just thinking about what my teammates are, are doing. I have to help them when I'm farming. Mm -hmm. Now, God's why weren't Toon Spirit able to close this one out earlier? They were one racks off getting Megas. That one took a little bit of time. And then even with the Megas, there were still fights being won by Shopify. Uh, the Tormentors were a bit <laughs> of a problem. You actually, unironically, like you, you lose your engine, your, your rate unlucky, they can't buy. Unlucky. <laughs> I don't know about that. It happens. I don't know if that's unlucky. Uh, it won't be the last Tormentor death we see at this tournament, though, I think. But, uh, um, you know, I think it was just a bit of maybe overconfidence and sloppiness because they, they're probably looking at um, this Shopify draft and like, okay, they've missed their timing they have this chaos night we outscale um and they kind of rush some of these high ground pushes and then we saw just great initiations i think Saberlight um really showed up this mm -hmm. entire series back-to-back -back games where i think he played um really well uh first on the dawn break and now the centaur um and then abed 11 6 11 he, you know he was starting these fights and um putting his team in a position to you know, actually kind of call their way back in when you have supports like sky and aa the damage output you can dish out if you're landing you know your initiations from centaur and earth spirit is you can punish them Team spirit if they if they screw things up and i think they did a really good job of recognizing that some of this late game damage isn't coming out of your Taurus Wraith King. It's actually coming out of heroes like yeah. Enchantress. Yeah. Um, so they were just focusing Maposhka every single team fight. And it wasn't actually until Mira got that Aghanim Scepter, but that it felt like Spirit actually had enough damage to start winning like 60 minute team fights once again, because that Dark Portrait was absolutely brutal. Yeah, yeah. After, after they threw like two team fights, they realized, okay, we, we need more weapons from the <laughs> yep. support team. We need to farm this axe on, on the Grim Shock. No, it was great. It, it starts off with three cores, but at the end, uh, all five of them feeling like cores with the impact they had on team Spirit. So, Massive props to them. They will be going into the upper bracket when it does come to next weekend when we start seeing the playoffs. Shopify going down to that lower bracket. And this time we're going to talk about our next matchup, TSM up against Virtus Pro. One of these two teams will be up there with Team Spirit in the upper bracket and briefly talking about them. Who do you favor a little bit more? Because TSM, slow start, but strong finish. 
Virtus Pro still kind of in that middle of the pack. Yeah. I, I favor TSM. I think they've got a real kind of identity with how they want to play. They kind of struggled a bit, especially on day one, but they, you know, got enough wins out of the, out of uh, day one and put themselves, you know, into a position where they aren't going to get a bad playoff matchup. Uh, and what I like about them is they just kind of realized they need to play this really aggressive style. They're picking like these tanky cores, even from the mid lane. They're playing Ogre mid, they're playing Ricky mid, they're just running around fighting. They played quite a bit of Bristle back as well. Um, and I feel like they've really just figured out this is the style that works for them. Um, and, you know, they've gotten some really nice wins out of it. Yeah, it's going to be a very very entertaining game for sure, but I would personally favor maybe TSM a little bit more. I, I feel like the team has a lot more depth in terms of like strategy, whereas if you look at VP, they've been maybe winning only with one or two strategies. You know, it's it's uh, hard to say whether they're going to be able to bring more to the table, but at the moment, I feel like TSM is the stronger team. Yeah, stop pulling those things out of the back pocket, but TSM being uh, our favored, even if just slightly. Let's know a little bit more about them as we do have a bit of content about TSM. I guess when we play against the uh, Fnatic TI-10, I had to play on lower bracket. I was a little nervous because it was like a BO1 and I always hate BO1s because it just, in my head, it was really like, I don't want to get last place again. I don't want to get last place again. Like my last TI and I think I didn't play bad, but I also didn't play very well. And when you're a TI, you, you really got to clutch the game through different angles. You know, it's not just click, clicking the buttons at that point. It's like you have to contribute somewhere that's going to be key and crucial to winning. Um, and I didn't do it. You know, I was very average. So I went to TI7 and then I didn't go to TI until TI10. It felt like three years had passed, had the same result. It was really frustrating. I was really like sad towards myself because uh, it meant like, well, this whole journey, you know, to get to the same spot. But, you know, that was very, really, like, that's how I felt when I lost, at least. I think the one crucial thing I've learned from them is to remind myself why I play the game and to every day just appreciate that I get to play Dora. And it's a game that I re I'm really passionate about. When I'm in that mindset, I really play my best and I'm the best teammate that I can be. Getting ready for the second series of the day for the road to the international. We're looking at something quite a little bit different than we just saw, but not too much because, again, it is going to be North America versus East Europe. However, TSM versus Virtus Pro here with T-Pant and, of course, Mr. Fear. How are we doing today, Fear? We just got to see Shopify not quite make it into the upper bracket. And you, as an NA expert, as an NA lover and enjoyer, we have to put our faith in TSM now, right? I mean, I think we have... a. Uh much more reasonable chance in this series. We, we, we've seen Team Spirit, right? They're behemoths right now. They look yeah. so good. And I don't know who's going to beat them, but we'll have to see. But carrying the torch for North America, it is TSM here going against Virtus Pro. A more manageable opponent, but not an easy opponent by any means here. And especially oh, for sure. if we saw anything from the last series, that hero right there, pretty hard to beat. The Spirit Breaker, whether you play in the off lane or position four, if it gets farm, this hero is a beast. Hey, definitely a beast indeed. And building up a bit of a storyline in terms of uh, the North American perspective, of course, we've been working with the region all year. I looked at some historics here, and we can think about what's going on in the draft. Four times has North America had two teams in the upper bracket. That's TI 9, 6, 5, and 2. Once they have had three teams, and that was in TI 8 with VGJ, Storm, Optic, and Evil Geniuses. But three times has North America not had a single team in the upper bracket. TI 1, TI 3, and TI 10. So TSM, they don't wanna they don't wanna let NA sink that low. So obviously they're coming in hungry for this matchup. But Furtis Pro, you already said it's not gonna be an easy block for TSM at all. Uh these players. They've been grinding it out, making this uh, roster work all the way, well, I won't say all the way, but at least some of these uh, additions to the team uh, since the last year's DPC tour. We look at guys like Kiritich, for example, Division Two DPC, it, the entire last year, this year he's playing in the in the first division, making waves, kind of showing that I'm a capable carry player. Pick me up for this team, guys. And of course, FNG, the OG Power Ranger, 2013 Power Rangers. I keep talking to you about this roster here so many times, but I am just happy to see FNG out here in TI. He's been there twice, and I'm happy here he's there here for a third time of the road. Yeah, he's definitely one of the veterans coming from the region. 
very strong captain and he's very smart as well about the game and the way he thinks about it. I had the pleasure of talking to him quite a few times and moving on more to this game at this point this is the first time tsm is going to get invoker which this hero some people find it still p some find a bounce but i think when you play against spirit breaker it's a, just a great choice having ways to be able to get rid of that bulldoze just to spell it yeah. is super nice and you can do that with the tornado so unsure it is a flex pick right now on who will play this invoker will it be brile playing in the mid lane will we see some support invoker shenanigans time will well, tell talking about tell. that ari actually has four of the openers the most openers for tsm and when they have opened with ari zero uh they have two wins and they have two losses so yeah we We've already seen uh, seen this pause for Invoker. We saw FY play it out before. Potentially Ari could be the one to do it. But we know Brile also capable to bring out the Invoker if they want to. And, you know, I think we're really looking at meta here. We've seen how impactful Centaur is all over the board. Mainly just the Stampede, but the little reworks here and there throughout this year, just making this hero much more stable and wants it. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, the meta right now is you pick these big strength tanky heroes ones that either buy blade mill into heart but centaur kind of has like a built-in blade mill already just with the retaliate there so you kind of just go for those big powerful items early on get your blink maybe a transition in between get the heart get the shard all of a sudden you've got like 9,000 hp in the team fights and you're unkillable making a lot of space yep. for your carries or mids to do more damage i mean even your supports can do a lot of damage depending on what they do we did see the invokers go for the Aghanims even in the support role, but still very curious to see what they're going to do here with this Invoker. Centaur, pretty much a stable pick all around in the offlane yeah. right now. You just, you take it early and you can be pretty sure as long as you lane it with a ranged position four, that it's going to be very difficult for the enemy carry to get his farm. Yeah, and also like the itemization that is the staples, vanguards and the pipes. You've got the option to just basically dis disassemble that vanguard. If you look like it's going to be a very magical heavy opponent team, going straight towards the pipe direction, or just make yourself a stronger frontliner, which uh, definitely Kasane can be. He does love the farm. Centaur will enable him that early farm, Get those big items up maybe it's an aura maybe it's just the vanguard for himself that's going to help him out and the matchup right now we are looking potentially at a ck for kirtich into the safe lane versus that kasane centaur yeah when you think about your carry picks and you're going to pick it pretty early it has to be a stable type of carry that can get his farm plays into well most matchups because he's gonna get counterpicked pretty hard here but it is a good lane versus centaur you do have the ability to sustain the double edge spam or just right clicks because centaur he's quite annoying with the fact he does go for that vanguard he has really high base hp region so having that life steal available for the ck it's gonna help a lot and omni knight this is a hero all right I mean, that's just a Dota hero, right? That we haven't seen too much of. <laughs> it's a Dota hero, all right? <laughs> well, yeah, well, where does it go? That is the question. I've seen this hero as a core and then the offlane. I've seen yep. it not so much as support, but it could be played as support. I think if you're not playing around Five seconds. just the harassment in the lane, that the purifying hammer, I don't know what's that called again, you know, that spell. I'm not entirely sure if you can play this hero as a support. But nonetheless, it is a bit of a surprise pick here. He certainly is as uh, Slatums, Toby, and New are the only players who have brought up this uh, Omni Knight, of which Slatums is the only one who hasn't got a victory. So the first time TSM uh, going for this hero, and we discussed about TSM a lot in day one and day two, that their drafts are kind of all over the place, you know? They're kind of hard to read where they, where, where they want to take the direction of this. Maybe bait their opponents a bit into counterpicking, and they will just shift roles with their uh, flexibility that they have in these heroes. Omni Knight core support, Invoker core support, leaving a lot of question marks, but VP, I don't think they care too much about that. They have their own game plan. We bring up the Shaker, potentially looking like a mid shaker be very strong against so many matchups but there's one hero fear especially when we look at TF tsm's perspective they found an ogre answer to this earth shaker heroes that had normally have pretty poor right click damage of course he amplifies it with the enchant totem ogre does pretty well against those yeah it, it could be that i'm still very curious on what direction tsm is going because this is gonna be their first invoker game first centaur game first omni night game as Five well and remaining. they have played where's your source of damage so there you go they have played one hero their damage is pretty minimal here unless omni yep. is going to be that damage dealer still trying to figure out 
where they're putting what heroes. You did mention the ogre. I don't think they're gonna do it this game because I'm probably pretty not. sure they needed just a real carry in this game. I, <laughs> I mean, think... that's what we really want to see. <laughs> right. So I, I'm hoping they just like pick a, a carry here, and then the real question is gonna be where's this Omni and where is this Invoker going? Is it going to be Invoker mid? Is it going to be Omni mid? Is the other one going to be support? I think it might just be an Omni mid. Looking at this, I think Invoker probably just going to be your range support that's going to lane with the Centaur. You're going to have an Omni going into the mid lane, and then you just got your Disruptor POS 5, and you're just looking for some Tomato carry here. On the other side here for Virtus Pro, though, they pretty much just need a support. It's, yeah, I guess they just need a support at this point. They're going to ban out some of the strong ones, Enchantress being gone. Uh, POS 4 is what I think they're most likely looking at. Getting something yep, like that, I mean, as you mentioned, the Shaker probably going mid. Yeah, they also they have opened up their draft as well with FNG's hero most of the time. We'll see if he wants to play the Spirit Breaker. Do we see something like, yeah, you talked about nothing to say playing the mid spirit breaker yep i mean it's an option if you want to so they also have their flexibility with this earthshaker spirit breaker it can still go all over the place but grimstroke yeah that's definitely an fng hero so we'll uh see how much they've adjusted uh since the first two days if they have something up there uh well, in their pockets well an ancient apparition so i believe ck shaker spirit breaker should be the cores unless you know east europe mids Bringing up Ancient Apparition, you know, that I don't think we're going to go that route, but it has happened before. Uh, unlikely. I think Shaker's just going mid. You're going to put the Grimstroke with the Spirit Breaker in the lane. You're going to lane up your AA with the Chaos Knight. And now Tomato is in a spot where, you know, he's got an Omni mid, potentially Invoker mid. Not entirely sure which one. Probably Omni. Now he needs to make his selection for the carry. What is going to be the best matchup? We've seen a lot of the Terror Blades being picked up in these type of situations, so that mm -hmm. could be an appealing option for him right now. Outside of that, you don't really you probably don't want to play the Naga too much against all of this spam available. But do you want to play mm -hmm. TB into a position for Grimstroke who's gonna get that early Ags? It's kind of annoying to do this pick actually, because you're playing Gris AA and Grimstroke, even though they are just both supports. They slow down what, or they limit your hero pool by quite a lot. And they're just going to go for the Terror Blade. I think that was probably the yep. best possible option here for them. It is a hero that can just carry this game, does very well versus Spirit Break in the lane, good versus CK. And of course, against the supports, they can't really do too much to them unless you get that Agnum Scepter online for Seiyu. You know what? Ari's playing a support centaur this game as Kasane will bring the Omni Knight into the off lane. We would have really thought that uh, Kasane likes to play heroes that like to farm a lot and bring up these big items that enables him to kind of okay. join in fights and maybe through auras or damage items or blinks. But he's bringing out the Omni Knight off lane and Toby, I think, is the only off laner who's done it so far. And that was also a win uh, back when they were still playing uh, that draft. However, I like the way that they they brought the Somni Knight, mainly because of the ult and just soaking up CK's damage. Nobody can get nuked right away if you're fast with your fingers. You have the Shaker's damage kind of getting mitigated as well. But the Ancient Apparition is an answer to that. We can slowly bring you down despite all of our physical being reduced for some time period. So Tomato probably feeling that if we have an Omni Knight on our team, I can pick this Terrorblade. What I'm most curious about to see, how is the Centaur support going to function? <laughs> because this is going to be an Omni Knight Centaur lane. Is that scary? I'm not entirely sure that's super scary, because you're going to have a lot of spam on the CK with the Omni Knight, because that's just what he does, keeps throwing hammers at you. However, I don't think you mind too much, because you do have that Chaos Strike to keep bringing you back up if you do get low. And where does the centaur, centaur fit into this? If he was a ranged hero, I'd get it. Like, you just keep spamming him down with just some right clicks and some nukes on top of it. But are you going to be able to get in there with the centaur? Very curious and very interesting to see if the support centaur as a dual lane with a, another melee hero being the Omni Knight is going to be successful or not. What I've at least seen in this particular matchup versus the Centaur and the CK, I guess Ari, well, this is usually when we talk about a three Centaur, but you could bring up extra points into double edge and kind of surprise the CK. Oh, he's actually doing a lot more damage than just that level one, 120 nuke plus the strength gain. But uh, it's probably not going to go quite that way. I actually think Sane's lined up the Midas. Omni Knight's not exactly the fastest farmer as well. He's probably going to need that extra going his way. Remember, 
back in the day of Dota, like Omni Knight off lanes, at bad on off lanes, it was the Radiance meta for off lane, right? <laughs> sure, yeah. But I don't think we're going to see a Radiance, but it could benefit them this game to have these very expensive items coming through the Midas on your pause three. We'll have to see. I'm not entirely sure what the meta is right now for the Omni Knight, but I think Midas is fine, but Radiance might be slightly too greedy. And I think you want to get to a point where you're just like doing what most offlaners do and you're just super tanky. And you just build up items that allow you to be just very, very tanky and unkillable. If you can get to the Radiance, then sure, that would be fine. It's just a little bit greedy. It doesn't really give you any HP until it's completed. I guess EHP with the evasion. But from, mm. until then, his job is going to pretty much just run around with the team, make things happen. There's a lot is going to ride on White Mon here on his Disruptor to be able to catch heroes because your Blink Initiator was just demoted to POS 4, which is going to slow down your Blink Dagger quite a bit here. So yep. they're going to play a bit more of a slower game here, but they do have the tools to get kills and catch. They just need a little yes. bit of levels and they need some farm. Yeah, I agree. Maybe that's where the Disruptor and the Invoker really show if you have only Stampede to close in gaps, Disruptor is definitely going to help you out on, on that perspective. But looking from Virtus Pro's eyes as well, uh, I kind of talked about, you know, Kiritich. He played back with Namiga last year, noticed he was in the original Bet Boom roster before the Bet Boom of this year that was able to get from Division 2 into TI in the same year. It was a miraculous run, the Hawk running the carry builds. Uh, but, uh, you know, into VP they went. Kiritich, he's. I think right now he was ranked fifth among all of the players in TI-12 in average kills, which is, you know, it's a good statistic for sure. But the thing that I'm worried about is when he's played Spectre or Troll, he's won his games. If he's played any other carry, it's 0-5. Not a single win. But CK's meta, CK strong, maybe meta is the key for this one. Maybe meta's better, you know what I mean? We'll have to yep. see. <laughs> but CK Rapped is the hero that <laughs> definitely needs to have a good start it's just how it it all is. i mean he's going this. pretty greedy too we don't often see the midas That's on this hero begins. but he is gonna go for it Adios. a very calm Adios. start for both of these two teams we are talking about an entry to the upper bracket for either of these two teams in this best of three the loser is gonna have to take the way of the uh the, the liquid quote all the way through the lower bracket and forward and this Virtus Pro roster, you know, it is a very, a, a very cherished uh, organization. Also had their moments and had their vibes during these past few years. They are kind of riding off of these new, I wouldn't say youngsters, but of course it is a much younger roster than the previous VP. Squadix, 20 of, 20 of age, Kirtich is 20, Noticed also 21 years old, and then the veterans, you have Sayush at 26 and FNG at 28. So uh, they've got that old experience combined with the rest. Well, Temato has found Sayush for the first time and a first blood going for TSM. That's exactly what they needed there, Tomato. Getting off to a hot start here in the safe lane with the Terror Blade. This is a matchup that you can't really do much as a Spear Breaker. That's why we keep seeing this pop up over and over again. In the early game, majority of your damage is just going to be from right clicking. You're actually just a little bit of a potato, to be honest, the hero. And they're going to go again. I don't know if they have the damage for this, they but they might. can make this one work out. I mean, a couple hits from Tomato might just do the trick him. with the help of the reflection. He slowed up. White Mon dropping low, and Sayush, oh, he can't go through the stick and the fairy fire. So White Mon gets to live a bit longer. Just an extra poke there from the Grim. Just not enough for a kill. But for TSM, that's another score. Tomato, two kills already under two minutes on a TV. That's a great start. Top lane as well at the same time. Kiritich dropping fairly low. Centaur, that is the support Centaur, that is, that is bullying this CK. I'm going to have to see how this lane matchup goes. I really want to keep a close eye on it. For now, it's going really well. They're harassing him. They're getting him low. They're completely free farming on the Omni Knight at this point of the game. So you've definitely got to be happy about that if you are Kasane here. And Ari on the Centaur. See what he's building up here. Just in the Tranquil Boots. See some move speed, realizing that Blink won't really come online. You're not yep. the core either, so you're not, you don't really need to build into like being tanky either. So many questions about the Centaur, but I'll have to just see it played out. Yeah, so I, get I think that's the answers. smartest course of action, right? Because <laughs> it's been a while since Centaur has last been played uh, as a support 
in a pro game. Uh, we've sometimes, you know, we went back in like uh, the Tide Fives, and sometimes we saw the Centaur Fours and Fives. I believe most notoriously, maybe you could bring up Poppy, for example. But it's been a while since he's he's last pulled it off. Ari, uh, the uh, the first and only uh, British TI entrant on road to on the road to the actual international. Uh, Making waves as well with these kind of surprise picks. But then again, it also comes back to, did Moon decide that Centaur support is the way to go? Or was this like, I want to play this? Because they also kind of, but we talked to, to, to TSM at the start of this DPC tour. They kind of, you know, memed around a little oh, bit. they're going to go on Like it was a thing, but they are going to find an opening onto FNG. And it seems like all these ideas that they have, they can make them work in the laning stage at least. And here I was like, yeah, Centaur Omni Knight lane. This lane doesn't sound very good against the AACK <laughs> lane, and they're crushing Surprise. it up here. The there. hopes of NA riding off of the two teams that could still make it to the upper bracket, TSM being one of them, and Nouns also later on. The two hopefuls at their uh, their home audience. Yes, and I kind do. of following the footsteps of Shopify with these international-ish type rosters. No, Ari might get charged though. Tomato went top lane as well. Ari, but all one HP. Kiritich will take this one. Kasane forced away. And also the battle in the bottom lane uh, kind of calms down or cools down at the same time as they tried to go on the Terra Blade, but Tomato gets to keep his life intact. Yeah, and Tomato, interesting enough, he went to our two points in a reflection here, so... Not gonna have that big metamorphosis at level three here, but he's gonna be able to keep spamming reflections over and over again. That does slow attack speed down too, so you can just like trade very efficiently by using the spell in the game. And I don't wanna see how the mid lane was doing here because you oftentimes don't see Shaker picked against ranged heroes. Or maybe they really thought that Omni was gonna go mid and they wanted to try and punish it. And Ryle was like, nah, I'm just gonna play a ranged hero here, going in for that invoker. That's a glove of haste already queued up with a magic wand. I wonder if that's going to be a, an early Midas or not, or if he's just getting that for the laning stage. Maybe he'll just get the treads as well. That would make a lot of got sense. A couple, got a couple Midas thoughts here uh, all over the place. It's a good not item. Ryle, talked about Kasane, talked about Kiritich having the Midas lined up. So maybe we'll just see mass Midas this game, you know, let the gold flow. I mean, most of the games that we have observed, like, they don't end very quickly. And it's very difficult to just go high ground right now, so it makes a lot of sense to just play the economy game. And Midas, what do you know, one of the best items you can do for that. So I am down for Midas purchases on pretty much any hero that can use the attack speed. Yes, that's and the that's key point it. right there. Anyone that can use the actual attack speed, if it's just for the extra gold, it feels, you know, it, it just feels like it feels into a, falls into a pretty weird place. It becomes yeah, a lot of no. We've got a bit of an attempt here with a metamorph pop. Sayush dropped low. Tomato on a killing spree right now. Notice throwing in the bash into the face of the TV. And got White Mon trying to go for here. some body blocks. But 10 seconds for a glimpse and the reflection is slowing him down. It does look like they can close this kill. Just a few more seconds and they could bring him back. But White Mon not going to dive under the tower. They will leave Notice low. Absolute disaster here for Virtus Pro in this bottom lane. The Spirit Breaker is unable to really get much of anything down here. Low on CS has already died one time. And of course, the Grimstroke sitting with two deaths as well, not having oh, very fun. But this top lane continues to be a problem right now. This AA is also having difficulties finding his place in this lane. If you just get walked upon and you're going to just die to these heroes, you got to respect the damage output of this Omni. Uh, Kasani on this Omni Knight, he, he's hitting hard. Yeah, you start to wonder, like, when you're looking at this top lane, is it more about the jitters of the TI debutants? You've got Kasane playing the first time in the road to the international. You have Kiritich playing his first uh, as well. Is it just, you know, a bit of shakiness, a bit of, you know, it's, it's a seeding match, but it's a pretty damn important seeding match because you could be in the top six Mid -lane. if you won that first round in the upper bracket as they are putting some pressure for the six-minute rune. It's going to spawn on the top half, just an illusion. Ari will go there to secure it, so Squadix will not get the bottle refill for himself. A gift from the Nothing else happens out of this. TSM going in mid with three heroes. Because the laning stage has been going so well, they don't worry about it. They're going to see the AA. 
Oh, hey, hey, getting surprised here. They've got a charge coming in from Notice. Defense, Yellow and HP. A couple more hits should do it. They can't get there. Tomato might be the one to drop here. Just a couple more to go. The glimpse coming in. The high ground attacks are enough. And FNG with the Ice Vortex tick out of all things <laughs> kills the TB. And FNG on the move away as Ari in between two. Goes for the stun. Gets Almost gets the kill on FNG as he gets a bit of healing in. Centaur finally finishes the job. Gets stuck with these cold feet. Notice charging onto White Mon. Sayush will drop that ink explosion right on top of Ari for the kill. The Glimpse bringing him closer with a stroke of fate connecting. And this is the first big fight Virtus Pro will capitalize on. But oh, they will bash. be able to get White Mon with the bash. One more hit to go. And he cannot go that deep. And Tomato has already returned back to action. Even that level one stroke oh, of fate. He's going to go for Notice with a charge. And that will be enough. Raindrops or not, Notice has got this one in the bag. How'd they see him? Oh, that ward is planted on the the twin gate there. Gave him vision of them to get that charge off. Maybe if they pay attention to those minor details there, White Mon will be able to get that D ward. But what sure a fight. The what a bloodbath by enough, the twin yeah. gate. <laughs> those are the ones that I think Virtus Pro kind of needs as well when you talk about their, uh, their current draft in this game. They are kind of reliant on heavy brawling at some stage of the game. They gotta get experience for their supports with the help of Spirit Breaker calling all the fights. They don't want to drop too far behind and Karatech, he could use some backup here. They don't have any TPs except for the Shaker, but FNG's here just in time. Will force out Ari and Kasane. Oh, notice Bulls is also driven away from his tier one tower with the Metamorph popped by Tomato. So TSM keeping up the pressure as well. They definitely are. And this has all been pretty much without Bryl, right? He's kind of been very quiet this game, just farming up a storm. Number one in that CS department. So he's having a great game himself, and you expect him to make some rotations at some point, but he's basically just keeping this Shaker staying glued to this mid lane, because he has no mana. Just spamming this EMP over and over again, and now all of a sudden there's no rotations you can make as a Shaker in this game. If you don't have any mana, you don't have any runes, what can you do? And both mid laners do find an entry into this yeah. game. Imagine how more explosive it's going to get than it already is. Oh, they're going to try and Kasana here at half HP, but suddenly as they do that, Centaur shows up out of nowhere. CK already down to half HP. Ari still tanking hits, but gets crit to the face by Kiritich. And Sayush has also TP'd it in. White Mon coming in for the back. Ryle has made his rotation as well. But as said, Shaker can't come to the help, so they're going to have to fight this with just three versus three, and Kiritich will fall. White Mon secures the kill. Ryle's going to be dropping low on HP, but FNG has no way of catching him, and the detection it's on Sayush on the other side of the tier one tower. So they will have to let this invoker go free and everything, you know, all the pieces of the puzzle just kind of clicking in. Shaker can't come to help anybody else. And Bryl has free reign. Very impressive for everybody. Squad X here just almost has a blink dagger already. He's actually winning a net worth against this invoker at the current point in time. He's just farming up. He's realizing he won't be able to make these rotations, but... Are they attempts on Kasane. Kasane! This one seems to be uh, a kill for... Okay, it's the supports picking up the kills. FNG will take this one. Gold is gold, you know? Of course, uh, you'd want these kills on the CK, but it is what it is. You're going for a Midas anyway. He's getting free farm, so I think he's pretty happy regardless. Oh, yeah. Money is still money. And space is space. Space is space, indeed. All right, we got our Blink Dagger online? Yes, sir, we do. Well, let's see what we can do here. Ari stunning up Squadix with the Inkswell on top of him. Tornado onto two. Ryle will be able to get Ari back to safety. And that Invoker really hurts this VP roster and literally just the MVP, the MVP, the EMP. <laughs> well, the EMP is the MVP in a way, as FNG is walking back Hold home. Already, yeah. just 20 mana, and they're going straight for Squad X. White Mon has Glimpse level three. He could just bring him back, and he will do so into the kinetic though. field. A couple more right clicks from Ryle has another urn charge. Fisher thrown in, though, and the silence. He had to pop as one to just barely get enough for Phantom's Embrace to interrupt Ryle. Yeah, I mean, he's going... Oh, he canceled his TP. He had, like, a Fairy Fire and a huge wand, so I don't think they had any chance killing that Shaker, unless they had Static Storm online, but he was, like, two creeps away from having Static Storm available, so unfortunate for him, not available, but it is now, so we're going to smoke up, and they're going to go ahead and try and to kill a Spirit Breaker. Scan connects. Sta Skanka does connect, but they're moving straight towards the lane. They see that it also uh, now shows a green line, so probably some traffic in the bottom lane. 
That is a Radiant Sentry, and also a Dire Place 1 Brawl on the other side, and there we go, the Instant Echo! Into White Mode, dropping the ulti to try and save Brile, but here comes the Counter Initiation, Ice Blast does connect onto a couple, TB will pop the Metamorph as well to start hitting FNG, Squad X, he won't be able to get out instantly as he gets glimpsed back into the fight, TSM already lost two members and noticed, four more seconds for the charge, Tomato wants to close on the gap, Squad X, has to blink away as Tomato throws in a right click and they will salvage this situation. They got the Invoker kill, so successful blink reveal. Definitely successful. That was a really great rotation by Squad there on this Shakery. He's been playing really well this game, I must say. He's been playing really, really well, considering he's in a bit of a tricky situation where you are playing versus Invoker, a very strong laner as he is a universal hero. And, of course, getting your mana burned all the time. Goes for Brown Boots, Blink Dagger. And he gets his revenge right away. Just getting every single rune, too, by the way. And also the like they to go. See what they can do here. The Glimpse takes the Shaker yeah, away for the time being. And that Soulbind will not connect into any follow-up spells, at least. Notice, trying to make a run for it. But the right click seems to be too much for him to deal with. And that gank leads into a lost member of Virtus Pro. Yeah, it wasn't quite close enough, but against the Glimpse, that's pretty much never going to happen. So good positioning there by White on to be able to just interrupt that there as CK now has some Midas, some interesting item choices yep. coming out. CK Midas, not something you see a lot, but it is fine. You use the attack speed, it can be good. But the more interesting item build is going to be Kasane on his Omni Knight. Midas queued up, Shard, bots to Hex, BKB. That is what okay. he's looking at for his item build. I'm going to get all these items this game. <laughs> I talked about him being tanky, going straight for bots too. Midas, not the tankiest build. We'll see if he continues to go for that build. Uh, it's interesting nonetheless, though. He will be tanky soon, TM. Yeah, tanky soon. And talking about the last gank as well, as VP lost the member in that gank, TSM were able to push the bottom T1 tower for some damage, so the trade goes for them, FNG. Gonna get hit by the EMP once again, and Kasane looking to close in the gap with that glimpse again, White Mon. He's been everywhere so far. Eight out of the nine kills he's been a part of. Very high kill participation for him. And these glimpses are exactly the tools in or the tool in this early game to get TSM these kills. And he needs to be part of these as well because they don't really have much else to, for their initiation, as mentioned. You have maybe a tornado. Yep. Ari has to walk in the old school way right now until he gets his blink. He's not even halfway there yet. So you've got to rely heavily on these glimpses. That's where we're seeing him max it out. Oh, Squadix. They're setting Squadix. up for him here. Tornado to set up for the static storm. And he needs Sayus to help him out. Buddy, I'm burning here, but there's nothing they can do. And, the glimpse. and they will even take Sayus into the arms of TSM Ari. Ready for the stun in two seconds. Notice trying to interrupt that ice, that wall. ice wall. That that space cow is like I'm stuck in eternity or some kind of black hole. But oh, it's just ice. Brile with the second kill going for him. And there we go, the guardian angel from Brile and the turnaround for TSM to take even more. They've got three. This looks like a fourth on Notice. He's trying to charge away. He will get out, but Kirit is down. And Notice that is oh, a full on team wipe. TSM. They took the broom and they're scrubbing Virtus Pro with it. Very nice by Tomato to just show up to that team fight as well, realizing his team needs to help because they absolutely need Tomato to show up there, make things happen. That ice wall was so good though. It looked really funny, right? With him just charging through at slow speed, but slowing that charge down allowed them to get that lot of extra damage into there, which helped turn that team fight in the favor of TSM here. And just delayed damage even in a case because he wasn't able to interrupt as he was stuck inside the ice wall and BP losing members slowly but surely. And guess what? Just like that, I was talking about Ari, not even halfway to mm -hmm. blink. One team wipe later, he's got hey. a blink available on the center now. So now you have that type of initiation that is just stable and reliable. Pretty sick net worth for a pause for Centaur 50 minutes in as this game's been going with a glimpse. Bringing in FNG, TSM coming out from multiple directions. All right, no second thoughts, just instant static storm. Notice can't actually can cancel his charge either because he's got silence momentarily there. Noticed, gonna get pummeled by Brile and a couple illusions from the TV. Ari thinking about going in, but it's blinks on cooldown. And there we go, White Mon with the glimpse. Man, White Mon. Oh, he's killing him with this disruptor. He's at a 14 Literally. kill participation right now out of the 16 kills. You're gonna have nightmares all and this after this game. All, all I can say is like all these years of, you know, Mike and John K 
casting White Bond's games in SCA, man, they should be proud right now of what White Bond's becoming. Again, such an impactful uh, POS5 support. Just love watching him play heroes like Disruptor. Yeah, he's definitely a really good player, and his Disruptor is a beast. And it's a very good Disruptor game, too. If you think about what Spearbreaker does as a hero, it's a very hard game for him to play because Bulldoze can get purged by the Tornado. And then Disruptor, he's kind of like the anti-status resistance hero because Kinetic Field doesn't care about status resistance. Glimpse doesn't care about status resistance. Well, neither does Static Storm. So he can just like lock him down when normally that's supposed to be Spirit Breaker's strength. He's not supposed to be able to be locked down. But against Disruptor, he's one of the wow. few that can do it. It's got a surprise FNG here. I, AA taking a, you know, a Sunday stroll inside their own, uh, well, not very, very green jungle, at least on the side of the dire map, but uh, get surprised there by an Invoker walking into him. And VP, they were trying to respond with uh, Squadix and Sayuj both Radiant sitting next to the tier one, the uh, tier two tower. Shaker only now just started building that Aghanims. He had an all right start, right? But their members are dying all over the map and it's really hindering Virtus Pro's capabilities of really fighting TSM back. At this Charge point in the game. In. Okay. What can they do with this? What's a very tough do? target. I mean, he's got his boots of travel online now with the Midas. Kasane is going to really pick up the farm speed. And he's just fast, right? Like with these boots of travel, giving 90 move speed. Well, surprise has noticed. Echo Sun coming up from Squadix and the Static Storm locking up this Shaker. And they are just a couple heroes here. But TSM, they've got more than just a couple. The whole team and is here. One. And the Glimpse. Welcome into the loving arms of TSM. Another I mean, kill for them and a 7k lead built up. Whitemon placed that Observer Ward to get the vision for the Glimpse there, to get that one extra kill there. But even... It's going bottom. It's not over yet. Yeah, it's not they over. They for another more. kill. Hey, sitting at the tree line. VP, they're scared. They're scared right now. Where is that Disruptor? Ari's coming in. That's for the kills. Looks like they want to That's fight on VP. Call. Notice I walking mean, with Gritage. Want some vengeance, right? But... Is it is it foolhardiness? Is it is it courage that they're using here? They've got an AA blast to connect onto Brile. It doesn't really connect with the debuff, but they've got the damage for Keritage for the kill. Ari could blink in and stun if they have the follow-up damage, but it looks like VP are bringing in the numbers this time. Glimpse throwing back. Nice stun to follow up on the Glimpse as well by Ari, but he loses half of his HP. Look at those crits from Keritage. Kasane has to intervene, and there we go. CK, I'm gonna TP out. Bye bye I ain't gonna stay here any longer as Tomatoes also showed up, but he's also losing some HP. Notice charges away. FNG and Sayush are trying to get away from the big evil Glimpse of White Mon. But they will not get caught this time by the Disruptor. So a successful kill on Brile and VP gets away. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what exactly what they need there. And it was pretty scary for Tomato as well. He walked in, his meta just expired, so he couldn't really do the damage that he wanted to do. But at the end, you saw an Ink Swell hit him with a charge out. That took 70% of his health, which is two spells right now. So Tomato after that is probably realizing, yeah, maybe need a little more uh -oh. time to get some more items here. That's a, it's just a dead FNG here. Yeah, but maybe a dead white mon too. Is it enough? He's got uh, just enough HP to survive that uh, AA blast debuff. He, he's fine. Alt alt. He's fine. He's fine. Still want to see if Kasane commits to boots to travel too, because if he does, that just means he wants to be ultra aggressive and just like maybe travel on to Centaur while he's initiating and just be there. I mean, he has ideas of doing it. We'll see if he commits to it. Talk about new innovation uh, drafts as well. We, we, we talked about this yesterday, that we don't really see these surprise, well, maybe with surprise carries or in general cores that we were discussing about, but at least like, it's not like this one hero shows up out of nowhere and just dominates the game in a way, because you don't really have those in this current meta. Like cheese pigs? Radiant yeah, cheese pigs, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the days of cheese and are they've been gone for a long time now. The meta has pretty much been set. The objectives are in play. Speaking of objectives, you gotta do your tormentors for both teams. You gotta do your chores. Oh, I gotta do your chores. You gotta do your tormentors. FNG, he will not die to it, which is good. No tormentor deaths Radiant today, but tormentors attack. supports worst nightmare. Yep. Literally tormentors. They literally are. Name. 
I mean, it's a torment for everyone. Like, carry players don't want to go back and hit him either. They'd rather just <laughs> farm. Yep, lack what of what TPM helping out the supports. In fact, think of it, it is I like a chore. It very much is. Can we can we talk about Invoker Hurricane Pike? No, what do you want to talk about? This uh, item on Invoker Radiant is pretty good because he's a universal hero, right? A lot of stats. You get the force yep. stuff out, get the Dragon Lance. It's going to be more of like a right click type of force here. He's going to be able to keep his range. Speaking of being able to keep their range here, they're going to force uh, a BKB. Yep. Could just zone characters here. Well, you say they see him TPing out. Just a normal toggle with this BKB is going to get out. So uh, I like how he works. just popped BKB. Looked around for a minute, assessed the situation. I was like, ah, okay, I'm out. <laughs> but yeah, like in, in general, always Hurricane Pikes, Dragon Lances have been like the stat items for multiple specific heroes. It's not, maybe it is the meta for Invoker, but it is actually nice to see it in this particular game. The gauge, to be able to Light what you can do here. You got two heroes in the Roche, three heroes in the Roche pit, while the others are fighting in top, and it's Brylon Whitemon, the dynamic duo for TSM, fighting a kill on Sayush. Making them know that uh, not the entire team is in the Roche pit, indeed. And Hurricane Pike is also kind of like a high skill way to deal Spear Breaker too. If he charges in on you and you Hurricane Pike him back, attack. they'll take him out of the charge. So you, that is a way of doing it instead of just going for yep. the Lincolns. That too, that too. It's a pretty good game to have that item. Like, especially when CK has a gap closer with Reality Rift, just push him away. Definitely everything will help here as this map, it's slowed down a little bit for the side of TSM. They're still getting kills and all, but the net worth lead has been higher. Only at 4K right now. I think it was at 6K, close to 7K. Yeah, it was 7K, yeah. yeah. If you look at the graphs, it has been slowly going in VP's favor, even though the lead's still on TSM. Winning the economy game, when maybe these Midas's starting to really pay off here is... Maybe just the speed in which they farm too, because if the game gets slow, if you look, Kasane, he did it. The madman has done it. He's looking at he the inventory. <laughs> this is like the most insane uh, inventory I have seen in a long time. Midas bots too. <laughs> I mean, he's definitely Kasane's... from NA, that's for sure. Oh yeah, that is definitely <laughs> for sure. Like this is some kind of a NA mania that Kasane is kind of representing here with these builds on the off lane. Oh, poor pubs right now. I saw that. I saw this off lane Omni Night guys. Guess what? It's bots to rush with Midas, and I'm gonna win the game with it. We'll Not even looking at anybody else what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> As his net worth isn't like he's had total free farm this game, right? As far as space, but his hero, one of the weaknesses of Omni, doesn't farm fast. If you can compare that to the Spear Breaker, who's kind of had a rough game and all the cords, he's still managing to keep up on the farm as the Omni that has a free game. A little bit of difference in heroes in the farming speed. Really a high reliance on Tado uh, and his Terrorblade this game. Tado, 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 and Brile surprising FNG, FNG again. Death. Yeah. And maybe even more, because Ari is chasing Sayush here. They do throw in the glimpse, and he's yules into the air. Our, this Ari build on Centaur is really enabling them set, set for kills. They've got glimpse, and then he has the yules as well to make sure that they can definitely land hoof stops. So yeah, you're not getting out. You are not getting out. Top lane at the same time. Not. Notice is right next to Brile. He's on the high ground. This time it's 2v1. Is it fair enough for Brile? Is it fair enough for Virtus Pro? Well, they're gonna try, okay. but that stampede, and oh, they do end up finding stuff. the shaker. Ari is here, trying to get away with the jumps, but that is gonna be his demise, burning to the end, and Brile another kill. You know, they see one more hero too. Glimpse hey. in the static storm. And yes, the all over the map, enough? unless Sunstrike is gonna oh. be enough to help them out. Notice barely gets out. Just a couple hundred left on the Spirit Breaker, but it's enough. Yeah, didn't have enough damage quite yet. And of course, Kasane, he's going for that Hex now. So next time that will be a definite kill with the Hex. And the whole map right now, it just belongs to TSM. It feels like they're Notice. able to farm right now. Can they get this oh, one? the Ink Swell is going to be connected. And Ice Blast is also their perfect combo. Kasane is here, though. It's the boss too, baby. Up. Does have Guardian Angel available. They also let him go. They see Tomato. He's frozen in the river. 
Here it just pops this Phantasm, and they're going to target Brile. Brile actually going to get caught with the Silence. Squadix, he's got the Fissure, and he's got them locked down. Here goes the Argonian Angel, but the Echo Slam. That will go straight through. FNG will fall to Ari at the same time. Nota's going to be charging onto Tomato, but Tomato, he's holding his ground, and Keratich is on the run. I need help, boys. Ari thrown into the air with his own Yules, but he will lose his life. Squadix will smack a big totem into his face. And Virtus Pro... You know, there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel as they can get three for one out of this trade-off. Yeah, and I think right now you're starting to see the Spear Breakers start to ramp up. These charges in and out of the fight, they're not able to cancel it. BKB is coming online soon. Actually, it's coming on the Corey right now, and this is the big one. If he can just go in with the Bulldoze, not really care about the Glimpse, not care about being tornadoed, he will be a huge threat here doing tons of damage. This is why this hero's first pick. Once you get to the state of the game where you have a lot of items, this hero does so much damage, pushes out every single lane, and perma stuns you. What more could you ask for? And so that 2k lead now remaining for TSM, despite all this uh, ingenuity with their item builds and how they've been finding pickoffs all over the map, Virtus Pro's team fight power slowly starting to show. because. We haven't really seen Virtus Pro as five since that team wipe happened in the mid lane. It feels like ages ago already at this point, because the game has taken a different course. Ari spotted by FNG. FNG will throw the instant ice blast, prevent the centaur from blinking forward, frozen for the Yules. FNG are gonna get hit by the cold snap as Spiral is coming in. Kassan is deep in. Squad is stuck on a cliff, stuck on a cliff. Where are you gonna go? You've been cliff teasy right now. And it's TSM that's gonna make sure that you're not getting out. And Squad X is just dead. Oh, poor VP. And Otis won't be able to run away either. Hit by the tornado. Pops this BKB. I gotta run, boys. And Sayush, I don't think he's gonna be that lucky as Ari with the Yules. He's gonna chase him down. We've seen this story before. And Kasane is high on his heels with the Somni Knight. Ari with the stun. Glimpse throwing at the Grim Stroke all by himself. And uh, TSM. It, it really just wasn't a proper fight at all for Virtus Pearl. You saw that Spearbreaker uses BKB in that fight. You do have the BKB available for a CK, but CK is not there yet. He has to walk all the way back to base here, so this is going to be a considerable amount of damage to this tower that Tomato is going to put in here. And Lincoln Sphere was the choice by Kasane here, as he does finish that up. He's got the Repel plus Lincoln Sphere combination here. Should be able to bail Tomato out of a lot of trouble. And the of course, thing that I'm boss curious too, about as well, here, he's going to be able the to thing get that I'm curious about your fear. Did you see in that last fight, how did Squadix, Squadix end up cliffed there? I did, did not see. Himself? I think he may have enchant totemed up there and just got stuck. <laughs> Unlucky. You do. Because there's no if there's real a replay of that fight. Yeah, if there is a replay of that fight, I'd like to see what really happened with Squadix because that was a crucial piece for TSM kind of just winning that team fight. They do have some forced movement on their team, but this Aegis, the first one, is going to be going in the arms of TSM. VP can don't, they can't do anything about it. They're just going to harass them. Oh, there you go. The shard on A even delays it a bit further, but yeah, that's definitely going to be an Aegis going into the arms of Tomato. I feel like it's going to get to the point of the game where he's going to want to start frontlining for the team. Kasane, he definitely does not have a build that screams, I want to be in the front. He wants to be as far back as possible getting his spells off, and we're going to get that replay just now to see what happens here. We're going to see Kasane come in for that boss two here right onto Bryl. He's here, and Ooh. then he just blinks to the high ground there oh. on the Shaker. It's just a blink. But he... Unfortunately, just the way the map is right there, he thought he probably blinked behind that cliff there, but just blinked on top of it into the loving arms of a Static Storm by White Mon there. Really unfortunate. I don't know if it would have changed too much there. It's not like him going on that Centaur would have yielded too much. Potentially, would have killed the Centaur, but you're definitely dying after that. Well, that was not the outcome that it was definitely waiting for out of that team fight. Just cliffing himself with a blink. A uh, small, tiny miscalculation coming out from Squad X. But uh, at least they're still in the game, and they're also smoking themselves up. They have a good high ground position, but you are fighting against an Aegis if you end up doing so. And the Radiant Scan, it's on point. BP also realizing that probably we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't fight this one. TSM on the hunt for a potential pickoff, though. They've got all they need for the catch. White Bon, Ari, Bryle. These are the ones to find pickoffs with Ari. Smoke yeah, no broken. Shaker. Gets caught here. They actually will be able to blow up the Centaur with ease, but Kyrgyz, he popped this BKB so early. White Notice with a beautiful charge in, though, but he's losing all the target. They can't see anything. They're just going away with their Glimmer Capes and their Ghost Walks. 
Yeah, detection is probably going to be necessary for Spirit Breaker to pick up as, yep, he's like, sorry guys, dust coming out in Courier now. I guess I'll put this race band in the backpack. We've talked about cores carrying dust. You know, it is it is the you know the team MVP when your twos and threes are carrying dust as well into the team fight. And notice, yep, he's got two of them in his inventory now. Doesn't want to let that happen again. I mean, I think VP's being incredibly greedy, to be honest, with you, on their supports, because like it's very difficult to have space for dust, which makes this item really powerful. Like Bryle hasn't had to buy any dust. Not necessarily, I mean, he does have some, but he doesn't really need it. I don't even know why he has dust, because there's no Glimmer Cape. Oh, there's a Shadow Blade on the CK. But Seiyu did not buy the Glimmer Cape. He's going for the Ags Rush. F and G of all items went for a Rod of Atos, Mana Boots. So he also just dies instantly to Brile, right? Because he can't just, like, get away with him with a Force Staff or some Glimmer Cape. A bit of greedy itemization here from Virtus Pro on the supports. If we look at some of these items up here, we've got a multitude of Midas's. I've seen more, but that at least has been a big impactor in this game, increasing some of the farm for at least a, a couple of these heroes, keeping at least Virtus Pro's two cores in the top three. Omni Knight, also a hero that kind of needs that extra Midas to uh, keep up in item progress. You know, <laughs> it's a travel to Panda Midas has Lincolns. I'm yeah, sorry, he is just sheep chilling this game, honestly, on Kasane. He realizes his job is mainly just to keep Tomato alive with the GA. GA is supposed to be the counter to the CK ultimate, right? CK at some point might want to consider a nullifier, but nullifier... Uh oh they see, see bro. Oh, the echo. Oh, that's a big one. Jumping Obviously straight on top of Brawl with the echo slam. Kasane coming in with the boots of travel too. Notice actually hitting the centaur on the way there, but Brawl gonna be safe for the Guardian Angel and Tamato. He's ready for the action. BKB's already popped on the side of BP, and they gotta make this count. They really need to kill him one. But Brawl, but wait, on the static storm's place down. Care Chase is gonna be stuck inside of it. They've already lost a couple of heroes on the side of BP, but they're forcing the rest Tomato's of them away. TSM, they might be, might just be able to clean out the entire team. Squadix is trying to run. Has his blink available? It's gonna be able to dodge that. Bl blood grenade as well, so he can blink right after the enchant totem. So it's not VP losing four or five, it's just the CK and the AA. They did get Ryle and also forced out the Metamorph and a right. couple ultimates, but TSM still, they're they finding it a spot where they can straight up push to the high ground. They got Ags on the Grimstroke right now, so they can make a copy of Tomato here if they want to go. I think they probably should. Here it is. And they're gonna try it. Inkswall coming in with the charge of the Ice Blast coming in as well. Tomato is gonna get stunned, but the Sunder comes out just in time and he dodges the Ice Blast too. Not gonna get hit by it at all. Squadix is already down. Kasane tanking the front line, but he will lose his life. So you will claim that kill. Tomato still has the Aegis for 35 seconds and he's on the run. Notice on the chase as well with this Inkswall. Has his BKB. Gonna make sure that he can catch this TV, but they need some backup here. Yes, he will finish him off for the first time. And now realizing that he only has the supports on his high ground, I guess it's a smart idea to just let them stay behind, not lose too many heroes, trying to ult on Tomato, but just getting yules by Ari. The charge coming into the camp instead of the hero. Ari blinks away. White Mon getting he caught by this one. FNT is right there. Six more seconds for the Ice Blast. Stampede coming out as well. Notice very low on HP right now, but still continuing with the fight. Disruptor low on HP. Ari down to half as well. Tomato's running away. Ari, he's the last one here remaining as White Mon is already down. But the Ice Blast the is ice following blast Tomato. Vision. It's getting vision for Notice. Notice coming with the charge. They do get the ulti to connect, but Bryla's also here. So what does VP decide to do? Do they continue with the chase because they're hungry for kills right now? Nanta to also also avoid getting hit by the nether strike and Ryle invis away with ghost walk so that fight that is finally done notice is an absolute beast on this spear breaker man he has zero fear just charging in running in his aggression right there and presence of mind to keep running into these fights got them those three kills that they otherwise probably would not have gotten so these fights do get scarier if this game goes on because grimstroke we did see that dark portrait being used on the terror blade all that net worth will be used against you especially if you have the means to chain stun heroes and boy oh boy they got a lot of stuns on their team here with a spear breaker they got the earth shaker and even the chaos knight if they can manage to lock down tomato with this dark portrait hitting him he will die as there is no Aegis on him anymore. That's something that I've, you know, we've talked a lot about during this entire year, DPC games with Grim Strokes and their Aghanims. When is it an impactful game for it? When it feels like, is it really going to do much much of a change? You finally finish it when you're, in a, when you're playing from behind. 
But this game is not like VP's like tens of thousands of gold behind an economy and just getting super out level. They actually have more experience than TSM thanks to these couple fights that they've won lately. You can see they're just, you know, the graphs are sliding in their favor, but is the game going to slide in their favor? That's a bit of a difference maker. I'm definitely a little worried if I'm TSM right now compared to like the position they were in earlier on in the game. Spirit Breaker is hitting critical mass. This hero like cannot be underestimated in the late game. It might be the strongest late game hero in Dota as far as I'm concerned right now from what I've seen. So he's ramping up. CK is going to always be CK, pretty stable overall. This dark portrait is just never going to make Tomato feel good. He's going to always want to find a way to get rid of this illusion as soon as he possibly can. And then, of course, the questions of like the Omni Knight. How much is this hero going to scale into the late game? The Centaur, he's just a glorified blink stun at the moment. And they see Brawl. No, they, uh, they actually got the gem, but they finally spot him. But do they get the catch? Yes, they do. They're another strikes there. And the Static Storm also plays down. The Guardian Angels for some very early notice, popping the refresher for another charge. Ice Blast will connect into the middle. Omni not going to be hit. The Echo Stam as well. And they do take down Ari. It will take down Kasane. Tomato, he's running out of firepower in the front line, so he has to deal the damage. But he's getting stunned up on the spot with the frozen cold feet right now. And Virtus Pro, yet to lose a member, forcing up the buyback off of Ari. That was really good. So far, still. Refresher was the choice for the Spear Breaker with the double charge in there, double another strike, double BKB. And he's going, going in back again. in. He's not done. Charge onto Tomato. Another strike is ready. 700 HP to go through. A couple more hits. They've got Tomato. They've got Tomato. And Ari also being controlled. Silenced at the time. CK Ari bringing him no in, but is disarmed. And Ari just died back on the Centaur. And VP. They've got a ticket right now to, to claim this game back in their favor, or at least be the ones in the lead. TSM, you said you were a bit worried about them right now, and it is definitely worrying for TSM. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about right now. It's just the amount of stuns you have to be able to let this Dark Portrait do damage into the fights here. Even though that wasn't the most impactful Dark Portrait, it's mainly just a Spear Breaker, man. He's going in and out over and over again, creating the openings, allowing that Ice Blast to hit. You get a big Echo Slam on top of the Omni Knight there in that fight as well. It's tough. It's definitely tough. And they're going to lose a lane of Rax on top of that. This TB is not going to be buying back just quite yet. 20 seconds for him to return back into action. The rest of TSM just gonna have to, you know, play calm, accept their defeat for the mid lane at Rax. And Virtus Pro almost 10k ahead now. And these graphs have been slowly going in their favor, but now it's a big landslide right now. And VP are, they're in a very good shape as they warmed up to this game because, you know, the first 20 minutes, you could have said by the base of this game that they don't seem like to be too much of a match for TSM. Things have changed. They definitely have, and maybe you have to go back to itemization a little bit on, like, to say, Kasane's Omni Knight. Has this item build really paid off for them? The boots of travel playing around the map? I'm comparing him to Notice right now, and it's like, it's a day and night difference on what these heroes are able to achieve on the map right now. You're just mm -hmm. a glorified repel slash GA right now, and that's about it. You're a support. The damage isn't coming from your hero. You can't necessarily frontline very well either. And then your mid laner is an Evoker who, he's doing decent damage, but it's not enough. So you're putting all the eggs and Tomato here, being able to do the damage. And unfortunately, this basket of Tomatoes here, it, it's, it's falling apart. All the eggs are breaking here. He doesn't have the damage. Also, the fact that, uh, you know, Nomad and Teagov in the last series, they were talking about the sixth player. Well, VP with Saiyushin, Gripstrokes, Axe, and the Dark Portrait that pierces BKB these days. It didn't used to back in the day, but at least now it does. It does bring them that sixth player, which is, you know, uh, Tomato. The, uh, the, the VP Tomato. VP Tomato is the scariest Tomato, as he does extra damage as well with the Dark Portrait. He does more damage than Tomato Zero does. 150% damage, by the way. Yep. And when you are a hero that's high agility and you build all stat items, look at Tomato's items. He is built Butterfly, Manta, Hurricane Plague, Scotty. These are all stat items. The only thing you can't steal is plus damage. And Tomato's only got plus 48 of that. The rest of that's 250 of base damage. Skirtich is going to already push onto the high ground. TSM. They're going to have to ponder their options. 
Gonna have to come back to the base as they don't get themselves into the high ground of uh, VP's bottom lane. Here it's already done with the tier 3 tower. TSM haven't smoked up yet. Trying to look for an angle of engagement. Tomato has a DD rune, so that could work. Maybe that is stronger than the VP Tomato having a DD Tomato. TSM. <laughs> no VP Tomato, but DD TSM Tomato is stronger. <laughs> <laughs> for the time being, at least, but for how long? TSM smoking up on four. Tomato already pushing up the wave. VP, they're backing out. They also have noticed on the other side of the map defending that push. Taking away the outpost, have some oh, vision. They're smoked up. They want to go on something here, but... Oh, we're, we're back to the old days. We're camping high ground in vision and wards. Nice. They found Bryle. Nice blink out, but the Echo stuff doesn't really connect either. Neither does the Static Storm as he's popped his BKB. And notice that's a very early pop for him as well. Doesn't catch anyone with the charge. And he's going to end up getting stuck in the trees while here. Ari is fighting against the rest of the CK illusions and getting pummeled to death. And Ari will be gone for 60 seconds. VP looking for another opener here. Notice in the front with the Ink Swell, but the charge is still on five second cooldown. Does get the Nether Strike. White Mod all the way to the low ground. Four staff safe quickly to get back to safety. But the Fisher from the charge as well. And White Mod's about to drop with this Disruptor. Low one P. Meanwhile, the model, the Guardian Angel will come out, but he's also going to get hit by the Soul Fight. Heritage going to be in the front line with the CK, and they're fighting for basically just to the death as Tomato has to run away, realizing that maybe I can't beat this CK by myself. And Bryle has finished off notice with a deep dive, dropping the gem onto the ground. And Virtus Pro on the retreat, but Bryle's not going to let them get out. Squadix got to get hit by the Cold Snap. Vessel oh, combo, and Kasane is here, oh. and Bryle <laughs> will get the kill. His corpse just went flying to the high ground. He's like, I'd rather die up, up on the cliff I'll here. Die up here. <laughs> I thought he might potentially cheese and try to get out of that, but eh, with the vessel, it wouldn't have healed very much, and he probably still would have died. So talk about stopping at the top. Yeah, quitting while you're ahead. But that fight in particular, Tomato was able to do lots of damage, and I'm not seeing where this dark portrait's going. It feels like either Tomato is eliminating it right away, which he should be, or it's getting blocked by these multiple Lincolns. They got triple Lincolns right now on TSM. All you're seeing is just Lincoln pop, Lincoln pop, Lincoln pop. It's hard to keep track of what spells are actually cracking these Lincolns open. We'll have to see, but they definitely do have to pop this Lincolns multiple times, potentially. Oh, Ari's I mean, They're going to go aggressive with the Stampede. FNG misses his ult, but Ari's going to lose his life here. Sunstrike is also on top of Kirtis. Kirtis slowly losing the fight, but has the Aegis. Oh, there's a dark Tomato portrait. The one right one. now. Still has the BKB as well. That is not a Metamorph illusion, but it is something. And it will buff up them with the extra damage. Tomato is on the run. He's going to move away from the high ground. FNG dropping the, the jam voice line, which is kind of a, you know, you're not, you're not coming on our high ground for free. Definitely not. And Ari, I think that was a little bit of impatience on his end there. He is a first time TI attendee, right? These are plays that you got to be careful to make. Jumping past the tier one tower. Didn't really blink on anyone at all there. Just kind of got stuck there and uh -oh, ended up uh -oh. dying. <sighs> Punish his team a little bit for it. Not sure if you saw the tormentor there, but Keratich was down to 40 HP with that armlet toggle as he did the last hit on the How tormentor, almost, almost popping his Aegis. Despite, might as well, you know, Aegis is running out. Doesn't look like they're going to get uh, an actual benefit for a quick fight inside these next 10 seconds. They're all over the place. TSM in one spot of the map, so Aegis will be reclaimed. It's hard to believe they actually had an Aegis throughout this entire <laughs> engagement here, but... Yep. That's going to be gone now. We're going to move those boots back into the inventory here. And they decide, oh, Aegis is gone. Let's go fight. <laughs> so they're going to smoke up instantly, even though they have lost their own Aegis. And this game has turned a little bit into some of the old patches are just camping some high ground vision here, as we have entered the late game now. Scans on top. Oh, exactly where TSM are right now. VP closing and they get White Mon in the front line. Echo does connect on Tomato and White Mon. White Mon's gonna be gone. And there we have it. The TB control for the time being. Ice Blast connects as well. Can they get a couple more hits? And notice Pops is BKB. He just needs vision, but there's no vision to be notice given. Refresh. Here it's itch. Forced out as well. Yeah, he popped Refresher for that, for that second BKB. So that won't be available for them in this fight. Good job keeping Tomato alive. I think right now this all is... coming back in. Okay. FNG gonna get hit by the sun, strike down to 700. They wanted to that really bad. And they'll go for it. They got it. 
I like how TSM likes these quick snipe attempts, you know? Like, let's, let's just try and throw a couple of quick burst spells and see if we can still back out. But not enough to kill an AA. I mean, AA is not exactly squishy anymore with 2k HP. Yeah, he's got some defensive capability now, too. He's picked up the Force Staff and the Ghost Scepter, so he can get out of trouble a bit more than he used to. And level 25 coming online after this creep, maybe? Ah, uh, no, a couple more creeps here for the Chaos Knight. Yep, that'd be the first one. And then we'll see what choice he goes for, either Chaos Strike Chance or Phantasm Duration. I think both choices are pretty good. If your illusions can stay alive, I think you go for it, and he will go Longer for it. illusions it is, by the looks of it. Uh, TB illusion kind of catching uh, VP maybe a bit. Uh, well, they're you know, weaker illusions, they just last longer. The other choice would actually make yeah. illusions do more damage because you're critting more. Yeah. But this is the uh, right, long term Phantasm. more damage, I guess. 40 seconds. Phantasms now into the base. Brile and White Mon using the Defender Gate. Going to go on the side. There is the Tormentor that noticed he's going to go for the quick D ward. Just the range racks lost in the top lane. One Lincoln's pop. Do they have another? Ice Blast will not connect. And the Stampede also used just in case. FNG still pretty low on HP. Has not really regenerated at all during this time? He's just standing his spot, standing his ground, this is throwing in more vortex, wave. more vision. Cardies are doing the work. Doing the heavy lifting right now for VP. Here it's Ari going over the blink stun. Does get hit by noticed. And Tor now yules up into the air. Tomato can't find an angle to hit them and can't even pop his metaphor right now. And again. Ari's gone. All buybacks are up for both teams, though. Uh, they don't seem to be on the same page. I mean, every time Ari goes in, it feels like they're just not committing. And he's just, like I mentioned before, he's like a glorified blink stun at this point, right? You just blink and you stun, and that's all you got. And they're just going to take this Rax with illusions. A very low committal. And what's going to stop them from doing that again? Maybe they want Roche. That'll be the only thing to stop them here, but yeah. your options as TSM. They're dwindling here. It's really got to be Tomato. He's got to do all the damage for the team. They're doing a good job keeping him alive, but the only issue we have right now is Tomato can't hit anyone freely because they're not getting stunned. White one, he has not gone for the Aghanims, so there's plenty of options for them to get out of the Static Storm at this point of the game. And of course, Ari, he's that one stun. A lot of pressure on him to make something happen with these hoof stomps, but it's very difficult. He doesn't have a BKB. Once he's in, he's in, and of course, he can get stunned very easily during the process of blinking in. Like, he blinks in, right? Instant Orchid from the CK, and well, well, that's done. You don't have a BKB. So he's having a difficult time finding these initiations here. And also, I think an interesting hero this game that could, you know, look very scary in the late game is usually like Refresher Invokers, but Ryle, he's decided to build a Daedalus on the Invokers. So that is you know, it's something different for sure. But TSM, throughout this entire road to the International, they've, they've been drafting differently, they've been itemizing differently, and they still believe it's going to work. BP, they're in around the area. They've got wards already inside the jungle, but TSM, in front of the Roche Pit, 50 seconds. Squad X is close. That's too long when Closing you're missing in the two gas. sides. Ice they got the vision. They see Ari. Ari's going to get stunned up by the Fissure, but Kiritich just going for the Watcher instead of any other heroes. Phantasm quickly popped up as well. TSM still not faced by that. They could have really go that deep onto Ari. Afraid of this invoker just tornadoing the whole squad. Yamato scouting up with information. Kiritich is just cleaning out more and more of these illusions, bringing in more of his. And this Chaos Bolt Shard. Waves are pushing in. All these creeps are inside in. TSM's base. The creeps are inside TSM's yeah, base right now, so more. you gotta do something. And this is what BP's happy with. Stampede's gonna be popped as all recharges in Fissure on two. There go on two by Squadix. Disrupt is gonna be low on HP. Can't get this uh, Static Storm off at all. Notice is low on HP too. He's gonna have to move himself over with the Wind Waker. But Waymon is down. Tomato's popped his BKB. And Kasane and Brawl, they're gonna be chasing onto Notice. FNG is also on the run. Kiritish down to half HP. Notice gonna be found. He's gonna charge away. And Invoker's been found as well with the stuff from Kiritish. Kiritish takes him down. Looks for Kasane as well. The Omni Knight down for the double kill for this one. And Tomato is down too. They're forcing out buybacks off of TSM and Ari. He's all by himself right now. I wish I had friends, but all your friends are dead. As Virtus Pro clean house and force out a lot of buybacks off of TSM. It could just go down to one more team fight fear. It definitely can. And when you have no buybacks available here, you have no meta. Roshan just spawns. And I think TSM, they're looking at, they're thinking, they're actually going to get Kirtage here. Oh no, not that as well. The CK, did they maybe extend themselves a bit too much? TSM. 
What a play. freebie. Out of the pockets of Avertis Pro. It's, you know, balls are being dropped all over the court. Both teams. I mean, you just have to have balls to steal there, honestly, to make that play. If you are TSM, that's playing to win right that's there. That's his buyback. Sure. That's yeah, his buyback buy as well for this too. one. The plot thickens Goodness here. gracious. And TSM got the jump as well. A VP. Sayush is going to be the one to drop first. Notice has to run away on the Spirit Breaker. And Sayush just forced this buyback. And they're so scattered right now. Squadix, no echo, no nothing for another 15 seconds at least as he's walking away, jumping around. Sunstrike for Vision won't find anyone in the area. What's even happening BP, right now? They've scattered all <laughs> over the place. Creeps again inside TSM's face. Look at base, but... He's behind enemy lines now, too. Uh, okay. I mean, this is a blessing for TSM. Getting that kill, getting the multiple buybacks. By the way, there was no meta for during any of this. That too. So now meta's going to be back up for the next fight. It might be 22k gold lead for VP, but one moment in this game from either side can decide it instantly. Yeah, if we want to talk money, that's almost a 10k swing. <laughs> Just a couple buybacks and a couple deaths. Sprawls inside the base to cover the creeps pushing. Roshan has an Aghanim Scepter that uh, both teams are kind of curious about. No one would like to pick that one up, especially Notice, who's played such a great Spirit Breaker game. If he gets an Axe for himself. He already has an Axe in his backpack. <laughs> oh, he actually, actually, actually does have an Axe in his backpack. Never mind. He just wants to, he just needs detection. He realized how much he needs detection that he has to hold the gem for now. And he's has dreams of getting the recipe of Agnum's blessing. But it's just gonna be another Roshan stalemate here, which so far has been favoring VP. Because they do have the advantage of having top and mid lane of barracks exposed here, as the creeps will come marching in very shortly here. And player number six. The TB of VP, the charge onto Ari. Beautiful connection from Notice. Ice Blast will connect on Tomato. He's gonna have to reset for a little bit longer. Ari is moving away. Ryle sniping FNG on the side at the same time. That's gonna be one hero that's not gonna be returning. Echo Slap followed by Squadix onto Tomato. And White Moss gonna be low on HP with the Guardian News. Go keep him alive. Kasane chasing Sayush at the same time as White Moss being pummeled by Squadix. But Ryle is here. They're taking 1v1s all over the place. But they will take down the Shaker. He's got a buyback. Ari being chased by Notice. That's the same as Kira. Is fighting versus Kasane. They're kiting them. TSM, but they are also losing members. They've lost two. That cannot return back off to the field. They're losing force right now, too, by the way. Looks like they are the ones that uh, emerge victorious out of this fight. Despite Squadix having to buy back, but Roche is up. They're going to go for it. All right. You know there's no buyback on Tomato. Well... This is a Ace. different NA versus East Europe game compared to the last series. Definitely. All right, they're going to do a safe play. Maybe they have time for both, but I don't think they have time for both. They chose to get Roche over trying to end the game with two cores being dead. They could have bought back the A and maybe went for it, but this is TI. They're going to play it safe. Hopefully it doesn't come back to bite him in the ass later when the heroes are respawning, but they still have a window here. It is 40 seconds. For the Terror Blade, more importantly, the Omni Knight as well as has a longer timer. And it looks like they're just going to play it super safe here and try to get these Mega Creeps. Also a big benefit coming out of the Ags on CK with that Phantasm on the entire global team. Very nice to have. Bit of extra chaos versus TSM. But can they hold? Can they hold this base alive a little bit longer? There's the Phantasm. Illusions from, you know, all over the world are going into TSM space. And Mega Creeps looming in the horizon. Range Rack's gone and the final melee and the Ancient exposed. Can TSM hold four versus five? It's a difficult task, but it's a one that they're gonna have to face as that Ancient is already down to half HP. Ari stunning up here, just the CKs right there, but they're focusing full on. Notice is buying the space on the time. Static Storm, Echo onto the back line, and a beautiful catch from Kiritish as well. Again. And TSM is out from game one. Virtus Pro, they claim game number one. And a very unexpected fashion as well this game was like all tsm at the beginning of the game but 
the resilience from Virtus Pro to be able to just hold the game for as long as they possibly did, get the team fights, wait for that Grimstroke Ags, and once they got that Grimstroke Ags, that game actually took a turn all the way in the favor of VP. Slowly but surely, the turtle wins the race by the looks of it, as uh, VP halfway into the game kind of found their uh, their openings. We saw them getting team wiped at 15-ish minutes uh, on their own side of the map. TSM controlling the map. We see interesting item builds coming up. Virtus Pro suddenly finding a couple of victorious fights and the scaling playing in their favor, but it also did come through some very heavy individual effort, man. I'm, I'm just looking at this Spirit Breaker that notice played out. But, I mean, maybe just ask the panel what they thought. Nat T and the gang, take it over. What a phenomenal showing from Virtus Pro there. They had their backs against the wall, but they were able to come back in game one for this best of three. So let's break it down and have a chat because we thought that Tomato's Terrorblade, he was being active. He was pushing uh, up against the tier twos. They were looking at going high ground as well. And I thought that this game was very clearly going to go in the way of TSM's favor, especially with Spirit Break and having a bit of a, a rough one for them. It's, it seems to be the story of just hold on with Spirit Breaker. He's it, the new late game carry winter. I don't know what it is. This hero just gets out of control once you get some items and levels. Same for the Grimstroke. That's two games in a row where the Dark Portrait suddenly comes out and like swings the tide of the games as well. Um, but yeah, it really felt like TSM. To me, the biggest issue for them was like this Omni Knight who was in the offlane took a lot of farm and right. wasn't able to like contribute in a way that maybe a core hero should. Yeah, his uh, build was something we were questioning. We also cool question marks, you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, well you can talk about it, Wendell. <laughs> let's talk. About, let's talk about his item inventory and maybe why this Omni offlane didn't have the impact a lot of other offlane Omnis have so far at the road to TI. I mean, one word scaling. Like VP just has better scaling with their heroes late game, like the, with the A, with the Grimstroke, the the Spirit Breaker especially. And whenever they had an advantage early game with the Terra bit. You got a lot of kills, right, with the team. They, they were hit by so many kills, but the kills didn't really matter because they didn't get a, a Midas on Invoker. I felt like Brow should have gotten a Midas because he needed to actually skill. Like, he had to foresee that they couldn't really end the game, even though Timano was so huge, the game. And they gave a lot of gold. Like, you guys were just talking about yeah. how Kasane built. Like, he, he had a very peculiar item build. Midas into level 2 boots of travel. Like, even then, after that, then he built, like, Lincolns and BKB, which I feel like it's... It's definitely not right for the game because he, no matter what he builds, he's not going to be able to front line. You're building BKB because you need to front line and mm -hmm. do damage. Right? But that game, I felt like his job is actually to stay behind the TB. Uh, you, you just need to protect him in the team fight. And I don't know. Uh, the Lincolns was fine, but BKB was a little bit too much. Yeah, and that became his job, but I feel like that's also a problem in itself because you've given this hero like 25k of net worth uh, and all he's doing is trying to sit behind your, your cores and keep them alive. But then there's an AA on the other yeah. side. So it's like he couldn't even fulfill his job, which was already maybe like too small of a job for how much farm priority you get. Because I always feel yeah. like you're, you're, there's this balance where the more farm you get, the more you're meant to impact the game, you know? Um, yeah. And if the, the impact just having on the game was more like a no, support no, That's true. They gave money to the wrong hero. They needed yeah, to it, give money to the hero that can Brown. change the game, which is Brow. Because he's an invoker. Like yeah. he's the one that has a lot of power. His spells work so well against the Spirit Breaker, you know? And Omni Knight, even you, your farm, what are you going to do when the Spirit Breaker is charging over? You, you can't do anything. So a mix of a little bit too much farm, uh, maybe on Kasane on the Omni Knight in the off lane yeah. there. He did uh, end up with 24k for himself. Itemization maybe a little bit off as well. I do even remember seeing briefly Bryle on that Invoker doing a lot of damage to Chaos Knight. Obviously could not 1v1, couldn't stand up there against himself, but he had a good show in Virtus Pro though coming out on top. That Chaos Knight, Kiritich, 16 and 4. Great stats for himself. The Earthshaker as well. Uh, a couple of missed ults, but ultimately a really good showing. And then I want to circle back to what Fear was talking about too, because when they got that Ags on the Grimstroke, that felt like a really big turning point. Do you think that was the main one? Or maybe there was something a little bit more in that Spirit Breaker too? Definitely, I mean, the game was starting to already look pretty good for them, but it, it's one of those things where it's such a power spike for, like a late game power spike, even though it is a support hero, because all of a sudden you just get like this extra hero in team fights that yeah. your other team, you just like put it on a, or it doesn't even have to go on a support, like put it on anyone other than maybe Tomato's TB and they've, they just got to run away. They're just melting to it. I mean, so. it kind of sealed the game for them. That's why yeah. you could see that they were paying so much emphasis on putting the Lincolns on Tomato, making sure that he doesn't get uh, the Dark Portrait uh -huh. on him. So, I mean, it was hard, you know, when you get to that stage. 
I, I feel like uh, what I would do this game if I'm the Omni is I would actually try to play less greedy. Maybe in the early game you could try to build like drums or solar crest and you support the TB because Team Mother has such a good game, you know. Maybe if you build more aura mm. items, you could have actually pressed and pressured the map more and just let the invoker get the Midas and yep. keep scaling, you know. Some drums and like even pipe like against the Shaker yeah. plus AA like and yeah. suddenly because they were like pushing high ground almost at yeah. various points. I imagine, yeah. imagine if he had a drums pipe at that point when Timano was yeah. so strong. Maybe he didn't die that fight and they were able to push high ground. Yeah. Couple of misplays for them, but ultimately you really did still like the draft. You thought both teams were able to draft quite well for themselves, and it just came down to that itemization and execution. So, moving forward, do you want to look at maybe taking out some of these heroes? This Chaos Knight is getting picked up a lot. The Spirit Breaker we highlighted too, or anything that you want to fall back on where TSM have found success in the past that you want them to really focus and try and getting their hands on. I'm I'm pretty okay with most of what like I mean like you say draft wise I don't think was necessarily the issue even like the way it played out we had a great game of Dota like that was a game that either team could have won at various points maybe with different decisions they made so I don't think they have to shake things up entirely um, I think you can definitely target some of those bands like I think the idea of taking away the spirit breaker that hero just looks so dominant particularly once you get past the mid game um, you know the hero struggles in lane but then it seems to just get away with so much in the late game yeah I mean I feel like uh, even though the hero is strong. I think that it's not necessary you have to ban it, but maybe you have uh, better supports that can deal with it. Like, Shadow Demon comes to mind. I know the hero has a terrible win rate right now, but he's like... A Wait, maybe they're not picking it at right moments, like yeah. the Spirit Breaker. <laughs> yeah, because Spirit Breaker can do nothing against uh, Shadow Demon Purge, so maybe that could be a solution against the Spirit Breaker. If you feel like you could you could not use your bans to deal with the SV, then you can use maybe one of the picks to deal with him. Yeah. What, what else sort of eliminates just how strong Spirit Breaker is late game and in team fights? You said that Shadow Demon... Just anything that tries to yeah. remove him? I mean, or just do what they did, you know, just try to group up early. Because if the game doesn't go long, then... Oh, you just think end early? Yeah, just end yeah. the game early. I feel like they had the draft to do it with the Omni Knight. Just the items were not really on point, which mm -hmm. didn't really allow the Terabit to hit his timing. Yeah. Is that a similar way to be able to shut down a Chaos Knight as well? Because when we looked at those stats, the KDA, Chaos Knight was also able to come back uh, pretty farmed up in this game too. Yeah, I don't think Chaos Knight's some hero that's just easily countered. Um, it's kind of good at all phases. We're seeing the scaling potential as well. I, you know, they had the game earlier with Shopify where the hero does fall off a bit in the late game compared to the other carries, but it's not like a fall off where, oh, if it goes late game, you've lost. You have to win before 30 minutes. So um, the hero is very strong lane great in the mid game if you're making those rotations um, and just pairs well with so many different supports. I mean, you have the CKA combo. It's great with the Grimstroke. Um, I don't think you can necessarily counter the CK. It's just one of those heroes that you're going to have to maybe deal with. Or, I mean, you can ban it, but I don't necessarily think it's strong enough that you have to ban it. Okay. Uh, the other thing on that TSM lineup that happened throughout the game was we highlighted our issues with the Omni offlane. It did also see Centaur in a position that a lot of people probably wouldn't have expected. Did you like it? Did you think that that ultimate is valuable enough to have it in the game as a support? They kind of got away with it. I felt like <laughs> the laning went a little too good for <laughs> Omni Knight plus Centaur against CKA. I think the CK and AA lane kind of, they got bullied too much at the first couple of waves of creeps when I feel like the AA maybe should have just focused on pulling creeps because I think he underestimated how strong the Omni and uh, Centaur was and he, he died twice. I think it was twice in the lane and it kind of snowballed the lane for the Omni and the Omni was like bullying the CK all the way. If they got past the first two levels, like say the AA was able to pull, like he just tries to pull the wave, get his level two, their heroes are going to be uh, stronger than them when they get to that phase. But unfortunately, he, he fed like once or twice and then the lane became really difficult for the CK. Mm -hmm. How much of a trap do you feel players fall into that when you get a couple kills in lane, when your laning phase does go so well, you're like, oh, I can continue going greedy? Mm, it depends on the team's vision. Though. I feel like TSM as a team, they have a very different vision compared to the other teams. I feel like they see the game in a very unique way. Not necessarily a bad way, but they just have their own vision on how the game should play out. And the heroes have different power spikes if they go for different items. So maybe sometimes... Uh, a little bit too much, you know, they're, they're trying to do too much, trying to think of uh, two different ideas to play the game when maybe they could have just kept everything simple, go for uh, normal items and just play the game. Because I feel like Centaur buying, uh, going post for might still be alright. He went bling, you just play the initiating role, your Omni just builds the team items and they just play together, you know, everything could have just worked out. It was very mid-game centric. Like they weren't trying to go for this like late game TB to carry the game. We yep. saw Brial join all these fights early on. Like we were really impressed by how active and involved he was. Um, and then, you know, as a result, they're winning these fights. They got the fast center mm -hmm. blink. So um, it almost felt like TSM went all in on this mid-game. And then once they couldn't 
close the game at that point suddenly the game kept dragging and it was like oh our invoker doesn't have midas our omni knights you know isn't really itemizing and that, maybe that's where the omni itemization if it was more drums pipe these are, the, these are the things that could ruin a team's uh, momentum yeah. in the game because sometimes you lose the game you feel like you're doing the right thing right but then you lose the game so then you second guess yourself then yeah, the next game you're supposed to play uh, like you mentioned Timado, he's doing the right moves he's coming to the fights and then he, maybe the next game if he gets into the si same situation he feels like oh maybe i shouldn't come i should he's farm like oh this is actually not a good time but, but then when he does that in that game then it actually made it hard for his team you know so all these kind of things is very difficult you know it might affect the team in a very different way and so it comes down to the coach whether he has to come to the team after the loss and try to tell them okay this is what went wrong blah 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 blah, blah and keep everybody in the right mindset so that they, they don't focus on uh, the, just the result you know you have to focus on what you have to do in the game your job if you're doing your job that's all that matters you know whether you win or lose that's after the game you have to decide yeah and look that's something that moon is really good at. He, he's done the morale and last year as well when uh tsm made it to the stockholm major and they had their uh, documentary sort of come out that was something that moon really did and they have a second coach so maybe that's something moon's also focusing on here uh, for the road to the international but their opponents vp it's only been three days are you guys impressed with the progress already from this team yeah, they, they felt kind of one-dimensional, I think. You put, they had one or two strats they, they looked good on, um, you know, a couple of different Spectre games. Um, so to see, you know, a kind of different look for them here and the fact that they were able to kind of hold on and kind of call their way back into a game, that's something we hadn't really seen from yep. them. Yeah. Um, so honestly, this I feel like this is the best game VP played all tournament um, because, you know, I think coming into today, this was two teams where, you know, I don't think, compared to like some of the other series where it's like oh you know but these teams probably happy they got maybe one of the easier matchups but they both played incredibly well here yeah and the other aspect is that for three players on this team this is actually their first showing you know at international road to international so people might not know a lot about them and we do have a little bit of a video some information on the virtus pro team I was coaching VP at last TI, right? And I joined also right before TI, if I remember correctly, maybe like three months prior to TI. And before that, I was a player. Uh, I would say every player, or not even player, every human being goes through the time of your life where you just need to take some pause from things you were doing before, right? Just uh, and a mental breakdown happens, you're like, okay, I just need some time to be with myself and just live a life. And then you're like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> time to come back to good stuff. The biggest lesson or like the biggest thing that might win us a lot of games is confidence. It's actually confidence, especially in our team. It's not like we are not confident in ourselves, but we are not showing this confidence to other teams or like we are not bringing this confidence into the game. And we can play 10 screams, 2,000 Dota games, and then we come into official game and like, yeah, hey, what to do? We're like chickens running around. Come on guys, we, we did it. We did it a lot of times. That's why we played this game. That's why we love this game. Let's have fun, etc. And this is... I would say what is like the biggest thing in this team. That's what I hope we will bring into TI. And as we return from the break, we are basically heading over to game number two and an important spot for Virtus Pro to claim a spot into the upper bracket if they can take game number two for themselves. Otherwise, the thing is, Fear, uh, the last time these two teams met in Riyadh, it was a tie, one to one in a best of two. But it's a best of three this time, so Virtus. we'll finally get a victory between these two and their grudges between each other. That's the beauty of best of threes, right? Nothing goes unsettled as the 2-0, you're just the better team. In game three, that's when things get really hype. I personally am hoping for a game number three here, but we'll have to see, especially in at TI and Road to International. These games get very tense. We even saw it in game number one there, both teams making some uncharacteristic mistakes, I would say, uh, playing a bit more stiff, but it leads to some really uh, high quality and high skill Dota. Even Virtus Pro at the start, we're probably playing very, very safe, maybe a bit scared to some extent where TSM felt like we're on home turf here. Uh, we're going to dictate the pace, uh, do what we want to do and make Virtus Pro answer. And they did have one team fight early on 
which led to a full-on team wipe for Virtus Pro. So that probably didn't do any good for their morale, but it did take some time until they got their courage back, started winning some fights, and slowly but surely winning the game, one fight after the other. But how does that impact our drafts? Because I think itemization-wise, well, we've already kind of discussed that a, <laughs> a couple times through, and also the panel talked about, like, uh, I mean, at least you can pump some extra damage here and there. Maybe if someone had a bit more farm the other that probably didn't benefit a lot on TSM. Maybe hero picks as well might be changing here, Fear. What do you think? I, it definitely it was a combination of both for TSM. Like, to have the lead that they had, but then at some point feel like the game is unplayable has to do with itemization and heroes. The Centaur boss 4, it did great in landing stage, and it looked okay for the most part, but it still ran into that situation where you're a Centaur in the late game, and what are you doing, right? Like, Ari just couldn't find any initiations because, like, you just have to get in there. And if you're not tanky on a centaur, it doesn't really work out. So Ari kind of, like, fell off the face of the map when he started getting into that late game scenario. And it goes to the same thing when you also look at heroes like the Omni Knight. This hero isn't meta. They came up with an idea. It just didn't hit. You know, you go bots, you go Midas, and then you go bots too. And then you're in a situation where you you have to be so much stronger than them. It just had no scaling whatsoever. And we saw the difference in like the scaling here. There is a Primal Beast in the game here, which is a very strong hero right now. Like the most powerful hero at this tournament, but that's probably why they picked Dazzle to block pick it because that is a matchup that is very difficult for the Primal Beast, but I was just looking a little bit at like the stats of the Primal Beast and what this hero's been able to bring to the table, and he's got a 72% win rate at this tournament with a 67% contention rate, so very powerful hero, but against the Dazzle, maybe you don't want to bust it out, and AA, this is a classic against Dazzle. And also talking about Dazzle, guess who has a better win rate? Well, exactly him. He's 9-3 and three currently at 75% win rate. Dazzle has the highest win rate in the tournament currently out of any other hero. So uh, they're also relying on the strengths of this plus, you know, support or core. The options there's. This was what I was the, thinking about pre-series, that this is going to be a very heavily contested hero between the two. Because Virtus Pro, they, they love to play the Dazzle. But TSM, they also got two players who play it. It's not just Brawl for the mid lane core, but also White Mon. White Mon's already shown this plus five Dazzle can be a nuisance to deal with, even in the laning stage. Yeah, they did do that. And it was very strong in the laning stage. And it was also against an AA where the heals weren't as great. He had some nice uh, man mode moments where he'd end up diving enemy mid laners with Grave to get some kills as well <laughs> after having a good laning stage. But yeah, they have the flex potential there. And I think if you are Virtus Pro now, it is deep enough into the tournament where they've seen this. They've done their homework. They knew they were playing TSM today, so they had all night to prepare and kind of like figure this one out. And that's a very early Wraith King pick. That one is, is. bizarre. I mean, it's, sure, if you're really looking at AA, and, you know, it might be FNG. He might just be an old school type of guy and be like, hey, I'm playing AA. Means you have to play Sven, CK, or, you know, Wraith King, because I want to stun in my lane. And CK was banned. So maybe they just decided we just want to have AA plus one make this happen. But even in the last game, the CK wasn't even enough to make that lane win, so we'll see if this move here of picking the Wraith King this early on will have the desired impact that they're hoping for. Well, at least following the footsteps of uh, their East European compatriots from the last series, Team Spirit were able to beat game number two versus another North American team, Shopify Rebellion, as TSM. It's, you know, region versus region multiplied once again. Will it be another 2-0, though? And is Wraith King going to be leading the charge? Someone could say that's a bit of a deja vu. But we have TSM bringing up the Tusk and the Lone Druid. And we saw, you know, Ten if I take Shopify as an example, they made, not in just that series, you talked about it before that in remaining. previous Dream League seasons, uh, or at least the latest one, they got the Dawnbreaker Tusk to work so well as a lane duo. So maybe TSM's kind of caught onto that, like kind of copycat idea. Yeah, we, we can pair up this Tusk with another heavy hitter, which Lone Druid can definitely be. Uh, they've got some good tools up coming out of these three heroes. Yeah, and Kasane has really been enjoying the Lone Druid in the offlane, so that's probably just going to be, as you mentioned, their position three and position four, Ari on the Tusk, Kasane on the Lone Druid, TBD where this Dazzle is going. I wonder if Virtus Pro has any like surprises for us with this Wraith King. 
generally it's normally just to carry it potentially i've seen it in the off lane but is it good in the off lane not entirely sure if it's worth it but it is a stable carry but time will tell where this wraith king will go the matchup for sloan druid it's fine as a wraith king it's not great it's i right. think because you have uh an aa in your lane but it should be fine. You definitely want to be a ranged hero, ideally, against Sloan Druid. But, yeah, not, not much else you can do about that one. But Phoenix, that is a hero that destroys Sloan Druid. Just, you cannot attack the egg with the bear. You have percentage-based damage against this very tanky heroes. It's AoE damage yep. on top of it. And all their heroes in general right now aren't particularly good at hitting the egg. They've only got a, a dazzle for the most part right now. But... Really good pick here. I like this one a lot. And it's bringing that team fight yet again that we saw in game number one from Virtus Pro. It's not a Grimstroke this time around, but it's another big team fighter. You got the Phoenix, you got the AA, and there it is. Okay, so this Wraith King is, looks like it's gonna be an offlaner and they're just gonna pick up the Spectre. Spectre brought up, so definitely uh, mixing things up a little bit here with Virtus Pro. Having a bit of flex in their draft. Phoenix and Spectre still, uh, well, Spectre very likely has to carry, but Phoenix and the Wraith King probably still waiting to be locked in where they're going to end up going. And TSM, do they have a curveball of their own that could probably tell us where this Dazzle is going? Because they uh, have played it to multiple, two different roles. I love how, I love how kind of uh, enthusiastic you get when you see a, a Lone Druid. I love, love my boy Lone Druid here. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, the hero has changed from a carry to like an offlaner. And there was like a phase where it was a mid. He's having a hard time figuring out where he wants to be. But I think more times than not, we're seeing Lone Druid be playing the offlane here. So I'm no, not surprised at all to just see this life stealer being picked up. And this is a classic response to the Spectre where you just can sustain through the damage. You have the feast to help you with that one. You can buy a silver edge. You can hit the egg. Probably a good lane matchup versus the Wraith King too, as this Wraith King most likely will be in that offlane position here. Only annoying thing for life stealers, you really do enjoy life stealing. It's in his name. He is life stealer, but you are playing versus an AA. So armlet's gonna be much worse. Just in general, your feast won't work in the team fight. So not a free life stealer by mean game by any means. However, we'll see what he can pull off with it. Well, at least looking at the the Virtus, Virtus Pro draft at the moment, they've yet to pick Phoenix in this uh, in these last three days. Uh, not a single pickup uh, during the group stages, and now here in the seeding matches, that will be their their first uh, to bring that one up. And the Spectre, Rikertic, that is one of his winning heroes. The both games that he has played versus Beast Coast versus LGD wins on the board. And yes, they they, they took the only loss LGD had during the group stage, which was the big difference maker that they got into this phase because the, the team below them is just one game away. And that was Beast Coast that got knocked out in that group. So beating the top team of the group, LGD with the Spectre, well, it's a it's a good indicator for them most certainly is here and i think both team both of these teams right now are kind of looking at similar things right now i think if you're on the side of vp of course you do have uh i believe last pick here so they have the option to just counter pick what they see but what they really need is a stun and they need more stuns because you have like a wraith fire blast and that's it right now. And heroes like Phoenix and A, they really enjoy having stuns. We saw in that last game, you have these two supports that do a lot of damage, but you had a stun on every single core there. You had a Shaker, you had a Spear Breaker, you even had the CK. This time you're putting in a Spectre, you still have A stun with the Wraith King, but you need one more here. And TSM, they get to decide what they're doing with this Dazzle now. Like, are we just gonna put, is this our mid laner? Is it gonna just be our boss five? Choice is theirs right now to pick what they find to be best for the game here. And I'm trying to think, like, maybe something else that can low committal hit the egg might be nice. Good work, good work. Uh, you talked about the Primal Beast very early on. It was banned in the last phase, so it went all the way through to this part. And TSM, it's going to be a Brile Puck by the looks of it for the mid lane. And now VP, what is the reply to it? The Puck, it doesn't really seem like your traditional egg hitter, but it is something that can uh, help out it's the life It's on the back line, and it Gets really the messes line. them up. So like, might, this life stealer. Yeah, it might put a situation where Phoenix feels like she, 
she has to egg in a spot you don't want to, right? Just because you're dying to the puck. And that is another way of dealing with it. And we're going to pick up the Earth Spirit here. This is what they needed. They need some type of stun control for their lineup here. Silences are especially good against heroes like Lone Druid and uh, Lifestealer, where you can just like, for you kind of force them into a situation where Lone Druid has to use his ult really early on, and Lifestealer might have to buy a Manta or something to get out of these silences. Talk about the Earth Spirit for a bit as well as this hero has been a lot has, has been first phase pick material also in the second phase locked in a lot like early for a lot of these teams but the thing is it has been living a viper theory win the lane lose the game because it's been like 13 minutes 11 minutes you've seen godlike sprees you've seen dominating sprees unkilled earth spirits but just hasn't seemed to be able to close out the game. And then you have, you know, we had that one Somnus uh, performance where he just kind of popped off at 20 minutes on Earth Spirit, carried the whole goddamn game by himself, pulled the troops together. So Virtus Pro, do you think this is a 2-0 with the draft that they have? Can TSM fight back? And what are the timings looking like? Oh, TSM can definitely fight back for sure here. But as far as the lineups go... It's hard to say who I favor more in here. I'm definitely going to go with the similar story as last game. If this game ends up going into ultra late game stages, I think VP's lineup is super scary. I imagine this Wraith King might end up buying an Ags or something like that, just prolonging the team fights. You're going to have Phoenix with the egg. So you got more and more Ice Blasts coming in. And as a Lifestealer player myself as well, playing late game Lifestealer into AA, it comes from a matchup where you can sustain and out carry the potential specter, but once you stop life stealing, the specter will shred you instantly. So that is one downside of the life stealer here. So they got to make things happen a bit in the early game. They do have the lone druid life stealer combination. They got a very tempo based lineup here. I think they need to be in a spot oh. this game where they keep getting gold, or they need to end the game. A bit too far when it catch Squadix here and allowing VP to counter initiate Dazzle. It's going to drop very low. White Bar might just be the target of first blood, and FNG is going to get it. Notice will drop as well with that off lane Wraith King, and FNG targeted by TSM to potentially give another kill for the North Americans. They are chasing him down as that orb dodge comes out. A couple extra right clicks enabled for Ari to close that one out. And just to get back on the thought about this uh, Air Spirit combined with Spectre inside the same draft. They had a that game. These two heroes, they had a really rough laning stage, and the blade mails were the ones that worked into their favor and kind of slowly turned it around into towards a victory. Spectre probably doesn't. Well, I mean, you could you can optimize the uh, the blade mail. I'm not gonna say it's bad. I'm not gonna say it's the one you don't want to go for. It feels like it is more a meta to just go straight up for it. But how does that impact your skill build? Max out dispersion. We've seen that happen. Going uh, Blade Bell on Spectre? Yeah. Blade oh, yeah, Bell no, with good. the max dispersion skill build. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I mean, but, it uh, definitely helps you farm another there. Fight. Ari is going to go down. Yeah. I'm probably expecting maybe they've already spread out into other directions, but... Is uh, he going down? I don't know. He's not going down, actually. On the edges no of that tier 2 tower, and there we go. All right, he's sacrificed himself. That's a lot of assists. <laughs> sure is. <laughs> But yeah, you definitely want to go Blade Bell on Spectre in most most of the games, just in general, because it's a very powerful item and it works really well with dispersion and it can be used as a farming tool. Spectre doesn't have a lot of ways to farm quick, so you kind of rely on just dispersion plus Blade Bell return damage to get you a lot of that CS in the early game. And he's even going for a smaller transition item too and getting the urn into the Blade Bell. Definitely does does work out. Well, so we have already four kills in this uh, in this game too. Started off with a real blitz uh, between the two teams. This is, we've got the Earth Spirit versus the Brile Puck in the mid lane. We've seen Earth Spirits have a great time in the laning stage, even despite whatever they're matched up against. And of course, Puck, you know, Phase Shift is a very powerful tool against dodging some of those abilities that he has. So it's more about just right-click training, making sure they get as much farm as they can, doing the early rotations with another having the coil, the other just having a very powerful level six, level seven rotation. The side lanes, it just feels like this might be a pretty much of a farm fest, at least in top, not bottom necessarily, as we saw FNG already drop low. Because, you know, it's Lifestealer versus Wraith King in, in the top lane. How often do you see a three Wraith King uh, just battle it out with a with an ancient apparition against your opponents? Yeah, this is a 
usually a lane you see in the safe lane. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. yeah. But it's uh, making an appearance in the off lane here, and I'm very curious to see how, more than anything, just how this rating does. If you look at last game, there's like no way in my eyes that you're winning this game if Noticed doesn't have the type of performance that he had on the Spearbreaker. Will he be able to replicate that on a hero like Rape King? We all know Spearbreaker's meta and how powerful this hero is, but what we don't know as much of is, is Wraith King off lane very powerful? What is his job in this particular game? Well, like they like to say, 17% luck, 17% skill. Wraith King. 100% concentration of will, or? Yeah, power of will, but Wraith King <laughs> is just, you know, Q. Stun. Q stun. They're chasing Sayush down in the top lane for a potential kill for TSM. One more hit's gonna deal and seal the deal, let's put it that way, as Sayush will drop the Tomato. They were also battling in the bot lane, dropping Keratich low. Lukasane with that bear and Ari on the Tusk, definitely making a lot of heavy lifting here. Punish that Spectre as early as they can, but TSM finding a kill into their top safe lane with a slow and dazzle. Life Stealer also playing another slow with a ghoul frenzy. It's just nice to have if you want to chase opponents. Definitely is. One of your farming tools as well, as it does give you quite a lot of bonus attack speed there. That too. On this lane, on bot lane, this isn't your strongest lane ever. So TSM, they're definitely in a spot drafting wise where they should be ahead from the laning stage. And they should translate that into getting a very big gold lead and probably having to close this game out before it gets into those ultra leaking situations. So everything is going pretty much as planned. But if you start to get more farm on the Spectre and this Wraith King, that's when things might get a bit more difficult. Ultimato. Yeah, he's just getting interested there with that Poison Nova already applied on Wraith King. Just wants to keep refreshing that tick. But I'm not really going to be doing that much work here. The CS department, at least, in the top lane, tied 17 is 16. Well, tied and tied. Very close to each other's with one CS difference. Squatix and Brile also very even in mid, despite a lot of red colors in the top 10. TSM having the majority right now as Spectre CS. Not exactly the highest, but maybe even a potential kill. Kasane is down 100 HP in the bottom lane. Spectre going all the way under, diving under the tower and getting a kill That's on That's a Kasane. resummon kill, too. That is massive. That, too. Like, he has no bear for 40 seconds here. So for the next about minute here, your Spectre's just going to free farm. And we talked about how this bot lane was hard. All that pressure has just been alleviated for the most part here. Is most likely the next couple waves for Kiritich are just going to be completely free for him. And I also think, if I saw that correct, Ari probably killed Kasane by casting Ice Shards into the Dispersion on Kiritich when Kasane was already in a safe distance but barely had any HP. So that could have happened. However, White Mon's already dropped in the top lane, so VP getting something for themselves as well. They're up to four kills now. Been able to uh, at least punish this Dazzle. Not a lot of max HP to work through. Well, this is a bit surprising, too. I would assume this Dazzle, one of the strengths of this hero, hasn't changed that much. Is The Poison Touch is really strong against heroes so that can't get away from it. And Wraith King isn't really a hero and AA that can get away from it. But still, I think they're overperforming here, VP in the laning stage. And we do talk about the Slay game and how scary their heroes do look in it. That has to be a bit concerning here for TSM. A lot of game to be played still, but very impressed here how they have stabilized the lanes that they probably should be doing worse there for VP. Definitely Shannon Squatix is actually uh, pretty high up here, tied up with Brile in net worth. Also with that life stealer following right behind. It is VP's side lanes that are following up behind. Oh, and they're going to make an attempt onto Squadix with the coil. Ari's right there oh, helping out with White Mon. But FNG and Sayush, they've got the power. And they will apply it onto TSM. White Mon trying to make a run for it. But the Magnetize is going to be there. Bryles also low on HP. Can Squadix get another remnant? Yes, he can. But he's still got sticks and fairy fires. Nevertheless, one kill, two kill. Rune secured. Squadix happy. And you just saw the power of Phoenix against Tusk right there. This is why they picked the Phoenix into the Tusk. You run in there with the tag team, right? You want to get the damage done, but you pop the Fire Spirits on top of two heroes there, and all of a sudden, you're not getting the right clicks. Therefore, you're not getting the damage done there, which makes an easy turn there for Vitas for his pro. Talk about the, the power of the sun. This is quite powerful. This definitely is very powerful. More powerful than Ice Shards, one would say. Yeah, melting through the ice. Good old uh, Virtus Pro. Uh, 
as already mentioned, you know, it's not the it's not the VP of the old days. The roster is very different to what it has been, but uh, already giving us a show at least in game number one, and not afraid to also experiment with something different because this Wraith King's yet to really be played in the offlane. So. Also, some confidence coming out of their drafting. Wraith King has a full uh, eight picks so far with a 62% win rate. Yeah, how successful. many of those are the offlane? <laughs> those are actually, there's, there is actually four offlane picks. So, okay, uh, there is, it ones, is shared. There is uh, something yeah. happening bottom lane. Oh, that is a Phoenix. And this, particularly the sun being targeted. It doesn't get popped by the they coral. Kasane. Kasane is the one to die first. And now Bryle just might be a secondary target. Does get the coil out just in time. And there's yeah, the magnetized with a powerful kick to the face. Squadix with a double. Squadix with a triple. Now, nah, Skiritich, I want a piece of mind of that as well. Three kills with the sun surviving. FNG doesn't even get killed. This is really concerning here. Like, F and G was one hit from dead. The bear was chasing him. The bear is about to get that last swipe to kill him. And then, boom, out of nowhere, Squadix just smashes a rock on Kasani's real hero and ends up killing him. Yes, I'm just going to have to find some answers around this because that was Pac basically dying on his uh, first proper rotation. Trying to help out his buddies, but not really succeeding. And we know how games can go if this puck ends up dying once, twice, three times and doesn't score any kills. DSM's going to be in a lot of trouble. How do you get back in with this lone droid? Having to t he needs time to farm. The life stealer needs time to farm. And you don't have a mid laner to play around with, basically, because you're so far behind that the Virtus Pro is just going to walk away with it, but they're going to make something happen onto Keratich here. Shadow Step onto Kasane. Drop down to half HP as well. Kasane he might just die dying. here. He's going to pop the true form. He does get a bit of healing out of that, and FNG will be punished. Sayush also on the runaway from Ari and Squadix. He's, he's the hunter in the night. The invisible Earth Spirit shows up out of nowhere, magnetize onto White Mon and the bear. Gonna get rooted up by the bear at the same time. Kasane gonna be walking back in. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Schooled by TSM by the looks of it. He thought he had the upper hand, but no. It was TSM. Maybe he didn't realize there's a Diffusal Blade online as he walked in there and got swiped by the bear a few times and just had no mana. So he couldn't really escape from that situation there. Rooted up, slowed up, surrounded by enemies. A rough life there. And I just want to make a little more notes on this AA and the impact it will have if it gets level 6. Only level 5 right now, but heroes like Lone Druid, and I talked about Lifestealer hating to play versus AA, but Lone Druid does too. Because if you Ice Blast the real hero, he all of a sudden can be focused down and will not be getting the heal from the Spirit Bear. FNG fighting it out with White Mon here. I want to stay all the way to the end with that battle. Sayush and uh, Squadix. Squadix, he's got his blade mail by the looks of it coming on the courier. He's got the recipe on the way. And a battle for the 10-minute room. Bryle will secure the DD. They spot the Earth Spirit, but White Mon's going to be targeted by Keratich. Forces out the early shallow grave. Well, not early. He's about to die, and he will. As Ari and Bryle are going to have to retreat on their side of the map. VP get themselves a kill despite losing out on the action rune. But Bryle can't really use it right now. It's going to have to make a move happen with Ari. And AA could be a good target to use it on. Coil is ready. Squadix is farming in the jungle right now. Bryle trying to get close. Ari's still scouting out, but no, he's not going to dive. Yeah, I think you chill here. Maybe get a little bit of damage with TD onto the tower. But other than that, that's just going to be your DD rune there, hoping to get a bit more. I'm sure they were, but that's all they're going to get for now. And notice in the like... meantime is also just pressuring top with FNG's rotation here, and little Skelly Bros are going to assist in this one. Kasane also applying pressure in the bot lane with that lone druid. It's only a 1v1, so he's got a happy lane for himself right now to try and get closer to the tier 1 tower. But uh, VP's mid tower down to 800 HP. Very soft right now. TSM also smoking up towards top. FNG is still in the tree line. Throwing in some fire. Spot it. Does he get it? the channel? No, he won't. He won't make it out. Ari and Whiteman are here. Gonna try again. It. But bottom lane yeah, here, you got Earth Spirit and AA going here. A ult is online. They that rotation is coming from TSM. They can't they quite get to Kasane though. They got a, they got an eye on him, but also they, they same him. thing they for Keratich. White Mob with a slow on the Blood Grenade. AA Blast to connect onto Kasane, and that is him gone. Ari, White Mon trying to make a run for it. Sayush and Keratich on the chase. Snowball trying to get away from the rest of VP. 
It's Phonics with the slow. So Tusk is also going to drop and VP successful with it. And that is a much needed double for Keratich. He's up 5 0 oh, 4 on this Spectre in the early game. Yeah, it's a bit ridiculous. His net worth wouldn't be what it is right now if he didn't get these kills. So, yeah, I think that's a little bit concerning if you are a TSM fan here. This Spectre here, we've seen him time and time again in the late game. This hero's ridiculous. Now, with this, oh, they're going to kill Notice to once here, potentially. Does have reincarnation. Well, he doesn't have it skilled yet. No, he hasn't skilled it. For it. He needs help at the same now. time he sees the orb. Yeah, now you're going to get some backup because there's a lot of heroes here. FNG coming with the heal, but Brawl's going to go for the silence. Tomato under the tower. You're going to help your life feel around. He's going to move away with the pop the sun, and they're forcing them away. Infest in sight. That's Husk, but Husk, there's going to be a bit of a surprise inside. Does TSM get to use that surprise, or are they just going to die one by one as they've lost Ari? And Tomato is dead as well. Brawl can't do much with that haste rune, and TSM losing a core and a support from their aggressive move. But Kasane, he will be able to take down that Spectre on a mano y mano. Yeah, Spectre had the Blade Mill coming out on the Courier. Doesn't quite reach him there, so it kind of made him just easy pickings there. This is one of Lone Druid's scariest timings. Once he finishes up this Diffusal Blade, he becomes very, very powerful as he can just chase you down on the map. He even has the Treads finished as well, so Kasane still off to a great start here, but your only concern is still going to be that this is not going to be an Immortal Life series. We just saw in that last fight there. That was without Ice Blast. Same thing with Kasane Bottom. If Ice Blast ever hits on either of these heroes, they become very burstable, so it's going to be a game about potentially sniping this AA before you can do anything, because I think this hero is going to be key for this game for Virtus Pro. If A gets Ice Blast off, then you're probably dying. If you can manage to avoid the Ice Blast by killing him first or hope he just misses him, then you have a real chance in the fights. Last game, we had a couple Midas's coming in, and this time oh, it looks like again. Sayush. Okay, we'll get back to that in a second. As Notice being dived under the tower. Brawl's also going to be here, but so is Spectre. Kiritich wants to get a bit of damage out. And Sayush has the Ice Blast ready. On to Tamado, trying to get to the high ground, and he's going to be history. White Mon's dead, too. Ari might just be a third kill going for Virtus Pro. He's got nowhere to go, and that Wisdom Rune secured by VP. And with all these kills going the way of Virtus Pro, you know, mentioned Sayush is the one lining up the Midas. So that's going to be one happy AA if he can get that one done. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's... All right, he commits for the Glove of Haste. That is a full commitment. He, he, he wants the Midas, and I think we're seeing a, a clash of two different ideas of how to play the game. Right now, on the side of TSM, you look at kind of their heroes, their life stealer. He went for an Orb of Corrosion, early armlet, has dreams of like a Desolator. These are all early game type of items. Meanwhile, and then you look at their draft too, right? They've got a lot of heroes that apply a lot of early game pressure and VP. They're like, nah, we're going to chill. I'm going to get Midas on every hero. We're going to pick Phoenix and Spectre together. We're going to yeah. have mediocre lanes. We'll just get to the late one and everything will be okay. Yep, and every time you pop through form, deleted. Back Ice to the blast. graveyard, Kasane. This is shaping out to be a very sad day for North America here as we already lost the first series. Well, it Two is starting to spirit. look like that. We've lost yeah. game number one here against Fergus Pro and game number two, it's looking and hard. And it's not, it, sure, it's only a 1k gold lead, but from my perspective, just how the heroes match up into the scaling department, it looks very difficult for TSM. They're gonna have to find a way to bring back the morale, rally the troops here, and find the play on the map, honestly. And they're sticking yep. around bottom lane. They wanna go at Kasane yet again. If he resummons his bear here and dies, it's gonna be rough. It's not gonna be real rough, he's but he's just playing uh, he's it wise. safe. He's wise and playing it safe for the time being. Maybe they can get a bit of a wrap around. I, I don't know, T Panda. I think he might be dead. He looks, looks like it. Ice Blast is going to be there, and he is dead once again, and so is his bear by the time he respawns. Also, to kind of paint the picture a bit about Virtus Pro's road to the international without with this entire year, uh, there's a team that was the regional qualifier uh, winner from East Europe. That was, was the team that was always fourth, tour one, fourth place, tour two, fourth place, tour three, fourth place, missed out on every single major. They've made their way here, and now they are actually looking at a shot without playing a single major this year of going potentially to the upper bracket of the main event. Uh, well, they're just then you have TSM. Then you have they're TSM. just showing it. 
that have been to a major haven't had too much success. So you're just going to be hunted here at the same time. They're the second top team from North America. And this series just looks like Virtus Pro has been a tiny bit better, making a little bit less mistakes than what TSM has been making. So they know that. They understand that. But VP, if you look at it from their perspective, they probably came as underdogs to the to this series. But they're not looking like underdogs at all. So what you're saying into here the, is they will get a much needed kill. We'll get that, but how many are they going to lose with this trade? Ari is already being targeted on. White Mon's about to drop the notice. Tomato's trying to fight back, but this life stealer without a death so his damage is limited. Squadix will take down one, and there's a T TP attempt from Tomato, and he will be able to get out with the help of the Rage. So only two supports traded off for FNG's Phoenix. I mean, without a doubt, that TSM is the second best team in North America, right? Maybe potentially first. It's a hard debate. I'd say second. But if you look at the road that Virtus Pro has to go through to go to any of these majors. They have to get through teams like Team Spirits. They got to go through Nine Pants. They got to go through Bedroom Team. Those three teams have been dominating the Eastern European scene. But they're showing us here that in Eastern Europe here that you have their potential fourth best team here is still damn good. Yeah. And what a show. And you got to give respect to that. Yeah, to have four teams at this level from one region is really just something else, to be honest. Talk about the West European story. It's always been like, yep, there's there's four teams and they all seem to always be in the, the top four of a major event. Potentially even, you know, remember last TI, for example, it was a European final. So East Europe is following in the footsteps and really making their own mark on the map as well. If they can get to the upper bracket, that is a story for this VP roster. Because last year, they were all pretty much Division Two players. They are so far away from what you look at tier one teams. And now they've really built up a story that they can be one of those. They could definitely be one of those at the road to the international. Most definitely here. I'm going to tune back into the game here. I'm just going to do a little update on like some itemization here. FNG is going straight hex rush on his position five Phoenix. And he is not that far away from it. Just a thousand gold here until he has that. We got the Midas Dream coming out for Seiyu. We're talking about greed here, right? Both games, they're playing for the late game. They're playing for moments like that. Even though they're winning the early game here, they're still playing in a fashion where they want to scale. Your Wraith King, he's got a Desolator on top of the armlet as well. They're trying to find Kasane. They know that the bear is hitting, so Kasane is probably somewhere around the area. They roll in, and they finally find him, but they also find White Mon, and they've got uh, two targets to coming. take with the Shadow Step right on top of the Lone Drift. He's trying to TP over with the Ice Blast coming in. And it doesn't actually connect. He will be able to teleport home and stay alive, but the bear, the bear's not as lucky. Yeah, he potentially could have died there if the Ice Blast hit, because he would not have healed from the fountain. He would have lost more HP because his bear would have died. Very fortunate Earth there. Takes. Fire Spirits, yeah, could have probably died. Very, very fortunate, but still the name of the game for TSM right now, it's kind of just run away. And honestly, it's more like paranoia. I think Sane is... At all stages, it's just a little bit paranoid <laughs> that he's going to die. It's not shaped out to be a very fun game for him to play, so maybe maybe TSM with the rest of their cores are able to step up. Ari is going to be able to pick up the shard from this Tormentor kill, while Roshan has also been taken by Avertus Pro. Spectre almost ready with a Radiance, 500 gold short. So more trouble coming TSM's way. Not what you want to see right now. I mean, then the scalability, if you just look at the lifestealer, right? He is getting outscaled by the Wraith King. He's out farming him. They're building the same items, but you already have the Desolator online for the Wraith King, or Tomato's still going for it. We talked about how he can't man fight. Like, I'm struggling to find good points for TSM right now. Okay, a bit of an attempt on a bait. Notice was just hanging around there, waiting for the Ice Blast to land on top, and maybe somebody jumps him, but they jump after, and Brawl gonna get silenced right away! The puck's gone! Brawl doesn't get to do anything! He does not get to play Dota, and by the looks of it, neither does the rest of TSM. They're trying to oh, go for the run. White Mon, the there's taking so much damage from this Magnetize, an Ultra Kill for Squadix! They got nothing done. They got nothing right on TSM. Oh my goodness, how much damage is being dealt. That's 4k and a Tormentor for VP. 
Nice and easy for them. If you look at the AoE damage potential that you have, you got Phoenix, right? You got that Earth Spirit. You've got the AA. There's a lot of AoE damage, right? And on the side of TSM, they go into those fight like single target tusk, single target dazzle, single target launcher, single target life stealer, and they're using all this single target onto like this rape king. You'll see here he's tanking all this damage. Like I guess we'll do what we can here. And Bryle's trying to go in the back line instantly gets silenced. So really well played by Squadix here on this Earth Spirit. He's been crushing it. But these team fights, with the way you draft on TSM, you had to have a good start. You needed to snowball the game. In a position like this, your comeback potentials, it's so difficult. I think you just have to split up and farm and just be greedy. Maybe this lifestyle needs to turn this Mithril Hammer into a Maelstrom or something. By the looks of it, because he happening. still doesn't have a Desolator, and he still won't be able to farm it as he's hunted down in the mid lane. And we talked about how strong a mid-earth spirit can be early on with a godlike spree. He is 13, 1, and 10 on Squadix at 22 minutes with that ultra kill that he scored from that last team fight. Almost a rampage, but not quite. But yep, Desolator. It's still in the works. Still in the works. That's your boy Wraith King, who already has a blink dagger. <laughs> Doesn't even have dreams of AC. AC coming soon. Hex, yeah, that's completed on Phoenix. So, and of course, you do have your Midas on the Ancient Apparition now. This feels hey. like just like a taunting Midas. You know, yeah, it does remind me of a lot of pubs. My. My POS5 AA wants to build a Midas so he can just chill at the back of the fights and, you know, get a casual Midas pop every now and then and maybe get an Agonist to amplify the old uh, Ice Blast that used to be. Now you just get that lovely, lovely chilling touch. Kind of turn into a Dark Will of sorts as are you going to get hunted down by VP. But at the same time, yep, yeah, he's like, I'm, I'm just going to go for it. You know, that's the Sayush way of playing Dota. Yeah, these are like the saddest games oh, to play. Auto. Not again. Yeah, that's a Hex, by the way. Oh. Position 5 Phoenix has a Hex at 20 minutes. Yeah, okay. So these are the games I was going to say. White Mon, he's probably going to go down here, too. Most likely, as he has no TP. He's just going to stun them. Yep. <laughs> and that's the thing, too. Noticed he also went for the 26 skeleton attack damage talent instead of the extra stun duration <laughs> he just really is feeling like this is the greediest i've ever seen a team be and they're getting away with it literally getting away with murder here and they are already on the high ground finishing off a potential first lane of racks Yes, and they have their heroes respawning shortly, but the entire VP roster, they are here. They're spread it out, making sure the waves are pushing. Squadix also clears out the bottom wave, which Kasana, you know, he's just part of the jungle right now. He's not even pushing the lane as they will take a mid lane of Rack secure 24 minutes in. It does look like they're not done yet. They have a creep wave at the tier two. Ice Blast bottom, they're actually targeting Kasane. They see uh, him. There's a his, Hex. His worries, his, own, they, his problems aren't over yet. Let's get the fear off in time. No uh, Ice Blast to take, but still is dead. Death number six is a certainty for Kasane. Gertzic is toying around with him a little bit there, but that's going to be kill number nine, and another dominating streak being built up on the Spectre. Virtus Pro just playing with their food here, and TSM doing everything that they can do. It's just, unfortunately, in this moment, there's not a lot that can be done. I think they do just have to just sit in base, kind of split push what they can. Maybe the answer is going to be summon Fest Bomb, but we just now finished our Desolator at 25 minutes into the game. Poor Tomato here just doesn't have a game whatsoever. He's the lowest farmed core in the game. Getting, Phoenix is getting close to having the same net worth as him. So even if they do use an Fest Bomb, I'm not sure who they can kill, but I guess it has to be the AA. If they can manage to kill the AA or the Phoenix before they get spells off, maybe that's how you shape up one of these team fights here. Yeah, it's, an, it's an opening for sure. And brawl has been trying. We talked about the puck. That's a great backline snipe. But the moment he shows up, Squadix has been there to instantly silence the puck, so you don't really have any defensive item. They don't have a single defensive item to even dispel at this point. Uh, any silence that is applied onto Brawl's puck, so no Lotus Orbs, no, no other proper saving abilities. Maybe just the Dazzle has to instantly shallow grave. Okay, now you can go in so you don't die, but that's not the way you really want to play this one, and he's also forced out right away. So at this current pace, Virtus Pro is Virtus Plowing TSM. 
They are. Maybe they can hope for a notice to actually accidentally double click his ultimate and kill himself here. Uh, so that will give him an avenue of maybe taking this fight here. Other than that, maybe we stay apart rough. from TSM after all. Infest bomb is applied for the puck, so let's see if he they can get, get to the, the back line and do some damage. Melee's already down. Sayush is there. FNG is right there, but they read the hex is onto the puck already. His surprise, it's lost. The silence is there, and the target of Ari. Tusk is gonna go down, and the puck's about to fall as well. Squadix with the roll and trying to get the connection there. Magnetize right on top of the puck, and he's still going. He's gonna go all the way, and he's gonna score a home run by the looks of it. Prowl still going to get away with the magnetize, and finally, the shaker. Uh, there's a shaker. Well, I mean, the Earth Spirit is definitely shaking the ground here, forcing Brile away. And that was like the scariest Uber ride of Tomato's life there, just the entire time just sitting in the puck. Like, I hope you got this, Brile, because I don't want to come out of this infest whatsoever. <laughs> this fight does not look good. And he continues to stay inside the puck here. They're looking for another play here. You see Kiritich in the top lane here. Are they going to chase him down? Can you even kill him if you make this play? We're about to find out. Well, an attempt is being Are made. Are we? We might, yeah. They found him. What can you do here? Manta Blade Mail, 1v2. And it's make, they're making it work. Notice is killing White Mon at the same time. Dude, Kirtis is jumping Kirtis back and forth. This version is hurting, and Tomato is dying. And Tomato is dead. And Bryle is dead. He just 1v2 them, and Ari does the cheap shot to secure the kill. But holy, this man, he just 1v2 them as a Spectre. <laughs> at 28 minutes, oh, man. they were the ones to initiate on him. And GG's called out. I'm sorry to say, Fear, but it is East Europe 2, North America 0, two times in a row today. Uh, what can you do? The, the better team has won today. It is what it is. I'm a big fan it is of competitive it is. Dota. And this, I mean, it wasn't very competitive, honestly, this game. But however, the teams and the performance by Virtus Pro in this particular series was really good. I think TSM, they tried to cheese it a little bit with a Dazzle again, went really heavy all in on the laning stage, but it just didn't work out for them. They lost the lanes when they should have won it. They went for a snowball strategy two times in a row, got outscaled really hard. Maybe they take a quick look after this loss here going before going into the lower bracket and reevaluate their play style. I think they're trying to play way too fast. They need to slow down, chill, take a breather maybe build a couple Midas's play more for the late game it's pretty strong scaling is strong make it happen also you got to give credit to Virtus Pro as well for some ingenuity pulling off that Wraith King into the into the off lane maybe TSM thought that if they put the low Druid up against the carrier Wraith King they've got themselves a good position but uh, ended up going into the off lane after all for noticed and Squadix had a, a beautiful beautiful uh, game and uh, we're gonna head over to Slacks and see what he has to say Thank you so much, everybody. Krasokchike, my friend. Hello, congratulations. They're coming out from their win. Hello, well done. My Can team, no Englando, no, no Englando. No, just one Englando for me? Only one Englando. Oh, come on, all right. They're hiding, they're hiding. They are hiding, like, like animals. They're hiding in the corners like uh, hamsters. Hello, guys, congratulations. How are you feeling about the win? We're happy, we're happy. We mm -hmm. didn't play well first, uh, first map, but then second, yeah, we definitely smashed them. Oh. Okay, well, were you expecting to do so well? No. No, really? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I was kind of expecting. They're laughing over there. It seems like spirits are pretty high, man. Yeah. Uh, what are you guys doing now? Nothing. Okay, fantastic. That's I mean, I'm talking to you. Well, my... yeah, I know you're talking to me. I'm mean, faster, faster. I said, I'm, we're done. We're done. I'm going to get one word from each of them. Be free. Be okay. free. Uh-oh, my microphone's stuck on a door. No problem. One word. One word. Just one word. Okay, great, great. All good, brother. All good, brother. All right, fantastic. How about over here? Hello, hello. One word. Hello. Oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. Hello. You had the two hand. Hold on, hold this. Great. And then we'll do that. Very good. One word. <laughs> very good, very good. Very good is how they're feeling. Thank you so much. All right, back to you guys over at the, uh, where the hell you are? The booth? <laughs> All right, where are you guys at? The couch, couch. Good couch. <laughs> yeah, he eventually found uh, the word there. Maybe we only need one word from Slacks next time, but it was a very great interview there. Nice to know that uh, only one English speaker on VP, but spirits still high. Very good, brother. They all know how to do some good nodding. <laughs> and handshaking. I saw <laughs> that one. The nodding, the handshaking. <laughs> uh, but they're feeling good. They're getting a 2-0 there with their other Eastern European uh, team spirit brothers up there mm. in the upper bracket now. So massive props to Virtus Pro. They talked about how rough game one was for themselves, but game two, it was just all an absolute landslide. They had everything 
I'd even say from the landing phase in their favor. They really got like the I think a, a great draft. Like obviously Spectre's being comfort pick for them, but then that last kind of pick Earth Spirit to counter the puck mid, it really just set them up for success. Puck didn't have a great game, couldn't really ro anytime Puck did rotate, which Brawl had to do, Earth Spirit was there to like meet him. Like that first bottom fight where the Earth Spirit has an arcane rune completely destroyed them, turned the fight around on them. Spectre didn't really get pressure that hard in the lane, which was maybe the biggest surprise. It felt like this Lone Druid lane should have done better against Spectre. In fact, the Lone Druid got killed by the Spectre very early on and you just can't afford to give Spectre a good start uh, in a game like this. I felt like maybe it was a little bit of frantic gameplay from TSM. They were trying to be all over the map, trying to make something happen for themselves. But at least when it comes to this draft, there could have been a lot of flex. They had that Dazzle, they had that Lone Druid. We didn't know what was going mid, what was going off lane. Would you have changed much around their winter? Or you think that, yeah, their draft kind of works out and really it's the main focus of they didn't know where they were going to be on the map? I don't like to blame the draft when the execution is like so so bad, you know. It's difficult okay. to talk about the draft uh, in, in that manner. I always try to focus on what can we do well first, you know. I don't like to go to the draft, oh, we, we could have just picked something else to avoid this, you know, when people are making mistakes left, right, center. And I, f I feel like they were just running around like headless chicken this game, TSM. They weren't really sure what they needed to do, maybe tilted from the previous game. Like they made one move, like uh, Parker mentioned, the puck going bot. Like uh, after that, they didn't really help uh, the lone at all. They were like playing around the the life steer, and I feel like life steer is a carry where he's a carry that's really hard to get kicked out on the lane. Life steer, juggernaut, and morphing. They sit in the lane, but they don't want the fights to go there. They yeah. they they just need you to go to the off lane to open up the map. This is when maybe we could have seen Kasane be a bit more yeah, of that greedy off he, Sure, he didn't have a perfect start, you know, but his team didn't really help him after that, you know. Yeah. And they didn't really take the bot tier one for such a long time. Yeah, the player on top, which is like the hero you're pressuring is the Wraith King, who is it's not his job to carry this game, you know. There's a Spectre in the game. Like you if you play on this bottom lane, you kick the Spectre out, Spectre doesn't jungle well. Spectre would maybe have to go top and then kick the Wraith King out, then Wraith King doesn't have someone to farm. So um it just makes sense to play around the lone druid because he's kind of the strong hero. And Tomato had a rough game, he was the least farm core, but th probably the best way to create space for him is by actually just letting him yep. kind of leave him alone to just farm wherever is safest, whether that's jungle, lane, just let him play his game and go put pressure elsewhere on the map. I mean the logic is you don't really want to help the person that after you help, he's also going to be farming. You want to help the person that's going to be making space, which is either the Lone Druid or the Puck. Those are the heroes that are going to be doing stuff on, on the map. And if you're the Lifestealer, your team is not helping you. It's okay, you know. You help the other cause, the cause are going to have a good game, and they, in return, will make space for the Lifestealer. Yeah, it's uh, help the others. There'll be space for yourself. This off lane Wraith King, let's talk about it a little bit more because it has occurred a couple times throughout group stages and it's on the rise, right? It's going to get picked up a lot more. But what exactly works for an off lane Wraith King? How do we make a draft? How do we make an execution plan that enables him to come online to have an impact and to not choke out the Spectre, who also needs quite a lot of farm? I think it's more about the item build, like knowing when you should be buying Radiance, your favorite item on off lane Wraith King. <laughs> <laughs> you have your experience in your games, you know, games off. Yeah, let's not talk about that one. That one's going to make me a little bit I mean, this worked game, up. <laughs> this game, Notice definitely had a had a much better item build. He went for the Death Soul, which allowed them to get Roshan, take the map, and you are able to kind of be the physical damage, the right click damage, because the Spectre went for Radiant, so he, he's not going to be killing buildings very easily. He wants to kill heroes. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the, the way you make it work is that you have that strong lane, you have the pairing with the Ancient Apparition, um, and you also, you've got this kind of good physical damage matchup against the Life Stealer, so you have a, basically just a winning lane that forced, that, you know, it doesn't necessarily force TSM, but they felt forced to go and shut down this Wraith King just because he was having such a good time in the lane stage. Yeah, it's uh, very easy to be sort of thrown around like that, hard to uh, really pinpoint exactly what you need to shut down. So it was a tough one for TSM. Again, a massive congratulations to Virtus Pro, but we've got to keep this moving. There's a whole nother best of three, two more teams we've got to get to, and Liquid is one of them. We get to have a little bit of insight, a little bit of info on Zai. I'd say last year, the, the role that Matu kind of figured out for herself towards the, towards the end of his tenure is something that I've I kind of carry that torch a little bit this year, I think. Uh, kind of stepping into a bit more of a leadership kind of kind of role. Uh, obviously taking control of, uh, of drafting and stuff like that, but also kind of trying to get our team on the same page and kind of just uh, focused on playing the way we want to play. Uh, and I think that was something that Matu was very good at. Uh, he's, he's very good at playing his own kind of style of Dota. 
the first teams I played on in my career, I had very strong personalities. Playing with PPD, playing with Fear, playing with Artur, Samael, and obviously Team Secret, the second team, playing with like S4, Kuro, and Poppy as my, you know, second team, really. And there wasn't really room for any more. Uh, so I think I kind of early on learned to, and, you know, just like adapt to the space and kind of just uh, try to mold myself into the group. I think Puppy has probably been the, the way he sees the game. It's just, it's just way different. There's a lot of good Dota players. There's a lot of good competitive Dota players as well, but not many of them can establish that kind of touch on, on the game, I think. Uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe that's something that I haven't been able to do as, as much, but I think uh, when it comes to leadership and, you know, um, captish and stuff, I think uh, at least I'll try my best to, to step into the role. Welcome back to the road to the international. We're on to phase two. We're on to the third BO3 of the day. And it's looking like another fun one. So far, it's been two 2 O's, but we'll see if this third series changes its ways with Liquid up against Evil Geniuses. I'm B-Cop joined here by Lacoste. Lacoste, do you think we're sticking to the 2-0 trend or are we seeing something a little bit different coming your way? Oh, it's not going to be an easy one for EG by any means because uh, two of these teams they've met uh, four times in 2023 and right. EG never managed to win against Geniuses Liquid. Like they managed it through Geniuses during the Dream League, the season 20. But other than that, when it comes down team to like BO2s, BO3s, Team Liquid always had the upper hand. Uh, I mean, Team Liquid had an amazing year. This was, you know, if there wasn't Gaming Gladiators, this would be like the best team of the year. If somehow Gaming Gladiators, uh, you know, didn't achieve this greatness that the first six, seven months of the year. But uh, here we are. I think this should be an interesting one because we already lost two South American teams. Uh, you know, still two South American teams left in the tournament. But uh, EG, they will need to step it up here. So we get on into the draft for this first game, the BO3s. It's a good switch up from BO2s that we were doing in the first half of the group stage for the Road to the International. And Liquid right now, they pick up that Primal Beast. So, you know, PB, we've been uh, seeing this hero quite a bit. It's been played by Nisha in the past, so maybe this is their mid coming through. But EG respond with uh, going to the Pangolier. Of oh, Pangolier, the most contested hero of the tournament so far. Like uh, this hero, even after all these nerfs, the hero still feels amazing because of like what he brings to the table. We like we try to nerf him, but still, everything around the hero is extremely good. Especially like if you, I think if you remove the fusel blade, the hero would not be as popular. But he brings like a lot of burst damage, great scaling, comes online early on and also burns mana which is extremely difficult to deal with like we've seen in our previous series that was just played like how potent some of these like earlier diffusal blades can be like on lone druid you go in you take one fight it looks really good even though they lost the game like you can still feel how powerful the item is yeah so we'll see what they want to do to line up with both these heroes primal beast usually see like an early bkb for him he wants to be able to get that pulverize out We've seen this hero, especially throughout the DPC. I know there were a couple games that we covered where Primal Beast was just going all over the map and making things happen early where you can kind of take advantage of that. Primal Beast is one of the few heroes who can rotate from the mid lane without having level six. If he's not having a good time in the lane, he can easily rotate to go for this like three, four minute uh, bounty rune in, in the enemy jungle and gank the safe lane. This hero like doesn't really need levels. I would say he's pretty similar to mid Earth Spirit. If he's playing into bad matchup, he can easily rotate and make something happen in the side lanes. Yeah, that onslaught as well as that trample, making it all possible. And right now we go to the bands for both sides as they ban that Spirit Breaker, the Invoker, Brew's been a very popular pick. The Dazzle, I think priority-wise, coming into the bands is finding its way towards the top for sure, as that was that first ban from Evil Geniuses. And uh, we've got TA, Kunkka, Grimstroke, Shadow Demon, and Phoenix banned out by the side of Liquid as well. Uh, well they've been favoring this Warlock maybe a little bit, or if they want to go for that for the side of evil geniuses as they see that Grim and Shadow Demon band out, Phoenix has been a pick for them as well. But one of the things that I want to point out is about Matthew, you know, he's played a different hero every single game so far, that including the tiebreakers. He has picked 10 different heroes. 
Yeah, he's uh, that type of a player that can pretty much play anything. Uh, he's gonna play some of these like weirder heroes as well. You know, he's gonna play some bounty hunter if necessary, be super annoying. And we can see, judging by the bands, that we're in this heavy like meta where heroes become super tanky early on. These are like blade mail, heart buyers, Kunkagon. gone. Uh, you see like a brewmaster, he becomes super annoying early on as well, especially in the late game becomes extremely tanky. Primal Beast is also that one. And some of the heroes that they removed, did, I, I was not sure if EG wants to remove Bloodseeker from the pool since they have Pango. They also use this Grimstroke ban, which has been on the rise for a really long time ever since we changed how the ink swell works where you can detonate it manually. But still removing Bloodseeker, I would say that Mickey is like top one, top two Bloodseeker players in the world. Because I've seen him rotate so many times, he becomes extremely active. And when we're talking about the active players, in terms of kills, Pakaz is in top three. And that's uh, pretty impressive because he's very like explosive as a player. Sometimes he'll play these slower type of the carries like, uh, you know, Troll, uh, something that builds into Battle Fury like Terrorblade, but still gets involved in a lot of the kills. And that's also while having four and six score in this road to the International, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, so look, they go to the Ancient Apparition and the Dark Willow, and Ancient Apparition has been Insania's hero three times throughout the uh, group stage in that first part. So going to something that maybe he's a little bit more comfortable with on this, and the Dark Willow is something that we're seeing on the rise. Um, you know, I, I've been saying it a lot, and I know it's not something that's been done too much, but there was the game during the Asian Games where Mongolia went to a one-position Dark Willow. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think that's <laughs> happening. This is... Uh... Okay. Most likely going to be a position four. Uh, there's some, you know, maybe something to play Dark Willow from the mid lane, but, uh, you know, you want to use this Primal Beast, use his strengths, and uh, it's a ton of damage. Like, it's also a relatively easy setup for Ancient Apparition to use the Blast uh, Onslaught into Pulverize or right. just Bramble Maze. Uh, even, like, Terrorize can set things up relatively good. Curse Crown as well. We saw how potent Ancient Apparition pick can be against some of these, like, healers, like Lone Druid in the previous series. So you now have Triant Protect you have Pangolier who wants to be like getting in and out of the fights multiple times. If they just lock onto Pango, they do have damage to kill him from 100 to 0. Oof. So, EG, they're going to be thinking about what they want to go against this. And quickly on, well, they go into the Venge and then second pick a Phantom Assassin. Venge has been Panda's hero four times already. They have really loved this uh, five Venge, but what? we'll see if it ends up sticking that way. As Treant's been for Matthew just once. As I said, he's picked a different hero every single Ten time. Vengeful Spirit has been the most picked hero of the tournament so far, Five but the win rate remaining. is like not the greatest. It's sub 40%. So, considering the nurse that did happen, you know, we could see it happening, but also some of the heroes. Uh, didn't get nerfed, and why we, the reason why we see some of these heroes being picked. Uh, so, this is. Uh, now, now this Bloodseeker ban also makes even more sense. You know, it's been a traditional counter to Bloodseeker, but it's also a hero that Phantom Assassin doesn't like to play into. Like, you can get vision of her, and also she can't use the Blink Strike because of Rupture. She's also not the hero that wants to buy into Lincoln Sphere. Mm -hmm. So very good ban, very good read. EG coming with the plan in this first game. Now, it, it's still on the board. It hasn't been picked too much, only twice by Mickey, but does Muerta fit the build here right now? Uh, potentially, but then again, you're playing into like a swap. Uh, Trend Protector can reset relatively easy. Right. Okay, he he has a, you know pretty big hero pool uh, overall. I would say uh, maybe not so much in this tournament, but uh, they only dropped like one game. Mickey has been you know self-critical about uh, some of the performances during the Riyadh Masters, but he is a top-tier carry. Mickey is insane player. If he's off to a good start, Mickey can solo carry the game. Uh, he's also, again, very active. We talked about Pakaz, but uh, now with the Earth Spirit pick, they might uh, swap things around. They're not revealing anything yet. And we can see that this Primal Beast could potentially go to the off lane. Uh, could be even Boxy's hero. Boxy does play the hero and uh, not revealing anything yet. So they still want to see like how things are going to go because um, unfortunately they don't have the last pick in this first game. So they're going to need to reveal the hand, but uh, you can see this Muerta that you mentioned and CK. CK has been also very popular uh, ever since the changes to his 
uh, strike uh, 0 0.3 extra Ten damage to creeps remaining. makes a lot of difference, increases his farming potential so much. Five seconds so banning the centaur, and then of course, you know, evil geniuses, they ban out the Muerta as well, like you said, the CK, Team so Liquid. just definitely Terrible focusing Mickey's geniuses. heroes here as they ban the Dark Seer and go to the Terrorblade for Team Liquid, and now you're up against TB. What does this scream for you for evil geniuses? What does this last pick need to check in terms of the boxes that they need? They need some, like, magical damage. The only damage that they have, like, Triant Protector and Vengeful Spirit are very limited. This is a really good Terror Blade game. You know, against Phantom Assassin, TB is not afraid to buy, like, earlier Butterfly. He also doesn't mind building into MKB against Templar Assassin, even Silver Edge. So these are all, like, items that he can buy. And also, speaking of Pango, Pango does not like to play into Terror Blade in a lot of these situations, but there's a BKB piercing ability, so with the Pulverize, they can hold him in place and with the overwhelming damage coming out from Terror Blade, they could take him out relatively easy even during the roll. So Pango maybe not feeling so strong, maybe they shift him somewhere, but his best spot is certainly mid. In terms of what we've seen from the offlane, I mean, Tide <sighs> is definitely one of those heroes that EG has liked. Yeah, EG so likes that. May, may, I, I know Doom is not the most popular hero, but I could also see them picking it up uh, just that so they have some extra control against this Terror Blade. This is also fine. I think they needed something, you know, just some kind of a control. Uh, it's also another tanky hero, another hero that builds into Blade Mail, and it's also Blink Initiator, something that they did lag. This is why I mentioned Doom as well. Once you pick up the Blink Dagger with the War Stomp, you can't be the one joining the fight first, allowing your Pangolier to find the right target. So they did end up going to Anisha on the Earth Spirit, putting Zai over on the Primal Beast. And Senya, of course, back on that Ancient Apparition, leaving Boxy on the Dark Willow. And how much does this axe do for you? This final pick, is it percentage changing? Does it sh move the lines here for the side of Evil Geniuses? Or is it still kind of with how the results have been heavily favoring Liquid in this first game? Uh, I think they needed a pick like that, but it's also a bit of a, on a slower side, I think Pango will, I think Sea Smile needs to be super active. Want to see how the bottom lane is going to go because this is Primal Beast into Vengeful Spirit, not the like the best hero that deals with Primal Beast. You have one stun, Phantom Assassin can use the Blink Strike, run away from it, but then again, there's also Dark Willow. So this is a killer lane, not just the killer lane, overall a killer lineup coming up from Liquid. Uh, you have mid Earth Spirit, one of the heroes that comes online the fastest, I would say, and also Pangolier. I think it's going to be how much, how many rotation C smile is going to be able to make and also in terms of stacking boxy has been pretty amazing so far at this tournament because he managed to stack in one game when they played against bed boom 16 cams when he was playing shadow demon you know shadow demon one of the better uh, stackers in the game same goes for vengeful spirit but panda is playing position five venge which means that he's not going to be in triangle and uh, matthew on uh, this uh Trian Protector, I don't, I don't think you can stack as many camps as some of these heroes that I mentioned. It's uh, going to be much more difficult. This definitely seems to be shifting into a little bit of a stack meta. Like, there are definitely more teams that are taking advantage of heavy stacks. Like, we saw Tundra, and I, that game you is always the one that's coming to mind to me throughout these first couple of days with 35 stacks within their game. And you're talking about how, you know, you had one player getting 15 stacks in a game. It's just, it's giving that extra gold on a map that already has so much gold to be had, right? Yeah, you need to have someone to clear those stacks in because you're creating gold out of nothing experience. So very, like, I would say this meta, very oriented around the stacks in general. Sometimes if you feel like there's always something to do and we can see EG, Trying to smoke, count to five, go through the gates. And let's see who they can find. Very good move. I like this a lot. Smoke is going to expire in a couple of seconds. Not sure if they're going to find anyone. And McKay and Senya up towards the top lane, but not seeing anybody just yet. We've seen this move a couple of times. I think we saw it by LGD. They made a smoke and all went through the twin gate. They tried to invade and find somebody. I think they ultimately ended up getting first blood, but it was from an already stable position that was up near this bounty rune. And they're starting to shift back on a liquid and Senya might find himself in a little bit of trouble. Doesn't exactly march the steps of the high ground. There's still it seems like it's being picked out. Yeah, Nisha, I believe he scouted one of the heroes, so he immediately pinged it out. 
No, he definitely. Gonna drop down, down Observer though. Ward and look at this deforestation in the top lane. AA starting with the Quelling Blade. Know that he's playing against Tree and Protector, so he's gonna remove Nikkei? most of the trees. He's in and Nikkei, he's very dead yeah, here. Yeah, Blood Grenades there. They've got the Battle Hunger on him. They're even gonna add a plus one to Matthew, who's gonna come over just in case. Axel it's first blood going the way of Evil Geniuses as Whisper grabs him. Whisper's like, sorry, but not sorry. I also want to get to my ring of health as soon as possible. He did not want to take it, but they also lost the vision. Templar Assassin, sorry, Phantom Assassin could not attack, but uh, yeah, he's going to use that gold wisely. You get to your Vanguard early on in this lane, Terrorblade, he really can't touch you. So really looking for that Vanguard just to maintain in this lane. And of course, you know, the TB going to that early level under the Metamorphosis, try to secure that early farm, maybe put some damage out there and... See what he can do once he does get that meta the second time. That's usually when you will see something maybe killer, but against a tanky tree and potentially a, a Ring of Health Axe on that second Metamorphosis that's going to come, I don't know if they really have the damage potential coming into the later minutes. Yeah, usually we see him starting with like reflection and then playing the lane, but uh, he wanted to secure some of the earlier CS and Matthew going to pull the creep wave back between Tier 1 and Tier 2 Tower. Also, a lot of the times you'll see Trend Protector starting with Orb of Venom, but you're playing against Reflection, so you don't want to get slowed. So, starting instead with the Magic Stick. Problem is, there are not many trees to work with in this top lane, because, again, Insania started with the Quelling Blade. Very standard AA item pickup right there. Oh, yeah. Before, it would mean, you know, you're griefing, you're turning into carry, but uh, against <laughs> Nature's Prophet, against Three and Protector, uh, you, you need to have it on the supports. Matthew, I, uh, thinking about maybe... Bottom lane onslaught, coming through as well as the Bramble Knee, is not going to catch anybody, but into the Shadow Realm and throwing that shot over to Pakaz, and... It looked like they might get Boxy Hughes down to about 200, 175 health, but a good onslaught coming through from Zai, pushing them away, and... Keeping him alive. Mid matchup so far, 10 and 2 for C Smile. Oh, Misha's only got a couple, but Zai bottom and Pekaz, ooh, Onslaught in, looking for the right click to get the kill, but he'll die first. They do end up getting the Phantom Assassin, but they lose that Primal Beast to Pekaz before he gets that kill. At least Pakaz got that last hit. If he yeah. didn't get it, that would be very bad for EG, but. Uh, Overall, not a bad trade because uh, you were, were already low on HP and you have a massive, this is double wave we're talking about uh, and he's keeping it close to the tower. As Phantom Assassin, you should be able to farm those. Oh, look at this slow in the top lane. Going for it, looking for Insania, trying to get this Ancient Apparition, gets back towards the tower. Now the eyes are on Matthew as they need one more shot to get that kill. Mickey gets it and we'll have a battle hunger on him. They're down kind of low on the side of Liquid. They can't kill Whisper, but getting a kill there is... Everything that they kind of want at the moment in a lane that's kind of tough to find some kills is Nisha rolls in on a C-Smile, and C-Smile needs to be very careful about his positioning. Mid is pretty even, as expected. You know, this is Pango against Earth Spirit, so both heroes are going to do well. Especially in this patch, I think like you need to know how to play these two heroes. Kick underneath the tower, C-Smile will swashbuckle away. Yeah, and you should try to put some pressure on a C-Smile and throw him under that tower. I've seen that attempt a couple of times. The cooldowns aren't exactly that high. He doesn't have a lot of mana to work with anymore for it, but... We'll see how both the heroes adjust as they're sitting level 4. Bottom lane seems to be a, a pretty back-and-forth aggressive lane where there is that stun. Of course, there's the Onslaught to get on top, maybe a Bramble Maze. If they get that extra lockdown on Liquid, they could get themselves a kill. Whisper can kind of be by himself at this point, too. He's already got that ring of health. And they do leave him over alone. And Nisha, the nature's grasp. Matthew's over mid, making this Earth Spirit's life a little bit uncomfortable. They might try to go for Whisper in the top lane before he gets Vanguard. I believe they do have enough damage. May, might need a Blood Grenade for some extra slow. Reflection, Metamorphosis, level 2. It's a ton of damage, so Whisper, he wants to stay slightly less greedy right now, pick up right. that Vanguard, because he's getting very close to it, just 100 gold away. Already has that Courier over at the Secret Shop, pick up that Vitality Booster, and then Vanguard should be good to survive in this lane. Well, kill is early on, things quieting down as everybody's getting their first few levels under their belt. 
Nasty maybe Mickey making a move before he's got this metamorphosis. Nobody coming through the Twin Gates just yet. We've seen a couple of teams utilize that, but Cold Feet, Whisper, slowed up, gets out of the range, so he's not going to freeze over. Meanwhile, Sea Smile over mid. He's out of mana, and he's only got 200 life to live with, so he's got to walk all the way back to base as he's got an empty bottle, and this leaves the lane open for Nisha. This will push Nisha closer to level 6, even though Erzprit's not the hero that needs level 6 by any means, but right. he's also a hero that once you get that level 6, you can easily make a rotation, especially with the 6-minute rune. Zania. Both feeds on to Matthew, but not before he dies is that going to have him freeze over. The Nature's Grass is down. They've got some spins coming out from Whisper. With the Metamorphosis, he'll get the kill on Matthew. It ends up being a trade, and again, Whisper is kind of the one who can stand his ground, help out with some damage from that counter helix, and... Okay, sitting low, but he's a okay for now. As Terrorblade, you should be pretty happy with these trades because Ancient Apparition can come back to lane, bring you some extra region for you. You got the right. solo XP, you got the last hit gold. I want to see this six minute rune rotation. Boxy, he's already in the river. It's going to be for Nisha. Regeneration. That's a big one. Sea Smile's not gonna find anything, but might find Insania, no rune, however. And Insania's kind of in this really good spot for Sea Smile because he can bounce off those steps and try to get the nice kill, but now the from kick from Insania. Still gonna get the kill. So with the Swashbuckle gets the kill, the Bramble Maze is down, Sea Smile in some trouble, but he does have the help of Matthew. Uh-oh. The living armor, he's able to really <laughs> just take a, a beat down and not really lose a lot of life. This leaves... Both offlaners with Vanguard. Not your traditional item on Primal Beast, but right. the, I think in this situation, you want to tank up as much as possible. We already talked about like limited damage that they have, unless they rotate Pango or Axe early on. I don't think Primal Beast is dying. Or three, and I was taking a look. There will be another stack of trample on top of the cons, but not really doing anything trying to clean up some of these creeps, and this is a triple stack on the Ancients that I stamp in the big camp over in the triangle for the side of EG. I'm just, you know, we, we were talking stacks beforehand, and there's no stacks made for Liquid in their own triangle. Yeah, we talked about the importance of the stacks, uh, one of the reasons why Panda moved to the top lane, because Vengeful Spirit can stack multiple camps. There's five against zero. Right. Trade Protector can, like, he's super slow. He can stack one, maybe two, but you need to use mana, and it's not... Like you have some extra mana to spare. It's 90 yeah, mana for Nature's Grasp. We talked missile, about this. And going through the Twin Gate gets the Sunder off. Whisper comes over. Four heroes here for the side of Evil Geniuses. They have the control, but is it going to be enough? He's low on Mickey. There's the Culling Blade. They'll chop him in half, get the Terror Blade out of the fight to start. But Bacchus isn't working with a lot of health here. He does have a Living Armor. Throws a Stifling Dagger over onto the Dark Willow, who goes into the Shadow Realm. So throws a shot over on a pan of the Ooh, another the edge, dunk. lands on a Boxy, has a chance at another Culling Blade, and will cut Boxy in half as well. So a good fight for Evil Geniuses as they look even further for Nisha, who's going to try and get through the Twin Gate. As it's a long jump over, and Paul was on cooldown for another two seconds once he got through. Yeah, some good early rotations from EG, not just like supports coming through the gates, but also Pakaz showing up as level 5 Phantom Assassin. Like, we've seen that from LGD quite a lot. Shiro being super active, going through the gates, especially when he's playing Luna and Panda. We'll go through the gates, get the D-Vord. Yeah, but they look for the Nisha. roll, they've got Panda. It's the roll, but should still be a kill. Yeah. Nisha getting that kill, and... He's not sitting too high with CS, but net worth-wise, he's middle of the pack. He's ahead of the Pangolier for now. Structures are fortified. Trying to get anything he can. And look at how deep evil geniuses are. While they were killing Terrorblade, they placed down this deep observer ward. Might get devoted later on, but they might find Terrorblade again. Mickey, he's in trouble. They know he, he has some thunder. thunder. Yeah, they've got the call. It's another dunk. This is a problem for Mickey. This is not just one death, but it's going to be a second one here. Never mind. <laughs> oh. I think it's fine if Pakaz, uh, you know, just get, grabs the kill there. Because <laughs> when you're playing with Axe, most of the time you will not get any of the kills. He wants to take all of them, and you can't really blame Axe players. It's good kills for Pakaz, right? But is the is it a worry that he's getting too involved right now? Or would you rather him be sitting back and farming more as Rolling Thunder was used over in the river? They've got a magic missile. They'll bounce up Nisha again. And with the swashbuckle, they're going to get another kill. 
See Smile looking perfect with that Rolling Thunder, but now can he survive? With the retaliation coming out for Team Liquid, they get the come to see Smile. They look over at Panda. They've got the trample. Some metamorphosis shots coming in from Mickey. And uh running away. Bramble Maze down, doesn't wrap around anybody. Liquid only come out with a pango kill. But it looks that pango kill is pretty big. I mean, he had double damage. One of the reasons why they got the kill on Anisha had that swashbuckle. It took them down to like 70% HP. Zai. We'll pick up the bottle from Nisha, use haste rune, and they're immediately gonna smoke. Vesper is super farm, just 300 gold away from his blank dagger, has Thumber's toy. That just... It might kill him there, though. Vanguard, it's also phase boots. A lot of the times you will not see Over it, but make it a move using that haste. Yeah, Bramble Maze, that holds him down. He's got a call, but it's only extending the inevitable death of his. It's a four times killing streak going the way of Zai, giving him a good chunk of gold on this primal beast. He's second in the net worth now. He's going. Vanguard, Phase Boots, Blademan. Oh, you can disassemble Vanguard, get into Heart later on. It's just become extremely tanky. In terms of like damage that they have on the ground, it's not the best. We already talked about Vengeful Spirit, Trin Protector, not dealing the most damage early on. Both of these supports are very defensive based early on with the swap, uh, with the overgrowth, living armor, but there's gonna be always this threat against Phantom Assassin. It's Blade Mail, and they might pick up uh, two of them. For now, Nisha is going for full Spirit Vessel to reduce some of the healing, have extra damage. We've seen Nisha use Magnetize and completely whiff it, but the uh, We'll need another one. Like, that's gonna be a ton of damage. Has those Urn of Shadow Charges. Spirit Vessel is being delivered as we speak. Is that gonna be an item where they make a move right after he picks it up, smoke up, and go? Try to get something? Huh? I, I could see it happening. I just wanna see if they have, but they don't have any smokes at the moment, not on the hero, so... I just need to farm up a little bit more. Because also having a decent time on Phantom Assassin, didn't invest his gold to upgrade into Orb of Corrosion. Instead, he's just farming with the casual Blightstone and this we're farming some gigantic stacks here in the outer ring. And this should be pretty good timing on this Battle Fury as he only sits about 700 gold away from it. And the map's been pretty open for him. He's been involved in five of the eight kills that EG have. You know, he got yeah, we said for the kill on like Nikkei. he mentioned that Bakaz is very active and we saw him rotating as a level five phantom assassin getting early involved which gave him some you know good chunk of gold they did manage to kill the tower in the top lane Zai. soul rings next for him a little bit of mana sustain for uh this primal beast He's been doing all right. You know, he only has one death, one kill, but now he's come over. He's got that blade mail. He has a stack to take. Boost up his net worth going forward. He's sitting top of the net worth for the side of Liquid. And with the game slowing down for the last few minutes or so, it's also giving Mickey an opportunity to kind of farm up too. Yeah, I could see EG getting a smoke and maybe smoking into enemy, like, tormentor area, try to snatch the XP rune, because Pango just finished off the Fusel. This is the big timing for Pango, a lot of minus armor, and of course, he found himself a Lance of Pursuit. You turn the back on Pango, this is got, like, Ricky is, like, <laughs> this is like, you know, upgraded Ricky. One swashbuckle from behind, extra slow, extra slow from Orb of Corrosion, a lucky shot, the minus armor. These swashbuckles are gonna hurt. They need to take him down instantly. So is Ricky at home better than Ricky in life? Yeah, Ricky, Ricky at home, this, uh, <laughs> Pango might Smoke do the trick. Liquid. It breaks. They go to the Rolling Thunder immediately from Sea Smile. Bramble Maze down. Overgrowth soon to be used here by Matthew. They're bumping up Boxy into the air back and forth as he's on the edge of those steps. Magnetized placed on a Matthew as well as Sea Smile. The swashbucker to get and try and get the kill on a Boxy. They've also got the Battle Hunger in the Wave of Terror we'll that gets it. They get Boxy, but they look over. Pulverize. Ice Blast coming in with the Spirit Vessel. Down goes Sea Smile. And two heroes are dead on the side of evil geniuses as the smoke was broken. It looked like a good retaliation from EG, but Liquid come out ahead. Axe was not in that fight. I'm not sure where Axe gold went because he was like very close to his blank dagger a couple of minutes ago. He's got this Vanguard he died once, but he's... Yeah. This was supposed to be like the big timing. They only smoked with two heroes, Strain Protector and Pango. And Liquid was so ready. Liquid with some moist moves. 
ready to counter smoke into the enemy jungle, finding the right targets. Finally, they have Blink Dagger on Axe. 15 minutes into the game, a bit... Uh, I mean, he did purchase a Blade Mail. Sometimes you'll see just, like, immediately into Blink Dagger if they lack initiation, but uh, seems like he prioritized some more farming and also clearing the Ancient Creeps. It's not like you don't have Counter Helix to deal with it, but... Uh, Nisha? Uh-oh, Nisha. Scouting things out. The rest of the team a bit far away. Not jumped yet, but everybody's here for EG. <laughs> Blink call trying to roll. That's an easy one for EG. Whisper actually missing the calling blade, so that's going to be on cooldown for 100, but where do they get this kill? Nisha just on the opposite side of the map, away from the rest of his squad. Whisper as well as Panda all nearby on Insania and Zai. They might look to make another move as Whisper blinks into the lane, and now they've got the Onslaught, the Trample, the Ice Blast. The swap was only on a Zai. It doesn't save Whisper's life, and now the Pulverize. That means two die. See Smile trying to get something out of this with the Rolling Thunder. They've got the Nature's Grass down. Overgrowth committed to lock down Zai and make sure that Sea Smile can stay on top of him, but the Onslaught bounces them up into the air, and now he's able to run away. No way he's getting out of this one. In a second, but the distance isn't there, and it's off the mark. He just TPs out. Oh man, Zai, what a player. Like all of these items that he invested into having this blade mail, having Vanguard, Magic Wand, Ogre Axe, uh, upgrading this Ring of Protection into Soul Ring like 13 minutes into the game. He becomes super tanky, gets on slot on like sliver of the HP and manages to survive. Zai is carrying this game really hard for Liquid. Still looking to fight bottom, terrorize. That lands, the fear is there, but the battle hunger ticking him out. So Insania not able to be saved, and they're still coming over, but a TP away from the Dark Willow, and the rest of Liquid have evacuated the area. Zai going into the BKB. We talked about how important this item is for a Primal Beast, and he now sits tied atop of the Nantworth with his own Terror Blade, so his item times have been quite good. Ooh, roll blocked with the Blink coming in from Whisper. He's not able to get out of this one, and now they've got the Magic Missile, the Nature's Grasp, the Control, use. but... He'll roll away from this side of EG. Maybe he'll look to reinitiate. He drops down, gets the roll. They've got the onslaught. Now they're going on to the Venge. Pandalo, magic missile. Shield crashed through. Matthew's low as well. He'll be the first one to fall on the side of Evil Geniuses. They're still chasing Panda. Panda, trying to find him with a magnetize on him. Nisha, shield rune's only got a sliver left. Only eight oh, available on it. Tumblr's toy. Panda away from Nisha. Can he TP out the roll? Not connecting yet, but finally gets the vision to put the spirit vessel on him. He puts himself into the corner, and Nisha eventually, oh, the swap, <laughs> will get the kill. We'll do some of that damage taken, but the ward that Panda placed, I believe, is going to get dewarded because Nisha caught a glimpse of it, and yeah, he's going to go in there and deward that one, get some extra gold for Boxy, experience for himself. Team Liquid, they have two of the best initiators in the game that don't require blink daggers who are super tanky you have primal beast you have earth spirit who can easily roll in onslaught in find the right targets and they have this thing to reduce your healing not just with the spirit vessel but of course ancient apparition if they lock onto a target ice blast like there needs to be immediate swap from EG to try to save the hero that's being focused by liquid yeah the swap that happened top was onto the uh, primal beast maybe they yeah, would be able to save like, whisper yeah attack. If they had gotten him with that swap. Now he's got that blink dagger. He's also looking for a BKB on the axe. Only a 2,000 net worth lead here for Liquid. E Evil Geniuses, I think some would say with the first phase of the group stage performance that EG had, this should have looked more one-sided, but they are really holding their own. You have that sigh of relief getting through that tiebreaker, and now you can kind of reset, right? Like, you have a chance to be in the upper bracket. Granting that second life. But uh, they could be potentially in the upper bracket, as you said, so a lot at stake here. They also have Phantom Assassin, one of the strongest late game carries in the game, and it's only 2k gold lead for Liquid at the moment. Mickey has been, like, very silent going into Manta style to amplify some of his farm, and you know that these e-gamers, they love to build Manta style against Trian Protector every single time they play against it, they don't want to purchase into early BKB. 
This is my problem with like Trinity Protector position four, where you can't really do as many things. Um, if you're like snowballing the game, the hero is going to shine because you can get to those items. For now, you have arcane boots and you have your shard. It's uh, relatively annoying to deal with him because he can like break your smokes. You need to carry dust, put a lot of sentries down. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of scaling, like getting to your second, third item can be very difficult. One of the reasons why Matthew has hand of Midas queued up. He thinks, you know, that this game might last long enough for him to get the, the value going from that hand of Midas, but it's very, very far away. <laughs> yeah, he's not... You would be happy about this. You would be like, yeah, he's halfway there, 200 gold. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I, I just, I, I sensed by the way you said he's only got 200 up, gold. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking maybe I just say he's close to this Midas to see what the reaction is. But close to gloves of haste. Yeah, he's almost got the gloves of haste. And maybe he could get that blink dagger. By the way, as you were talking about all that, Kaz got his BKB. We'll see how they react with that. Swashbuckle magnetized. That comes in with That's the three man silence. One. Now they're going to onslaught. They've got the swap, but it's on a map. with the spirit vessel on them. It's on all of them. will take them out. And now they've got the kill on the three with Panda falling. That BKB proving useful for Zai. And they clean up one, two, three heroes on EG and should be able to take a tier two tower. The water roll in from Nisha Magnetized onto three. I believe Geoming AA Blast right connected onto two of them, plus the Spirit Vessel, and also amplifying all of that damage. Ancient Apparitions, Ice Vortex, it's maxed out. That's extra 25% damage increase. Plus also an item that uh, usually we don't see. Boxes with Veil of Discord is going to amplify some of that damage. Boxes is not playing for himself. You're not going for Hand of Midas and then trying to get Aghanim Scepter. Maybe later on, but for now he understands that most of that damage is going to be magic. And look how fast Whoa. they melt. Three man geomagnetic grip with the magnetize. I and mean, that is perfect play from Nisha. The silence has made it impossible for them to leave, leave, leave the fight. And the swap really didn't do anything either. Liquid finding a stride and really flowing into a lead here as they've got themselves a 6k advantage. Uh, Tormentor picked up for the side of EG. They do get that shard for Pangolier. Sue Smile's got that roll up now. And he's looking to get himself a Lincoln's, try and survive and not get himself pulverized into the ground Yamcha style. You need some kind of a defense against that. Uh, also, you're playing into Terrorblade, the uh, Sunder. EG has been, like, relatively quiet. They're still farming. Phantom Assassin is level 17. Finished off BKB, about to finish off Dessa. Holding Orb of Destruction, so that's gonna be a ton of minus armor coming up from Phantom Assassin. Liquid, going for their own Tormentor. Boxy dropping low, but uh, he's fine. And because he dropped his HP dropped lowest, he's gonna receive the shard. I wish it worked that way. That's the secret, though. If you That's lose the secret the sauce, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you lose the most <laughs> HP going for Tormentor, your chances of getting that shard just they escalate. So now he's got that upgrade of the Cursed Crown. Bramble's making things very difficult, and it'll force these heroes into having perfect positioning, truthfully. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. There's going to be so much stuff on the ground from Liquid, like a random Ice Vortex. Bramble Maze now with the Cursed Crown upgrade, Magnetize, Reflection, uh, Primal Beast running in. It's going to be a very difficult game for EG to, like, they need to be the one starting the fight. Otherwise, I feel like if they get initiated on, uh, damage has already been done and they will need to fall back. Roll. Observer Ward, Nisha, Ups. he's in as Blade Mail, as another Shield Rune, so he's, he's really not afraid to jump in. How many times has he had Shield Rune already? I don't know. After three, I stopped counting. <laughs> Extra 1,277 effective HP. Uh, that is a lot. Bring them over like 3,800 effective HP. Which for an Earth Spirit 24 minutes into the game makes you feel pretty invincible as he's also almost got this heart. So. Shows up on your screen for a second. The Primal Beast pick win rate, but they go in with the Pulverize and the quick damage with a Bedlam on top of this Zai Primal Beast. Doesn't even need to use the BKB as they kill off C-Smile with ease. They'll go right into Roche off that. And this should secure them Roche. Primal Beast having this level 15 talent. Uh, 
having the spell mechanic off his own if necessary against a lot of this stuff like we we're talking about wave of terror uh train protector ulti what are you laughing about <laughs> the onslaught into the roche pit knocking mickey out of it <laughs> thank you see it's, it's it was kind of funny yeah zai wants the, the ages for himself he's a real carry for the first 25 minutes yeah So immediately moving towards top. You see that Matthew is pushing in the creep wave. Bound regeneration. Go to plus win probability. It's quite up there for Liquid, and they are going to find Matthew at the end of the day. Okay, gets a kill there, and Liquid with another one under their belt. Look bottom, ice blast coming in, and this is gonna be another I, I top bottom. Your spirit. You know that things are not going Whoa. well for you if you're losing heroes in the bottom, in the top lane. They're also holding the ages. Seems like Team Liquid might be ready to go tower is under attack. and take out these last uh, tier two towers. Not sure if they want to like commit to a high ground. There's nothing in the bottom, but if they find another opening, they might go for it. So look at this uh, damage. magical damage coming out. It's uh, <laughs> mostly magical. Everything except Terrorblade. And we still haven't seen Mickey hit heroes because he's been jungling for the good, like, 15 minutes, pretty much. And something that we did mention, like Terrorblade, he is also not afraid to get, get Scotty, become super tanky. He's sitting at uh, 34 armor at the moment. And another hero that uh, kind of likes to buy MKB. Another combo. Yeah, look at C-Smile, forced to roll out. He does survive. I mean, that's something. Now they're going to go to the swap. They've got themselves the call. Zai's caught. Terrorize comes in, but it's not going to be enough to save the Primal Beast. Battle Hunger onto Earth Spirit, but Nisha makes the roll up onto the high ground and escapes the grasp of EG, who, you know, kind of use a lot just to get that kill. Those BKB is going to be on cooldown now if uh, Liquid maybe attempt with the next Metamorphosis to take a fight soon after. But without Zai at the moment, they'll probably stay at their distance. AG probably happy with the kills that they got, even though they traded two nine-second BKBs, they still managed to get a kill, and also Pakaz getting last hit, getting closer to that level Radiance 20 talent. As he has a ton of uh, damage coming out, also Radiance finding a tier 3 token. Let's see what he's gonna get from it. Alan Tunic is afraid of Terrorblade, his right clicks before he gets MKB. Us. That BKB now has that Basher. Deso, only two charges on it. It was a later Deso after he went Battle Fury BKB into the Desolator. Yeah, it wasn't Deso now, it was Deso later. That's why. They're still uh, gonna go and try to take this tier one tower top. A couple of you. minutes left on that Aegis. What the hell? Rambo Rambo Maze. Maze? Yeah. Gotta connect. They're still going. They want Panda. They'll get themselves the Pulverize and the kill. Mickey with another. And do they look even further? They do. See Smile actually taking a lot of damage. The roll from Nisha all the way in. Stifling Blade dagger. Bell? Can he get the he kill though? Uh oh. They'll take out See Smile. Down goes Matthew. Pakaz not doing enough damage. He doesn't have enough health. Health either. Or help. Nisha. Rinkin, call on He's Nisha. In, into tier fours, but this heart regeneration, Dragon Scale keeping him alive. They're super tanky, and something that we did mention is Pangler, he's never gonna feel too comfortable rolling on the top of Terrorblade. If he used meta, like, he can just shred him. So, needs to be careful. This is not also Pangler that does have Lincoln Sphere, Aghanim Scepter. It's a Blink Dagger for now. A Dandelion Amulet, so a little bit of a magic resistance, but uh, still physical damage coming out from Terrorblade is insane. He's uh, having his MKB finish going into BKB next, but they're still gonna respect this high ground defense from EG. Because Divine Rapier queued up. So. It's a bit of an early one. Let's see uh, if he can make something happen with it. Ooh, Got the light mail off again. Now, Ice Blast coming in. BKB's gonna wear out in just a moment from Whisper, but they've got the bash, they'll have the right clicks. Matthew is the one who gets that kill. He'll pick up a good 699. Some good initiations from Whisper, finding Nisha two times in a row, blocking his roll as well. Going into Refresher next on Axe. They feel like they lack 
this control. So with Refresher, you will have two BKB charges, uh, two calls available where they can actually burst people down. It's all it takes, Phantom Assassin, someone to hold them in place. I want to see if Pakaz actually wants to commit to this Divine Rapier. It's a bit of a the riskier side. This is like 30 minutes we're talking about. Right. I would say maybe you want one more item before that, something that makes you more survivable in a fight like this, but he's been trying to pick off and get in and out of these fights. This is also pre-shard, pre-Aghanim Scepter, yeah. even though like Aghanim Scepter got nerfed relatively heavy in the previous patch. We'll see if Pakaz wants to commit to it. Might buy Relic after selling Great Band and then like have potential nullifier if he doesn't want it. What's, what's the, the, is it just a straightforward, like you want Whisper and half Pakaz to get the damage out as the game plan for EG? Like, what's a more detailed look for them as, you know, they are starting to get down by quite a bit. It's 9,000 now, but with one more fight, it could be a, quite a formidable deficit on them. Oh, overgrowth from Matthew holding them in place. And now they're starting used. to come over. They've got the call, they have the Ice Blast, but it's not enough of a deterrent. Kaz has the kill. Ghost Scepter used by Insania. You know, I asked for the details, but EG would rather show me because Insania's dead. Two heroes gone. They have buyback available on the Ancient Apparition. They go to the Magnetize as well as the Geo Magnetic Crypt. They're looking for the roll on a Whisper. That's a kick. That's a kill. Onto Whisper. Down goes the Axe. They've got control of the Phantom Assassin with the BKB trying to TP out. Terrorize Throne, but it's not going to matter Ooh, with the close. BKB lasting a second long enough. Panda? Do they have any reveal, uh, Insania? Not very around him, but no. Sai's gonna find him. Ambitious. Insania used buyback in that one. Very, very greedy Manta from Terrorblade. All the heroes were missing. He pops the Manta style to farm, and they catch him. The power of Trend Protector being invis holding the gem, and then he couldn't get out of Overgrowth. Ooh, uh, still Matthew. no BKB on him. They see him. That's gem. This yep. is massive. So they're gonna be able to devoid and also see this annoying train protector who just set things up to kill Terrorblade. And that's gonna mean that they need to find a pickoff in a much harder way than just having Matthew in deep to get that gem back. And Sini is gonna be holding it, but we'll see if he continues to hold that. Otherwise, maybe they get a pickoff on the Ancient Apparition to get that gem back in their hands. And Pakaz, after seeing Yule Scepter, Ghost Scepter, Glimmer Capes, Aeon Disc, also on Dark Willow, he's gonna change his mind and go for Nullifier. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense. Because if you commit to Divine Rapier, this is also a nice play. Like, the, he still got stunned by Onslaught, but Boxy also very quick to find him with the Yule Scepter. Matthew with the <laughs> smile. <laughs> almost, almost. So they're gonna put pressure on over bottom. Boxy, he's got Yules, like you said, has the Aeon disc to survive with the Null Fire now in the hands of the Phantom Assassin. Maybe they could take that away and clean up the Dark Will, who's eh, got that Veil as well, but landing a good Terrorize and or having the Bedlam on top of Zai really does add to the fight for them. So taking Dark Will out might be a bit of a priority going forward. We'll see how they fight. We'll see how they hold, because it's also not that easy like you said, for Matthew, because of the fact that they've got the gem in the hands of Liquid. And that's being helped by Boxy at the moment. Which we'll see how much that works, because it's not like Dark Willow is deep into the fights, right? Like, he's usually sitting on the back. Yeah, you want to keep the distance. Azai might be the one holding it, but seems like he's prioritizing having Soul Ring as right. his mana tool because primal beast he does consume a lot of mana especially when there's nothing happening you want to be farming those camps uh, as fast as possible and then getting out of trouble so after that fight things quieting down a little bit for liquid but they are also setting up for the next roche they're not trying to lose anybody before this roshan respawns and mickey out for a second but back in sees that roche is available and this should favor Liquid, but they're not taking it immediately, just at maybe looking to see if EG come their way. I don't think EG's gonna defend this one. Because lanes are, all three lanes are pushed in. Terrorblade causing a lot of problems. They don't have that one hero who deals well with TB illusion. Sometimes you'll see like supports picking up 
some Dagon, but uh, yeah. I, they're, they're really not close. Matthew, Matthew again. Spotted, yeah. Uh, he well, he already lost his gem, so can't lose it twice. That is true. Now they kind of know where the side of Liquid is, but like you said, they're not going to be defending this one. They're, they're trying to get their next items or so, and Pengal, you're trying to get into the Octarine core. You know, he's 500 gold away from that. Because I believe, finished the, uh, he has the Abyssal Blade, so he's going to have that extra little touch of lockdown, and he's got a double damage now bottled up. So that could, could be a different taking taker. Fight with that and uh, in a rough spot, Yules from the Dark Willow. They have the Bedlam, a Shadow Realm Strike from Boxy to get the kill on a Panda, so now both supports are dead on EG. Right off that so, Roche. Uh, having a hard time pushing the high ground, like one swap, one call from Axe could cause a lot of issues. And also you can't deal chip damage to the towers because of living armor. Um, it, it does not make it easy to just put a little bit of chip damage on, but this top tier three not being healed at the moment. Got a thousand health. If maybe he's working on mid. Okay. Matthew out for he's going axe, so no, he's going Midas. He's Ooh. Midas is being delivered on courier. 35 Ooh. minute Radiant recovery Midas. So he, he ended up getting the blink before the Midas, too. When he had that queued up originally, I thought maybe he'd go Midas first, but ends up going into the blink dagger, then the Midas, which now at 35 minutes, if they can hold, might pay itself off, but we'll see. So that's already a long used the glyph. Out. Terrorblade meta still up and running for another good 30 seconds. EG I'm gonna smoke. smoke, double damage. Popped by Pakaz, level 23 Phantom Assassin with Nullifier, full Abyssal Blade, and now has Divine Rapier through that. There's the swap, Stifling Dagger. They're gonna look and try to get the kill here out of the Terrorblade. They've got the Ice Blast coming in. That's gonna land on the three of these heroes. They've got Mickey low, but can they get the kill? They'll take out his first wife, Pakaz, Whisper, and Panda all gone. Pakaz bought out. He does not have buyback. They got the oh, kill on the Terrorblade, but this is terrible as they'll lose his smile. This might be the game. Insania with some like good plays, landing Ice Blast, I believe, on pretty much all of them. And also Zai jumping in, Pulverize, grabbing the target. And the, this might be the game. 65 seconds with no Phantom Assassin. You're going to be playing against Mega Creeps, or if they're going to fish, see does, if Pakaz does have buyback. Uh oh, this is very dangerous territory for EG. They're going for the throne. Can you? Potentially make a move here, trying to throw these magic missiles out with the shard to stun up a couple. But they're still going for the tier four as you have Matthew to try and give it living armor to hold on longer, but that's not working out right now. And Whisper, he's going to start farming. Maybe thinking that they can hold. He left the base. He's, he's out of there. Now they've got the swap. Cool. Fountain's not going to do enough. They've got the roll. They've got the glyph, but they still call GG. And that will be game one going the way of Team Liquid over Evil Geniuses. Oof. Team Liquid getting the jump and getting the kill on Phantom Assassin who invested everything. This was the best shot that EG had pretty much because Phantom Assassin had double damage. They managed to burst Terrorblade, but he was still holding the Aegis. Even without Aegis, I still feel, you know, that would be a really good fight for Liquid. EG, yeah. a bit on the slower side. Like, we've seen some teams picking up this Trian Protector plus Vengeful Spirit duo and then lacking damage. I think Liquid utilized this perfectly, finding the perfect pick pretty much for the game. All these three heroes, they don't really do much, and then they picked Terrorblade, put this Earth Spirit on the mid lane, and also having Primal Beast in the bottom lane, Zai carrying pretty hard for the first like 25 30 minutes of the game he was all over the place being on top of the network and uh, both supports as well off liquid going for these pickoffs uh, they show up and uh, we gotta give credit to itemization veil of discord on boxy synergizes nicely with primal beast and also ancient apparition second ability gives them ton of damage we saw in a couple of these fights how quickly they melt yeah it was really good from liquid so they keep their winning ways going and uh well, they're now up one nothing over Evil Geniuses. To break it down further for you, we've got the panel. So, guys, take it away. Thank you very much, B Cup and Lacoste, for that incredible game of Team Liquid versus Evil Geniuses. Unfortunately for EG fans, Team Liquid continues the winning streak up against the South American Juggernauts and now put themselves in a great position to enter the playoffs in an upper bracket seed. I'm joined on panel by Winter, by Lizard. 
Liz, first time you've been on camera today. How are you feeling, fam? What's up? I'm yeah, feeling great. Took a little walk this early morning around Seattle. Met some Dota fans in the city. Oh, yeah? And I'm right on time for the good, good stuff. Right on time for the good stuff. Unfortunately, Winter wasn't good stuff necessarily from EG all around, but it didn't look so bad at the beginning. Uh, where do you think the game started to fall apart for them and Liquid starting to take control? I mean, when their heroes can't really do enough damage because their, their overall lineup composition, like the supports, Venge, Trian, they don't really do much uh, in the early game. Mm. Like uh, the Axe and the Pango are the only heroes that are kind of doing some damage compared, if you're comparing it to the Earth Spirit and, and Primal Base on Liquid. Those two heroes, when they're roaming around, they're far more scary, you know? If you're X, you, you kind of need like some Skyrath hero or Dark Willow with you, you mm -hmm. know? You, you don't really want to be roaming with a Venge or a Trian Protector. Yeah. And it's not only the, the supports, right? Like the Venge and the Trian obviously don't do anything, but with who can they play and make stuff happen? Like what are the combinations that EG can be successful with? Like even three heroes, which three heroes do you combo yeah. in to get kills fast enough and get away mm -hmm. with murder? Like you can't. On Team Liquid, Dark Willow plus any of the cores you've got to kill while TB is just farming chilling inch the apparition plus any of the cores and he's got a kill it doesn't even have to be three heroes right mm. so you can just chill and farm and uh, with the TB that is while your team does all the work which is exactly what happened here yeah they are relying on the PA way too much you know in this draft I sure you know if you get to late game and the PA has a bunch of items but if the game doesn't really get to that point then I feel like uh, it's really difficult for them to play to play the, uh, the map in the early to mid game, you know. Mm. I think Seasmal did uh, an amazing job in the early game uh, with uh, with his pango, but eventually yeah, just... I, I cannot believe my ears. <laughs> Raising Seasmal. <laughs> All right, I've seen it. What what happened this morning while I was gone? Well, this is a reformed man. I saw the chat <laughs> saying something about Winter and Artesi. Now he's <laughs> praising Seasmal. This is... A reformed man. I mean, the man right did, there. did a good job, you know, on his pango in the early game. Like I felt like uh, he played uh, as well as he could uh, mm. in the first like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, it was only so much he can do, you know, with yeah. uh, with the setup. Uh, unfortunately, their twenty fourth pick axe didn't exactly pan out like the way that they hoped for. Maybe they needed to go back to the drawing board and figure out if we have pango mid and we have uh, a PA draft with this kind of uh, passive like. You have you you pretty much have two position mm. five heroes, so you, you need the off lane to be kind of more like a, a damage dealer. Mm. That definitely makes sense, especially considering that the contemporary meta here on the road to the international has been a beefy cause where nobody dies. Just keep your entire squad alive, having people frontline for you. What do you make of this, Lizard? What's the counter like? And the thing is, Liquid keep doing this, but also picking ancient apparition, exactly. which is what you normally do to yeah, counter yeah. the tanky heroes. You, you already answered your question, right? Like it's the ancient <laughs> apparition. If you want to deal with the tanky boys, that's the hero to go for. You can see some other teams trying out Skyrat and things like that, right? All the amplified damage against the tanky boys, but Ancient Apparition has always been the one. Like, you get that hero. There's, there are some forbidden heroes to mention, like Timber Saw. I don't think we've seen him um, wow. at all. Who? Have, who? Have, have we seen him in the group stages I at all? I don't think so, so right? Yeah. In any case, Ancient Apparition is the perfect answer. But it's not only about having a lot of damage or these tanky dealer, tanky uh, hero breakers. It's about having any damage, which they didn't have. With Treant and Venge, it just isn't going to work. Mm. Well, Timbersaw has been completely ignored, Winter. But speaking more of this Ancient Apparition, I think it's probably not a mistake that Team Liquid, this is Insania's most played hero, four games, four wins on the AA. But one of the ways I know, Winter, that he really understands this hero is I was looking at his itemization, and it's different every single game, right? Even in this game, he ended up going for the Blink Dagger. Like, is there, is there a standard way you think the hero should be played to be itemizing, or should you be taking the Insania approach and just pick and choose depending on the game? It definitely depends on the on the game. The blink is a very ingenious approach because right now with the shot, yep. your ulti applies the cold feet, so you can just blink instant, stun somebody right away. Mm. So it's kind of nice to be able to do that. I feel like the overall the hero doesn't really have any build that you must do, yep. you know, in a particular game. It always depends on how the game is going, what your team needs. Yeah. Long, long time ago, Inch the Parishion needed uh, only one item. That's the Aghanims, right? No, no, like, no, no, no. This. He needs yeah, this. Midas and then <laughs> Aghanims, of course. First you get the Midas, then you get the item, uh, then you get the Aghanims, and then you get this smirk <laughs> from our boy, Senia. <laughs> yeah, he had a wonderful game. I'm not sure what exactly you need to do to get an MVP and an Ancient Apparition, but he got it, and yeah, we were blessed with the smirk. I mean, part of the reason why AA has been a good here right now is 
his enemies are no longer here. The zoo matter. Like, A doesn't really like yep. to play against the zoo heroes, the offlane zoo heroes, like the, the Visage, the Lycans, mm, the, uh, the Beastmaster, the Brutes, you know. Mm. Those heroes are kind of like gone, you know. So it's a perfect environment for A to, to thrive right now against all the strength heroes, the, the heroes that like to build hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep, yeah. hard. There, there, there are some teams that are still one team that's still trying to do it that's entity right like with some visages here and there but yeah I overall TSM does it too yeah but o overall i agree completely a is in a pretty good spot speaking right of now. all these tanker calls right now obviously eg have lost their first game so they need to do something interesting to bring things back for game two the hero they've been most successful with outside of the pa which they tried now for pakaz is a hero i'll admit lizard we've spoken on camera i'm cold about it kunka the water ah. boy Liquid did end up banning it against Evil Geniuses, mm -hmm. but given that it's their most successful hero overall, given how good Kunka has been looking these <laughs> last couple of days, given what you saw earlier from Spirit today on the big pirate man, don't you just first pick Kunka if you're in the hands of EG? Look, if you took the same draft and you mixed it up and you gave Sea Smile or Whisper Kunka, nothing would have changed. Like, you still get the same idea, the same draft, more or less. Mm. What you needed in that place is any sort of a kill hero on position 4 or 5. You needed some more damage, some more oomph. I think they got stuck a little bit in the... Um, in the Matthew ideas. Mm. He's always playing some yeah. invis, backliners, bounty hunter, Ricky bounty Trian. hunter, Ricky Trians, you know, he's always, I, I don't know, gimmicky. Mm. He's always playing. You, you cannot have a position five bench if you are playing. If you're playing like that. Uh, yeah. If all these uh, heroes are in the game, the bounty, the, the tree and the Ricky, the position five hero needs to be like something like a Phoenix, mm. uh, a Warlock. You need to be a damage dealer and you can push out waves and you have some team fight, you know, because all those other heroes, they don't do damage. They don't have a team fight. Mm. So your position five hero needs to kind of balance it out. Yep. The position five in this particular case, Matthew, has done quite a lot for the squad. And one thing that I found very interesting is that up until today, he'd played a different hero every single game, right? This is a second tree game, but every other game, it has something mm. new, something different, right? Four or five. Uh, uh, Matthew, Matthew, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Matthew. And it's, it intrigues me a lot, right? Because up against an opponent like Team Liquid, normally it's Liquid that does this massive variability in their drafts. But this tournament, they've been kind of reserved. It's actually been EG that have been very, very weird. But is it a good idea, do you all think, to have your five position be the one that is the one that rotates unique heroes every single game? I mean, they are kind of like... They have two fives, I feel. Like. Yeah. Both of them. Both Panda and Matthew, yeah. Mm. Yeah, like, like some drafts, I feel like... It, it's not exactly good, you know, when you have uh, Sea Smile and Whisper playing like the Axe and Pango, like you have two utility cores. I think it could work when you have greedier cores, then mm. you can run double five position heroes. So then they need to figure out how to find the balance yep. in the draft. And so far, honestly, I've loved the way Panda has been playing throughout the tournament, like uh, the rotations, the movements from the five. He's always there to end that kill. Yeah, he's it, very sacrificial. Right? Well, at times. Yeah. At times, he's that one. I'm just here in time for my core to die so that I can get experience <laughs> in the kill, you know? How Oops. Convenient. <laughs> how convenient, yeah. But he does do the job overall and I think that he is like ever since Bali that we talked to him I think you were on that podcast as well uh, were you? No, I was on with the Panda one. yeah in any case like he's such a marvelous guy very humble and I love the attitude that he has towards the game yeah I mean the big picture wise they just need to figure out how to find balance in the draft you know try not to tunnel vision too much onto a certain thing because what I'm feeling right now is they are trying to give Whisper a lot of priority in the pick order mm. and sometimes you have to try to consider not just comfort you know maybe he felt like x was yep. comfortable that game but he wasn't really actually really good with the mm. overall lineup because when you have the 24 pick there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulder mm. certainly a lot of responsibility right now within the game of dota 2 for the rest of eg if they want to figure out a way to get themselves back into a winning position and to tie out the series so that they do not drop down into the lower bracket once we reach the playoff stage on the road to the international of course though before we have them completely gone before we see liquid celebrating their win we still need to find out a bit more about evil geniuses themselves We've been speaking about Matthew a lot on the panel. Let's hear directly from the man himself about his journey here to Seattle. Muy emocionado. O sea, fue mi primer mi primer tiempo fue en Seattle y en realidad me sentí muy emocionado. Creo que fue la parte más emocionada de mi vida en el dota competitivo. Eh, porque fui parte de el primer equipo sudamericano de clasificado mundial. Entonces como que había mucho mucha emoción y a la vez muchos nervios ya que era la primera vez que competíamos internacionalmente. Y nada, como que llegamos al TI, 
dimos lo mejor de nosotros, pero lamentablemente nuestra falta de experiencia y los nervios también es como que jugaban en contra, ¿no? Y veníamos con equipos que venían jugando ya casi siete días, si no me equivoco. Entonces fue como que nuestra primera vez y fue una bonita experiencia. Creo que yo comencé a ser capitán a partir de 2018. Uh, en realidad lo que pasó fue que en Sudamérica yo sentía que la gran mayoría de personas jugaban muy bien Dota, pero tipo los capitanes no tenían una fluidez al hablar y no sabían comunicarse bien. Entonces yo sentía que tenía esa posibilidad, sentía que podía llegar a mis compañeros y podía como que hacer esa comunicación en la cual ellos se sientan cómodos y estén bien y, solamente, y solo necesitan jugar para ser un capitán en Sudamérica porque siento que es muy diferente ser capitán en Sudamérica que ser capitán en, en otra región. Entonces, básicamente fue eso, que yo sentía que tenía las cualidades para poder liderar a un equipo aquí. Welcome back to the road to the international. We are here with the third series of the day, game number two. It's Liquid against Evil Geniuses, and Game 1 went the way of Team Liquid, but we're right on into the second draft. Taking a look, Lacoste, take all this information in. What do you got for me so far? Uh, there's one hero that has not been banned, because Team Liquid, they banned out Phantom Assassin. Uh, sorry, Templar Assassin in the previous game, and this has to be, like, top three heroes for Pakaz. He's insanely good at the hero we saw throughout the first two days of the tournament uh, how well Templar Assassin can farm and how much damage this hero can deal in short period of time if you can keep this tempo. I want to see some changes from EPG. I want to see, you know, some more aggressiveness coming out from their position four and five. They picked Phoenix. So far, they haven't played Phoenix on support role. Uh, it was only Whisper who played it once. So they have this flexibility. I'm pretty sure that, you know, Matthew and Panda can play it, but uh, already liking how they're switching things up here. Yeah, last game, you know, Panda was on that Venge and it's the fifth time throughout the event so far that he played the Venge. It wasn't exactly the best performance from him overall. Maybe we'll see him on something a little bit different going forward if, uh, Maybe he goes back to the Grim that he liked a couple of times. He even, you know, he's gone to the Marcy once, but now Liquid, they go to the Bristle back, and this has been a very popular hero up to this point. Ten as, seconds, you know, Zai's only played it once, but we'll see how he does or if he's on it with the Nature's Five Prophet in their draft remain. already, too. Bristleback is super strong right now. Like, when, <laughs> when I first saw changes to Aghanim Scepter, didn't really like it until I saw some good players actually utilize that. He becomes uh, almost unkillable. And I think, uh, you know, EG, they might have been up to something, bending out this Ancient Apparition. Team Liquid coming with a strat, uh, picking Bristleback in this second phase immediately after seeing Ancient Apparition ban, because AA caused a lot of issues in the previous game. We also mentioned that we wanted to see Doom in the previous game, and now they're going to pick up this Grimstroke that you mentioned having double Doom. Uh, Doom doesn't mute items anymore, but it's still, you know, anti-healing, so something that is going to be super good against Bristleback, against the... Because Bristleback builds into Bloodstone, he also wants to get the Vanguard to become, you know, unkillable, sit in the middle of the fight, so this uh, Doom could come in super handy. So this is shifting most likely the Phoenix down to four, Grim five, right? With the Doom coming into the three position, or is there a different way that you would play this? Most likely. I think you want to give farm priority to Doom. They also haven't played it on position four. I know some of the teams love to play position four Doom. Nine Pandas are definitely up there. It is a flex pick for them, but uh, I feel like things are going to be, you know, pretty straightforward in this one. Doom 3, Grimstroke 5, uh, Phoenix 4. Uh, they might also switch between them. Depends, like, which carry they want to pick. If they want to use the carry that utilizes this Inkswell, they mo might go for the killer lane, but uh, we'll have to see. Yeah, you know, if that Phoenix ends up being a 4, it's a little bit different from EG overall in the draft because they yeah. are yet to pick their 4 position in that first slot. That's not really been the priority that they've been giving or showing. I, I know it's a small sample size at the end of the day, but... It is something a little bit different when it comes to those kind of dynamics in the draft for EG. Uh, I'm just thinking like what Liquid can pick here. I like Spectre a lot. I feel like this hero is super good right now being on low cooldown, 20 seconds less on her 
ulti is pretty massive and also just want to see some other guys that can jump Grimstroke, can jump Phoenix, having a bit of a global presence from Nature's Prophet. So whoever shows on the map, Spectre is not like exclusively late game hero anymore. She comes online super fast with the blade mail. And we've seen in some of the games that uh, this hero farm stacks extremely fast and it's all about stacking. Team Liquid didn't stack as much mm -hmm. as much as they usually do because they were like constantly Team running at G AG in the previous game. This time Liquid go for the Venge, and we'll see what they want to do to pair up with that in this phase of picks. They've got the Nature's Prophet, very mobile hero. Could potentially see something a little bit more global from them if maybe they want to go to like a safe lane Spectre and have Ten Nature's Prophet remaining. TP in with a Shadow Step uh, contribution. Five seconds and remaining. we can see the items that Insania went in the previous game. I really like this Blink Dagger on Ancient Apparition because it's not your typical AA item, but uh, I've seen pro players picking it up from time to time where you just like jump on top of the target that is stunned like you you pretty much become a guy that is following up on initial stun and there's gonna be like primal beast running in earth spirit you blink in right on top immediate aa ult Five and they can't dodge remaining. it they will pick up uh, ck and vengeful spirit uh, so this is gonna be strong lane seems like team liquid they want to fight in the lane and also having some kind of a save against doom so you get to doomed it's you you get swapped instead and also ck if you're the one initiating the fight if you have your illusions going you're gonna have a hard time finding which one is real for doom to find the right target Target. And now looking like the easiest Doom game of the moment, and now EG probably think about what's been shown to them and how they kind of have to react with Phoenix, Doom, and Grimstroke on the board for them already. And it's looking like they are going to want to match here with something, yeah. but... I'm, I'm down for some Sven or something like that. Mm. Uh, All right, yeah. as you say it, it, it becomes a reality. And uh, that's something uh, else reason, for us. And the reason why I like it is just you want to be the one like finding the right target going in and being the first initiator we saw in the previous game that uh, eg wanted to do that but uh, had a hard time finding the targets and also having cleave against ck and the illusions plus also having five seconds item that like you build into silver edge so you can break bristleback and you have enough damage to kill him so now eg focusing the mid Team bans, they ban that sniper, ban the Earth Spirit and Pango, because both teams looking for a mid, so you're kind of getting down to Slim Pickens here. Invoker was already banned as well. Uh, sniper, not a traditional ban by any means. Team Liquid did run it once. once yeah. This like a new build with the Diffusal Blade. And also, in this game, could be really good, because you have extremely good frontline, you have Swap to save you plus extra damage that you get from Vengeful Spirit later on, and extended range where you can kill Phoenix Egg without actually going close and uh, getting in range of it. So, pretty much everything's been banned that Niche has played mid so far in this group stage, except for the Queen of Pain. It's the one thing still on this list. Evil geniuses they ban turn to pick. Puck. So let's see what EG want for their final pick. Liquid having the ultimate last pick, and EG are the ones who go for Quab. So now Nisha, so everything he's played some... is out. Yeah, I, I like what EG drafted for themselves. Like this CK, he's going to have a rough time dealing damage with his illusions because now you have like this Grimstroke, uh, you have Phoenix as well uh, with the protection, Sunray on top of them, Queen of Pain with the bounce back from the ulti. Not, not sure if I like like the changes to Queen of Pain, this overtime damage rather than the burst damage is a huge nerf to Quap, but uh, like it, it can be good in some situations where damage over time cancels the blink dagger longer, but uh, overall I think it, it, it is a massive nerf. So 15 seconds left for Liquid. See what they pair up with the CK Venge Bristle MP, and it will be the Wind Ranger. So Wind Ranger, I know I saw New play it in the off lane for this for uh, LGD, but they're going to be playing it here mid for Team Liquid. And how do you like this matchup, Wind Ranger against Queen of Pain mid? Oof, I, I think they didn't have many options left. As you said, like Nisha needed to play a new hero because most of these heroes have been banned or picked uh, Queen of Pain. So they needed something. I, I, I'm not sure if like you need to 
carry hard as Vendranger in this game. I feel like you need to be slightly more active early on because Bristleback can carry and we saw that Zai can carry for the good 20, 25 minutes early on if he's on this hero that becomes super unkillable. And this time, Team Liquid will have Vengeful Spirit. They will have Bristleback. So be aware of those stacks. What I want to see from EG potentially is invading enemy triangle and uh, setting up some vision early on, like uh, between seven and 10 minutes and go in with Pakaz. We know that Pakaz tends to get active early on and maybe steal some of the stacks that Team Liquid's going to make for Bristleback. Yeah, so when you're going up against a team that really does make a lot of stacks, there is opportunity to steal them. We'll see if they can cover that ground, maybe get good vision up there and and move over as a team to force Liquid in a position where you know maybe they feel uncomfortable making those stacks and or just leaving them open like that and forcing them to react into not only defending their stacks, but a fight that may not be beneficial for them. It will be interesting as uh, we're going to be getting into this game number two, the Wind Ranger. The last pick on this one, it was Swim Pickens, but is it everything you wanted in a last pick for Liquid? It's a like good control if you're joining the fight slightly later on. If you get initiated on by this Doom, Sven, you're gonna die unless there's gonna be swap coming out. The, like they definitely need to swap out the Doom target. So positioning from Insania is gonna be the key, and we already know that you know Insania on some of these saving supports, he's positioning his top tier. Nisha gonna scout things out in the mid lane. They already placed down Observer Ward. Being on the other side. Oh, uh, there's been a huge nerf, like indirect nerf to Windranger, because the item that she wanted to buy was Road of Athos, which build up was two crowns. Right. Since you're being universal hero, that gives you a ton of damage. But ever since the changes to Road of Athos, the build up, like you don't want to buy Vitality Booster. I've seen Wind Rangers picking up Power Treads, some going for Dragonlance, some going for Maelstrom, and then scaling, getting Aghanim Scepter. I think Lincoln Sphere in this one is going to be the key playing against Doom, playing against Grimstroke Sven, so you can't get initiated on. Taking a look at the game so far, as uh, they were trying to get a D ward here in the mid lane, but they placed that sentry off to the other side. They know where it is now, they've pinged it out. And they also have a sentry. So that sees the OBS the of EG down in the bottom area of the map, so they might be getting two OBS out of here immediately. But we'll see how they progress. Is going to be two bounty runes apiece. Nothing really doing before that, and you can see Boxy coming over with Nisha just to secure this D ward. In the end, they're going to swap things around. Have Whisper play Phoenix. He's really mean whisper is like one of the best offlaners in the world he's like super stable he's been stable for years in terms of his gameplay mm -hmm. i think like for me he is the best south american player because he's just like that good he, he can play anything and uh, we're gonna see phoenix again they did play phoenix one so far in the group stage and uh, he he did extremely well, Matthew. This is gonna be a fire lane. They wanna, but you're playing Already against going Liquid. After Whisper. Oh, yeah. Oh. Dousing the fire, extinguishing it out. And Senior gets first blood. Matthew looking for a trade, not gonna get it. And immediately, just with the minus armor, the wave of terror, the early chaos bolt. They were gonna shut down Whisper in the lane early. Power of Nation's Prophet, getting that early ward. They're going setting ahead. things up. They want Matthew. I mean, look at the damage that they put on, and it's not like these spells have these ridiculous cooldowns and level two is going to come around. They're going to have another stun to go with it. This is dangerous for EG. Let's see if they go again, because Insania, he's still just level one, but a creeper two, and he'll have that magic missile to throw. Matthew needs to be careful. He's very low. What is he bringing? Healing Salve, another Blood Grenade. They do have a lot of minus armor in this lane. Not so much early on, because CK wants to put another oh, point boy. in his Chaos Strike. And swell. Zee. That's Zai. not going to stop Zai and He's Boxy will get the kill. Whoa, already two Box kills. Box is going in again. Box is thinking about maybe picking up the water rune so C Smile can't refill it. He wants to see where Nisha's going, or maybe TP top and try to set things up on Matthew again. And Xenia's just going to run him down. Uh, if there's a TP, I mean, the help is... Potentially not needed as Insignia is just going to get a kill here under the Doom, and it's already three kills for the side of Liquid and a 1,000 net worth lead. I and mean, there it is, Boxy. Out of control. He was 
He was thinking where he wants to go. Do they want to kill Matthew? And I assume Matthew TP's mid refills bottle for Sea Smile because he just got his loon snatched by Boxy. And Boxy's back to the bottom lane again. This also leaves some solo XP for a short period of time for Bristleback. So Zai managed to get to level 3 and I could see them playing aggressively. But you also want to get to your Vanguard timing, then Sven can't really hurt you in the lane. So already at a pretty significant deficit. I mean, this is three minutes in. It's a 1k net worth lead. They control both Lotus Pools, so they're going to get that advantage there of the heal. Mickey, though, losing his courier to Matthew, who's in deep once again. He's also going to pick up a bounty rune, so doing whatever necessary. And Matthew, with that tree and protector last game, was really trying to do everything that he could to save the game for Oh, Boxy well. bottom. They're playing super aggressive ink swell. Oh. Should be enough to kill him. Uh, Pekan's getting that kill. A little bit too big for his britches as they get the kill on a Boxy and and uh, as well as Pekan's getting at least something on the board for evil geniuses. Insania, yeah, he's really feeling himself. Double Bracer on Vengeful Spirit. He has 83 damage. <laughs> He might, have coming in. he might have the most damage they got in the him. game right now. Matthew's dead. Icarus dive, but the Chaos Bolt's there. After the dive, the Blood Grenade, Whisper, one more, and it's with the Wave of Terror. They get both kills in the top lane. Get hand of Midas. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, he has do it, Boots do of it. Speed, Double Bracer, Fairy Fire. Universal Hero, by the way. Really enjoying it. Look at him. Like, they're gonna come back to your lane. He has also Lotus, the one that you mentioned, and there's... <laughs> Lanes are falling apart. The mid lane is also not doing too hot because of that rune that they managed to steal from Sea Smile. Right. Queen of Pain really relies on runes to be able to play active. Constant harassment, Nisha, level five and a half. Sea Smile about to crack level five, so big difference in the XP. Not only that, he's holding onto a water rune and two charges on that bottle, so he's ready to just kind of have the sustain here and force Sea Smile, who's got an empty bottle himself, out of the lane. It's a rough position to be in. Denied. You can see Nisha. Oh, well, throw the power shot. Maybe Boxy comes in, Sprout go and get the kill. And he's up on the high ground. That's exactly what Boxy wants, but high ground, maybe not the right positioning for it. Turns off the Watcher. Even Insania is making he's a move towards the mid lane. Box is going to pull the off creep the creep wave. wave. Yeah, and there's Catapult coming. So this is going to be some big damage onto it. Let's see if C-Smile manages to drag the creep wave off his own. Nisha probably thinking about going in. There's still Fairy Fire and Magic Wand available. Power Shot misses. So Box is going to drag the creep wave back towards the mid lane. Top lane again. Matthew taking a lot of damage. Insania still here. He's got a wave of terror in two seconds. Matthew, one more shot till he's dead. Pops a salve, but wave of terror off cooldown thrown at Matthew to get another kill. And it's six to one. Panda even shows up top, but there's not much he can do here. And now you're just kind of leaving Pakaz to his own accord over bottom. Oh, we said that Insania, he really shines on these saving heroes, but <laughs> he's the one dealing damage 5 0, zero <laughs> five minutes into the game on Vengeful <laughs> Spirit. This has to be the best start you can Man's ask for. Embrace, Ink Swell, Sunray, Insania, he's got to save his carry. They've got a Sprout, but Whisper's going to burn right over it. However, he's going to lose his life in doing so. Mickey survives. The Phantom's Embrace runs out, thrown back over onto the Chaos Knight. Mickey, though, slaps it off, and Panda going to lose his life as Boxy's got a double kill. Insania, it's the snowball I'm effect. Uh, I, I could see uh, Team Liquid also going in trying to steal enemy XP runes because they put so much pressure in the stop lane. means that the bottom... XP rune or the XP rune on their oh, side is going to be bottom. free to be picked up. Box is bottom again. They have not stopped moving around the map. I, I mean, they, they have teleportation, but just the utilization of these twin gates too. And forcing the Grimstroke to go over mid to refill this bottle, it, it's not been fun. Zai going to lose. No one is in the bottom lane. lane. Yeah, they just spreading them out so much because Zai has Vanguard, which means that Sven can kill him. Queen of Pain is level six. 
Does uh, not have a point in ulti yet, saving a point for now. Boxy will get and, that uh, wisdom rune. Phantoms Embrace, Inkswell, maybe they get the kill here over mid. Scream used, Inkswell pops, Sonic Wave, that's a kill on Anisha, desperately needed. But if they lose more than just Panda on this retaliation, it would be bad. They don't lose anything so far. The back end of a god Kaza's strength here from with Kaza's Kaza's coming over mid. And he gets the kill on a Boxy too. Big kills to stabilize the game for EG just a touch. I mean, the lanes had just dissolved for them, and they're lucky. Because is there as he was farming the jungle with God Strength. A very important kill for EG. They definitely needed that. The lanes were bleeding way too much. Zai, complete free farm in this bottom lane. How many stacks do they have? Two stacks. Insania already in the triangle, trying to make some more for Zai so that he can pick them up. Gotta get that stack going. On the other side, I. There's some stacks being made right now by Matthew. Ink Swell trying to stay out of it. They've got that Shadow Strike on Anisha. Box coming over. Scream, Sprout, Sprouting himself, putting himself in an odd spot, but the power shot comes in. They get the kill to see Smile. They look over at Matthew Whisper trying to Sunray down this Wind Ranger. Doesn't get it. The Shadow Strike might tick him out, but they've got the Magic Missile to get the kill on a Whisper. They look over at Matthew. Four heroes down to the side of Evil Geniuses just like that. Oh, Nisha surviving as well, toggling, using the magic wand, that extra regeneration from Bracer. Whisper used everything, like he threw whatever he could, but he's, uh, like, if they had Supernova there, that fight is completely different, but since they got to dumpstered in the lane, he's sitting at 0, 4, and 0 at the moment. Uh, it does make a lot of difference. So he manages to survive, they get a couple of kills, and uh, Zai again. Offlane Enjoyer, farming for himself. Uh, I believe he has mana boots coming, Clarity as well, going into Aghanim Scepter next straight after finishing off that Vanguard. Boxy with the Storm Hammer, God Strength pop for this Infernal Blade and a kill there. So Pekaz gets himself onto a killing spree after dying early. I said I wanted to see some aggression from EG where they like go inside the enemy triangle and tries to steal some of the stacks with Sven. I don't think it's happening. Like it sounds like a great idea, but uh, there's also Bristleback available, who's going to be finding those stacks pretty soon. See Smile, he's got to blink away. They put the Phantoms Embrace on him. They're looking for the Ink Swell, but now trying to blink out of range of the swap. Instead, he'll swap. focus his attention on the Panda. Wave of Terror, the damage with the Magic Missile, Matthew getting low, Stroke of Fate comes in, they land the Shackle Shot, Sonic Wave, Insania still ticking Deny? down, but they'll end up getting Ooh, the kill on get Insania, Pakaz is dead at the same time, thanks to Boxy coming in and helping out Zai, oh, he's he in too far, Ink Swell's there, and he'll end up dead. Oh, still that's a big for one. Zai, Supernova, down he goes. So, that's two massive. front attack all over the place, kills. Wrath of Nature, getting these heroes low, but not gone. Ooh, Matthew picking up Purge Creep, uh, like the range, the cast range on it is uh, like very small, but Tumblr's toy coming in clutch, jumping on top of the Wind Ranger, dispelling her, which did result in a couple of kills. 20 kills in 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't think you can ask for anything better. Um, two this kills. This Bloodbath Dota, always fun to watch. So. I have an idea for blood grenades. <laughs> I'm listening. Do you think blood grenades should restock quicker with each death in the game? And it's not terrible. I heard worse ideas coming out from you throughout the, the whole DPC season. We had some bangers, though. You had some bangers for sure, but uh, this is... That one know. was TI caliber, I think. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> I think maybe. Might implement that one. Maybe the frog agrees. 2K lead, though, for Liquid right now. Zai, yeah, he died, but he's, he's working on an Axe. He's almost got two components of it already. And you're not lying this time. He actually does have 900 gold saved up. Ogre Axe. Ooh, this is a big kill. Yeah, down goes Whisper. He's been trying to find some safety. He's one in five already in the game. Insania has 105 damage on Vengeful Spirit. Going into drums next. This double bracer allowed Whoa. him, and look at this cool play. <laughs> Going through the gates from the bottom, and up. He got the stun on the box, he was TPing up on the cliff. So everybody's gonna come over, blink, just trying to get the vision, who's gonna get it? Scouting, get but, uh oh. Trying to be a tree up on a cliff like that, but he'll end up dead. Wrath of Nature not doing any damage, really. 
Sea Smile has 2,000 gold saved up, thinking about what he wants to buy, whether he needs like some kind of Orchid or it's just gonna be, you know, casual Kaya for now. Maybe Witchblade, it's also an option. You're playing against Wind Ranger, so you wanna have that true strike. Is under attack. Hmm. Don't, I, I wanna say I don't see that item as much anymore. The Witchblade. Buying Blitz Knuckles for now? Okay, it's gonna be Witchblade in the end. He bought Blitz Knuckles, thinking about maybe he wants to turn that into Orchid, then send his courier back. Smoke from EG. This is a big kill. Matthew got the Doom off. Yeah, so they're looking to land this Inkswell, but just out of range. Stroke of Fates, Smile coming over. They've got the Phantom's Embrace. That was a silence with the Another Doom thrown back on. And Five there's seconds. the Sun Ray. Three second they cooldown. got him, but here's a turnaround. The Shekels gonna connect on the Sea Smile, but they've got the silence. So now he's starting to run. Link away for the fight. Good Super Nova in the middle. Banda. This is really nice. Nisha's gonna end up dead. Zai trying to get the kill here with the help of Insignia. They'll blow up the egg, but they've got the Sonic away from the low ground. Zai on the run. He'll get a viscous nasal goo on a panda, sewing them up and turn. trying to get him with that quill spray and will finish him off with the help of Insania. Matthew also falls. It's a three for two so far. Link, TP attempt, wave of terror. Insania so can't close. get the magic missile. No swap, uh, no magic missile. Just got the glimpse of it. Uh, they survive. I mean, we've seen the power of their lineup. This is also without Pakaz joining. He's farming on the other side, has Blink Dagger being delivered to him, but uh, some big damage coming out from Visper. As we see, he managed to get those Spirit Vestal charges. Fire Spirits are maxed out. Two points in Sun Ray. They still killed Supernova, but uh, he got the job done. Also needs a little bit of recovery. Going Midas. Going for hand of Midas. Yeah. He's, uh,. Not that close to it. 1,600 gold. I was thinking what I wanted to say. He's got half the components. Almost there. Zai, meanwhile, 200 gold away from the axe. So that's going to be an, a big upgrade. Radiance Middle Tower is under attack. And say, look at Insignia where he's at net worth wise. It's illegal. He has <laughs> almost insane. the same amount of farm as Nisha. Oh, Whisper. He's under this ward. Tumblr's toy, magic missile, another kill on a Whisper. There's nothing he can do. The supports are so farmed on the side of Liquid, keeping up with the cores on EG. Level 10 on Vengeful Spirit. Same level as Wind Ranger. Got that cast range. Talent on level 10 and going for Agadim Scepter. I feel like Boxy, yeah, yeah, they're, they're actually doing it. I see Boxy buying some of the sentries, uh, placing Observer Wards. They want to have Insania to scale where you can use this, swap aggressively, save a Doom target, die, and then respawn with that Agadim Scepter. Because when you get these smaller items on Vengeful Spirit, you're going to farm a lot. <laughs> they're also very good at fighting because they can't burst you down. He's sitting at 1400 HP right now, seven armor, has drums, has Tumblr's toy. Matthew. We saw him do this with a tree and trying to farm out as far as he could, but now Boxy's here with Insania, Magic Missile, the Minus Armor coming in as they've got a Solar Crest on Boxy. And again, it's just easy damage for Liquid. Grimstroke plus Doom is like very strong support duo if we're talking about like post uh, 30 minute, uh, also if you can execute the combo, but look at the amount of farm that Liquid supports have. Insania, so, uh, he's in the front lines. Blink Here comes trying Bristol. To get to the They've got Zai, who does have this Ag, Sonic Wave, and Insania only dying for the second time, but they end up losing C Smile for it. Whisper's in pretty deep, but they've got the God Strike for it because the damage is out. They get the kill on the Nature's Prophet. Now, Soul Bind, but the Quill Spray, Zai ends up There's taking the out Panda. Doom. They've got themselves the Soul Bind. They have the Double Doom. Do they have the damage to get the kills? They'll end up blowing up the Egg. Now they win the Shekin shot on him because he's sprouted up and killed off by Nisha. Matthew on the run. Mickey ends up falling to Matthew as now Nisha at least trying to get the finishing up. touches to this team wipe. They bought back on Boxy. They'll get the kill to Matthew and it's so many heroes dying in the fight but EG are team wiped. EG executed. Like this was the pretty much the best fight that they had so far. This was Pakaz joining with the Blink Dagger with his ulti but the damage coming out from Bristleback his new shiny Agadim Scepter. <laughs> you can see how much damage it deals and now going into Agadim Shard also like I like the way you know they're gonna need some Lotus Orbs they're gonna need some Lincoln Spheres on side of Liquid one of the reasons why Nisha is going for it is you know you're playing against Doom you're playing against Sven uh, they're gonna cause you a lot of issues and right. just like Doom early on has a Blink Dagger with this Purge ability so your win run is not gonna go off so I'm taking a look at the fight again again Pakaz look at the damage included. now from Bristle but it's yeah it's so much damage from Bristleback 
they end up at the end of the day like they do get this kill but Zai is, is already doing so much. They do have Pekaz, though, top of the net worth. Like, he is their saving grace right now. Doom They're going to take another fight as well. Once Doom is up in 50 seconds, I can see EG having BKB on Sven and be ready to go. Maybe even threat Roshan, smoke into this top area. But speaking of Roshan, I think like they're not going to let it go. They understand that EG have a really strong timing, so they're going to go in, use all of this minus armor from Solar Crest, from Viscous Goo, and Vengeful Spirit to get it. And look at that. Insania, almost Ags, as you like to call it. Two components <laughs> already done. Never gonna give that up. Wave of Terror, Shackle connects, Matthew dead, Zai. Credit with another. Oof, Dota plus. 83% already for Team Liquid. By the way, Insania, 8, 2, and 12. 20 of the 25 kills here for Liquid. Despite the fact that it's a bloodbath, uh, again, 6 Ks, maybe not as high as you thought it would be. EG after the like, laning phase kind of... I think the... Because like, it, it's well distributed yeah. amongst everyone. Uh, look at the cores, look at the supports on EG. Sven, he has like the highest network. Queen of Swap. Pains in the middle, two supports in the Magic bottom. And, and they're gonna die again. And, uh, Whisper though, in deep. They've got the Doom. They're trying to get a kill here onto Zai, but he's got the Aegis. Have they lined up the Supernova correctly? Oh, it's just a touch early. And here comes the turnaround. Rodham Toast, the Shackle connects oh, to the Sprout combo. behind him from Boxy. They get the kill on Matthew. They were only able to take one life out of the hands of this Bristle. And Liquid take advantage again. I mean, you can still see damage coming up from EG as soon as Sven jumps in. And they want to get him. He just showed bottom. So, Team Liquid, they want to run at them. Nisha, new shiny Foxy. Lincoln Spear. Whisper, standing in the sprout. He's going to be dead for a real Power shot. Time now. I get the kill 70 on Foxy, seconds. Though. Yeah. Bought back in the previous fight. So, moving it up to 8,000 net worth. Because still. Getting involved in these fights, not dying in that last one, and he's going into the Silver Edge. So they really want to make sure that Zai eventually isn't just allowed to be here in these fights and output so much damage. But even with one hero checked off the mark from Liquid, if they're able to get the Silver Edge and everything, there's still a lot going for them on this dire team. It ain't that easy with just getting rid of the Bristle. Shard, Agatim, Scepter, Bristle with Bloodstone. They need to focus him down. Like, he <laughs> he needs to die immediately. Otherwise, they're going to have massive issue. But uh, Mickey, he's been farming. He's, like, very close to Bristleback, very close to Sven. Going into Blink Dagger. Link is here next, finishing off oh. his BKB. Bottom tower is under attack. This Viscous Nasal Goo is just vicious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I called it vicious for a good 10 years. It's a long time. But, I mean, you look at it with the, with the combined power of hairball and everything, it really is vicious. It could be thick, it could be viscous, but it is vicious as well. And they're gonna how use you, this movement. To how do you take this here. fight? They're gonna take their Tormentor XP rune as well available in 20 seconds. Bristleback can pretty much solo it. Yeah. Seven. Goose stacks. Who's going to get it? Insania, of course, because why, why not? not? <laughs> so now you have extra magic missile. It's not like it got slightly nerfed because it's 75% uh, of magic missiles. Current cast range. Uh, you, but you also Ooh, have that level 10 talent. Go for, but they've got Sea Smile in. Stormhammer's going to land onto the Wind Ranger. Icarus dive. Oh, oh got they've got the stun. Whisper, though. Sunray. Spirit Vessel on him. Supernova Sonic Wave all coming through with the Sunray from Whisper to get the kill on Anisha. Now they pop the BKB. They've got the Ink Swell. They'll get the kill on Insania. They'll take out a second. They'll blink forward trying to get the CK who pops the BKB in time. TP's out and a wave from EG. Not a bad fight for EG. They managed to pick up the XP rune on Sea Smile. He blinks in aggressively. And there was also Whisper so ready to take that fight. Uh, dives in, gets the Supernova because they have really good heroes to protect the Egwit. We were talking about Sven jumping in with the Stormhammer, the pushback from Sonic Wave. We got another Tormentor as well, by the way. Shard for Mickey. That one's kind of annoying. 
upgrade to that chaos bolt. More illusions. Also, you can farm the creep wave, use chaos bolt on a creep, and then go back if necessary if you don't feel comfortable. Right. As we see what Mickey is doing right now. He's looking like it's like later. Survive Matthew's Doom, which has shown to be putting complications in there for the side of Liquid. Lotus next for Zai. His courier's dead, though, at the moment, so he's going to get that farm and eventually get there. And we were talking about the Silver Edge from Pakaz earlier, and not too far away from that. Level 18. At level 3 ulti in God Strength, it's uh, massive damage. Like, the, these heroes are still going to die. Everybody on side of Liquid building pretty much same items. Blink, BKB, Lincoln's here. We're gonna see what Bristle decides to go for. The Lotus Orb that we talked about, very important against Sven, Grimstroke, Ulti, Doom, Queen of Pain, like removing all of these stuff, the overtime damage from Shadow, Strike from Witchblade, like even Phoenix, Spirit Vessel could cause a lot of issues. Smoke was used and they finally get it onto four of these heroes. Whisper, meanwhile, he's off away from the fight, trying to catch up. Maybe they're able to get something going here if they can find Zai, who just activated the Bristleback. Just miss them like ships in the night. They'll instead go back into the jungle and continue to farm. They didn't quite have everything there, but Liquid doing a good job with their Sixth Sense to avoid it. And from here, Liquid, they smoke themselves. They're going to try and make something happen on their own. Both teams feel super strong about taking the fight. Whoever gets like first initiation, if they can maybe take out this doom, take out Grimstroke They're before anything can happen. EG See split. Smile, he has region. Looking for a swap. Has that haste rune as well. Bit of a status resistance as well from newly purchased Kai Assange. Look at Insania. Not afraid to aggressively swap. Looking for someone. He's got the Ags now, so. They want something. They look at Sea Smile again. He's just on the cusp. So maybe top lane might be it. They are pinging away at Pakaz, who shows himself in the lane. Pakaz being greedy, farming these camps, and he's going to be spotted, but no, he doesn't get it spotted at the end of the day. He feels it. So he's close. out as well. Nisha that was real close. It out. That was like two seconds too late. If they get that kill, that would also potentially secure them Roshan. Yeah. Roshan's gonna be Big point on Dyer's side. Nisha going through the gates. He still wants to use this invis, try to get a kill. There is Deep Observer Ward scouting Matthew, who's farming underneath the tier two tower right now. They're all nearby for the side of EG. They're showing Pakaz in the lane. And they smoke up. Again, another smoke coming in from EG. Sea Smile gonna be left unsmoked over mid. He's going into the Ags. Wrath of Nature gets used and he's. Now they set up, I believe, Panda trying to get the smoke on Sea Smile. They need to try and find something, but the vision isn't exactly there showing them everything. They've got a middle middle of the lane ward up top. Maybe they can get their hands on a Zai. They find him. They go to the God Strength. They've got the damage. They'll get the kill. This is smoke well worth. Spikaz with the God Strength will continue to farm up this top lane, and they ping out Roche immediately. It's 14 seconds away. Big timing for EG. They like this war that you mentioned, caught a glimpse of Bristleback coming through, going for farm, and then Roshan's gonna respawn in a couple of seconds. Let's see if Panda goes back in. Bottom lane, Side Nisha, the bit. doomed. That's commitment from Matthew, but they need to stop the TP. Yeah, just TP out, Doom doesn't mute anymore, so you can use your items. It's not as cool as it used to be. It was way too cool. <laughs> <laughs> He's going it's into the uh, spare. Top, Panda. I'm surprised that Panda didn't just go inside the Roche pit and check when Roshan's going to respawn because they killed a big target. Like, this is the best target you can kill. Take out damage coming out from Bristleback, and now Liquid will contest. By contest, I mean they might be able to kill it. Double damage. On In bomb for Pakaz, level 20. So Warcry armor. That's going to provide him a lot of armor against Bristleback, against the right-click damage from CK, even Windranger. But it seems like Liquid, they want to go inside the Roche pit and kill it immediately. They're in on it. Nobody here, though, for EG. Here's this ward that sees Matthew. And this is going to be second Roche 
for Team Liquid. They're also going to get their hands on Cheese. They were able to take away the Aegis from the hands of uh, this Bristleback before, and then work with that afterwards for EG, but this time around, we'll see if it's as easy. They do have the double damage still bottled up for a little while, but again, they're under the vision of this ward that Boxy plays, and they're coming over on the side of Liquid. They've got the Wave of Terror. They'll have the swap. Matthew looking dead on his screen already. Good stuff from Insania, canceling the Blink Dagger, but uh, yeah, Vision has been key, not just for Liquid, but also for EG. Every single time they got a pick off, it was because of the Vision that they placed. He's gonna find a neutral item, tier two, tier three token. Let's see what he's gonna pick up. Titan Sliver on Zai. Zai will need to be very quick with this Lotus Orb when they feel like there's oh, they found he needs to precast it. Oh, that's big. You've gone green. So just They're the not done. Are so has fast. another swap available in a couple of seconds. Drums as well. Cause that silver edge is going to run out. Double damage has half the duration on it. They're still looking for another one here. And Sai activating that bristle back has the lotus on himself. That means there's no storm hammer to be thrown on him. But Mikasa is going to farm right where they got Matthew picked off. They have the vision there. So they have the information of where this Sven's at. Double damage is gonna run out. Yeah, it's being pinged out that they just placed Vision. This Observer Ward. Doing so much. Sneaky one from Boxy. Provided them Vision. Let's see, Matthew's not gonna find it. It's out of range. Oh, they see him again. They wanna go. They've got Boxy TPing in already. Curse of the old growth, sprouting him up. The control is there. Focus fire and putting Matthew back in the grave that he crawled out of. Matthew just pinged the high ground. He's like, <laughs> there's a ward somewhere. I placed down sentry, but couldn't find it. This, these boxy wards just doing so much for Team Liquid. The vision around the map is pretty good for them in great farming locations that EG have been utilizing. So it's now a 10,000 net worth lead. We haven't really seen a five on five fight. It's just been pickoffs for Liquid all over the map. While that's been going on, because he's farming, he's going into the MKB. He's got the Silver Edge we talked about, but I don't know if it's going to be enough anymore. The deficit's becoming too much. He still packs a punch. Like Sven is uh, almost at his peak at the moment. You can purchase a shard. I think that's a big upgrade. Like we've seen some of the Svens, uh, like even in the TI qualifiers, uh, especially level up, they love to pick up this shard on Sven early on just to be able to play around the team. Uh, most of the damage on side of Liquid is physical. All three cores, like even a Vengeful Spirit with this Aghanim Scepter. I don't think we've seen Insania dying, to be honest, while he had Aghanim Scepter. Usually what you want to do once you pick it up is just run at people. They've been running at people. The problem is he's uh, way too tanky and he's not dying. <laughs> The shard that we saw from level up to Hawk was always, it was always early from him too. He was never afraid to purchase that shard knowing that if you're sitting atop of the net worth, the odds of you getting it from the Tormentor are pretty Oscar. slim to none. Midas for the Doom. He's going into the BKB. He's got 3,000 gold going his way. And now Pekaz queuing up Noel Fire, queuing up MKB. He's trying to figure out what he wants. Sold Mask of Madness, but Assault Curious. So that's gonna be some extra armor for the team. Like he's Zai. on high ground. Minute and 20 left of that Aegis. Oh, they've got Insania with the Wave of Terror. Now they've got Zai going in with the Hairball. Use these drums, Rod of Atos. That's the control from Boxy needed to try and get a kill, and they will on a Matthew. Boxy has been setting things up for Team Liquid in both of these games, especially in the second game. They're still not done. Zai on top of the high ground it's with the Lotus Orb on him. Makaz needs to find the right angle. He might go for the backstab. Fortified. He needs to find his moment. He does have that shard queued up now, what we were talking about. So they back away. They know there's not a lot of time left on this age. It's still 38 seconds, though. Maybe could have stayed for a little bit longer. Just don't want to give anything up for free. Team Liquid is out farming them right now. Boxy, he TPs on a different side of the map, uses Threat of Nature. Uh, uses this sprout to get the farm treants uh, stacking the camps as well with it uh, so doing pretty much everything that he can and 
Of course, EG slightly too afraid to leave. They might go for a smoke once they push out the waves because they want to use this Sven because Sven is super strong right now. Silver Edge, we haven't seen Bristleback being broken yet, I believe. There's also another Tormentor available. Zai is going to take care of the business. Radiant Not as cool as the five courier Dazzle Tormentor take. Still very cool. <laughs> yeah, cool nonetheless. That's my favorite way to take Tormentor now. Uh, Fox is like, yeah, I'm helping. So Nisha gets it. <laughs> and on the other side, Sea Smile gets one. So we'll have that Blink Silence and also Gale Force. Not as strong as it was when, you know, it was global ability, but it's uh, still very good. Keeping them in place, uh, set up for a Shackle and also for potential Bristleback. Bristleback. Uh, <laughs> just those Quill Sprays, keeping them in place. So CK can deal damage as well. Got that level 20 talent, Quill Spray damage, so that's gonna be pretty massive. Sven did pick up the shard, understands that he needs to buy all of the items that he can right now. No point to save for buyback Sven, not that type of a hero, because he's relying on his ulti to deal as much damage as possible. Let's see if they can find someone else. Again, providing vision. This is gonna Gosh. catch Pakaz's bottom. Nisha with his eggs. Just gets the EMP. There canceled. it is. Yeah, they go, they land that shackle. Beautiful execution. No buyback. Swap into Hex from Boxy, into Shackle. Whoa. And, whew, we talked about, like, no buyback, but if he's outside of the base, th this game is pretty similar to the game number one, where they didn't have buyback available, and the game just ended pretty much. Let's see how much damage they can deal in 70 seconds. No Triant Protector on EG this time, so all damage that they deal is not going to be healed. Can clean up this creep wave pretty quickly, but backdoor not activated just yet. They're a little bit hesitant, not knowing whether or not Sven's got that buyback, but taking the tier three and no buyback yet, it's giving them that little bit of a hint that, hey, maybe he just doesn't have it. We can go for it and commit. The back door finally kicks in. They can still go through the back door protection and yeah. kill it. They've got creeps coming over. That'll be gone in just a second, and now there it is. So it's at least one set of racks here for the side of Liquid. Extending Make that and we're lead to 21,000 and uh, still another 30 seconds. Good they got themselves again. a swap Same the combo. It's so smooth, it's so clean, it's so fluid. Liquid, just make it look so easy sometimes. That this might be the game. Like, because 20 seconds, these are long 20 seconds. And again, they caught Visper. Yeah, four seconds four done. Four seconds stun. He's just trying to get back into it as well. Oh, he snipes him. Oh my gosh. Gets him with the power shot. Mickey with the tip. And that's oh, it, no. they're playing against Mega Creeps. No Queen of Pain, Whisper does have buyback available. Uh, Pakaz needs to deal some heavy damage right now. They have one chance. If they miss this chance, they're gonna be starting in lower bracket. Not looking good. Whisper's got buyback, holding it for now. The tier four is low. And now again, just having Nisha using that focus fire, cleaning up these towers, leaving the throne exposed. They've got the swap into the hex. And now the reality rip, they go to the soul mine. Is it gonna be enough with the gods coming in with a BKB? Does he have the damage? He will, he takes out Zai, he takes out Insania. He looks over at the illusion of Insania that he left behind. Throne is exposed. Swap once more onto the Grim Stroke. They're focusing the throne for the moment. Panda's gonna fall, he's got buyback, pops back into the fight. Nikkei working on these smaller buildings while Zai's got himself the Lotus where he bought back and came back into the base immediately. Sea Smile getting low. Focus Fire once again. Supernova's gonna be used here by Whisper. They look over at Mikkei. They've got the BKB. They're chasing the CK back. Because with the Silver Edge, maybe he can go after Zai. He breaks him. He just bought back, but they've got the control. They have the Sprout. Nisha with the BKB as well as the Gale Force pushing these heroes on the side of EG back. Icarus dive all the way over, but he doesn't oh, have a Supernova God, to work with. Stunned. They've got the reality. Stunned. They've got the stun out of Pekaz. They've got the control out of the Sven. They've leashed him up with the Sprout. They'll get the kill. On this fan as well. It's 90 seconds without their carry. Zai back to full health. C smile and the rest of EG trying to stop this from going down. They'll call GG and Liquid will take the 2 0 over this evil genius side with ease. A very clean execution coming out from Team Liquid in this second game. Like the combos that they executed, swap into Hex two times, is what kind of opened up the map. And also these deep observer wards from Boxy, from Insania, mostly coming out from Boxy. Just the overall perfect execution from every single member of the team. Yeah, so Team Liquid, even with the Wind Ranger, uh, take the 2 0, and we'll go to a big Wind Ranger enjoyer. We'll throw it over to Slacks. Take it away. Liquid, guys. Liquid win. Liquid! You won the game! Okay, I've never actually seen a player that upset to see me in my life. Congratulations, Liquid! You did it! Woohoo!
right, great. Well, anyway, uh, interview time. Uh, who wants to do it? Hey, you get a special cookie for your hard work. You. What'd you think of that game? Uh, was well, kind of hard. Okay. Yeah. But you did it though. Yay. <laughs> And Zania, the good interview target. Hello, welcome. How was the series for you? Uh, it was good. Game one was really good. Uh -huh. Game two started really good, and then we did some clowny stuff. Yeah. And then it got interesting. Mm -hmm. And then it ended good. Okay, fantastic. I mean, that seemed like you guys had to work pretty hard. Boxy, you feeling good about that game, buddy? How was the ride? Yeah, what was the ride for you like? You know, if you had to describe it, if you had to say the road to the international was this a bumpy road, highway to hell? You know, Dota Road, take me home. Smooth sailing. Smooth sailing, a paved road, even with the Wind Ranger. Nice job, every. Oh, and of course, we have to get the man here himself. Just a one, oh my God. A one worder, if you could, please. For the fans out there, how was the, how was the game? Slow. Okay, slow, slow. Much like this interview, I can tell. Zai, any word? What, meme? Zai? Oh, what do you got for us, buddy? Uh. I don't know. I was going to watch the replay. You're kind of in my way, I think. So I'm in your way as you're watching the replay. You just won. What do you have to learn? So if you could please leave, I want to kind of watch this replay, you know? Jesus. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Great. Great interview. Great times. The boys are really flopping, excited with energy. Back to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the way, Slax. What's up with you, man? We're trying to do some replay analysis. God damn it. Team Liquid, there's a reason why they look so hot right now. You can see how they're locked in. Zai especially will not leave unless he lifts an Aegis for the first time in his career. And he has a very good chance of doing so now that they are through to the playoffs on the road to the International. I'm back on panel. I've got Winter. I've got Big Liz. Boys, uh, I think Insania said it best, Liz. Like the game at the beginning. I honestly, at 10 minutes, I thought the game was 100% over. It was such domination. There were like eight kills in the top lane. Yep. Boxy had denied two water runes. Bottom was kind of a disaster as well. Yep. What happened in the mid game? What did Liquid do? Uh, I, I don't know who I would praise more. Would it be Insania or would it be Boxy? Mm. Um, together. Together. The, pl <laughs> the power of friendship. Yeah, but this Nature Prophet hero, it's insane. If you have a, a lane that's a little bit deep and can't really get out, Prophet just destroys it. Mm. TP's in and that's what he was doing. He goes top, helps out Insania and CK, like CK Mike can't spell Mike. <laughs> next level. Anyways, um, it was a really rough lane for EG. I think top is where it all kind of fell apart because Nature Prophet was getting way too much. Insania, Lacoste called him like one of those players that um, excels at defensive heroes like these Sabres, these Oracles, these Vengefuls. At the same time, every time he plays these heroes, he's got like seven kills, zero deaths. Like he destroys. And that's partly because he likes to kill steal a little bit with some of those spells, but not in this game. He was just on point. I think he was buying the aggressive items. Yeah. I, I like it when position five players get drums early instead of like the bread and butter. You get arcane boots, you get glimmer cave, you get a four stuff, you know, boring items, you know, drums, go in, set up kills. But then again, back to uh, back to EG, like the root of like uh, the problem of the team where I see they always face in their games is the off laner is always dumped on an island alone because Matthew on the position 4 he likes to run around freestyle you know like mm. he wants to do his own thing <laughs> and sometimes it's good sometimes it's not good you know it creates a lot of like uncertainty in the game and whereas a lot of the games I feel like uh, Whisper he's on a hero that needs to have a decent start a decent enough start that the support then only can leave him alone, you know, but oftentimes I feel like he's being left alone way too much. That's probably the best way to describe Matthew. He's a freestyler. <laughs> I, I think you need that in a position four, right? Like you need flair, you need... Uh, it, not in it, this, I, I uh, feel like not in this meta, you know? Like, yeah. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But that's I a agree. tough thing, I guess, right? Because when EG were looking good at the beginning of the year, in particular when they were playing at the Lima Major, it was with the style of leaving Whisper. At the time, it was mostly like Timbersaw, some Broodmother here, their Broodmaster, Broodmother as well. But heroes that you could do that with. And that's when they were successful. So I guess it's hard to unlearn the habits that got you to success in the first place. Yeah, it, it all comes down to the, like you just said, heroes that are played on the offlane. That's number one. But I think it's also very important to know exactly when you can leave them, mm. right? The problem is usually you can leave your Offlaner, if you already have gained some significant advantage on the offlane, like you're pressuring, he is maybe a level higher, he got a couple of kills, a couple of those rings of health or something to sustain himself. The problem was in this particular game, 
they don't have that. Like he's, they're being destroyed together. And yeah. if you leave him, it's, it's a phoenix, you know. He's a phoenix. What's he gonna do? He he has that dive on a 40 second cooldown. He yep. can escape once, and that's it. I think what also makes it very complicated here uh, on the enemy team to deal with Team Liquid, right, is how quickly they can get on top of you. We were talking in the previous game about, all right, what do we need to do to be able to kill these heroes, these uber tanky heroes? And in this game, they still struggle to do that. The kill combination was a little bit better, though, Winter. Uh, could they have executed a little bit better in the early game to get some of those key kills, maybe one or more deaths on the Bristleback? Oh, hell, I think also that one moment where they killed Bristleback and didn't take the Roshan. I mean, that was, I think yeah, was that was kind of a bit of a unlucky moment. They didn't really scout. Uh, I mean, he was scouting and then he came out and then Roshan spawned. Mm. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, I feel like uh, Pakas did a good job, you know, when his team, they were behind and he was coming to the fights, defending the towers. He was doing whatever he can, or whatever in his power to help his team, give them some little bit of extra damage to mm. stun. But he was down the call, you know, I feel like a lot of the fights, they were lacking damage because he was so poor on the Phoenix. Oh, that, like, Phoenix, for the longest time, in my opinion, wasn't a great core in general because the hero, mostly what he provided was the Sunray and the Egg, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time it would even be just the Egg, this nuisance that everyone goes on. Right now I can see it res resurging a little bit, like some, some teams are mm, trying out the offlane Phoenix. I'm still not the greatest fan, but uh, from EG, I like this draft and this style of play 10 times more than game one. Yeah. Like game one, I never felt they had a sliver of hope. Uh, this time around, at least, um, they could put up a fight even when the lanes went poorly. Mm. Because we really did try his utmost to try and carry this game back into a useful position, but unfortunately, unable to do so. Team Liquid just a little bit too solid, a little bit too good. You know, we're praising Insania for his prowess in the laning phase, but I really think this Boxy Nature's Prophet, it should be in every game. It's the amount of pressure he can apply on the map. He's killing everything, and I think Boxy always has been one of those players whose positioning is spectacular beyond amazing but we're going to be talking more about exactly what's happening with the game between liquid and eg we'll break it down a little bit further but before we do so we still have to remind y'all we have more dota to come one more series here on the road to the international which will be game and gladiators versus talent esports of course one of the talismans of the game and lineup has been their star mid laner quinn so let's find out about his journey here to seattle on the road to the international I think difference during the DBC season compared to like Riyadh and the Stream League, I think, to be honest, I think teams got ahead of us a bit in terms of meta. I think the, all the ramifications of the massive map, map size uh, patch weren't really truly felt until more recently. I think Riyadh was one of the first tournaments where people like that was started to be felt more. It just takes time for people to like truly understand some of these things and it's still being felt like people don't really understand the map even close to like they used to with the old one where everyone knew everything and it was like every game was like pre-planned you know five minutes our game's over. It's not like that anymore and I think we were honestly just a bit behind on some things and and other people just they got ahead of us and so we're just playing catch up and when you're playing catch up as opposed to like you're in a good spot and there's slight things you're tweaking that perspective difference is like massive and I think for the last two tournaments we were in the perspective of we're trailing and we're like clawing to try to catch up to people as opposed to being near the front and like maintaining that position. Gentlemen, welcome back. We've got our final series of the night ready to go as well. Gaming Gladiators taking on at Talon Esports. And we've seen some three series with uh, a couple of quick two zeros. Hopefully this one will uh, change the script a little bit for that all-important upper bracket slot. It's a talent series. You know it's going to go a little bit longer. They do like to farm the map. They're, you know, Tundra light, they're Spirit light. They take the slightly longer games and they actually have a slightly more advantageous recent win record against the Gaming Gladiators. They ended up knocking them out in that third, fourth decider at the uh, Riyadh Masters. So they're going to have a little bit of momentum going their way, especially after the day two where they went four and zip after a disaster of a day one talent going zero and four. Yeah, which was uh, a crazy bounce back for them. And you know, Gladiators as well, though, of course, a lot of expectations coming into this TI with the, the year they've had. I mean, no one has had as successful of a year as, as these boys. No team ever has won every single major in a year. And these, uh, these lads have done it. I mean, multiple other tournament victories on top of that as well. You look at Dream League, you look at some Bet Boom tournaments. Of course, you're know, towards the tail end of the year, we have seen... You want to call it a little bit of a decrease in some of their, their play, but really, I mean, these are still the, the team to look out for. And they're going up against, like you said, a team that knocked them out at Riyadh. So I think 
I don't know. I thought a lot of the other series were going to be really close. We didn't get too many close games. I'm hoping this one will be, though. You know what? It's uh, the day has been running pretty quick. People have no excuse to go to bed early, you know. Stick around, watch the whole day of Dota. This is the one. This is the main event of the day, the last series of the day, like we said. And uh, well, we're going to see another Dazzle removed from the pool. The most banned hero, I believe, all throughout TI so far, and for pretty good reason. You can just clump up, move on forward. The uh, the bad Juju providing so much armor, so much protection. And I'm keen to see how both teams have an understanding of how to play around this heart meta. Game and Gladiators in particular, really just love buying up hearts on as many cores as possible. And they even are one of the few teams that prioritize the Necrophos a little more than others, with Quinn picking up, I believe, three times uh, already so far this tournament. And anything, you know me, we, we've been casting together for a little bit, that percentage-based damage is, I think, the key to unlocking a lot of these strats. We saw EG just try the Doom. I think that's another good one. You both have the, uh, the percent damage with the Infernal Blade, as well as the Doom itself, to be able to nullify all of that healing that comes through from either healing supports or um, the heart itself. And I've been saying as well, another hero on top of that is the AA, which we've seen some priority with so far today with getting first phased. And it's also another hero that we want to look at heading into this series. So far, Celery hasn't played it in any of their games in the group stages, and Oli hasn't as well. You mentioned uh, a successful hero for Quinn with the Necro, three games, three wins. Oli, three, uh, three games on the Pug, not three wins as well. So that's something that he's been playing a lot. And even Tofu, five games on the Moeta. So this is also something that we see a little bit more emphasis on between these two teams with their supports compared to some of the other teams that we were covering in the group stages. Yeah, I'm honestly a little surprised that they haven't given a little bit of attention to the Moeta in the, uh, the first phase, and that's exactly why, right? You just have flex. I think it's being played pretty much equally between the position one and position four roles, but in terms of win rate, when it's played as a position four, it's like 75%, something yeah. ridiculously high like that. And Tofu is a big reason why he's just been... And it's not even just one item build either. He goes completely different ones almost every single time, whether it's Vessel Yules, Glipnir Ags, Four Staff uh, and Lotus Orb, Drums and Pipe. Like, they have got so many options. It's so flexible. But then again, so is the Invoker. And it is indeed. Yeah. Of course, a hero that's pretty much always been first phase banned in a lot of the games that we've seen so far, the road to the international Five slips through. On, uh, without a doubt, I'm going to pick it up. Just again, staying with the Moetta, Duracho hasn't played it yet. So every nope. single game, it has been Tofu. Uh, of course, we have seen Duracho more than... Yeah, it definitely has the capability. We've seen uh, previous Dream Leagues when this hero just came out, but at least so far, they feel like it is best uh, suited for a support. I think he's played it like three times in the past six months, though. So it's not like he's been super practicing unless he's been spamming it behind closed doors. It really, to me, it doesn't feel like a Duraccio hero, you know? But some of those heroes, you'd say, is the Chaos Knight, which is, without a doubt, top five carries at the moment. I still don't have, you know, too good of a read on, on where, like, Wraith King fits into play. I know Duraccio's got, like, a really good Spectre and Life Stealer. These are really solid heroes at the moment, so... Of course, we're not going to be looking at his here at the moment, but when we get further into the draft, we'll see what they want to give over to Duraccio. There's a potential for it. They could look to uh, pick up a Wraith King early-ish just because Ace has shown the potential to be able to play it. Um, I don't think Quinn has actually played too much of the Primal Beast. It's really been Ace that's been fulfilling that sort of role. So in terms of, like... Uh similarity and flex between the cores it, it would really have to be between ace and duraccio even like the lone druid is a possibility you know we were talking about that yesterday it really feels like this is the sort of meta that ace would absolutely be loving any surprises so far with i guess the second phase we only see gladiators at the moment but the dawnbreaker and the tusk remaining uh, I think it's specifically targeting like this offlane. I think that's a big reason behind why Talon were able to come back with that 4-0 and zero record. They just played to their strengths, right? And Q, his uh, Tusk is pretty great. He's one of the only people still playing the support Tiny, and he made it work yesterday with two wins, I believe. And uh, yeah, you mentioned the Pugner as well. I'm a little surprised that Ollie still has that uh, it left in the pool for him. Of course, picking it now would a little bit reduce the flexibility of this Invoker, but even coming into the tournament, Pugner plus Void Spirit and Underlord were the two heroes that uh, Talon really liked to pair together. And well, there is that Tiny that I was talking about. Man, if anyone is going to pull out a support Tiny still, it's, it's going to be that best man on world. screen right now. You said best, mm -hmm. on, best in the world? That's best a, in the world. That's a pretty big claim. 
Cause Bro, he's like third in net worth consistently as this position four tiny. Come on. And this is the hero we've been, uh, you've been definitely mentioning a lot as well with the Phoenix potential. You've got strong combo now out of the park. So a lot of team fight, a lot of AOE damage. We're going to need to see a response out of Talon. I mean, you, you pick the park into the tiny. Like, do yeah. I guess we haven't seen really them play the Invoker too much as a support, but you know, there is maybe now you're deciding, do you want to put tiny mid lane and then, and then play the Invoker or whether it be for, for Cure Oli? I think you're still generally okay with playing Makoto on the Invoker. Yes, it's really hard to like chain lock down the puck, but that's what the Tiny is for, right? So it's really just about, you know, maybe playing a little bit more passive of an early game and then really just starting to ramp up around that 15 or so minute mark when you should be starting to come online with your, uh, your Blink Daggers, with your Urn Vessel, whatever it might be that you've got at that time. Could be a cool little combo as well, like Coil into Deadshot. So we'll see how Gaming Gladiators, if they can execute mm -hmm. that combo as the game goes on, but moment what do we feel like talent need to cover because again we see like a lot of team fight out of uh out of gaming gladiators are you looking to go down that route a little bit as well for talent to be able to take these five on five fights once we get there yeah, possibly. I mean, the Brewmaster has actually slipped all the way through to this stage, and I think it's something that Jabs plays pretty significantly well. Of course, it would lead to having a double melee offlane, which isn't really something that you want to be giving away at this stage, uh, unless you're incredibly confident about the strength of it. And I, I'm just not quite sure if they are quite yet at that point. They're just going to you know, go back to the well again. Why not? The Pugna is a really good combination. It allows you to stay out on the map very frequently just with that, uh, that mana battery coming through. Of course, it's probably not going to be paired together with the likes of a Storm Spirit, but still feels pretty strong when played together with a Tiny or an Invoker. Even just the Decrep for the Avatos combo really does rip someone apart. Five seconds remaining. Have you got a preference with carries with leaning into the Pugna? Mm, not really. I mean, I, I think you just need someone that's either A, going to have a good amount of stun and kill threat, or you need someone that just stays the hell away from him and doesn't really care because Pugna's big strengths are high damage, Game high gladiators. movement speed, but a lack of like mobility spill, uh, spills. Oh, we were mentioning the potential of Duraccio uh, having a lot of success in the past, but the Wraith King Ace has played it a lot so far as well, but 23 Savage too we've seen in the past really like this Wraith King hero. So you've got a pretty strong safe lane for Talon. Of course, we don't know even if Jabs wants to play it in the off lane. You do have a lot of pushing potential, which you know now with the Wraith King Pugna, these towers could fall at a really rapid rate. And the one criticism that I had about Talon in times gone by, even when they had that really successful Riyadh run, was that it felt like teams that just outpaced them just absolutely ran through them and so i like that they've added this extra string to their bow where they're able to actually be the ones playing a little bit more on the front foot early on it's why liquid have such a great record against them right liquid are great at playing fast but talon now they're looking to try it themselves and uh, if it is savage playing this this would be his seventh game so far of this tournament uh, sorry ninth game and this would be his ninth unique hero so he is really just going for the versatility on his pentagon right now that's the other carry we brought up earlier. So, mm -hmm. so both sides are pretty happy, at least with their ones. I wonder what the... I could see Ace playing it too. Yes, without a doubt. He's done it in the past. Mm -hmm. Ten seconds remaining. I'm just seeing a heart builder. You know, like they, they, they have a lot of damage, but again, the percent damage a tiny bit lacking outside of the vessel, right? And you know you're going to have the Phantasm to be able to get out of that. You're eventually going to be able to get into a BKB on the CK. We even see occasionally a Manta style come out from him, but probably not super early on. Uh, so it, it is going to take a little bit to be able to get through this CK's HP pool, especially once he hits up onto that level 15 talent. Minus 100% damage taken from the Phantasm. So they only take an extra, uh, what is it, 225% or, you know, 125%, if you will. What do you feel like Still they are... Like people that deal with it. What do you feel like they're lacking in the, the offlane? You know, I know you said the potential of the CK to be one or three, but if we are still looking for that ace hero to outround their draft and be able to pair up with a Moeta for Tofu, what do you kind of feel like they need to cover? 
I don't think they would hate a Brewmaster either, to be honest. I mean, Ace has really good micros, so it obviously already fits his sort of style. And also, it's a nice way to be able to dispel things like the Decrep if you're using it defensively. You can completely isolate one of the heroes in these team fights. You can, you know, use the, the Void Brewling as well for a little bit of that pushing uh, potential. And you, are, you know you've already got the potential to, like, control a closed-in area of a fight with the Dream Coil, with the Calling, with the Deadshot. Like, it's a lot of stuff that holds people into this little choke point. So I feel like a Brewmaster would work really well. Do we see a potential of uh, a Centaur even being considered as well for the Gladiators? I mean, it feels like Centaur Moetta could be a pretty strong lane. Maybe as the game grows on, Wraith King, some of the physical damage might be a bit of a concern, but it's just another, like, initiating hero so the Puck can follow up. So you've got the Chaos Knight as well, and Moetta can freely be able to play around these fights. It's a possibility, and they do get rid of Ace's low druid. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking like I, I have a lot of faith in Makoto and Q in terms of like their spell timing, right? Like yep. if you're going to pop the Stampede, they're going to be ready with a Blink Avalanche. They're going to be ready with a Tornado to be able to interrupt that sort of thing. So that's really just what's uh, coming to the front of mind for me. Might not get the same level of effectiveness as you might be truly wanting. Let's even see what this last band's going to be for Gladiators as well. Of course, we've. You're just seeing prior, they're looking to get rid of the Sven just in case it is going to be Jabs playing the Wraith King. And you know, you are going to need to find some ways to be able to deal with this Chaos Knight. Just, you know, the Phantasm, they are really lacking that AoE damage. I mean, Tiny's a support, really, you're probably not considering him. Invoker, I'm sure, pretty decent at it, but you'd like someone else to be able to help out. Yeah, I haven't really been playing too much other AoE heroes for 23 Savage. It's basically only been the Sven so far, unless you can counter PA and getting into that uh, that Battle Fury, but I don't know about how I would feel about that one. Uh, in terms of other things, <gasps> Legion Commander wouldn't be horrible if you were wanting to run this as a position one faceless void, just to have a little bit of extra saves coming through, and they do go for that brew for the extra team fight. So now, like, the potential of locking someone down 100 to 0 just ramps up even further, right? You don't want the Phoenix to get off his ultimate and his Sunray. You don't want the Brewmaster to get off his split, because then like, the team fight just swings so far in the favor of Gaming Gladiators. So this really does feel like Talon pick off versus gaming gladiators yes. team fight without a doubt without a doubt so we're gonna have to see if they continue to go down that route here for telling if you want another strong lane because gladiators have very strong lanes at the moment so we get that 24th pick to be able to outround your draft whether it's going to be jabs or savage to be able to secure their lane mm -hmm. looks like they're still discussing it between the two of them they're the only ones really raising any kind of points within the talent camp right now I'm surprised that Sunby hasn't, you know, done the, the classic coach thing and yoinked one of their seeds. The play has be comfy. Ooh. The Naga. Okay. So is I it... always... I, I, I'm just waiting, just in case it's a jabs one, yes. because, you know, it's a, it's a C specialty to be able to put the Naga Siren in the off lane. Obviously, uh, if Maseros was here for SMG, he would have been doing it, all the way going back to KP as well. He loves that off lane Naga Siren, but... It's going to be 23 Savage playing it. It is going to be a Jabs Wraith King coming through. It, it kind of goes away from that, that pick-off style that I was talking about. I guess, I suppose you, you do go into the Orchid a little early on the Naga Siren if you really wanted to go down that sort of route. And they are a little bit single target focused. But, yeah. I mean, again, you've got the Wind Panda to be able to deal with some of those Naga illusions early on before she gets a lot of those stats. So it's a good way to be able to clear out a lot of 23 Savage's team fight effectiveness if it does get to that stage. But remember, that's not really what Talon are going for, right? They're going for the burst. They want to be the ones that are initiating and starting things off. And I'm sure that's what Sunbeam in the background is drilling into his boys right now. It's definitely an interesting read, right? Where you can, but I know you're mentioning a lot about Talon's potential to just go for these pickoffs and avoid the team fights, and that's something that Illusion Heroes can really uh, help enable. Where you just split up the map. We've spoken the supports on Gladiators are really going to struggle with dealing with these Naga illusions. So, you know, we'll see. Do you even have the potential? Like, if Egg is used, you can song to to kill it or retreat, depending on how Quinn's going to use his coils. So, there's a lot of like disengage 
your methods out of Talon now just with this Naga. And again, Gladiators, they're very team fight heavy, very cooldown reliant. So we're going to have to look at Talon and how they can open up the map. You, you need to get these Makoto's rotations on point. You're going to need a pretty decent blink timing on a Q. So his also early rotation is going to be pivotal for on how early he can get his blink. But you know, if Gaming Gladiators can just get their levels on their supports, their cores, take a couple fights with their ultimates and start to build that lead. And if they can get these five on five fights, it can still look a bit scary for Talon. But the Naga really throws a, a spanner in the works here. So we'll see what Savage can do. We will. And uh, like I was saying before, during the earlier stage of the draft, I really still think despite having this quite aggressive pick off heavy and even tower push oriented draft, it is still going to be a slow ish 10 to 15 minutes, at least from Talon's perspective. That's what they want. They want to get their core items online. Like you said, Q needs to get into that early blink dagger if possible. But once they hit that timing, once they truly come online, I'm expecting to see these four heroes minus Savage on the Nagasara just grouping up and trying to ball down these towers. You know, with the, the blink dagger, you can isolate someone, you can burst them with a decrep, nether blast, hero vessel, which I'm sure Makoto will have at the time and uh well good to see a little bit of banter going on in the overall chat broski coming through from 23 project <laughs> mbappe all right <laughs> what do you think about the dot cringe after uh 23 savage's name um to be cringe i don't know i was expecting something a little bit better i guess he's got no sponsor tag oh, Baraccio. run away should be fine, Jabs. Oh, he's in the fog nicely. We get the illusion. Oh, yeah, we get to, Plus we two, get baby. to enjoy the Nagasaran illusions as well. The the noise of the washing machine <laughs> coming on, through on, on, <laughs> every single right click. Not, they got two illusions. Hang on, this extra two gold for Quinn and Tofu to start. Is it over? I don't know. Let's see how many bounties they get as well. Mm -hmm. See if we get a fight too. So, of course, both sides well aware of the current positioning. Let's we'll see. This is going to be such an exciting matchup. Like you said, you know, previously Talon, they knocked out Gladiators at Riyadh. We've seen previously Dream League. Gladiators, oh. I think it was uh, Dream League Season 20, actually knocked out Talon in the playoffs as well. So, the battle begins. been back and forth <laughs> between these two teams for the entire year. It does look like GG is going to be able to find three bounties as well to start. I love the Celery Mind Games coming through as well. Only waiting to drop the Good Luck Have Fun after they get that mid D ward off as well. I mean, he does little things that are kind of crazy. Like, in the middle of a game, like, after a play, even if someone was completely uninvolved, he'll tip them. Even if they weren't <laughs> supposed to be part of that, he'll tip them. Just to kind of, you know, sow some of that discourse into the rest of the team. Like, why is he tipping him? What, what are we talking about? It's, it's all about that little extra edge that you're trying to get throughout these games. Edge is always important. Always important. You get a little bit of advantage against these two teams. They're so evenly matched. Such a treat as we get to see them already being able to battle it out in such an important series. Q down to 100 health, though. So early on, Dorachio and Celery putting a lot of damage into the two. This could be a very messy lane, though, for Talent. Double melee, really going to struggle with the Fire Spirits. Again, Chaos Knight, probably one of the better laning carries behind the Trolls. So... And this is not going to get easier as levels go on as well. No, it's it's really the level two timing that I'm looking for here on Game and Gladiators, right? Tiny has zero armor to be able to start things off. He's bought a Ring of Protection specifically because of this purpose, going up against a Chaos Knight. And, uh, you know, when that Reality Rift comes online, well, maybe you won't have the mana pool for it, actually, uh, considering he has been spamming out the Chaos Bolts, but it really is going to put Q in uh, a lot of strife. You know, going down to negative two armor, you're probably going to be able to secure the kill onto him. So it's important for Talon that they get up to a level two pretty quickly on him just to get that early point in the Avalanche and disrupt any kind of aggressive plays that GG might be trying to make against them. I mean, are you already considering about maybe even just dragging the wave? I know it's not as potent as what it used to be, but... Is this something you're considering from Talon to maybe offset the, the current lane setup? Because we see level two, they're going to go. Jabs should be our first blood with a dive slow. Duraccio doesn't need to dive under the tower thanks to Celery's damage over time. And they will take a little bit of damage from the Korea waves. Q's still going to hold them down as well with the Avalanche, but it's a nice hit back damage wise. But nonetheless, still that first blood gold is going to be huge in this lane. It's going to be Celery getting it again. So got the... Uh... The D ward gold got the first blood gold, and you know, again, Phoenix really doesn't need all that much to be able to have a really high level of it's impact. It's cold on mid. <laughs> What's <laughs> happening here, actually? Cold stuff could be frustrating with a Kree wave. Yeah, Quinn 
that you want over the right side. Still has some water runes to play with, but we already see this mid matchup as well. Quinn trying to you know put it to the edge here on Makoto. It's gonna mean that with that dive, he ends up losing the flag bearer creep, so doesn't have that little bit of extra regen. But of course, with the uh, with the Invoker, somewhat sustainable, right? You've got the Cold Snap to be able to play around with if you wanted to just sit in the Ghost Walk. Probably a little bit too early. Not playing again. Do it. Yeah. Nice Avalanche to be able to cover jabs at the moment. But the stun as well on the dive. Celery will actually go down. A much needed kill for Talon. Yeah, very, very nicely done by Q specifically, making sure that he's able to follow him up on the backside. And again, just that Wraith Fire Blast midair. That's if you're going to make these uh, these big brain plays, trying to dive in onto the Rachio. This skeleton damage is really starting to stack up here on Duraccio. He's got a tree. Is it enough? Oh, no, 20 health. Is it Q? What? <laughs> Looking for the Taz. <laughs> Why not? Got to go for those sorts of plays. And you were talking about the regen. Game of Gladiators is out of regen. And because they've gone for that uh, earlier kill threat, yeah, they've got one point in the Chaos Strike, but it's just not enough to be able to keep yourself safe up on this top side. But still, overall, all lanes going fairly well for the Game of Gladiators right now. We haven't really been talking about bot all that much, have we? Now, oh, Ace off to a good start. 9 in 6. To the 16 and 3 currently for the Brewmaster. We'll see what his item build's gonna be. You know, we've got him like Brown Boots, Midas, Radiance, maybe a little bit of extra utility as well as a potential. Is there something you are looking at here for, for Ace? Uh, I think the Radiance would work fairly well, right? You know that it's going uh, to prevent tofu? perhaps a little bit of damage. I don't yeah, know about this. Yeah, they wanted to go for Ollie, but it just meant that Savage was freely able to right-click. And now Ace is in some danger as well. Decrypt to slow him down so Savage can get in front of the retreating Brewmaster. This eventually will be a double kill, and we are seeing the power of this Pugna again. Talon, they played it three times with three victories in the group stages, and Ollie's really given a good start over to Savage. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when they were playing it in the games leading up to the Road to the International, like it was by far their most common picked hero to be able to pair together with a lot of these other combinations. And well, uh, I've even talking about, we often see a lot of supports don't have a ton of synergy. You can get kills with just this Pugna and Q once he starts to get into that uh, Blink Dagger timing. Dude, Quinn is... Bodying mid though, 34 and 6 compared to the 26 and 4. Very impressed with the start that we're seeing out of the puck so far. And of course, we know previously, actually, top lane jabs looking to TP out. Oh, we died in base. Stun still all cool down for the right. Yo, Q should be able to get back to the tower. Are they actually looking to go for it? No, never mind. It's a big deal to have the Wraith King all the way back there, basically level on net worth with Celery up until this point off the back of the first slot. Savage. But again, oh, wasn't expecting that. All right, well, some big kills now for Gladiators. You get that one up top. Ollie's now going to be pressured out as well. So yeah, a couple core kills, 1,000 net worth lead early, and this might help the supports to rotate to try and secure the power in. We've already got Q. It's obvious though, Quinn knows he's here. Ooh. Nicely done. There wasn't <laughs> too much more that Quinn could have done there. He did. But I mean, the thing is, you had a creep wave half underneath this top T1 tower, and Q, uh, Q wasn't getting it. They knew the jabs didn't have a TP, so he was either stacking or going for the power rune, and you would have to assume that the power rune was the one that they were prioritizing. Still, though, that extra regen rune is going to provide a lot to Makoto. I mean, we were talking about in terms of last hits coming out a little bit on top on Quinn, but Makoto in terms of net worth is right there with him. Yeah, actually, definitely not body. Not, not bodying at all. You know, he's still doing a very good job. What do we want to see out of these mid laners, though? Because with Coswex, already we will get our first rotation out of Makoto. So shove the way with the tornado. Now looking to try and play with jabs as well. Q is not nearby. It's just going to be the two cores on Talon. First it's a question of how close does he get to that sentry that's currently blocking the hard camp. Doesn't look like he'll be able to make anything happen. And they've got the read. Of course, Quinn shoves out the lane, so... Where would we like to see Quinn rotate to as well? Then, you know, that coil, of course, first one of the game could almost just guarantee a kill. Is there a lane you would prefer the puck to move to? I'd personally prefer him to go to top, just because Jabs has already had a pretty rough start, and uh, it's going to just be put this Wraith King in the bin. You don't exactly provide a ton of utility when you're being played as an offlane, and they've got that kill threat there with the Chaos Knight as well, guaranteed.
Wonder when we're even going to see Oli maybe think about making a play, you know, potentially through the portal. Currently, hugging around this mid lane. Whack it away at this yeah. tier one tower already. He's level five at seven and a half minutes, so three points Nether Blast. He could put a little bit of damage in. I mean, that could be really frustrating. Just the Pugna showing mid, shoving the wave, putting pressure on the tower to force someone here, which could enable Makoto. And we're going to see again him to consider about moving top, but. Yeah, he's got the urn coming out to him now, and he's probably retreating back to be able to contest this top power rune. No one covering bottom side for Talon right now. Gaming Gladiators have secured that one, and it's going to be an arcane rune. So what more could you ask for as a puck? Celery? You're going to be able to stop the dive away? Let's get some separation. Still going to hunt with the tornado, but off the mark. So Celery, okay. Again, Makoto, these movements. We are going to see. I mean, he's currently fine in net worth, but... You've got to make sure you're keeping up. Yes. Yeah, that's the big thing with the you got to make these early rotations count. you got to get those charges in the owner's shadows. You don't want it to be because you've died, and now they're actually going to go for a rotation of their own with that arcane rune, and they know they have to deal with this mid uh, creep wave. Jabs in a lot of danger. I mean, more heroes from Dyer starting to funnel to top. You just have to sacrifice Jabs. In fact, yep. he's even going to be able to TP out. Quinn is still going to be there nonetheless with the coil. So get the kill on the Q. Is this all five heroes? Everyone from Dyer is at this die. top side. He was able to TP out as a result of all of that. So, I mean, it's it's a lot of heroes being committed. And again, 23 Savage is happy on this bottom side. He's playing the Naga Siren. Maybe they feel on Gaming Gladiators that, you know what, we've got the Brewmaster. We haven't had to use the split just yet. We have the answers to it early on before she gets too many stats that the Wind Pen is just going to be absolutely able to wreck it with the Dispel Magic. Do you feel like... Oh, I'll actually hold that because we might have a bit of a brawl once again with three heroes around mid. What the play is going to be, of course, Dyer. They have this ward that was able to scout at Q's currently position. Tofu's hanging behind Quinn as well. So it looks like the puck should be fine. Do you feel like... Because we just saw the read, like Gladiators are putting so much emphasis on defending their tower. That was the big advantage we spoke about with Talon, you know, with the Nether Blast and the Wraith King to take these early objectives. Do you agree that Gladiators should like bring four, five members to defend these early towers or should they just play the macro game? I think they're, they're banking on the fact that Talon are going to overcommit and they're going to really be able to come out on top with any sort of defense because you, you can't have that sort of thing happen where you only end up getting a support, right? 23 Savage getting a ton of farm is Salary, this could be dangerous. Coil with the egg, but they just blow up Quinn. His health pool disappeared. Makoto's going to go under the cover of the Ghost Walker. Pretty good dead shot, but really not going to help out too much in the end. Another turnaround's going to be there. What can these two supports do to pressure Talon? I mean, Tofu will use a defensive ultimate. Makoto can still stall out the retreat. Even got Tornado with the ready. Mavlanch will help them yeah, close the distance. A little bit messy with the Tornado. And Tofu actually yeah. gets out. They stop the tree throw damage. And our Celery is going to be back with a combo. Ace comes out of nowhere as well. He won't be. He's got the ultimate ready to go if they want to continue chasing. And in the end, I mean, it is... It's a support for Quinn's life. You're probably happy with it for Talon, but it's a messy spell casting nonetheless. Top lane, Thoracio. Makoto's going to look coming. to try and tip in with jabs. He's just got him far too aggressive in this lane. They recognize as a very vulnerable Chaos Knight to these rotations, and they will be able to capitalize off the back of that. He's going to try and make it work live? for the kill. Uh, surely not, right? Toss forward? Duraccio? No way. Toss. Oh they... my god, he's getting away. Chaos Knight is just so speedy, man. Makoto, can he catch up to him? No, he doesn't have cold snap no for Tornado way. and Rock or anything. Nicely done. So much space. So that's a couple of kills that you really probably should have converted onto both one onto Tofu with the uh, the Avalanche being used at the same time as the Tornado, not dealing that additional amount of damage. And yeah, Duracho getting away with murder there. The plus side, at least still for Talon, is they do have this pushing style lineup. So Ollie is just chipping away at this top tower. It doesn't matter if a couple of creeps get hit into that mid tier one. There's not too much significant damage being done there. And they are going to be opening up the map even further for Savage to play completely uncontested right now on this bottom side of the map. This tower does have to go down now though. Like we've seen yeah. Gladiator's done a pretty good job to stall it out for a couple minutes. And with Egg on cooldown, we are going to have some difficulties of potentially defending this tower with multiple heroes. And yeah, it does look like Talon will be successful. You also take... Lucky as well. Power rune, top side for Q. So uh, Quinn was right in position to be able to secure that one and maybe make a bit of a move down here to be able to gank Savage. But without that, you don't have as much of that surprise factor. They're pinging it out right now that they have been missing off the map for quite some time. So let's see where Savage looks to move. Both sides are making their own play. Currently, they're going to... Talon will run into Duraccio first. They don't want to go for Look the CK Mimos Savage. Song. 
Did he even? That's the next level play. Oh, well you done. Might have saw Quinn underneath the tower, but yeah. anyway. Okay, so both sides look for their own individual play across the map. They'll both be thwarted as well. So this will give a bit of an opportunity now for Gladiators, maybe to put some pressure onto the T1 tower. I mean, they're ready to go to force a, a 5v5 fight with these ultimates back up. Do you can, do you even need to though? Because again, I mean, Ace, Midas, 2k gold in the bank. Are you looking to really take these big engagements at the moment from Dial? Uh, I think you can, just because, again, Talon aren't quite ready yet, but uh, I think what Talon are doing is pretty good. They're not committing their Wraith King to a lot of these pushes. They're not committing 23 Savage to a lot of these pushes. They're only putting heroes that are going to provide a lot of effectiveness in terms of being able to do some tower damage, open up the map, but it's not the absolute worst if they die, and they've got a lot of saves for them in terms of stuns, decrep, heal, tornado, lots of stuff to be able to make sure that they're not giving their lives up for free. I... Dude, I haven't even noticed. Jabs has a Midas queued up. So we are... I mean, this is the classic talent Long greed, one. right? Like trying to go ultra late game. Mm -hmm. See if he's going to be able to get to that stage. So smoke off from Talon, looking to try and move down bottom to slow down some of the farm that Ace is getting. These two heroes by themselves might lack the damage. Ace can have the potential to get his ultimate off. The timing needs to be perfect with the chain control. They decrep him. Ace, there we go. But still, I mean, not having Bruce Split now makes you feel like, you know what, okay, yep. we're a lot more confident to be able to take a lot of these fights. We saw there the Tumblr's toy on Q. Doesn't have the Blink Dagger just yet, but does provide him that little bit of extra initiation. I mean, the Savage and Jabs are going to be very happy about this as well. You know, they, they don't have that extra little bit of lockdown. They don't have that team fight. Maybe they can get a little bit more greedy with the, uh, the farm that they're looking to try and pick up. I mean, we see Mac Makoto just queued up the Midas as well after the vessel. This tower is under some danger. Oh, very awkward dead shot. <laughs> <laughs> there was a Ricky in the river. Ah, okay. Right, right, right. Just trying to break down some trees to stop the TP locations in. I see. For sure. Are there no cellars here? Makoto be fine, though. I mean, Savage is right behind him. Crow's gonna break. Dive directly on the top to they want to deal with the egg of retreat. Savage and Oli's gonna try and turn to bring it down. The ditch. Man, so close Almost. from Tofu to keep it up, but see Talon nonetheless will be able to bring him down. Now they're gonna look for more. Quinn Duke's over to the right side, but Q, perfect placement out of the tiny. He's gonna make sure there is no escape from the mid lane on Gladys, or is there? Another orb to get some separation, and Quinn will get out of danger. Yeah, barely. One more second, and he would have been dead to rights. Looks like Makoto might even be looking to try and go for a, a bit of a follow-up here. He might see the Illusory Orb going up towards the north side, and he's got those Spirit Vessel well charges. Done. Nice hunting, Makoto. Gonna be able to stop the Sunray instantly. Now Q's even moving Surely over as well. Does. They should no. be able to get a double kill as a result to this Makoto. Hunting deep behind the tower, getting ready to potentially punish any defense out of gaming Gladiators. I've been really impressed with how Savage has been playing this game so far. You know, sure, he dies one time on the bottom side, but just the realization that he has this complete bottom side of the map to be able to farm, he's put himself a good amount ahead on in terms of net worth. He made sure to use the song to be able to get away when they went for that one attempt. And then when uh, when they thought that maybe they could try and make a kill attempt of their own, he's in there, right in the position to be able to use that early Manta style, to be able to use all of that net worth as a significant threat. So really really like in the the savage play so far again nine games ninth unique hero from him so the man is versatile and he is really taking over in the net worth up mm. there by long show i mean it does have to be said that the rest of the cores on talent are struggling to keep up in farm but importantly you've got this blink on q ready to go he's not with the team just yet for this attempt quick fingers by quinn so jabs is still pop all that much on Talon to be able to make that kill attempt happen, right? You've got uh, Cute, like you mentioned, gonna be about to come in as he refills his, he's got a Midas as well on the tiny, oh by God. the way. We're gonna have, what, four, okay. three Midas's? Three Midas's Should be three. on Talon. So, maybe I'll wait, because I think they're gonna look to try and make a play off the back of the, the blink on Q. So they do see Duracho farming top, which would be a, a oh, huge what kill. A vision around this top side as well. And they should get him. Stuck around for a little bit too long. Duracho's been flawless so far, 17 minutes in. 
But Talon finally going to be able to close the door onto the Chaos Knight. They are instant TPs coming through from Gladiators. Are they going to be fast enough one? to keep him alive? Sunray's out from Celery. Duracho getting a lot of bonus health back with the life still as well. Now the Supernova gives him firm control. Duracho is all a bait. And now with Gladiators here, they can look to clean up. Jabs is going to end up going down. They'll be rewarded with the kill on the Cube. Savage wants to turn the fight. The first fight for him, looking to get involved. He's got that all good ready in the arsenal, but it's still messy. Makoto doesn't have the health pool to bite back as well. Now Ace, he wants to charge on four, but the song will stop him short. Savage is able to TP out, but Duracho lives long enough. The boys come in full force, and that's a three for one in the end. It's just those little things, right? Millimeters of difference. The uh, the chain control wasn't perfect before he was able to get the Phantasm off, which meant that uh, you ended up hitting the wrong Phantasm illusion. Look at all that damage as well coming out from Celery. This is the reason why I'm saying, teams, I know it's been picked a fair amount already, but pick Phoenix more against a lot of these beefy heroes in these longer team fights. It really does shine. Yes, another attempt potentially. Perfectly. Yep. Underneath this observe ward. There's no split now. But Eight. it's against the Radiance. Should nonetheless, with all the magical damage, be able to bring him down. the chance this time. So again, this is the big thing we brought up in the draft, right? Like, Gladiators, you're playing with a lineup that is very cooldown reliant. So Talon, mm -hmm. this is where you can look to really put some pressure onto the map. And it's going to be up to Quinn, kind of, to stall it out. I mean, you see, instantly shoves out mid. It's going to force Talon to respawn. And now we've got a little bit of break in the action. How do we feel about this going late game? Because your gladiators, you look again, 5v5 team fight looks super scary. But Talon feel like with their Midas is maybe they can compete up against this Quinn. Nice oh. silence. Wow. Oh, is he gonna, gonna need to coil Q? He knows the kill threat's coming there from the tiny, and yeah, the the multiple Midas's. Re oh, okay, ends up snapping the coil anyway. Uh, yeah, the multiple Midas's really do lean it slightly more towards Talon than what I would normally predict, and okay. also just the fact that it's Q playing the tiny. Right, we've seen what this man is able to do. We've seen his mid to late game impact. You could kind of like the Muerta, honestly, become that legitimate fourth core for the team. So I really feel like it's going to be pretty damn even if it gets late. That's going to be the fact that Talon are playing around this ward as well, right? It's something that I was really wanting them to do. They knew with the kill that they were able to secure onto Ace that it was obvious that that sort of area was warded. So not only do they protect it, they also get rid of an Observer Ward of Game and Zone. But still, net worth is literally dead even. And the reason why it was like that for quite some time was because of 23 Savage, but, but now it's given time for... You know, Jabs, his Midas is continuing to pay off. He had a Blade Mail queued up for quite some time, but it's currently the Radius that he's changed his mind to. We are seeing he's looking for that Ultra Scaling, which we have kind of seen from some of the offlane Wraith Kings, you know, Radiance, Interceptor. I know earlier today, we got the kind of core Wraith King from Noticed on Virtus Pro, so a bit of a different choice here from Jabs, but yeah, mm -hmm. like you said, still very close to this game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Wraith King Ags is pretty significant this game. I mean, you consider the sort of heroes that you, uh, you're you playing alongside. Like, it probably means another Avatos combination, for example, if Q ends up dying, and that's a significant amount of burst damage. It means a lot more damage coming out from Ollie. Like, these sorts of things are super significant once it gets to the later stages. And again, the Midas is really starting to pay off now. That they are. What about some of the support itemization? We've spoken a lot about Moeta having a very versatile item build. We see Tofu 4, 1, and 2, highest net worth out of the support. So he can kind of go for some you know, different items to help out. And we'll see how we can get involved off the back of the smoke here. Gladiators as the target. Q is currently going to show on the lane. They should know what smoke's going on, though. Ace revealed the Cinderbrew and the Clap. So let's see how well they play accordingly now on Talon. Yeah, it's just an all retreat. Not even defending this mid wave at all. They're letting Duraccio be the one to be able to take it out. They know something's up. They would much rather have better positioning or no positioning at all. They're just going to back off completely. So time wasted, more value for minuses. You know that Game of Gladiators aren't farming. You're okay in general. And for the fact that their tier one tower mid lasted until 21 and a half minutes, I think they're fairly satisfied. Yeah, so I was going to... Make a bit of a line being drawn on the map now, but I'm sure Jabs is saying, guys, just give me a little bit more time. 400 gold away from my Radiance. That'll be a real difference maker against this CK. Are they looking for their own smoke here for Talon? What's the group up as they want to, but yeah, like Jabs really just wants literally an extra 30 seconds. So, okay, so what was... can you do to the lanes in that time? I going to mention before, do you like the route from Tofu going the Lotus? Like, is there you know, any other yes. things? Okay. 
like by far i think it's the best item this game considering what you're up against right it means no no targeted sum from the wraith king no slow from the wraith king no cold snap no orchid no decrepify it's a lot it's of a stuff lot. that it yep. protects you against even just the toss from uh from q as well so these sorts of things are really going to be high value for them i mean even just the armor component as well right against the wraith king and the naga siren feels pretty good some big item timing so Savage completes the heart, both teams. and there's the Radiance as well for the Wraith King, so we are ready to go, and we're probably at a stage where we need to be looking towards Roche. I'd say Dire maybe struggle a little bit more at taking that, um, but Radiant, with, without a doubt, should be able to if they have a, a little bit more time, so it is going to be down bottom for the next two minutes. No one currently has too much vision set up in the area. Quinn knows there's people nearby with that Nether Ward being placed down. Ends up just being able to poke at Prod onto the onto Q. He knows that unless Savage is there, there's no way he's going to die. And even then, he's got the Yule Scepter to be able to play around with for that Orchid. So it really is Q uh, being the main hero that he needs to be worried about. I wonder if they're even make, making the call of, you know what, we wanted the Radiance yes, on Jabs, you. now we want the Midas on Q before we make any sorts of plays. Hell, even if we end up dying, we're still going to be impacting our net worth positively. Not if he dies, though, and gives up a good amount of uh, that unreliable gold. Back-to-back -back smokes, that might not work out. Jabs, Jabs is going to act it. as a bait, pops the smoke, of course can eat a lot of the spells. They haven't used too many big abilities, though. Meanwhile, over to the left side, Savage going toe to toe. It's a pretty good supernova in the middle of the team fight. 23 needs to make the call the retreat. They'll get out of range of the egg. It's a lot of abilities now used. Meanwhile, Jabs on the right side, though, does get assassinated. Can you still go for more from gaming gladiators? You don't have the greatest health pull on Thoracio. All you've really got left is the Pierce the Veil on to Tofu, and he's got the Aghanim Shard as well to be able to play around with, so he can look to stay on his grounded man fight, but yeah, like you said, they've got absolutely nothing else. No Dream Call, no Supernova, no Split, no Phantasm even, to be able to make plays around. So the fact that, you know, a Wraith King dies, not the greatest, still the uh, very long cooldown on the Reincarnation, but he's going to be back up, he's still got the Midas oh. ticking, so I think he's generally okay with things. And he's going to be the one acting as that bait a lot of the time. You can see immediately after that, he queues up the blade mail, just making sure that, you know what, if you're going to commit this much onto me, not only are you getting burned, you're also probably going to die. Really have the lanes in a good position to, to make something out of the map here, Talon. Get the pick off onto Tofu. They're going to look to maybe connect to top as well. They've got this lane shoved out. Mid's going to be pushed out as well, so... They can, I mean, you still got, what, 50 seconds with Egg on cooldown, 57 with the Primal Split, so you can continue to posture pretty aggressively inside Dai's jungle. Yeah, Vision isn't amazing right now for Talon, especially considering it did just turn into nighttime. I would have loved if Ollie was able to, for example, get an Observer Ward behind that top tier two tower just to be able to play around. But you know that Jabs isn't going to be joining in for the next little bit, right? Like, it's still another 40 seconds until he's going to have that reincarnation back and available. So I assume he just wants to get that Blade Mel before he joins the rest of the boys. But I was really expecting perhaps a little bit more uh, emphasis onto, you know, putting some damage into this tier two top. It's so crazy to see triple Midas and one on a support tiny, a four tiny. Let's go. <laughs> like, what is it? What are they doing? This is just classic talent stuff, man. Let's go late game. Let's ultimate <laughs> cube, bro. We've, a lot of people have mentioned, you know, Jabs are very greedy. Off laner, you play ultra late, three cores. Why not have a fourth core involved as well? So, do. A bit of a difference down some of these upcoming fights, Celery, with that second level in the Supernova. We've seen eggs have been very difficult for Talon to address. And I do not think that's really going to change unless it's a poor placement of the egg inside the fights or Savage again uses Song to deal with it. Hmm. Once it gets later on, I think it's a lot, they're going to be a lot more capable of doing it. Like Jabs will probably go maybe a BKB, maybe a Blink Dagger, but I'm, I'm expecting an AC to be coming as well in his future, just to be able to provide that little bit of extra attack speed both for himself and the rest of the team yep. and provide a little bit of extra protection as well against the likes of that CK. It's a huge... He's pretty huge himself. He's got 4K HP now on Duraccio, so it was hard to kill him before. Imagine now. Big boy. You do compare him, though, up against the other carry in Savage. It's about to be a butterfly, which could be a huge item timing. We have seen he's had some difficulties with, like, entering some of these team fights. 
But this game has really not changed in regards to the status. We've only got 19 kills, 1,000 net worth lead, and it, I mean, it's been like that for 10 plus minutes. Mm -hmm. Q once again prioritizing his own mobility. He's got the Ogre Seal Totem as his tier 3 neutral item. So very nice one to be able to have just to provide that little bit of extra quick speed to be able to get in with the Blink Dagger, even just as a tool to be able to get out of that calling as well. Feels really nice. <laughs> Dude, Ace is a man to queued up. You want your own like illusion spam of waves? I can, uh, I can do that too. Radiance Mantle. Mm -hmm. All right. Very interesting. Universal Hero as well. Feels good. True, true. <laughs> so crazy. All right. I wonder what his item is going to be after that. His top ward is just out of range as well. Yeah. Thank you very much, they... Bus, for picking this one up. What do we feel like is realistic here for Talon to be able to get off the back of the ages? Who do you even give it to, firstly? Is there a preference? Mm, I don't know, actually. I mean, maybe they feel like Savage needs it just to be able to play aggressively more with this butterfly that he's uh, freshly picked up, right? Like, if, if you've got all of this survivability, then you gotta do something with it, right? And uh, I feel like he's no stranger to being the one that dives in super deep. It's like they'll be able to get the Wisdom Rune as well. And it always feels like Talon are just waiting for like, yeah, one more item, yes. yeah, one more thing. You know, you can uh, you could go for a little bit more of an aggressive oriented draft, but at the end of the day, you're gonna default back to what's got you to this stage. And uh, well, three Midas's and you know, a little bit of a slower mid game really does feel like the Talon way. I'm just a little worried that perhaps when they had that previous big timing up top where there were no ultimates on Gaming Gladiators that they didn't get enough out of the map. Still though, almost a BKB on Makoto, which will feel real nice for him. I do like the fact that we see Gem already currently on, on Gladiators compared to Radiant. And when it's going to come down to with such an even game on who's going to be able to get that jump, you have some very important heroes in, in their ultimates and Talon have this potential to blow them up full from zero. This is a very interesting pathing from Doraccio as well. Jabs is about to be cut out. off. Now, he of course, does have reincarnation, so the instant rainbow TPs are out. He's committing? Doraccio did buy the BKB prior, noise. so if required, he can use it to retreat. What is you know, the call? They're, they're walking through a creep wave. Dude, Savage is charging. Quinn's away from the team as well. You won't have to park for the moment. It's getting it's a, a bit messy, though. Yeah. I think they're really just wanting to bait out a few of these big team fight ultimates, both teams acting as that. You know, can we get the song out of them? Can we get the brew split out of them? Can we get anything? But neither team is going to be taking the bait. I see. With those TPs down to bottom, let's see what Gladiators can do on the map now. This is going to give them at least a bit of advantage with their mobility. We do see instantly Talon moving two heroes to top. Makes a lot of sense, right? You could, you could sacrifice one lane, but not even that, actually. It's going to be Jabs TPing towards that mid. He is working towards that AC that I was talking about as well. So I really like this. I was considering that because of how effectively he was being controlled in that, in that past fight, that he might be considering a, a Blink Dagger or a BKB. But this really does feel like A, an egg killer, B, uh, a puck killer with the minus armor, and C, just protection against the, uh, the Chaos Knight. One man we haven't spoken about too much this game is Quinn on the park. Of course, he's a very comfortable hero, master tier with it. We've seen him take over games in the past. The hero that we you don't really get too often at the moment in the meta, but he has a very interesting item queued up in the Mjolnir. Sure. I mean, going up against a uh, an Argusar, it always feels pretty good. He's already got that early Aghanim Shard as well, so he's going to be launching out a lot of attacks, getting a lot of those procs, basically guaranteeing a, uh, a Maelstrom proc every single time that he uses the phase shift. It's only going to be one proc as a little internal cooldown. We're going to get a fight, yeah, with these ages. It's just not going to be a bunch of posturing and people just farming. You'd hope so. I'd you? hope so. I mean, what's, uh, what's Savage got coming out to a BKB? I mean, if that says I want to fight, like that, that is really the one that I'm expecting to see them try and rally around a little bit here on Talon. But they've got to get used to each other's butterfly. Doracha is already halfway towards the MKB. This is a big spike for them. And they currently see Savage away from the team, so they're going to smoke in the opposite direction. Oli might be the first point of contact. He's going to continue running to the left side, so maybe they'll get a, a juicy kill instead. Yeah, they've got BKBs, though, and they've currently got no way to be able to have that BKB piercing disable Ooh. right now. Quinn still just Ooh. on 18. Salute detection. That's a little bit 
What's the call going to be? Makoto turns super early, use of the egg. They, they don't really have many with heroes to protect though. Makoto with the alacrity. I mean, it's a big opportunity if Savage wants the song to, to get some more heroes now. Die yeah, want to no, fight. They're, they're coming in. Over to the northern side, Duracho assassinated Jab, so that was a reincarnation used early on. His ace jumps in the middle. Duracho's going to look to get the second life out of Jabs as well as Savage's song will do nothing. 4v4 at the moment. Gladiators, can they look to get more as well as Savage? He's by himself. Tell they're not in a position to protect him as GG. Find a big kill. They're going to be able to surround him on this second life and Quinn will force away the reinforcements. Savage has the BKB to protect himself momentarily, but look at Ace guiding Makoto on the back line. That sets up for Quinn's jump. And Orchid will prevent the spell casting, but the dead shot drags him back to Doracho. And Ace isn't done just yet. Deep inside the base they go. They might need a toss out. Q, can he protect Savage? They've got the drain, Ollie. He'll keep 23 alive for the moment, but there is going to be no response from Talon, and finally, there is a big break from Dyer. There is, and I mean, it's unfortunate. Oh, they're still looking like they want to try fighting here on Savage. Again, the Avatos combo was can available. He? Jabs is coming back up. Savage, can you fight try. this? I mean, you really don't want to use this Makoto buyback. You're relying on Ollie and Tiny to tough. get you out of danger. Savage gets some distance. Quinn's going to jump to the back line as well, but the spell's still on cooldown for Q. Yours in snare. Avalanche is up in a couple seconds. Duracho's going to try and prevent out. Q from Perfect holding Duracho. Quinn into place. And meanwhile, these buildings are full. They've held the buyback from Makoto, but there's still a bit of an opportunity to get more kills as Quinn easily jumps and blows up, jabs, and all of a sudden, this game, it's out of control. Yeah, it's blown wide open, and it goes back to the tiniest of things. They had the glyph for the Tier 2 tower that they were fighting underneath. Maybe that extra multi-shot would have also cleared out the creep wave and prevented them from being able to take this Tier 3 tower. So little things like that really do add up a whole lot more. They're even able to lay down some vision on this uh, top side of the Radiant base, and they haven't cleared it out just yet. So they know exactly the fact that they are leaving the base. They're not going to be holed up being played a little scared and this is really what I was worried about the fact that with the ages before they hit some of these really scary timings on gaming gladiators they just didn't get enough out of it dude that was all without an MKB on Duracho this guy is having a incredible showing he is nullified Jabs's impact two six and zero from the offlane Wraith King you know he's gone for this radiance AC queued up but we haven't felt his impact and just Duraja was killing him multiple times inside these team fights. He's such a menace. Level 20 now, and with that big item, it does not get easier for Talon. And you just saw how well uh, Ace was able to deal with the Naga illusions as well, right? Like, he's he's probably as tanky as he's going to get on 23 Savage. Like, he's going into a heart, uh, sorry, a Scythe next. This isn't a Scardi game for the Naga Saren, right? You're, you're farmed enough, you need to be able to do some damage rather than just be survivable, but... Yep just it takes so much damage from that dispel magic from the brewmaster and dude they killed the egg without anyone else there like that start of the fight for talent where you didn't have to commit too heavily to get a big hero like it's not only the egg but it's the the sun ray as well from celery that we might see have a lot of impact inside this smoke engagement not a lot of heroes and savage that's the real naga look savage pops the bkb no messing around <sighs> He bought out too. This is a hex now completed for 23. Mm -hmm. It's also a Mjolnir now finished up by Quinn. That damage from the puck is going to be super significant. He's got Macy coming out to him as well on the brew. What did he basically buy? Octarine. Never mind. Dude, he's so farm. Yeah. Oh my god. Quickening charm on top of it. One of the better neutral items for the brewmaster. Wasn't he seeing an axe from him just to have that permanent uh, storm brewing out? See, it's just taken over the map. They are not stopping as well. Double siege wave. A force talent back to base. Even an aggressive glyph coming through here, wanting to protect this wave as much as possible. Team previously, the team fight ultimates have been disastrous for talent inside the fight. They're going to jump jabs again to start. Should be able to kill the first life without committing too heavily. What can Talon do to protect Jabs on the respawn? Get some separation to the right side. There's the song. They can help protect Jabs, but do they go you back in afterwards? Toss. You got a toss on Q. They're so hesitant. They're not going to get anything. 
Oh wow. I mean, this is just some incredible 5v5 team for gaming. And we're seeing these big ultimates just be such a concern for Talon. They, they don't have ways to address them at the moment. They're going to try and make a, a fight occur with your know, Phantasm split on cooldown, but these are for 40 seconds. They smoked under the ward. Okay. They know it's coming. They're just backing off completely. Might even be looking to go through the twin gate and get the hell out of there, but it looks like it's the high ground that they're wanting to play around, banking on the fact that Roshan might have respawned. It's a really long one. Probably the longest they could have possibly hoped for on Gaming Gladiators, and you don't want to walk up into this. Quint in a great spot. Pops the smoke, gets the information. They're going to use the ward as well. You will find a pretty good initiation onto the Phoenix. There's just no follow-up. No boys. Salary's okay. Q's jumped into the lines. Dan and Talent don't want to follow him to death. They'll look through retreat to the southern tide. Duracho's gone far too forward. So big Q onto the chaos side if they're going to be able to find it. A supernova dropped on the Hag. They're going to try and turn to deal with the Egg. I don't know if they got the right clicks. Egg will pop oh, at the last hit. second. Makoto's in some danger. Duracho with the instant buyback into the middle with Savage. He'll give them an opportunity to retreat. Ace, he actually cancels the TP. The brueling stops Savage from getting out. They cannot chase the Naga Siren down to the south. Quinn, he got Makoto as well. A disastrous fight. The buyback from Duraccio, huge. The egg even better. And now gaming gladiators can look to walk it down and go for the finishing blow. Savage wants to bring one man with a grave, but he won't even do that. They got absolutely nothing left as well. Q doing his best to try and delay the push, but Ace is everywhere, man. Topping the net worth for Game and Gladiators right now, and he's being the absolute bane of this Nagasar in his existence. No song save. No Naga illusions in the early game. Even just the Radiance for that aspect there. Two fights, apparently, is all you need. Especially with the caliber of this team, you give them an advantage and they will completely take over the map and not look back from there. About to be mega creeps for Talon to deal with. They're gonna hold on, but still another 20 seconds until you're gonna get any sort of cause back into this game. And uh, they went for a slightly more aggressive route, but then the, the greed took over. The classic mentality of wanting to go into that late game. SEA plays it better than a lot of other teams and a lot of other regions, but it's just not enough. <laughs> Shaz is like, take my life instead. <laughs> but they were just turning to the throne. Makoto's back. You've got, I mean, Savage in fight, but it's far too long. A couple of seconds too long. In fact, in gaming, Gladiators will be rewarded with their gameplay with a first map victory 39 minutes in. And it's a, a convincing one as well, right? It seemed pretty even in the early-ish game. They got off to a good start. But man, it just goes to show why this these guys have won pretty much every land that they've attended this year. What is that, an 80% success rate just coming in fourth at Riyadh, knocked out by these boys on Talon. But other than that, it has been pretty solid all around. Ollie, just the blank thousand yard stare coming through. He knows that they had the opportunity to be able to come into this game and that Wraith King in the off lane didn't work out quite as well as they were expecting. No, it did not at all. Unfortunately, we, we weren't. You want to compare Ace to Jabs on this Brewmaster hero that has, you know, we've seen had a lot of success in this, you know, so far road to the international in the previous tournaments before it as well. Ace and the boys need a couple of fights to be able to get this game one victory. And in the end, they looked incredibly clean with all their team fighting spells so gladiators a game advantage let's see what the panel has to say about it though game and gladiators claim game one here and against the side of talent esports getting a little bit of revenge for what happened at the Riyadh masters however the most interesting thing about this is the triple strength heroes that they utilized but well, we're going to break it down find out exactly what happened and to do so i've got some double strength boys the big beefy homies lizard gods what's happening gods uh Talk to me about this game, right? Greed is good? 99999? Uh, look, they, they're going to work on whatever cheat codes they're putting in because all, all the Midas's and gold in the world couldn't save them here. Uh, it just felt like their timings were all off. Like, you have this, like, Naga, and then everyone else is like, let's get Midas's because this game's going to drag. Yep. But then suddenly Naga's ready to fight, and you've got three teammates with a Midas. It's like, you look around, and it's like, all this gold, and... Yeah, not into it, it, items that help you fight. It's, it's like that catch-22, right? Like your Naga isn't ready to fight, so you're buying a Midas, but once you have that Midas, your Naga is ready to fight, and but you aren't because you have a Midas, right? Yeah. Uh, at least it was minute 25 min Midas, not minute, minute 35. 
However, the team that did buy it on the support lost again in like five to ten minutes. Yeah, seems to be the case that like you have to be a bit more active, right? I mean, we saw today when we see teams like Liquid, teams like uh, the side of Team Spirit earlier on, always very active items. Maybe it's a damage item here or there, but nonetheless, something that will do something immediately once you purchase it. Yeah, and I, I think one of the big interesting things for me with this game is like, yeah, they had all these minuses and that limited the goal they had to fight. But even without the minuses, I think we just saw that there was a draft in the game in Gladys said that was going to be hard to beat. Like, I was looking yeah. at this like, oh, they're kind of just getting away with farming and all these cores. Like, Talon surely is going to win this game with Naga. You know, Wraith King's got minus and Voker's a good late game hero. But they just had no way to ever team fight. The yep. Brewmaster plus Phoenix Puck. Like, there was one fight that Phoenix went in and popped Supernova and it instantly died to an inv Invoker Alacrity, but they still dominated the team fight because yep. they have so much other tools to use. They have the primal split, they have the puck coil, and there was just no way that town, regardless of items, could ever actually win a team fight. Mm. It was one of those difficult situations where you know, sometimes I look at games and you ask, what can you do, right, in a losing scenario? What happens if things aren't going perfectly? And like God said, not only was there not that much team fight available mm -hmm. for talent, but just the damage as well was a bit of a problem for talent esports. I, I don't know. You, maybe the Snaga was the crucial problem for them, the way they played around, mm. around her. Maybe not the hero itself, but the way they played, because they got pretty much every... Like, when, when the draft concluded, remember what we were talking about. They got every hero that they usually pick, like Pugna's... Uh, Hero they picked in the last five games. Yeah. Tiny, they are the only team that really shines on him as well. Invoker is usually banned out against Mikoro. Like, they got everything they wanted, but it doesn't really mesh up together. Mm. Like, the Pugna usually has a different mid, like a Storm or, or a Bristle on offlane, something that he can use himself as a battery for, right? Like, in this game, there is nothing of such, such sort. Like, Raid King, Naga? Not really. So, they had some issues yeah. here, and perhaps the cohesion of the heroes wasn't as strong as usual. Yeah, even the Invoker, like who you put the Alacrity on, like it doesn't really on himself. Naga. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, it worked out to kill the Egg once, but that's, it's not, they didn't really have the synergy to win the game with their draft as much as it looked like, oh, the, you put these five heroes together, as you said, and it's like their comfort zone, but. Yep. I feel like m if they had something different than a Naga, maybe they could have snowballed the game mm -hmm. because that's something that their heroes do extremely well. You have this Pagna that's constantly hitting the tower, constantly blasting it, right? And if you try to poke, defend, there's always tiny to rotate behind, toss someone back, catch them. It's really difficult to deal with, but you don't have a carry. You're waiting for that carry to get farm. And once he did get like Manta Orchid, it wasn't really that useful in fights. Let's talk about the team that obviously won the game, Game and Gladiators, 1-0 up right now, a step closer towards getting themselves into their playoff berth in the upper bracket. This Muerta of theirs has been... Yep. This needs to go away. This has to be banned out. Not just for the scaling later on in the game, but there was some point where he got a kill on 23 Savage in the laning phase. And I was like, wow, Murta does a lot of damage. My goodness, you need some kind of plan to deal with this. And so far, we haven't really seen a plan from any of the teams that have allowed it to go through here in the playoffs. Yeah, you have this here. You can just first pick it. If it's a good carry, more it's a game you play as the carry. Otherwise, it pairs with any of your kind of classic offlaners here. It gave Brewmaster the best like game and lane possible. The Brewmaster was doing so much, and it was in large part due to that more to that hero just has a dominant laning stage and. I don't know what, there aren't really any obvious picks I feel like that give them more into a hard time in lane. Yeah, I feel that both teams really got what they wanted, but uh, we might not see Muerta or Brewmaster in the next upcoming match. Because, yeah, you gave away the Pagna and Tiny won against them, you can leave them in again. Mm. But Brew, man, Muerta enabled him, sure, but that hero is just way too difficult to deal with. Once he yeah. gets the Octarine core, he has his brewlings every single fight. Yep. It's very difficult to play. And I believe they picked up the brew pretty late in the draft, right? Yep. Okay. So th that to me is kind of crazy because they had a lot I of bands later on. Yeah. 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 I suspect maybe Talon Esports might have actually wanted to have the brew themselves, right? You're playing into the CK. It felt like they were angling in that direction. And we saw the last pick on the Naga took a really long time. I think they were like, oh, crap. You know that situation that happens, you're angling for one certain pick, it goes away, the entire plan is upended, you have to start from scratch now. Because I'm pretty sure, looking at the way that the game unfolded, not so sure that they had the Wraith King offlane in plan from the start. Yeah, I, I think they drafted really well until maybe that Naga pick, because having the flex between Wraith King being either safe lane or offlane is amazing. Because you get to that 24th pick, the final pick of the draft where you see the entire me team, and you can pick so many more heroes when you have that flexibility of the Wraith King. So maybe the plan was to pick an offlaner like a Brewmaster and then have maybe a bit more of an aggressive, well-rounded draft. But at the same time, it's talent. They love playing 50, 60-minute yep. games. They like greedy carries. Mm. I just don't think Naga was the right greedy carry to pick there.
Yeah, feels like Naga does end up falling off a little bit too often. So we do not have a victory for Talent Esports to bring you. It's Game and Gladiators who are ascendant right now and are one step closer to progressing into the playoffs in the upper bracket side of things, where they will already find some pretty cool contemporaries. Liquid, Spirit have already made their way into that side of things. And of course, we saw Virtus Pro dispatching TSM later. It's only one game up though. And unfortunately for Talent, it has been two O's the entire way. But if there is a team that I would probably back to be able to come back after a difficult loss, mm -hmm. it'll probably be in Talon because they make a habit of it and they've it's done it throughout it's the entire It's year. happened kind of recently, didn't it? Yeah, Adrian. Yeah, yeah. Well, so very hot during, lands, it happened. What happened during the group stage? <laughs> yeah. Just at this yeah. tournament. <laughs> they started 0-4. The next uh, game was 0 Yeah, yeah. No, this, this is a team that knows knows how to bounce back. They've had some, you know, very, very painful losses. Uh, so, you know, I don't think they're a team that gets completely rattled. Um, you know, they've played it and they've got a lot of experience at this point. Uh, I think, you know, Sambi as a coach has been kind of in the, the hot seat when it comes to the SEA Dota region. He's been the premier coach of the region for the longest time. Uh, so he's the kind of guy that you love to have on your side when it comes to kind of bouncing back from a game like this. Yeah. They went from 0-4 to 4-4 in the group stages. They can definitely at least even out this, this series, right? Mm. And what are we making of Game and Gladiators? We saw in that video earlier on that Quinn was mentioning that the atmosphere internally within the team isn't as commanding as it was when they were on top of the world. Uh, looking at the game so far, at the beginning of the group stage, it was still a little bit shaky. Uh, what do we make of it here, Lizard? From day one until now, is Gaiman back to their former glory states? I'm not so sure. Like, I still feel it's a little bit shaky. It's not as... Um, like, you know, one team... It's going to be funny to say because they just lost, but EG, when I, when I look at them, they have a lot of flair. They make some mistakes here and there, but they're playing the game in their own way. Mm. Um, that's what I saw from GG before. Like, they would always play on their in their own fashion, on their own way. Here, I feel like, yeah, they have some heroes like Muerta on position four on Tofu, but I don't feel the same commanding force that they had throughout the season. Mm. That's why they didn't really win the last couple of tournaments, right? How do you think they need to fix gods in order to get to that point in time? Because let's be honest, you need that kind of force of nature if you want to go far in the international. Yeah, I think a part of it is about maybe refining like an identity that works for them because a lot of their dominance, um, you know, was earlier towards those, you know, first couple of majors. And since then, with the patch changes, it felt like they came in with this group stage with a few different heroes and ideas that didn't instantly find them success. Then they kind of resorted to like spamming some stuff like Necro for Quinn. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like figuring out what their hero pool is going to be, what their best strats are going to be, because it feels like we've seen just a lot of different looks from them game to game and not like one key idea of like, this is who we are, this is how we're going to win games. Yep, that's the one thing we need to see more of from the side of Game and Gladiators if they want to return to their former glory and have a shot at claiming an Aegis, the first one for everybody involved in the roster. But they can't count their chickens before they hatch, remember? We are still in the seeding round of the group stages. This just determines where you start in the playoffs next weekend. We still are on the road to the international. So a lot of work to be done. And what do you gentlemen think? Who, which kind of teams benefit the most from this more elongated schedule that we have for this year's international? Um, I think the teams who I, mean, I just rely less on like the momentum because you know the breaks mean you have more time to kind of sit back and study. So the teams with I mean every team has coaches these days, mm -hmm. but I think some of the more analytical teams, teams kind of like gaming gladiators like Tundra can do very well. Um, I think some of those maybe like. Eastern European teams who just ride the wave, you know, like the Spirit yeah. lower bracket run, it's a lot harder to do that because, I mean, I think Spirit's one of the top teams here. They don't need the momentum necessarily. <laughs> but in the past, you know, you, past TIs, you've had teams who just ride through the lower bracket and just playing day after day and they just keep winning. But now you get these three, four days off. I think momentum plays yeah, less you get of a... to shake them up a little bit in pubs, you know. <laughs> yeah, them, yeah. Tip them in pubs a little <laughs> bit. I don't know. Maybe... Tundra are gonna overthink things. They're such nerds in this game, right? <laughs> that they're gonna make make so many grand ideas that they might even clash at the end. I'm just kidding. I'm sure that they'll do just fine. Mm. One of the things that I have noticed very well coming out of Gaming Gladiators when they play Dota, you know, just before we went to the game itself, we we're talking about Boxy, right? And how good his positioning on the map can be. When Gaming is at their best, it almost feels like they're playing with hacks. Like they know where you're gonna be ahead of time. And I remember when Quinn was speaking about the new map. Do you think that might be the issue, that they haven't yet fully mastered the map to the degree where they can make those 100% analytical predictive moves, well, and then that's the reason why they're not shining as easily? Maybe they have demanded that statement already in the last game. If you think about a couple of movements that they've made without any words, without any vision, I believe teams are adapting to everything that Valve, that Ice Rock throws at them <laughs> way too fast now. <laughs> like, I don't even know what you can change for teams to take more than a couple of months to adapt to. Just 
Remember 23 Savage in this last match on Naga Siren using oh, that scan, scan the into the song. But also remember that those two have scan that have smoked went exactly for him. They knew exactly where he was. Mm. So Yeah, yeah. it's almost pre very impressive by Gladiators that they knew where to find him, but then just as much yep. 23 read the move and saw it coming. So um, you know, the map is bigger. It feels like, oh, you're not gonna be able to get away with all this greedy farming on Nagas and TBs and stuff, mm. but like we saw it earlier today with Shopify and Arteezy. He was farming ancients and constantly would get hunted down as if Spirit knew exactly where he is. So even with the bigger map, you know, there obviously is a lot How more. How do you to feel farm. about that, by the way? Uh, Your NA is yeah. a bit in shambles. Are you okay? Uh, look, NA, we love farming neutral creeps. You know, pick up the race, can get the scaly boys. So you don't need the ages as long as the as creeps as are killed? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, I see. So, is there some extra reward for? Most GPM, most oh, creep skilled. Look, all I'm saying is when Iron Talon comes back, NA is rising back <laughs> to the top. <gasps> NA is not the only greedy region that exists in the world. Talon Esports, the sole representatives of Southeast Asia, played a very greedy game one and it didn't necessarily go according to plan. Let's find out if they'll be a bit more reserved and can find the answer to unlock Game and Gladiators yet again as we go into our second game between these two. And to bring you that action, we have Aries and Daynark. Australian boys, take it away. Boys, 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 what is up? And we've got Down on Ganaries here again to cover game number two of Gaming Gladiators versus Talon Esports. And, well, game one, it was looking really damn even until about that 34-minute mark, wasn't it? Literally neck and neck in terms of both net worth, win probability, everything, but it just took one fight from Gaming Gladiators to really kick the door down, take out that first set of racks, and then it felt like Talon were on the back foot. If they're going for this pickoff style draft, they can't allow that to happen. They gotta always be playing for a little bit ahead because at the end of the day, if you get to late game, team fight wins Dota. And uh, well, we'll see how that's going to be impacted with this second draft. Exactly the same setup. Radiant again for Talon, Gaming Gladiators with the first pick once again. We see no Phoenix though this time as well. So that one is going to be taken out of the arsenal here from Gaming Gladiators. Had a very good showing out of Cellar. And overall at TI Denog, we have seen that there has not been a team that has won the international starting in the lower bracket. Gladiators, they're one game away of putting talent down there. And it would be a miracle run. You don't have to go through the best of ones anymore, but they are still way too many series in again. We have not seen a team win out of the lower bracket. Gladiators, this is a very commanding position. Has to be a lot of confidence now with their capability to be go, able to go up against Talon, one of the better 5v5 teams. Surely they banned them where to here, man. Surely. Like, you know that Game of Gladiators are going to pick it first. It's been their most picked hero by far, but they're going to prioritize the Brewmaster. You know what? Fine. I thought that Ace was the MVP for the team last game. But I feel like you've just got so much flexibility on um, on Gaiman to be able to make this work for Tofu. Again, both with who's playing it as well as the item build. It was a new one. I don't think he's built Lotus so far this tournament. Maybe once, actually. Yeah, he went Lotus and four stuff, but this time it was... Uh an urn into a, a Lotus Orb. So again, just something slightly different from him, perfectly fitting what is required for them this game. And you can see he's the one having a lot of discussions with the rest of the team right now, because clearly his hero is going to be one that comes out pretty early into this draft. And overall, there's a lot of differences with Talon's ban, right? You got three heroes in the previous game uh, well, that gaming gladiators had, and, and previously it was the Spirit Breaker, Pango, and the Game Primal Beast that was banned out. So there is one of them that Talon banned prior. But you've got the Pango, which of course we see in first phase often. The Primal Beast is available. That is going to be the response from Gladiators. Talon, you know, is this a uh, cure that kind of prevents the Pugna? I, I don't know. I was very impressed with Oli's like laning stage with the Pugna. I don't know maybe if the Primal Beast just like incredibly high amount of magic damage is a deterrent to the hero, or if they still feel like overall it's it's super strong. Yeah, I wonder what they're going to go here. I mean, you could consider going something like maybe an Enchantress to be able to counter this. Ollie plays that pretty well as well. Yep. You could Game consider maybe a Dark Willow. You could consider a Rubik as a possibility, but they're just going to go bristle back instead. You know what? If it gets lit through, why not go down that sort of route? And it really did feel like Jabs with that Wraith King probably had the lowest impact of the previous game. You can't do too much as a Wraith King in the off lane if you don't get off to an amazing start. And then going Radiant Smiters, basically trying to act as a position one, we could see there with the kill score three seven and zero it wasn't what you were expecting to see from him but i love seeing him on all a few more of these active style heroes when they really started to get the w's on the board it was when he was playing the bristle the dawn like these sorts of heroes that are able to really just be on the front foot really intrigued on how they look to protect the bristle back with only one of these bands so 
I really would like an AA band out. AA Primal Beast sounds very scary with the potential of just getting kills across the map and guaranteeing yep. the, of course, ultimate. I mean, already you have this kind of half built in break with the Primal Beast where eventually you will be able to go down that scepter route. So mm -hmm. let's see how else they're looking to try and deal with the offlane bristle because so far Savage hasn't played it. And I'd be expecting as well Gaming Gladiators to be hoping that that Necro ends up making its way through, right? Percent damage is feeling really good for them right now. Of course, they, they don't want to do it too early into the draft because if you just get, you know, Spirit Vessel and Nullifier, then it becomes a whole lot more challenging. But if they don't pick up a Nullifier Builder, then you're going to be feeling very happy about uh, being able to secure it for themselves. And they're actually going to be the ones to get rid of the Shadow Demon. Has one of the worst win rates so far in the tournament, despite a lot of picks. Granted, they were by, you know, some of the, the, the teams that have already been knocked out, most of them. Um, but against the Primal Beast, it really does prevent a lot of that consistent Ten charging in, which Ace loves to do. So they're willing to forego it in their draft, despite it being a hero Five that both Celery and me. Tofu have super high potential to play. And where to still in, man. Okay. Definitely a lot of options still available here, so... <laughs> yeah, I think one. Anything that could force movement is always going to be a good thing, right? Because that's the thing that you want against a Bristleback. You want break and you want predictability. And I feel like predictability is exactly what you get with someone like the Muerta, right? Even We even saw, you know, just lay down the calling. <clears throat> what are you supposed to do? You know, you can't cast your spells if you're constantly having to run through the uh, the calling wow. spirits. Hawk Ban. Okay. Obviously felt like the matchup prior a little bit messy for Makoto, so he will go back for his ever so comfort invoker. Mm -hmm. See how Quinn wants to try and play into it. Now the Conquer previously was banned out to protect the invoker, which was the first phase from Talon. So this is available if you want to consider it on gaming. Uh, could be, I don't know, maybe have the same heroes with Primal and Conquer, like they do very similar things, but it is your like traditional counter to at least good matchup versus invoker. I mean, Quinn could potentially TA here as well, That's right? Bad. Like up against the... Oh, okay. Well, no, no, no they can't. <laughs> but it would have been pretty good against the Invoker as well as the Bristleback. Uh, what else could he be considering? I mean, I know historically Quinn really hasn't raided the Sniper, but he picked it up earlier in this tournament and he looked pretty decent on it as well. It was a stomp when they were able to uh, secure that for the team. So maybe that's something that he's considering right now, just something that's able to stay as far away as possible from that uh, that Bristleback. You know, you've already got a tanky frontliner in the Primal Beast to be able to play around with. You brought up before about the Necro potential later in the draft. I do wonder, like, if the Invoker is a bit of a deterrent just because of, you know, the capability to get rid of the Ghost Shroud, so maybe that's something you're considering on Talon, and we're glad honestly, it is... Honestly, wh why are you picking Pango in 2023? Honestly, like, it's... Pick a real hero. <laughs> what are you trying to say? It's just... <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> And it's just I'm saying so if Wind Raid is horrible, and if you pick Pango in pubs, no. <laughs> it's, oh? get, get rid of it, get rid of it. They've also got a great hero to be able to pair together with it, right? In the uh, the Keeper of the Light, both for the lane, you know, the Primal Beast is going to love that Chakra Magic for the cooldown reduction, as well as uh, the Quinn Pango once the uh, the lanes start to break down. So I, I like this combination. One of the positive sides, uh, I think it was Gods that mentioned it on the panel, is that now you actually do have an Alacrity someone that wants alacrity in the bristleback right like he just needs that little bit of extra movement speed to be able to chase people down of course the quills are going to be what's doing the majority of the work for you but the downside is you can get away with like 33 and collapse build of going for just the one point in the bristleback passive so that it procs more often but I think they've got a lot of damage, so I don't know if you can actually afford to do that, right? Like, you, you're you going to need to really relish this window that uh, you're going to have up until the Primal Beast has the Aghanim Scepter and really be that frontliner for your team. Dude, where's all their reserve time gone? They <laughs> are still second phase, only two picks, down to seven seconds for Talon, so... Is in a lot of time early on to be able to work out what they want to go for. They will actually pick up the Ancient Apparition, so of course, I mean gonna be very nice versus the primal beast let's see you i cannot go something like a chaos knight versus primal and pango which is definitely one of the better leanings it's banned actually anyway so never mind so um Ten do you feel like it's maybe. even like you need a stun for cold feet because i know that used to be the big thing in the Five past could just be like slows being enough so considering maybe a life steal or something like that no they're just gonna go back for the q tusk for now but again it's a double melee and this is uh something that 
Gaiman haven't revealed their safe lane at all. So they could basically just pick whatever heroes that they want to be able to abuse this lane. Whether, like, maybe they go and edge themselves just to be able to have that extra little bit of survivability, to be able to harass from afar. We know how great Celery is at the Enchantress, probably one of his best heroes. So I really wouldn't hate seeing him pick something like that up. Warlock, Jakiro, they're great options. Are you ever considering that's what they're going to go? Are you ever considering it like a saving support? Because at the moment, you're know, telling AA for the entire time has always been like stunned into ice blasts, and if you have someone to disrupt that, it can kind of minimize his impact. Maybe just someone that builds four stuff as well, right? Like, well, what what stuns do they actually oh, wow. have? And they're actually going to pick the PA now. All right, sure. Duraccio has had pretty good success over the years on this hero, and it's another break against the uh, the Bristleback. Also, you know, up against an AA, you could two shot. The AA, unless you get really lucky with some of those neutral item drops. Well, we're going to be looking out for Glimmer Capes, not Gossamer Capes once again, just to be able to uh, provide a little bit of a reprieve there. I mean, ag again, brought up before, but I don't think you can be looking at the Naga because of the Primal Base Pango to deal with the illusions. CK is not a potential. Definitely limits some of the heroes that Savage is going to be able to play in this matchup. To me, it really does just feel like an Enchantress is what they're wanting here, right? Like something that you've got a PA so that you can, if the carry gets into a bad spot, you can always just Phantom Strike back to safety if you get locked up, blocked off by nice shards. And again, you're up against two melee. So someone that's relatively survivable. And Shakira is pretty survivable as well, right? Really high um, stats that you get across levels. You know, dual breath against two melee here is always going to feel really good. Mentioned it before. And they've got a decent amount of control as well. So that macro pie would have uh, given them a lot of value. Even a little bit of tower push as well. What do we think yeah. about the Venge as well now with PA? We've seen previously like Venge PA. Yeah. Celery has played it twice. Plus lucky so. shot. Yep. And also more potential predictability with the uh, the Bristleback, right? Swap him into the middle, get a Pulverize off onto him, and yeah, gives him a lot of trouble. That's why they ban it out. Good call. So the only other hero Celery is currently played is the, the Warlock. Or... Yep. Warlock Ench. They're my two options. Uh, so let's have a little think for Talon, what they're considering. So when you think about what's going to have a decent enough time against the T, uh, the PA, excuse me, are they going to consider something like a Sven? You know, like uh, something that provides a little bit of armor for the team, something that can buy a Blink Dagger and potentially blow up the Pango before the roll starts, Coddle before he's able to get back to safety, as well as, again, you've got Alacrity to be able to provide. So they go ahead and ban it out. See, we're, we're, we're both calling things, man. We're getting it. I'll say that hero is kind of doo-doo at the moment, though. 39% win rate might even be lower after that previous game loss as yeah, well. Yeah, but Pango's lower as well. So yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it is indeed still getting picked. I'm oh, dying, right? okay, I I'm forgot about classic. this here altogether. <laughs> you talked about wanting that saving support as well. The grab ally is still going to be a factor up against the Ice Blast if Celery is on point with his positioning. Man, this is actually a fantastic <laughs> dying pick. We just haven't really seen it. Ten seconds <sighs> remaining. I mean, I don't now know. you need a Tombstone here too. Do you, do you go life stealer? But then the carry to carry matchup is horrible. I don't know if you can terror blade as well. It's primal. Yeah. Uh, matchup can go back and forth with Pango. Let's see. It's of course a classic. We got a whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, this is okay. Rupture Pango Primal. I mean, this is a big thing. You know, also, Phantom Assassin needs to be super mobile. But we have not seen a lot of Bloodseeker. In fact, let me find out how many one. games one. won. Okay one and it was a loss that okay. had been played and i'm honestly very surprised you know with all these beefy boys coming to the front uh i'm was expecting you know the the agonim scepter true, true. as well as the agonim shard to really give a ton of value you know two is it two percent still or is it slightly less the uh the steel that you get from every hit i think it's like 1.8 maybe or something like that but uh effectively i feel like the reason that it hasn't been picked up too much is that a lot of these heroes just hit their timings a little bit earlier than what a bloodseeker can respond to right like you only really become effective against the beefy boys once you get phase boots maelstrom um bkb and then you can look to go for it because you just can't fight at all without the bkb at least now prior to that point you've got answers to the likes of the pangolier the primal and the phantom assassin it literally rupture counters all three of these heroes it's just can you get to that point where you st truly do feel effective and again this is savage's 10th game and his 10th unique hero so i'm loving seeing the versatility come through makoto doesn't seem too happy about having to play the invoker again uh, but Jabs is just full-on focus. 
really intrigued to see how this Bloodseeker lane is actually going to be able to go because I know there was a big nerf with... Look at these jump cuts. Oh, we can <laughs> see all the boys. Quick little... The reformed man himself. They're all... PMA only, Lockie. Of course. Of course. The only, the only choice is, is PMA. Mm-hmm. Intrigued to see how this Bloodseeker lane is going to go, right? With some of the changes we saw in the past. I mean, that was, I think, was a big reason. You know, you, we've seen Bloodseeker be super strong in the lane, just your blood rat capability with the support. It's a lot of damage, ridiculous amount, even just level one. But I know the thirst, like, lifesteal was reduced pretty heavily. And this is a lane yep. with Primal Beast and Coddle. They can do a lot of nuke potential early on. So I think that's going to be a pretty volatile lane. And you're playing with an AA as well, right? So it's not even like you've got that set up for the blood, right? To make the lane a little bit easier for yourself. Kind of similar thing with the AA. You don't have a core to be able to set yourself up for the cold feet as well. So I wonder if Ollie's uh, skill build is going to be a little bit different here for the lane. Obviously, the great equalizer of everything, the blood grenade, is going to help them out a little bit. You know, the ice vortex plus the blood grenade plus the blood right. That's a lot of blood right there is uh, going to give them a little bit of a hand. And you never know. Anytime I see a tusk, there's always the potential for that early try lane to be able to possibly get that first blood and Q's the one leading the charge now into Game and Gladiator's territory. Yeah, it's a different read from from Dyer. Gonna go down to the south side instead and Talon looking to play very aggressive into the jungle. So we won't have, I mean, last time we didn't have a first blood, we're very close to it though, but either side will get themselves set up. How do we feel about this draft as a whole? Do we feel like the, you know, GG have the potential to be able to find this 2-0 and book the tick into the upper bracket or can tell and send us to our first game three of the day? I was really preferring Game and Gladiator's draft up until that Bloodseeker. So like the, the 23 oh, Savage, if, he, if they're going to win this game, it's completely on him. So if he's able to get enough space made for him so that he can get into that trio of items that I was talking about, Phase Boots, Maelstrom, BKB, that's not enough. He needs the Aghanim Shard on top of that, then into the Aghanim Scepter. And then we'll see what they're capable of doing. I'm just a little worried about, you know, having to contend against the likes of this uh, break coming through from the Primal, the break coming through from the PA and the really strong lanes that you've got in both of the side lanes. Q in trouble? Hopefully should be I able to get that blinding line push back. Off. They're going to have a lot of slows as well. Jabs is actually coming back in, but I don't know if there's much that Talon can do to get Q out of danger. They might be able to get a return might kill. Some Quills returns. are also taking a lot of damage and the Quills are starting to stack up. Seller is also in some danger. Are they going to get away? Oh, they didn't commit onto one of them. Okay. They just got Delta split on. Who got the first blood? Was Celery? Yeah. Same as last game. So both position fives, love and life, being able to come into it with this one. And oh, we were talking about the potential for the tri lanes. I don't think Tofu's going to com completely commit. And he does end up TPing on out. This is definitely a, uh, a magic wand lane, if I've ever seen one on the top side. Yeah. PA are dying. <laughs> Bottom lane, Ollie. I ended up going down. Please just that upro right click far out. Oh, his positioning is going to be uh, really, really important in and this lane. And he just TP'd there, man. Okay. So now he doesn't have that for the next 45 seconds. So Savage is here on his own. He's going to need to manipulate this lane solo to be able to make sure that he's able to get a lot of these easy last hits for starters. They weren't able to block off the small camp, so he's able to clear this quickly enough. Might be able to get the pull, but it's the worst possible one that he could have hoped for, the Cobalt camp. Double silence, nicely done. How do we feel about this top lane real quick? Because the Undying is a hero that we've seen fallen off pretty heavily with some of the nerfs. The Decay 13 second cooldown, which was a big one. It is, of course, against that strength hero being jabs. They've got they're the going. level two and they're ready to go, but TP instant TP up. Yeah. Q, I mean, he's got some stick charges, so he's going to be okay as well. He's still got the zombies to prove to be a bit of an issue, but it's only a little bit of chip damage. But the Tombstone use, they're still putting a lot of pressure on with this extra level. Why not? You know, you want to take advantage of every single opportunity that you can. There's that early point into the Bristleback, and I really feel like Jabs... Hmm. Does he need to just be survivable, or does he need to kill people? That's the thing that I'm yeah. considering early on, right? You know that Savage is going to be able to do the killing if it gets late enough, so maybe you do just go into the classic Bottom build, lane. you do max out the Bristle. Speaking of Savage, he's in some danger. So if he actually doesn't look for the Blinding Light, it's going to use it to push him away instead. Let's poke. Already been given a couple of tangos over by Ollie. Realizing that he might need to move a little bit further away. He needs to just focus on 
uh, a little bit more attention onto Tofu. And this is what I was talking about in terms of like the skill build, right? If you do have um, someone with a stun or with a lot more magic damage, maybe you do go the Ice Vortex or the Cold Feet, but I really feel like we might see a few more points of the Chilling Touch from Ollie in this particular lane, just because there really is no setup at all, considering they've used the Blood Grenade and they have no other ways to be able to slow them enough. Bit of a fight. Actually, no fight. It looks like Talon's going to be able to get both of the Lotuses. Side lanes. Meanwhile, of course, we're going to have a lot of action from top and bottom. We will take a look at how mid's going at the moment with Makoto and Quinn. I'll hold that because bottom, bottom action continues. Never mind. Savage going to stand strong. Lotus. They feed the Lotus, and if required, he's got a Fairy Fire as well. Tofu tries to body block, but now he's going to be in trouble too. Blinding Light pushed away. It won't do anything. Savage easily able to chase him down. Now top lane as well. Q's got the snowball to close the distance. Doesn't drag in jabs. Is trying to deal with the... Oh, Neutral creep. Dudes, what? What the a flick. here. Well done. Means maybe slightly longer on the deck than uh, we would have previously liked and might allow Talon to be able to get this stacked pull of the uh, the hard camp over to the left-hand side. So it's not like the lane is going to get any easier, but at least he won't lose too much farm from this existing creep wave as Savage getting dive once again. There's action all across the map. It's what Talon are really wanting, right? Because this is going to allow the Bloodseeker to just get so much more active with that thirst, with the bonus movement speed. And again, we have two mid laners. Base boots coming out too. Makoto and Queen can be very active. It does look like Makoto 25 and 5 compared to the 20 and 2. So both sides having a pretty good start as well early on. Mm -hmm. It's going to need even more tangos on this bottom side. Tofu's been doing a really good job of just making sure that Savage is getting harassed with high frequency. The what really acting as a roaming ward is Ollie, just making sure to see where exactly Ace is. Oof, just dodging out there. Look at this. Ace is no cares. Ollie's like, kill me instead. I'm the one that you want, but it is not. It is 23 Savage that it is priority number one. Even moving down towards the bottom side is Tofu getting hit a little bit by some of these creeps. You'd hate to get hit by that purge from the Sated Banisher. Might get a D-Ward off. Never mind, it's denied. Oh, no, Roche. Oh, no, Roche. Roche. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, surely not. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he just wanted to be part of it too, you know? Yeah. There's a bit of, bit of a quiet start. Did, they didn't even do Rush last game, did they? <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm part of this series too. Oh, they get involved. Oh, uh, they did it once. They did it once. Nagi got it. All right, well, nice timing for Rush to, to help out Tofu with uh, getting denied. We'll see where he's going to look to try and TP back to if he wants to refill Quinn's bottle. Wants to go down to that bottom lane. Looks like it will be the play to mid. Might even stick around as well. Drop a ward, try and secure this next power rune. We already see Q starting to make his way over. He's placing that nice high ground vision as Tofu. Might potentially reveal that he has the potential to drop down a <laughs> nice blinding light, pushing Ollie back up onto the high ground and oof, just placing that fresh ward as uh, well. Q should be fine to be able to get the snowball off to dodge the rolling thunder. They might even turn over to the right side. Tofu is in some trouble. Ollie and Makoto hand in hand should be able to bring down the support on Gladiators. There will be a response though. Pretty good shards, Quinn nonetheless. Swashbuckle at the ready. He's going to be able to guarantee the power rune is an illusion, which is quite nice. First invoker early on as well. Mm hmm, for sure. Just means a little bit less potential for these supports to have to rotate towards the mid lane. Celery just ended up walking down here. He didn't use the TP for that purpose. And what you really want to do is be trying to stick into one of these side lanes as much as possible. Just keep the pressure moving up there. Looks like he might even be starting to build up a few stacks for both, well, honestly, all three cores on Gaming Gladiators are great stack takers. The Rachu's in some trouble. These Quills up to four now, especially with Q here. He's got a Kree wave coming shortly. You see Jabs is angling to the right side to be able to follow in pursuit. And the shards oh, locks him into place. And this is going to no be a catapult wave time. as well. So this damp tower will take a lot of damage off the back of that kill from Talon. Mm -hmm. Really does feel like a much more jab style of hero, doesn't it? The bristle back, you're able to be tanky by the vanguard, be up in their face and use your ability to outskill people. There's not too much outskilling that goes on with a Wraith King. <laughs> No, that, that dude's just a brute. <laughs> Shen, Shong, maybe base of spells. So are they going to be able to kill him a second time? <laughs> Arachio, straight uh, back into the lane. You're going to need some mass TPs out of TPs Gladiators. Well. They will come through the form of Ace along with Celery. 
Yeah, I mean, these are big TPs right now. Savage has this time to be able to play solo. Ollie able to dodge out that onslaught. Is he going to get away? Surely not. Think, oh, all right. But Savage came through the portal. This is done. Rupture at the ready as well. Oh, doesn't Ooh, find the vision it. on Duracho. Force to use it on Ace now, though. I'll try and kill the tower to stop the rotations, but Kodo's <laughs> here as well. So another big kill that Talon's going to be able to pick up, really minimizing how much Duracho can get out early on. Shots from Kuge Seller just slips out. It's just the little things that Gamer do so well, though, right? Like the, the deny to the neutral camp, the rotations at the very last second to make sure that Duracho doesn't die that additional time. They get the deny on the tower. Yeah, just, they even force a few rotations from Talon, right? I'm sure Savage would have loved to just be sitting back farming unopposed because he knew that Ace had made that movement up towards the top side. So the fact that they make the movement and it's not even him that gets the kill, it's Makoto, I'm sure he's going to be a tiny bit salty about that. It is good to see him being active, though, nonetheless. I mean, Rupture can almost always guarantee a kill, and we're going to see it not even used here for Tofu. Makoto is able to get himself close towards the Vessel. Gladiators are trying to strike back, though. It's Quinn and Celery together. You do have Ace reasonably close by as well. GD. That double damage rune is going to shred them apart. Nice. Now, the shards nice. makes it a little bit awkward, but Savage has already tanked up way too much damage, and Quinn's already looking for the plus one kill. They won't be able to chase down Q. They will get a nice little Corey snipe. If there is any plus one about it all, he uh, had already bought the Javelin on Savage, so didn't end up losing too much gold from that kill attempt. And again, you know there's no Rolling Thunder if you have to consider. It's again just what Quinn does when he's got these runes protected. It's a, a hallmark of any sort of Quinn team is that the supports are going to provide the uh, the assistance there because they know that the man is capable of providing that impact. But we talk about impact, that Diffusal Blade, only about 400 gold away. Uh oh Ace. Should be able to stop the trample away. Salo is actually going to drop the tombstone on the high ground, but it's going to do nothing here. So nice little kill for Talon. Let's see where Makoto wants to go next. He's really been on the mark with his rotations. 3 0 and 2. A much different performance we're seeing out of him. An instantly look in the mid lane. He can combine with jabs. Also, they a great timing as well out of the power. He's going to run straight into him. But they want to go for Tofu, which is the easy kill. Blinding Light will only stall this one out. Quinn will try and do whatever he can. Ace is even going to TP in. Rolling Thunder's still on cooldown for 15 seconds. That's a nice perfect tornado. tornado. Makoto's invoke of this game is really on point. Now, Quinn's in some danger. They will have the Friend snowball to be able to stop the pulverize, but it's a little bit too late, though. And now, Seller is going to look to enter with a flesh goal, and Makoto in some trouble, but the shards will do nothing as gladiators. A big couple of kills to be able to slow down this momentum that the invoke has been starting to build. Yeah, and they could have potentially gone for a bit more of a slow play, right? They had the 10-minute siege creep there. If they just, you know, didn't go overly deep and dive, maybe you could end up taking out another tower and start really invading into the space that Duraccio is still going to need to be able to get into this Battle Fury and then the items beyond. It's having some me time, though. It's a pretty decent position in regards to the net worth and... Mm-hmm. See, I wonder what the build is going to be from Savage. I mean, he's got this Mjolnir queued up, of course, with the procs, able to go through the evasion. Mm. wonder what else you're looking to consider. I know you brought up the Scepter. You know, when does he want to go Shard as well? If there's going to be any, like, transition away from the, you know, the classic BKB and all some of the other uh, items. So. Nah, uh, you, Bloodseeker is very much linear with the way that you need to play it these days. There's a reason it's only been picked once so far this tournament. It's just a tiny bit slow, and this is what I was talking about as well, right? Jabs has uh, just the one point in the Bristleback passive, so again, uh -oh. he's going for this higher damage potential, but I, I'm a little worried because we saw how quickly he melted there underneath the tower. It's not like they're lacking in damage on Gaming Gladiators, especially with the start that Quinn's had. But he's also not incredibly fat, and this stack is really going to help out from Jabs. Got a hard cam, got an ancient, I think they're both triple. And we can really see the Brissa back, though, once you get this Scepter Bloodstone. It's going to be a big thing if he can get it before the break, though, on Dial. Mm -hmm. That's always the big thing. And you can see there's nowhere close <laughs> to a break being purchased up on Gaming Gladiator's side. Wanting a Blade Mail first on Ace, I would assume probably the Heart before that, but you know, I could consider him just going straight into the Aghanim Scepter on Ace as well. But uh, yeah, for PA, it's going to be quite some time until she considers going for that Aghanim Shard for herself. Very impressive performance out of Quinn so far to start this game. 2-1-3, and three, top net worth. I'm going to look to try and smoke off the back of the very early Diffusal Corrosion, and of course, 
Tofu can always amplify him with the chakra. So let's see how Talon are going to be able to respond to this. Both sides scans are off the mark. Identical times, though. So both ones clearly know that something is up. Ollie right now, one side Q, just acting as that little bit of a distraction. Probably don't want to be giving up both of them, right? We know the level of impact that this Ice Blast is going to be able to provide. But they are lacking a little bit of that lockdown if Makoto isn't around. So he's just hanging around in this mid lane, wants to get into that Midas so that he doesn't fall too far behind Quinn. <laughs> they <Quinn>. want out. <laughs> yeah, they want out completely. Feels like Quinn's going to get a lot more of his net worth off of kills, right? Obviously, taking neutral creeps is a lot faster ever since they gave mana to basically every single neutral creep with this Diffusal Blade. But uh, look at this. The support's just taking away a little bit of the Duraccio farm as well. Who is still going uncontested, man. And his net worth is now just taking over the position of Makoto. We have not seen them hunt him down so far. I mean, Savage has also been fine. Three, one, and two. He's got his farming cellar in the Maelstrom. But Celery's got a great read on this, that they're hunting Duracho. He's going to maybe act as a, a smoke block, or if they jump him next to the T2 tower, could keep him alive long enough for some extra reinforcements. They somehow don't see each other until the very last second, and, well, there we go. They're eventually going to end up backing off. Is, is Makoto going to be okay? Yeah, he ends up TPing away up on that high ground. The, uh, the courier ended up giving himself away a little bit. Not the worst. It's not like uh, Gloves of Haste really would have changed all that much for the start. And he's already got that Midas starting to get queued up as well. Even picking up the the uh, the wisdom room for himself. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. Very similar to game one though, right? Where it was a pretty action-packed like first 10 minutes and then the game starts to slow down. So do you feel like there is a, a side that is enjoying the status quo more than the other currently? I'd say both, honestly. Like, a lot of the plays that have been happening from Gaming Gladiators have been this trio of Pango, Coddle, and uh, the Undying, just because they've got the farm that they really need. Again, supports don't need that much. You've got the urn available on the Coddle. Quinn, we've mentioned time and time again about how much farm he was able to get early on into the piece, who is going for a satanic play. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and it's really just all about making space for the PA, enough said, but also the other break potential coming through from Ace. Why is he going satanic versus AA? I'm very intrigued. Sure... The spell is quite nice, but I really, uh, this is a very interesting choice from Quinn. We'll see how it's going to work out. Maybe just thinking that he's not the one that's going to be the main target for the uh, AI Ice Blast. So. Ace charges actually through Talon. They got the vision note, dude. Again, and back to back times that they've tried to, to bring down Ace bottom lane. This time they wanted to set up with Makoto, but yeah, he gets out. Just those little decisions like going the Faded Brooch, right? Obviously with a Primal, the Trample gives you a lot of value, but even just there, we saw Wind Lace, Phase Boots, Faded Brooch, it's enough to be able to get him away. And the fact that it was nighttime as well, right? The, uh, the movement speed buff that you get. Is under attack. So have, of course, the Scepter completed for Jabs, and Ag Shard is already queued up next here for the Bristleback. Probably that's the time that Talon really want to be making something happen, right? Level 12, Aghanim Shard on the Bristle. Vanguard should be enough to be able to provide a little bit of safety. Of course, you've got the, the Tusk for that extra layer of protection as well. They'll scout out the fact that Q has just freshly picked up a Blink Dagger too. So that might impact the way that people are positioning on lanes. They know that they've got a lot of burst potential with this Spirit Vessel of Ice Blast available. It's a nice go from Dyer. They secured the power in for Quinn. Yarkin. Once again, potentially baiting Ace. 2k health they have to go through, but Talon, they're making their own play, sweeping through mid, potentially looking to try and connect with their strongest hero at the moment with the Bristle back. Didn't seem like they saw. Well, now they'll definitely see things now. Ice uh, Vortex being put up onto the high ground. They had Undying's Courier up there, so instantly sees the fact that you've got an AA hanging around. And the only reason an AA is going that far forward is if they're looking to set up some sort of... Smoke, but Duraccio, once again, just dodges wow. them out barely. Dude, I was really seeing the praises early game of Makoto, who's still 3-1-3. and three. Like, KDA-wise, he's looking incredible, but after that one death, his net worth has completely fallen off a cliff, and this is going to be an issue as the game goes on. You compare him to Quinn, the net worth disparison, it's really racking up, and... Uh, this is the fine line, right, with this Spirit Vessel kind of cost works on how much you farm compared to, you know, going for pickoffs across the map at the moment. It, maybe you need to consider a little bit more farming with you, just at least to get that Midas. 
Yeah, and it's not even like it was completely on Jirachu as well for that uh, that counter out, right? The the combination of wards, the combination of Celery's calls with where exactly they're looking to move. It just feels like Gaming Gladiators have way too good awareness for the movement from town, and they recognize the, the fact that you were just talking about, right? If Makoto's not getting kills, he's not going to scale at the same level as uh, as a lot of our cores. It, it's why I was really putting a lot of emphasis onto 23 Savage and the way that he's going to be able to play this game. Yeah, very, really good read. Got it is a no, I mean, T1 Tower's not being defended. Instant scan and ping from Durachio, but talent, they've had enough, dude. This kind of cat and mouse, you're missing every smoke and move they've made. They want to try and at least force gladiators to take a fight by the pit and, and die. They're not gonna, they're not gonna take that at all. They're fine with giving this up. They've got the lineup to continue to be able to stall. You, you'll get the T1 mid, you've got Durachio freely farming with Battle Fury. So, looks like they're more than okay with giving the ages over to Talon. Not even wanting to get the deny off onto the, the mid T1. Obviously, just pop the ghost walk, so it doesn't want to waste that, but maybe just waiting to see if there is any hero that ends up showing themselves. Would love a quick meal onto Celery. It might not be quick, though. Boys. But it is in nearby. Lucky Shot's going to make it a little bit more messy. It looks like with jabs coming through along with the Ice Blast, without a doubt, they'll get the kill. There might be a Tombstone as well if they want to go for it. Instead, there is a tier one mid they can consider. Yeah, I don't think they want to. They want to fight as far away from that tombstone as possible. They know that they've got Tofu as well as Quinn there as backup. Top lane. Okay. Savage. Oh, all right. Random rupture. Why not? No farm for you for what is it? Ten seconds. <laughs> Such an annoying rupture. What is, what is that? <laughs> it's I mean, like... This is much more of the the style from Talon that I was really wanting to see, though. Right? They are playing on the Gaming Gladiators side of the map. They've hit their timings, they've got the ages. Now you've got to make sure something happens before you reach these next big items that Gaming Gladiators are going for. I mean, Ace has basically got his Aghanim Scepter now, so he can make plays. You've almost got a BKB on Phantom Assassin. She can make plays into a lot of this. So what are you going to be able to make happen? I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with the Mjolnir at this point on Savage. I think you just got to be making the most of your own inbuilt uh, attack speed buffs coming through. Uh, and then just look to try and get into that early Aghanim shard so that you can actually look to stand and man fight. With this Dire Observer Ward. Far oh, out. So much. Yeah. See the Midas, how slow it is. We've had ad average 1640 so far. Very delayed here from Makoto. We are about to get to that 20 minutes, and very shortly after, we've got the Wisdom Rooms as well. Gladys, they're already ready to <laughs> try and pick up this Tormentor, so see the importance of the potential shard, whoever it's going to be, whether it's Tofu. They would love Grab Ally. Ah, uh, Celery? Celery doesn't we'll die. die. He will. <laughs> sure, uh, surely, come on. I'll let you as good as Fly being able to Bro, predict. my bingo. My bingo oh. has torment to kill. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of them's trying to predict. That Sunstrike. I mean, it wasn't that close, to be honest, but it was a cool read. Close ish. I think. Where, where did he ice blast? Don't know, I didn't see. You see that clip? No. Of, uh, no? It was pretty cool where Fly predicted the Tormentor was getting taken and Ice Blast and got a kill on a support and the Wraith King's reincarnation. I was, I was, I was impressed. It's alright though, never mind. Okay. Top lane, Savage. Has to pop the BKB. It's gonna be a long enough duration to TP out. Yes, it will. That is your nine second duration though. Yonu completed as well. So he's got, again, more of a farming accelerant. I just. This is it, though, right? I, I really want to see Talon make something out of this first Ages. You cannot wait for too long. You know, you've got the BKB now on the pier. You've got the level 15, so that extra cast range that you're going to be able to find the back lines and stay way far back. Let the uh, the Pango and the Primal Beast be the ones that start off a lot of these fights for you. Even just the, the Aghanim Shard coming through from Quinn, right? It's going to allow him to just be able to position himself... Uh, to not worry about the rupture quite as much, right? We mentioned before that it's an amazing Bloodseeker game yep. for what the rupture can do to all three of their cores, but if you can minimize that as much as possible through, you know, the roll-up, through the Satanic, being able to heal up a lot of that damage that's being done, and take away, more importantly, the attention from Duraccio, the core that you're really worried about, that's the big factor. Finally, dude. Get the grab ally. When was the last time we had a kill? Fire out. Makoto going to be rewarded off the back of his move. The help of the Ice Blast. Needed. That is a much needed kill. This has been a very slow game like we saw last time around this time. So, ages for another 50 seconds. Seems like they're kind of happy with at least all the farm they've been able to get. I guess we go back to the question I asked last game. Like, 
Talon late game compared to Gladiators? Is there a side you're more comfortable with going to the, the later stages? It really depends on what the itemization is going to be, right? If we eventually get start to see a bunch of Lincolns getting picked up, then I'm really feeling not too great about Talon's chances because that's going to nullify the effectiveness of this rupture. Even if Savage gets into that level 25 Talon, right, to get an additional charge, it's just not going to be enough. And we know they've got the burst potential. I mean, you're playing with a PA, for God's sake. Fire out PA top net worth as well. That has gone uncontested for quite some time. Deso almost completed after the BKP. Talon are going to look to smoke to try and connect. And Duracho does kind of reveal himself in the lane. Got boys behind him, though. They know the Aegis is about to expire. They know that if they ever were going to make a play during it, this is the time. But once again, Talon, first Aegis. Pretty ineffective. Granted, they still have a few of their own items to be able to pick up, so maybe they're just putting a lot of faith into their own scaling potential. What do we feel like is kind of going wrong with Talon with all of their attempts not working? Is it just the props really need to be given to die with their read of the map and whenever yeah. Talon's moving? Or is it like, you know, maybe the ward placements from Talon, not as much emphasis on shoving out side lanes? Like... What, what do we feel like but it is? How can you do it as a, as a Tuscan and AA? That's the thing. Even the Invoker, right? This isn't a, uh, a Quas, uh, sorry, an Exhort Invoker where you can, you know, use the Forge Spirits consistently just to be those ones shoving out the lane. He's trying to do it whenever possible. Four points Quas, four points Exhort. So he's going to have two Forge Spirits, but it just feels like Gaming Gladiators have the superior draft for that exact purpose that you're talking about. <laughs> I'd love to see someone pick up this Lotus pool. That would be a full greater Lotus. Just watching 24 minutes in. Five heroes just huddling together now. Uh, we have a Midas on Q. Like, are we really in this position again where we have a position for going on Midas? Apparently, this is the status of this game. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of that, to be honest. I was really hoping for him to get into an Agative Scepter just because you've got the Bloodseeker combination, right? You've got the ability to isolate. You've got something else to be able to set up for things like oh. the Ice Blast to completely isolate oh, someone no. away. And oh, no, man. Solo. They don't want to... Take the bay. Maybe they think there's more. They'll drop the no. ward. There's a sentry in range. Jab should know. Sees it. It's um, activates the BKB. Tries to turn, but once Aish is going to be in with the break, might be a little bit easier about killing the bristle back there. Hesitant though. Gaming don't want to commit fast. heavily, and now with the reactions out of tell for the grab ally, he'll keep him alive momentarily, but it's not going to matter. Stunned as he re-enters the living. He won't be there for too long. They want to go back in though. Savage is committed with the BKB. He's in a lot of trouble as Quinn's going to be able to target him down for the moment. Has more than enough force to be able to bounce back off the rupture. She's proving to be annoying, but it will not matter in the end. And now Q can still jump over the top. Jabs is starting to stack up this damage. His bristleback has gone uncontested. And where is Duraccio? Just not involved throughout that team fight. Was having a bit of a battle over on the left side. I think he killed Oli, but maybe with him there, we see a different fight. But in the end, tell them they're able to come out on top. Yeah, Makoto providing a lot of that control, preventing the PA from having too big of an impact. Still ended up doing the most damage on uh, the Game of Gladiators side, but that's the power that you're really looking to see from Jabs, and they put so much priority onto taking out that Primal Beast. They still don't have the break, so you don't have this answer to the Bristleback just yet. He's put a second point into the Bristleback. I'm keen to see if he puts any further into it or if he's just going to prioritize the stats from here on forward. First side. Just like that, Makoto's covered, recovered his net worth. Yeah, that he has. Hurricane Pike not completed for Makoto. Importantly, levels as well is looking good. Level 15, mid lane. Yeah, Gonna be able to get him. He doesn't have any charges at the moment on the vessel, so doesn't have that easy way to be able to combo together with a cold snap, but they're going to need it, right? Like, you popped both BKBs pretty early on Talon there, and I was a little worried for their long-term potential in that fight, but really just going to show that if you don't have an answer to the bristle back, all that <laughs> doesn't really matter. I want to go back to something the panel mentioned previously in that last game where they highlighted the Midas's were a little bit of an awkward timing where they weren't able to play with kind of the strength of the Naga's early, like, three items. I do wonder, like, if you win these fights, we're not going to feel it as much, but there is some big timings out of, you know, 23 Savage early on, the Bristleback really importantly this hero. So if you can win the next fight and continue to stall, then sure, we're going to say this Midas is great. He's going to get Scepter at, at a pretty early timing. But if Gladiators win this fight, then get Roche, the map will be difficult to play with. They could Jabs to start. 
Yeah, and they've got the break now on the PA as well. She's got basically all the items she could possibly need, even going into that nullifier next. Can't lose that sure ward. That Ghost Scepter's not a fact. They're going to jump Q straight onto Tofu. They should be able to blow up the Kip of the Life, but Grab once again, life. Sally will keep him alive. They found the Kodo. Now that's a big target to take out of the equation, but They're Savage is going to look to enter as well. Sirachio! These crits are raining down, and now Quinn... Hot in pursuit, but who does he want to jump though? The zombies giving them the information. Tell have done a pretty good job to retreat, but the BKBs, they're not available if a further fight does break out as Quinn would jump over the top of the shards, but they would just sacrifice the life of Q and there we go. A fight will go the way of gaming gladiators and eventually they're going to be rewarded with Roshan as well. And this map will now start to shrink as a result. That's all right, he's got the Midas, he'll be fine. Recovery Midas for the Tusk coming through. But yeah, just like you said, it really does show that if you just lose one fight, if you don't use the uh, the net worth that you've built up for that level of effect, they coming? Yeah, look at how much damage. I don't know if you could look to fight this. I mean, an instant Sunstrike maybe when Makoto comes up to see no if ice it actually is the case. But no Ice Blast and complete vision as well. Ace is acting as that frontline bodyguard. Ice Blast is coming through now. It's going to clip on two. Grab You've got the age has been instantly taken care of. And now they won't get much value out of the break as well. It's going to be on cooldown for a little bit of time. What's the call on Talon? Makoto's going to be back though. in. Duraccio jumps to the left side, but the BKB on cooldown. Can he activate the cheese? Gets it off for the last second, but he's still going to be bursted. Fall to zero. And Jabs is left standing in the middle of it all as well with the scepter. This he's bristle broken, back though. is ripping Ace apart. They got to get out. Gladiators, you need to cut your losses. But Q jumps over the top of the high ground. That's a perfect shard placement. There is no retreat from Dyer. Tofu will be cut down as well as Talon. The numbers disadvantage, it did not matter. What a fight by the pit. That's crazy. I thought they had no chance, no BKBs, 3v5 sort of situation, but the breaks just weren't there. They were able to land the perfect Ice Blast at the perfect time. Luckily for Game of Gladiators, they were still able to secure the Aegis and the Roche kill. Could have gone even worse for them. And we talk about those timings. I mean, Bristleback's about to get even stronger. Level 20 starting to build up a few more of those quill sprays. And it was all about that Sunstrike just providing them that level of information that they needed. Value of the Tormentors as well, right? Gets the stun off onto the Undying. Means that he might get the Flesh Golem off, but wasn't able to get the grab ally there. Both for the Tombstone, just in general, but also that saving potential. And I, wow. So many little things inside that team fight Could have gone either way. But overall, Talon now, 4,000 net worth lead. We see the power of what this lineup can truly dish out if they have this opportunity to spell cast and, and freely right click. Yeah, Jabs prior to that fight actually had picked up the greater healing modus as well. So he had that 900 heal coming in clutch and then was still able to swap in a vitality booster that he had backpacked at the time. So that ended up making sure he was able to survive through the initial burst and then, yeah, just turns it around completely. This goddamn AA shard. What, an, so good, what a man. buff to the hero. Yeah. Like, just slowly over time. Vortex, get rid of that shard. You have an innate now where you're able to push out some of the waves and give this man a stun. That has always been, you know, one of his biggest critiques where team fighting stuns, you don't have that. You're also, you know, kind of immobile and slow. That's still the case, but... We are going to continue to see what this Ice Blast can do. And that was a you know, big reason in that last fight, the stun onto three. That was the reason. Undying being taken out of that fight. Honestly, I think it's very different if you're just able to lay down a tombstone, if you're able to wait out a few seconds of that uh, Ice Blast debuff. Now you've got some big talent. Savage level 20 has that rupture cast range, importantly. There was another 20 I just saw as well. Bristol yeah. got his, PA got his. And a nullifier, so right. they realize how much of a threat Ollie is giving them this game. You might have a Ghost Scepter, which he, which he picked up pretty damn early on, but he is going to be the absolute priority target for them. I'm really wanting to see, like, when are these Lincolns going to start to come out here from Talon? They don't have the greatest ways to be able to break it from range. This has been really the first time this series, though, where Talon have been able to get a, a little bit more of a, a foothold in this game. And as honestly... A this is like 23 savage has got the ags and now he's got the ag shard as well so this is the first fight that i'm really feeling like savage has the potential to take it over completely it's been all jabs up until this point but Rachio? now that you've got two legitimate ones that's scary now there's a dd bottom as well that might be the thing that turns the tide 6k advantage at the moment for talon but i mean a pa with a dd just Yikes. completely changes the rule book out of doubt 
Let's see what the call is going to be for them. Do you want to continue maybe looking to try and deal with some of your waves at the moment? Because Gladiators, they are not leaving each other's side. I mean, same with Talon as well. It's the status of this game, how even it is. One fight still. Gladiators could even this one out. And of course, the stakes as well on the line. A potential upper bracket berth here for gaming Gladiators. I wonder why you even go here for Talon, because I feel like they still need a little bit of armor, right? Like the, the Pango, the PA, they're hitting for big, and it doesn't seem like they want to go towards an AC. I really wouldn't hate a Shiva's Guard, just to provide a little bit of that slow, yeah, more importantly, the healing reduction, because when you consider what you're going up against, right? PA with a Phantom Strike, you've got the Satanic on the Pango, you've got the Undying Heal, you've got the Coral Heal, it's a lot that you're going to be able to minimize. Can they look at Jabs if he goes for this right creep? Camp. Well, they've got the vision for it. Oh, is he going to go for it, though? He's make it blown up with this DD. Jab's going to run straight to them. And with the ward, yeah, they know yeah, that yeah, no yeah, one yeah, else yeah. is behind him. This is going to be a huge kill. Break is out, and his health pool just evaporates. That's a gem as well. Double gem now for Gladiators. All right, straight shield. rolling thunder. <laughs> yeah. Still pretty long cooldown on it. Max level, but another 60 seconds until it's up. But Primal Beast, of course, one of the big benefits of the hero. By the way, reach level 20 now, so even more damage coming through from the uh, the trample. Pulverize already back up, and yeah, like you mentioned, that double damage effective both for the kill as well as that tower taking potential. This time, they'll remember to glyph for the tier two tower, so this push won't immediately result, and they're moving up onto the high ground. Looks like Talon will be able to take a little bit of control themselves too. I know it is getting very scary with the potential of what this Phantom Assassin is going to be able to do inside the fights. That is your one thing. I mean, talent, do they have at the moment the heroes or even you know the built-in items to, to be able to deal with it? Maybe Scepter could be frustrated and kick him out. Actually, yeah, who, who does Q actually even... Like, what's the play with the Scepter? Who you, you have... gets ruptured? <laughs> okay, pretty much. that's pretty easy, all right? And, you know, again, it's going to get to that point. And again, it's going to be even more effective if they aren't going to go for these uh, these Lotuses or these Lincolns, right? Where level 25 on Savage is going to result in even more carnage. It's still a fantastic rupture game. All three cores, even the Coddle, to be honest, uh, are vulnerable if they get caught out of place. I think he's got the eighth Might one. even be looking to prioritize him being the one to pick up this 35-minute uh, Wisdom Rune as well. Let's see who's going to be able to get that one. Do have a bit of lull inside our second game here. GG should be able to get their own Tormentor, who's without the shard currently. Ace Tofu. So. Looks like it is Savage that's going to be yoink it up. As soon as they see the Thirst movement speed start to cover, they're like, okay, they're doing Tormentor. Instantly smoke as a result of that. Sun Strike, a little bit off the mark. This is a scary position to fight if they continue to angle to the right side, though. A choke point area should very much favor Gladiators to be able to get the back line and also play with and that they Tombstone. They know they're about to go for a smoke. They just grouped up under a Watcher that they had under their control. So right now, Jabs just wants to shove out the wave, force someone to have to deal with this first. Tornado off the mark. Oh, Makoto being on the front, worrying. If they could retreat, this would be huge. Rupture's out or as they well. Get a good rupture off. Finn's gonna have to protect himself with the Akinem shot. He's falling pretty low, but Meemoth Darachi wants to jump in the middle. Ace is gonna oh, fall in pursuit as well. They're holding down the Kota oh, momentarily. Right, right. Darachi with a burst damage. They'll deal with the Invoker. What's the call now from Gladiators? Can you look for more kills? This Q, he is isolated in no man's land as Talon can't enter Dai's side of the map. And another fight will go the way of Gladiators, and now they can look to get some more objectives. Good God, that was good. Just wait out the rupture. Make sure that you, with your Satanic, is able to provide the safety. And like you said, they isolated Q. Q did the right thing. He wanted to get that Walrus kick off, make sure that he was able to burn out the rest of the Pangolier's HP pool. But instead, Celery drops the Tombstone onto Quinn, gets him inside the grab ally, means that, like you said, Tusk completely away from the rest of the boys and ends up dying as a result. It was really, really well done by Gaming Gladiators. Full team fight coming through there. That was not any sort of individual play. That was a team understanding. Top well, this top is getting shoved in, so it will be a response eventually out of die to be able to go back for that. There's no way they run into Savage, right? 
Mm -hmm. Sure, we got this. Wait, hang on. Are they Dude, thinking wants... about fighting Q? Hopefully, not with the boys at the moment. Tarachi, no BKB in. as well. Ice Blast will clip on the right side. It separates the Phantom Assassin, and there There's is that, that combo. Rupture kick. Health pool gets blown up. Gladys will be able to retreat, so they only lose one. But of course, that is a big kill on Tarachi. And Roche is up in 20 seconds. We'll see if Talon's able to scout it out straight away. High risk, high reward. That's the Talon way. We saw that with the previous Roshan attempt. Uh, and they weren't able to secure the Roche, but they still got the successful team fight off the back of it once again. Who would imagine a team would be protecting a tier one tower at this point of the game? But I suppose it's really valuable, like you mentioned, with Roshan coming up in 3, 2, 1. It means that they're going to have, if buybacks are required, that additional tower to be able to TP to. Second Roche of the game. Oh, no. Yep, they're all coming. Uh, do you give ages to Makoto? Very worried about how so vulnerable he is inside the fights, but I feel like oh, there's a lot of other people as well can be blown up. I'd give it to Bloodseeker personally. Okay. Like he's almost at his level 25. Like you can legitimately do like 40,000 damage in one team fight as this Bloodseeker. Probably more so when you're going up against like the really beefy heroes, like three oh, wait, what? Um, builders. Oh, it's yeah. third rush, my bad. Okay. <laughs> So end up giving it to Makoto. Maybe just feeling like he's dying a bit too easily. But I'm still waiting for this level 25 on Bloodseeker. He's almost got the Refresher Orb completed as well. So you will have four ruptures coming out. And I'm just doing a quick uh, Lincoln's check. Tofu's nearly finished one up. He's about 50 gold away. But beyond that, I see nothing. One Lotus Orb and Quinn just starting to work towards a, uh, a Lincoln's of his own. So it really just is going to be that sort of how are you best going to use this time? If I'm... 23 Savage, I'm saying give me the farm. Stop taking my farm. Let me get to level 25. Stay close by, but not close enough that you're going to be leeching my XP. Who would you prefer to have this refresher shot on? Because Jabs currently has it in the backpack. Uh, Feels fine enough to me. I mean, just to be able to get off two Bristleback actives is so enormous, right? It means that whoever gets caught out is dying, unless I mean, Celery has been pretty good with his positioning so far, but it just puts so much more emphasis onto him to be able to be in that right place at the right time. And lucky for him, he's got the ninja gear to be able to play around with. So he's got his own personal smoke. I mean, I'm sure he would love to get into something like a blink dagger as well on the Undying, just so that you can always be there with the save. What's a gem I count as well? I know Dai had two before. It's like Coddle's still got one. The other one's in the fountain as well. So probably going to have to see Talon soon. Look to consider that. I mean, you really need these items. Though. I mean, Oli has had this execute off for quite some time. Q would love the Aethlins to be able to enable that combo with saw prior to deal with the Archeo. Savage is like, stop leeching my XP. I'm so close. <laughs> multiple times now that you've had one or two teammates relatively close by to him. He's isolated now, so he should get the level 25 off the back of this, but just imagine if Gaming Gladiators were going for some sort of kill attempt right now onto that sort of area. It's got the rupture charges though, finally. So let's see what the call is going to be. So I have plenty of time to work with the Ages. They do not have any deep vision to potentially look to smoke to. The wards, in fact, still getting held. And I wouldn't even hate the the uh, refresher being given over to Q, to be honest, right? Like double Walrus kick with whoever gets ruptured, that's pretty deadly. Even just double punch, three second BKB pissing control and someone like Dorachu inside the middle of the fight. And if Savage is able to right click him, that could just be enough. We are going to see them smoke. Radiant yep. are scanning. They are. Scan is, is that connecting or not? It's like pinging every now and then, but it. I think it did off? to start. Yeah. They're very split. They are very, oh, yeah. very split. No yeah, way he shows. Pick onto, surely. Oh, They're going to see the dagger. The daggers. But they, I mean, they have no vision on the back line, though. They don't know that anyone else is not behind Duraccio. So it is still scary nonetheless. Literally, like, inches between being able to catch him out there. The blur nerf, not enough to be able to uh, lead to Duraccio's death there. Doing their best to be able to try and shove out a lot of these lanes, but... Like Gaming Gladiators realize the strength of the potential high ground fight. We talk about level 25s. Well, you've also got it on Durachu as well. So, so many more ways to oh, be able no. to rock that coup de grace. They didn't play for the wizard room. <laughs> I don't know how I was able to get that. They might lose their other as well. I mean, it's also a really big wave. 
Does anyone else make that play other than Duraccio? I don't know if they do. They're going to lose the other two? No way. That's a here. Oh, <laughs> no. Yoink. Oh, so much experience. All right. They'll be kicking themselves a little bit. Yeah, instant ping out coming through. Another tormentor for themselves. Anyone lacking a shard right now? Looks like just Invoker. Not too bad, honestly. Just keeping people relatively close by to the Bristleback. Yeah, it's not a bad shot at all. Let's see, they're doing a very good job, though. I mean, Pelinant really forcing the issue, though, on getting a oh, fight. They've only got 45 seconds on the Aegis. It's, again, one of these cases where it feels like Talon fights better from behind. You know, they want to be in this sort of disadvantageous position as looks like Tofu is even <clears throat> going to be able to get away from a Makoto gank attempt. I, I still am just so worried. I do not care that this PA was nerfed slightly. Like, this, yeah. this hero late game, it is a mm -hmm. different beast. I don't even care about his KDA. As long as he's got the gold, he's got the Satanic about to be complete. In fact, I think he just went... Yeah, he, he's he's bored out. Blessing for the Scepter and Satanic getting delivered as well. So Duracho is ready to he's go. Huge. He's so huge, man. And the thing is, as well, you're going to have that slightly less duration on whatever lockdown that they've got. He's been very clever about this. The Ascetic's cap, he knows that he just needs to be able to withstand during the rupture, right? It's still a fantastic rupture game. I've said it about 50 times right now, but as long as you've got the Satanic to be able to heal up any of that damage dealt, you're not only ensuring your own survivability, you're nerfing a little bit of what the Bloodseeker is able to do, both in terms of movement speed and right clicks. It just feels like a really solid itemization coming out from Gaiman. And the thing that I'm worried about for Talon is that you've won waited long enough that now you do have multiple Lincoln Spheres up. Gonna try and force the issue. That is, look to smoke. They don't have the greatest power room to play with. Will at least potentially help them try and deal with some of their lane issues. Are you gonna take a fight around a high gun though? You'll need to drop a ward. Seller could even use the tombstone for vision as well. Chad's not quite with the boys. He's going for his own break. A bristle back going break up against a PA. I see the Watcher getting taken. No pings, though. Makoto almost running straight into them. It's a jump. Tofu will start. They've got the vision advantage. Instant rolling thunder. It's Quinn's going to try and hunt the There's back lane. Lincoln's. Second use of the rupture. Quinn's going to have to stand in the middle. Where's Q to be able to get the kick away? Now, Quinn, he's isolated from he the team. Satanic. It's all up to Duracho now, but the rupture's used. Grab he should life. be free inside to fight. He's going to try and chase down the code of the south. A quick disengage gets him out of danger. They're not done just yet, though. Ace hunting for more, but Talon retreated to the safety of their high gun. Do they want to go in, though? It's just such good team play coming out from Gaming Gladiators, man, right? Like, you're going in, you're popping the Satanic, you're getting down to about 30%. Uh, Quinn able to heal up to a very, very healthy portion. And then the perfect timing from the grab ally. Not too early, not too late, making sure that if you were wanting to commit up onto that high ground, you're competing into zero vision, into a tombstone layer down at you. And by the time he pops out, you're playing alongside of a Keeper of the Light, right? So he's going to have another set of spells to be able to play around with too, with no ruptures left. Archer is just ready for someone to step a little bit too far forward to blow him up. No one will give him that opportunity, though, so they'll go back to the T2 Tower. Wave, it's a juicy one. Of course, this is the area that you always need to be a little bit concerned about going up against an Aghanim Scepter Tusk, going into high ground, and it feels like that might be what Gaming Gladiators are looking to play for next. Find another one of these pickoffs onto Q so that you're not going to have that risk of getting kicked back with a rupture underneath Tier 4 Towers. Uh-oh. That is a scary rune. <laughs> Scary, scary rune, and they're going to be able to find it as well. So, Duracho's bottom, so Kun's probably going to take it. Rush potentially up in 15 seconds. They've got full control of this left outpost area. After, did they lose the gem as well in that fight? No. Okay, Oli's still holding him. It's still a pipe dream of this hex. He's getting close. Yep. Billy coming in value. Even just his own level 18 would be pretty nice. Extra second on the Frostbitten. Extra little bit of damage. Dude, probability is 50-50 dead even. Yep. Feels that way. It honestly feels like Gaiman need to mess up once. Kind of like what we saw last time around, right? Like, these team fights haven't gone swimmingly for, for Talon. Like, it's just been really good play by Quinn and Celery in particular. Their just understanding of where exactly each other want to move, where each other needs to be, has been just on point. Wait, this is a scary bridge to cross. 
Only will lead the charge, wants to drop his own ward, which completely scouts oh. Talon out. And Duracho's gonna be able to jump as well, but the break's there. Jabs is in a lot of danger. Refreshes his health ball thanks to the cheese. Now Duracho down low, they blow him up. No Duracho for the team fight. Talon, you've got to get more. This is your one opportunity. They'll try and cross the bridge back to their side of the map. Ace wants to try and disrupt them. Perfect but the tornado. tornado clips on four. Duracho will bite back, but he's way too far away from the team. Ace, he's going to hold down Savage on the right what? side. Ace just solo killed the Bloodseeker. Now there's a big opportunity. Gladiators, they'll need to get more out of this. The investment out of the buybacks is costly. As Quinn... Should stop Makoto on the retreat if they oh, got the detection. Run. It looks like they do. We'll try and TP out, but the rock throw will stop him short as Gladiators somehow come out on top. How did he do that much damage? I suppose maybe he had the uh, the blood mist running at the exact same time as the blade mail was being popped there by Ace, but literally 100 to zero on that blood seek, a crazy amount of damage done by him. And now he's level 25 as well. So got even longer duration there on the, the pulverize. You're just gonna be able to completely lock people out of the fight. They're gonna go for a cheeky play once again, but GG, they're not phased. They're just gonna finish this Roshan and get a refresher shard of their own. So I guess you know, the big thing is the fact that multiple really important buybacks were used. Of course, we're looking at the Duraccio buyback. I mean, Seller is, is nice, but there is a win condition now. If you killed Duraccio twice, this game looks very different. Just kill him twice. It's easy. Easy. I killed him once that time. Once. <laughs> That's the difference maker. And again, it's the scary prospect of going up onto the high ground. I want to see how much pressure they put up onto this high ground when they don't have the Bloodseeker, when they don't have the Invoker. And if Talon have the cojones to use this buyback, if Q is able to get into a good position for a kickback, they might be able to do it. Oh, they're looking for it. Maybe even able to blow him up. Four to zero. Celery again. Oh, yeah, again. This tombstone save. And now you've just sacrificed Q's life. And Bristle's in a little bit of trouble as well with the breakout. AC's sees an opportunity to be able to charge in the middle. Savage tries to do what he can, but it's not going to matter. Now, Duraccio senses an opportunity. Makoto with the tornado will disrupt. The combo's going to get laid down. Kick further inside the base game and Gladiators. What can you do on the respawn to just even sacrifice his life? Quinn will try and give an opportunity for the Phantom Strike, but the instant Hex is finally there. And now they're He's looking for more kick. as well, Ace. Kick back. This is the opportunity Talon have been waiting for. Ace will go down without a doubt. It's just a question of can they get more kills? This Savage will not be able to cancel Quinn's TP, but that is the dieback on Duracho. 100 seconds for Talon now. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you had to use a couple of buybacks onto Jabs and Q. Well worth it. They were just wanting to wait things out, get that satanic perfect use of the uh, the stun combination to make sure that you really didn't get too much value out of the PA. And you see the lines being drawn out by Savage. He is like, we are ending this game right now. We're not going to get a better opportunity. 50-minute creep wave, double siege creeps, and plenty of units to be able to soak up all of this multi-shots if Talon choose. Uh, sorry, if Gaming Gladiators choose to commit that uh, Glyph of Protection. Obviously not wanting to do it for a Tier 2, wouldn't be refreshed, but now's the time. Can they do it? If anyone shows, they might just jump again. You know there's no buyback from the Pengo. Quinn in the middle. So Hang on, bold. Bloodseeker? What is the damage on Savage? It's going to be really cautious, but we're going to just try and waste as much time. But again, if anyone's nearby, Q may look for the opening with the kick. He's starting to run up. Jabs is just softening up a little bit. Wait, Jabs? Why not? Dude! Hey, look, in. in trouble now as well! Sorry back again! Down, remember. Oh my lord, these tombstones, but it is just space. One building down, what's the call from Talon? Call is to keep on going. They want to have this map advantage. They want to keep Game of Gladiators fighting on their side of the map. They don't want that instant pick off into a dieback, into the inability to be able to fight, and they know it's 20 seconds until the PA is a concern. Jabs doesn't have the greatest mana pool for this fight. I don't think they want to take a fight at all. Yeah, they're going to clean up what is possible, and then they're going to get the hell out of there. Look at the respect, man. Far out not give a opportunity this is still just under four minutes where there is not a buyback for Duraccio and they have showcased they have the capability to be able to kill him inside these fights and if you can somehow kite the primal now there does seem to be a potential damage issue 
All right, at least this time Makoto is there on the bottom side of the river because there was another freaking double damage, but Kavoka ends up picking it up this time. But Daedalus, dude. All right, let's see what Makoto can do. <laughs> oh, jeez. He still wants to keep alacriting himself. <laughs> no vessel charges is a bit of a concern. Buyback status as a whole this game. Savage and Makoto, the only ones on Talon. Gaming Gladiators. Quinn's going to have enough gold in 80. And then, of course, the Dino AC has got enough as well. Going for another move. And they find the pick off even. Wonder, uh, Q's got a Octarine queued up. I understand it. Just wanting to get more Walrus kicks. I wouldn't hate seeing him go a Silver Edge as well. It's a good ward. It's another way. It's yeah. a really good ward. Smoke's gonna pop. Oh, oh, good reaction. So quick. And Celery, I think, has been the MVP. Hang on, they're coming. GG so far. Smoke's gonna pop. Oh, he's in a really peculiar position where they can just blow up the support. A quick guaranteed kill onto an easy opportunity. Gives them a 4v5 and potentially more as well as Q's gonna go down. These are the what? heroes without buyback. Oh, Savage. No, Savage. He, he, he stuck. trapped himself. He can BKB and TP, but you, you gotta make a call pretty shortly. He's gonna TP now. Oh, just no, ace the shot with the it. charge. Oh. Won't stop him, but uh, dude, now no one's They'll there. The guy that no one is with jabs. It's just Makoto as well. But the Invoker, oh, he also needs to get out of danger. That is a disastrous team fight. The worst thing that could possibly happen is Savage is gonna try and do whatever he can, but one crit jump over the top. Duracho will not let Savage get back to the base. And now they send blood in the water. Makoto as well. Well, you could not have had anything worse happen for Talon. And now as a result, Makoto, they'll catch up to him as well. Buybacks are used instantly. I guess at least the lanes are in an okay position, but my you oh see my. see exactly where they're going, right? Makoto goes bottom, Savage goes top. Try and shove out these lanes as quickly as you can. I'd love to be able to just drop that uh, Mjolnir buff onto somebody Ooh, that you can't show yourself. This is ballsy, Savage. You got to get the hell out of there. But they might not even care. They've got the creeps. Three is enough. They're just going to go up onto that high ground. The buyback's coming up shortly. None. 50 seconds until the AA and a minute until the PA. So Duracho feels confident of being able to go for this all-in style push. I've got Glyph, but it's a miracle hold. Glad it is one fight away of getting some revenge when Talon knocked him out of Riyadh. Let's see what the combo is going to be. Oh, it's just, it's not on the mark. You tried to set up with the tornado. Still They're the just going to go for the throw. Duracho might die to the sun strike. That's a big start. Makoto's putting in work in the defense. Ace will try and turn to Savage for Q. Kicks him right next to the fountain. That is the damage they need to bring down the Primal Beast as well. And they have held. We are not done just yet. The Savage will also stop Celery from getting out of maybe? Celery? Oh, cute. Nice prediction. All right, he's able to catch up the Celery. So at least there will be a third member that does go down. One of those members that did buy back previously. That's that's his die back, even though it's up in another five or so seconds. But you could just see how anxious 23 Savage was there, not wanting to full on commit. He bought back himself and he's going for a freaking E Blade, man. He just wants that extra little bit of damage. They want 100 to 0 people with this rupture kick combination. <laughs> what is this game, dude? What is this game? I'm happy that we're getting a close one. Yes, today's been a bit more one-sided. A lot of two zeros. I don't know if this one is going to be a two zero as well. And they just... All right, let's 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 see. What can you do, Talon? If there was any time to buy out, this is it. I mean, Savage could look to get into that start of the E-Blade pretty soon, but it won't change too much of anything. Second lane of Rax going in their favor. So again, the lanes are passively just going to be helping them somewhat. It's just a matter of, can you afford to wait another five minutes? I don't think GG is going to give them that opportunity with Roshan potentially respawning right now. It's pretty quick. 45 seconds and they'll know it's around the top side of the map. Are we, are we getting him? Are we getting the tier five items? Locked? We may be. We may be. Some big items though, nonetheless. With the Lincolns, late game Lincolns, 56 minutes in, both Duracho and Ace wanting to go down this route. So this could be just something that catches them by surprise on Talon to mess up a little bit of the spell casting. Have to keep an eye on those Lincolns inside these fights. 
whole that's Lincoln's what dude. allowed Quinn to be, yeah, I, th that's what I was saying before, right? If it gets super late, doesn't matter how many ruptures you have if you're just able to Lincoln's them constantly. At least it's not the old meta, right? When it was a Medusa with like four different Lincoln's buffs on her, you actually need to have an element of skill of being able to pop them. Tofu really wants to be able to deward this, uh, this observer, and he's making sure it's Duraccio is the one that does it to not give away too much about their smoke. Poor go. By Baxter there now. Two members of Talon. Not for Talon, though. Jabs is on the front line. They're going to try and poke at the Brissa back to start. Blinding Light pushes him out of Ace's charge in the middle with an early BKB out of Jabs. It should be okay. Looks like that's all. Makoto's in. Oh, Thunder's a big deal. And yeah, look, look at bottom. Yeah. It's pushing in. Someone's going to have to TP back. Do you have the shard on Coddle? You don't. So I want to see if uh, we do see Tofu look to try and pick that one up just so that you can recall Quinn back to the fight if absolutely necessary. And they'll see first that Roshan is up. <laughs> his eye filled on Savage is crazy. I know you brought up the, the Usher and Kai before. He's got Timeless Relic. It's yep. Very interesting. All about read. that spell damage, man. Just let <laughs> let the Blood Raids, let the Shard and the Agadim Scepter do the work. Yeah, there's the Shard and... As Quinn Reed delivered once again, Gladiator is such a power position for them on this high ground with the ward. It is very difficult for Talon to be able to break that. They're just going to have to wait for the lane to get pushed in. That's the main thing. So they will have to go back eventually. They've got scouting tools, right? Like you can use the, the handball for it. They could use the Sunstrike for it. They could use the uh, the Forge Spirits for it. Lots of things, but you just got to be careful on Ollie in particular. Just patience. Don't put yourself too far forward. Yep. Patience, patience. That's it. No glyph from Zoe. It is, it is the road to TI. I just want to see them keep a Forge Spirit inside the pit. And they, they will. will. All right, one person's back. Durachi will TP, of course, again. Yes, with the coddle. They got the recall. And we got 40 seconds until potential tier five items. So not the worst place for GG to be holding up here, up on the top side. Then again, uh, it is going to be moving down bottom in about 30 seconds, right? And you have to be very careful about that if you're Talon, right? Like if you TP Ooh. down bottom to be able to contest this, yeah, yeah they're actually going to set up early. They're not sending those Forge Spirits up onto the high ground, so they don't know about this. So if you TP down, they're yeah. already going to be there. And then if you buy back, you're not going to be able to TP there again. So they could once again look to isolate this Talon roster. They've been doing such a good job of it so far, despite not really having the tools to do it. Really nice Sunstrike coming out there from Makoto, predicting the fact Agreed. that they were already down there. So instead, they TP down to their Tier 3 tower, and they're just going to look to run it in. Still would mean that they won't have those buyback TPs. So it's going to be another one of this cat and mouse sort of games where can they just look to wait it out until their TPs are back off cooldown? The Raichu is not here currently. It's supposed to try and scout and give them really much information. The Raichu is trying to get these neutral items. One will be dropped now. Aces as well. Very sure, okay. Radiant shadows from Savage. Aerith Shield's not bad for a, for a freaking rupture. Is Makoto just trying to see if Durachu is going to deal with this wave? I guess this is a nice thing where Talon can kind of intercept anyone looking to get to Gaming Gladiator's position. Yep, they're using the Forge Spirits for the vision around the pit, so they know they're not losing a big uh, objective. Someone's going to have to deal with this, so it's just a question of how are they going to be able to respond to it. It's the Siege Creep wave as well, right? So someone needs to be addressing a lot of these Super Creeps that have pushed into the GG base, but they're being patient. They're just getting their tier 5 items, and now it looks like the recall back onto Duraccio, and they're going to try and slip inside. Quinn did just TP away, though. They know they're in. They know they're in. But you got recall, man. It's going to be up soon. It's a Sunstrike to scout. A little bit split at the moment from Talon, it's not going to matter. Roche just getting poked. Fallen Sky by Pango. I mean, it's just more time that you're invulnerable, right? Not going to be taking damage from that rupture, providing a little bit of that extra control that the PA needs. Spoken about how the Talon have the capability with bottom and mid getting pushed out. You see the same as well with top. It's a big wave that Oli has to go back to deal with. There's a catapult wave as well, so they don't want to give over this full set of barracks. At least it's an AA, so you can still have that big team fight impact from the base. It is, but, but they've Radiant finally found a little bit of isolation. No one's claimed that one from right now. Quinn, he's not going to mess around. Instant rolling thunder. 
Looking to get to the back line. There's the Lincoln like Puck double. Like Savage it. is in a lot of danger. Duracho is going to try and close the distance. Savage can't get any life. Still back. It's too late for Makoto. Spellcasting still. They will get a return kill. Can Makoto slip under the cover of the Invis though? Ace has got the detection. Pulverize slams him into the ground. The buyback to the pivotal thing is they're already back in the middle thanks to Tofu's hell. Can they get any more off the back of this though? Ace is going to try and get on some jabs. They'll separate themselves. Two fights are breaking on simultaneously. Really up, man. His jabs uncontested so far, but he's not going to have the mana or the health shortly as well. As the breaks are proving too much of an issue. Look at the mid base though. Makoto, he just bought back to Makoto. This is an all or nothing play. Quinn's going to need some assistance as well. They'll get the TP in from jabs. jabs They're going for the too. throne, man. Someone needs to respond. It happened to them at Riyadh with Liquid. They're trying to see if they could do it themselves. But they're not going to have the numbers. Jabs is pretty goddamn survivable. Two fights they again are happening to Racho. He's not with the boys. There could be an opportunity to Racho and Savage That's going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They're going to push him down to the southern side. I mean, back to mid, we see Jabs and Quinn. The BKB protects the Bristol back down to the south. We go. Ice Bars connects. When is an opportunity for Savage? First Hex is oh. out, and that's all they need. A die back on Duraccio. Two and minutes without your Phantom Assassin. Are you kidding me? They didn't die on Talon as well. They were somehow able to get away on both Jabs and Makoto. Get away with murder, forcing everyone away back to the base in queue, interrupting the TP return from Duraccio as well. And they're still having to be very careful about this, though. They're backing off. They're using the Book of Shadows just to try and give themselves a little bit of a reprieve Dude. against the likes of that PA whenever she tries to jump on them. 3v5, who cares? Gladiators have the confidence charging at Talon. They do not want to let this Roche go. They have got to care a little bit. <laughs> 80 seconds still to get Roche and also go for the base. This is your best opportunity, Talon, to send us to a game three. Yeah, and Makoto is about to get an Aghanim Scepter for himself as well, you would assume. Just getting himself that little bit of extra control. Do they go for him it? Being one of the ones that bought back, he's the one to claim the Aegis of the Immortal. Surely, right? 50 seconds? 60 seconds, yeah. Ollie, not with them for now. Just once again, looking to influence this top side of the map. No way. <laughs> no way. They're not going to go for the finishing blow, so we will stick around for a little bit longer. And die I said have it before, and I'll say it again. Late game Dota is where C really shines. Dude, why is there a rapier on Oli? What am I looking <laughs> at? What is this? Attack from range, Oli, do it. It's all or nothing now. You just got to go for it. 25 seconds. Quinn's on to Makoto. BKB. They want to deal with the tombstone. What's the call? Messi inside the team fight. Ice it's a lot of damage from Ace. He's trying to control the backline, making space. The throne is now exposed. Talon, they're going to go straight Savage for the jugular with a stitch and desolate on this base. He's falling fast. Still Duraccio down for five seconds, and it's going to be too long. Talon up, will send us to a deciding game three. And what fashion to do it in. What a play from Makoto and Jabs. The balls on these men, and you can see... Celery feels like that's one that got away. You know, they got to those big timings that they needed. They had the solid lanes for themselves. Lanes probably didn't work out the way that they were expecting, but as soon as those Lincolns came up, you see the cheeky little smiles coming out from the Talon boys. They know that this Bloodseeker really was the one to be able to do it for them, but what an early game by Jabs as well to be able to set everything up. This was high quality TI level Dota from both of these teams. It's a shame that one of them is going to be starting in the lower bracket as we're going to be starting to head towards game three, the first game three that we've had of this stage two of the playoffs. But I don't even know what to say with late game Dota. It, it just, things get so chaotic, messy. You've got mirror shields to worry about. You've got refreshers, random freaking ancient apparitions, buying a rapier. What is this build? But in the end, Talon... They would come out on top, send us to a game three, like you said, the first game three of the day as well. I cannot wait to hear what the panel has to say about this wild second game. A wild game indeed in areas you might not know what to say about late game Dota. However, Talent Esports have demonstrated time and time again that they know what to do when it comes to these late game situations. We have our first game three of the day, Talent Esports going the distance against Game and Gladiators. 
What a strange game, God. You've been around the scene for a long time. You've seen many games on the road to internationals. Have you ever seen a game quite like that one? That, that was special, um, you know, and I think TI, I mean, we were just at the road to TI here, but you, you bring out the, the best in teams. At times you can bring out some sloppy games because teams aren't playing at their best, but this was honestly two teams just going blow for blow. Even from like the last 20 minutes, it felt like it was just, oh, this team's going to win. Oh, wait, no, the, oh, the other team actually, and they're just trading buybacks, trading fights, trading roaches. Um, you know, we got to see a Bloodseeker come out mm -hmm. on top. The Ags refresher build really, act, like somehow managing to enough work with some of those Warriors kicks to kind of get all that rupture damage in. That's, that's the only damage she was doing <laughs> look it was enough <laughs> uh, but just absolutely chaotic crazy late game donut tier five items everyone loves to see him yeah just insane um the resourcefulness of talon allowed them to go for this uh, rupture plus kick walrus kick play mm. which was a lot of fun and it kind of turned the tides like they started winning against pa they managed to eliminate her multiple times then Gaming Gladiator in the river fight, when they catch both the supports without buybacks, I thought the game was over. I stood yep. up, I set, sat in this seat, right, because the game was legitly over. They went for the throne and they did kind of the right thing, ignoring the heroes just hit, hitting the building, but uh, they probably didn't count on Mikoto and how much damage he can dish out. Yep. Like, even through the BKBs, he just destroyed them, pushed them back out from their base and... Yep. This is the fight where it all began, more or less. Yeah, I think Makoto did a great job recognizing, like, hey, my Bloodseeker is not doing any right-click damage whatsoever. Kind of took it into his own hands. He was, you know, obviously had the Alacrity, gets the Tier 5 Stygian Deso, gets a Daedalus, and he just became this extra additional damage output in the late game that they desperately need. Mm. Game that right-click damage, uh, helping to compound the already existing physical damage coming in from Jabs. I mean, we heard at the end there how well Jabs did early on. There was a point in the game where not only did he feel unkillable, but the amount of damage he was outputting to the enemy team felt like he's the only reason they were winning those fights to begin with. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to see Bristle in game three, to be honest. Uh, that hero is pretty bonkers, it seems. Slightly broken, just slightly. But uh, they they had ways of dealing with him, right? Like, PA is considered one of stronger heroes of the, to deal with the, the Bristle. The problem lied elsewhere. Like, you couldn't jump on the Bristle, because if you do, if you show your hand, then the Rupture comes in, then the Walrus Kick comes in, and the PA is as good as gone. Well, yeah. They had some different difficulties here, but... Regardless, the, the game was just absolutely insane. The team fight here and down bottom next to the Roshan fight that lasted for like three minutes. Mm -hmm. Must Pleasure be good to for Talon Esports to be in this position where they're the ones forcing a push, you know, putting their bodies on the line. Memories of Rio are probably sprang to mind. 23 Simons glued to his seat at the moment. No one stood up. <laughs> Until that last tick of health in that throne went down. Uh, but yeah, I mean, honestly, it was kind of even to the very final seconds, very composed, because like they won that fight, PA's dead without buyback, and they're like, no, no, that's we have 120 seconds. We can finish off Roge. Mm. Bloodseeker even killed some creeps to heal on up a bit. Then they went, they literally killed the throne the second that PA is respawning there. Uh, AA buying a rapier and everything just for that final bit of push there. They, they, it was very calculated, very disciplined, and not, not rushed because a lot of teams would be like, okay, PA said 120 seconds, let's go head rush down the throne. And without the ages, things could have gone bad. I feel like the big difference between these two drafts are basically both in both of these teams have carries that are absolutely gone in team fights from second one right like they can't do much it's all about the other two cores and how much they can contribute how much they can actually execute when you look at gaming gladiators like pangolier and primal bees they're all about setting setting up they dish out some damage but mostly about control and set, setting up for pa to destroy everyone the pa cannot do that at the same time on talon you have bristle and invoker maybe a bit greedier maybe they don't contribute to that control but they can carry the game themselves yeah, they can indeed carry the game. The carry is not necessarily all that much, unfortunately. Obviously, Diracho forced to play the edges of the fight as much as possible, playing around the debuffs as he can. And of course, we have 23 Savage, spell-casting Bloodseeker. You love to see it, understanding that his value is going to come from having the quadruple rupture <laughs> as much as humanly possible. These are not items that you would imagine a game like this, 60 plus minutes. This is not why I want my Bloodseeker inventory to be normally, but in this game, there's no other option. Yeah, it was kind of funny, like, you know, Lizard mentioned, like, the Warrus kick was a big timing that helped turn the game. The Bloodseeker in level 25 was a big timing. Getting that extra rupture, and with Refresher, extra couple of ruptures made such a big difference in these late game fights. Um, and ultimately, you know, even though he wasn't a carry really by any sense of the word in this game, he was a huge part of why they won, just mm. because of the way he itemized and played to, to address the, team, the PA. It's the team effort, yeah. right? Yeah. 
And it was that combat that they had, you know, like you mentioned, the Walrus Kick Rupture. Going into the third game, I doubt we'll see 23 Savage playing Bloodseeker again. But I also doubt we'll see Makoto playing Invoker. You were mentioning in the first game, Lizard, that you were surprised that he was allowed to play it, mm -hmm. given how often it's banned out against him. They let it through twice. They beat it the first time. Second time around, it's the reason why Talon's able to win the game. If you're Game and Gladiator in their shoes at the moment, are you starting to reconsider your bans to make sure you either get Puck earlier to win the lane, or you're just banning Invoker heads up? I'm not sure. Like after this last game, perhaps you are actually banning out the Invoker. Because in game one, if you remember, they completely let their best heroes go through. Yeah. They let their support duo that was picked every single game yesterday go through and they still won against it. But this time around in Walker, maybe he's a little bit too problematic. Mm. And what about the Bristleback? Could you just be... We see this hero being right now one of the most picked heroes in the entire tournament. I believe he's actually number one overall. He was losing a lot, but as I think we see more and more teams drop out, we're starting to see the effectiveness of the Hedgehog become a little bit too much, God. Yeah, I think teams have adapted. A lot of the, and even a lot of those losses were teams more playing the bristle on the carry role. I think teams mm. are understanding, um, you know, that this hero needs to mostly be played off lane under, except maybe under some rare scenarios. And also figuring out what cores work better with it. Like I think too many teams were picking bristle with like greedy hard carries, picking it with the TBs, the Nagas. It works much better with these more aggressive fighting carries. Here we had a Bloodseeker. We've seen it work well with Chaos Knight. Um, so I think teams are just get, getting better at understanding how to draft and play around bristle because it is a hero that takes up a lot. Of space a lot of farm in the offlane. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a little bit less about the draft and more about which one of these two teams is going to mold less <laughs> going into game three because this game three <laughs> was gut wrenching for both teams, right? Like mm. you're hitting the throne, then they're hitting the throne, then you're hitting it. It's like, yeah, a, at some point it's very exhausting, and you could see it on players' faces for both of these teams. Yeah, and I think like someone like even if you look a guy like Quinn is going to feel like you know I can take on this guy, uh, this invoker mid. Um, you know he took the pango here. He had his choice if he wants to go for more of a hard counter pick and go into like the Kunkka, for example that we've seen have a lot of success against the invoker mid. So you know it's sometimes nice knowing your oppo the opposing team. Hey, they're going to first to invoker. We can play and prepare our draft around that. Whereas if you mm. ban it. You know, there's gonna be. We don't know what they're gonna pick. Mm. So if you if you feel like you can beat the invoker, which they did in game one, leaving in the pool could be a drafting strength as well. I mean, even in this game, right? Uh, Quinn on his Pangolier did end up winning the lane quite handedly against yeah. that invoker, forced him to get like some 19 and a half minute Midas yep. for the longest time. Even though Makoto ultimately carried the game, his team had to drag him to that mm. position. Without Jabs having such a good early game, Lizard, we would not be here right now. Yeah, I mean, Makoto was far, far behind. He was kind of crawling back up there with his Midas, but it's 2023 and that's invoker. And on the other side, it's a Pango. <laughs> Not sure if that's a hero still. <laughs> what do we make about uh, some of the greed that came in from Q again? He went for the Midas once more, did it in game one, didn't necessarily work out. Mm. This time around, though, something was different. Same minute, by the way. Same minute. A minute earlier. Minutes. A minute earlier. But this time he had a Philly stone as well, so get even more GPM. Yeah, I mean, being able to get these late game items like his hex, less less so the rapier, but the hex at least um, was a big part of some of these team fights. Having that extra bit of lockdown, being able to maybe catch somebody by surprise before they BKB. So you know, it's it's great. Um, I think more than anything, just the A8 as a pick this game. Um, we kind of talked a bit about how the two carries were both negating dealing damage. It yeah. wasn't just the other cores where it felt like Talon had a lot of damage, but the supports. A hero yeah. like AA is just offering a lot in these late game team fights compared to an Undying, who it felt like was just a tombstone save. Yeah, Oli, you know, he's been around for quite some time, got a lot of experience in IG, came back into SCA. I feel that uh, he knows his stuff when it comes to this hero. And we were talking in the last series, like, what can you buy on a anything? Yeah. But when it comes to Q and his 24-minute Midas, I have complete trust in this guy. He has so much flair. And there's a couple of position fours right now that uh, are reminiscing me of Jerax. Mm. Like, there's a ton of flair in them, and the way that they're playing these tinies, these tusks, Matthew as well from EG, like, he's doing his own thing, and I like that a lot. So on the side of GG, one thing that is concerning for me going into this third and decisive game is the fact that when you look at their draft, they had more of the control, right, relative to what Talon had. Talon had what? They had Snowball, Kick eventually, uh, some Invoker spells. But that pretty much comprised most of their active control and team fight. And nonetheless, Gaiman still found themselves losing some of these team fights and engagements. That's going to be a bit worrying, right? What do you do now? Is it an issue of trying to double down on that team fight potential? Do you pick heroes with a little bit easier execution, or do you just go for even more damage, doubling down on the PA route here? I think they're, you know, you're going to have to stick with 
um, you know, to some extent, wait and see what the draft is and stick with what you play and what you play best. I don't think you can just say, okay, we're going to have to go a completely different route, pick a bunch of team fight and control because that's maybe something they feel was lacking the previous game. Um, you know, I think the way the drafts work is it's, they're just so complex where you got to take it pick by pick. When you get to the carrier roll, they have a bristle. We need something that addresses bristle. PA makes sense. So, um, it's, it's really hard to know outside of maybe that when them seeing their first couple of picks and what they kind of need to address. Like if they're going to let Bristle yep. through, they need a Bristle answer, for mm. example. From what you've seen, Lizard, uh, give me a prediction for the third game. Who are you backing to win this third and decisive game and start the playoffs on the road to TI? Oh, and damn. Game? Such an easy... Pre I'm 50-50, whatever. I'll go with Talon. If, if I win, the chat is going to think I'm a brainiac. If I don't, <laughs> they're going to flame me anyway. But uh, no. So my reasoning behind this is... 60-minute game, gut-wrenching as it was, I feel like uh, you you get the pump after that, right? Like, it's much easier to keep on winning after a game such as this one. Yeah, they're going to get that boost of momentum, hopefully. And we see the discussion happening in the game and camp. You know, Diracho really... <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> he's, he's, he's taking a break. You need to breathe, yeah. bro. Oh, that, that game was tough. It was so long. You know, even, how do you know it's a tough game, God? But even Talon is like, yo, guys, maybe we should have closed that one out earlier. <laughs> yeah, they won that one. They're still looking like, you know, end of the day. You know, they've probably been up since this morning, getting ready for this series, discussing some last-minute draft prep, uh, maybe playing a scrim or two. And, uh, you know, they're looking like, whew, we still got to play one more. So, uh, you know, both teams are going to have to really dig deep to get that last bit of energy reserve ready mm -hmm. for game three. To make matters worse, your reward for winning this one. Yeah, sure, you proceed into the upper bracket of the playoffs here on the road to TI. But your reward is playing Team Liquid. Oof. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Fun. Enjoyable. A Team Liquid team that has beaten both of these squads. Uh, maybe not necessarily in the grand final scenario, but the road that they've had at Riyadh. Team Liquid looked really good against both of them. They've been able to get these Ws. This is a, a scary place to be if you're one of the teams here. For one yep. last game, yeah. put it on the line, but you got to win. You know, got to look for that W. So with that, we're going to find out who has the distinct pleasure of starting the playoffs in the upper bracket, who has the maybe displeasure of ensuring that to go up against Team Liquid, but most of all, who has the privilege of entertaining us with some stellar Dota 2. And to find out, we send it to our casting duo. We have Aries, we have Danark. Gentlemen, for the final time tonight, take it away. Gaming okay, Gladiators, the team that has been the most dominant through the entirety of this season, find themselves one game away of potentially starting the road to the international playoffs in that lower bracket. And we have seen in recent history, Talon, they have been able to even knock them out at Riyadh as well. Will that continue? We get a game through first one of the day. And like the panel was saying, it is not easy to be able to come back, calm the nerves from a 60-minute defeat. So that's where Talon thrive. You can claim Gladiators it is though be able to find a way back we'll have to wait and see i mean uh, i was watching the cameras there duraccio he looked pretty exhausted at the end of that one and you see the cool tattoo he had in his hand as well i uh, had time to whip my camera out with the old google transit it says crime on his hand and i feel like they thought it was a crime that they lost that game considering the number of times that they were able to catch out these talent heroes without the buyback and still weren't able to end that game so i'm uh, really psyched about this one i'll be honest when you and i got the schedule and we found out we were casted this series i just rubbed my hands together because i I knew it would be close. There's a lot of feeling behind this one. And like you mentioned earlier, no team that has started in the lower bracket of that playoff stage has ever won TI. So this means so much for both teams. We get to see the masterminds behind it go at it again. See why first year as a coach in the competitive scene and all the big tournaments has been seven out of the year he has won five of them of course with gladiators that is a incredible track record for him just entering into the scene and what is he going to be able to do up against the experience of sunby i know the panel was speaking about it this would be a big draft advantage if you can be able to beat the invoker which they did in game one are you going to be able to find a strategy to deal with the bristle back and well, they actually don't even want to deal with with how Jabs nope. was able to play in that previous game. And it's going to be the exact same format as well. Game in first pick, Talon, Radiant. So we're not seeing anything too much changing up. You would assume that they have similar sorts of strats for like hero pools to go back to. I know whenever we've seen, you know, the likes of the PA, the Sven, the, well, not really being picked right now, but the Gyrocopter uh, being played up on the Dire side. It's a lot more viable, but... Uh, uh, we're not going to see any crazy shenanigans like that. Who knows? Maybe it's just going to be a game and Gladiators starting out the, with the Muerta once again. They've got a really good record with it. It wasn't banned out in the last draft. Maybe they just go back to what works Five for them. Seconds remaining. 
You're going to be that respect as well with Ace's brew that we saw last game banned. Mm -hmm. A lot of decisions Five that need to be made. It did last fairly long into that draft as well, right? And at the end of the day, Talon picked a Naga Siren into it as well, which was kind of puzzling a little bit, but uh, you know what? I'm sure they, they got some learnings out of that one. It's not like game one was a stop, right? Up until 35 minutes, it was literally dead even. So it really just does come down to those minor little details. Ollie and Jabs just going absolutely bananas, TPing in, ratting the base. It's all that sort of thing that really does start to add up. And we didn't even mention Ollie with his Divine Rape. <laughs> he, uh, he ended up doing 199 damage to buildings, so it didn't really influence things all that much. Looks like they want to get rid of the Primal Beast as well. Lots of tanky boys <laughs> removed. I like it, because this really does feel like Game and Gladiator style, right? Just be unkillable. So what gets let through, though? You've got Templar Assassin, Spirit Breaker is you know, some of the the ones that have previously been banned out in both of the other games. Brewmaster is going to be there, Moetta. You know, you've got to be looking at Talon's supports. We've seen the Nature's Prophet played multiple times uh, from Q, Pugner as well. So there is that Templar Assassin ban. And they're going to snag the Spirit Breaker for themselves. You know, I was telling you, I felt like this is the hero of the tournament. It hasn't been picked enough to be, but it's just so busted. Of course, Collapse makes it look a lot better than uh, what it already is, but uh, I, I just love it, right? You've got so much level of flexibility. You can play it as a core or a support. You can one-shot creep waves. And once again, I like this a lot. We've seen back all the way when he was playing on Motivate Trust in 2020, Q has the capability of playing this Dawnbreaker, and he plays it at such a high level. But of course, it's been Jabs that's had a lot more success on it in recent times. And once again, again they've given him one of these lanes that is going to probably be advantageous because you really want to be playing with jabs on the front foot that's where he feels most confident i mean you just think back to when the nature's prophet core meta was really a thing i don't think talon lost more than a couple of games whenever he was able to pick that up early on you see they're going to make sure q doesn't go back into the toss which can be very scary with the tag team starbreaker combo so mm -hmm not have that to play with it is a question of where how are you going to potentially deal with the invoker i mean spirit breaker can you know go back and forth tornado is always frustrating but any hero that gets on top of the invoker can always you know prove to be a bit an issue so do they feel like the sb is enough to be deterrent and they're just going to make sure makoto has to play a, a different hero now in this final game speaking of q i wouldn't hate seeing him pick up uh, dark willow this game obviously it goes away from the is it three games in a row that now that they've had double melee in the uh, off lane? I, I think, think so, it has, yeah. but uh, it's pretty good against the Spirit Breaker just to be able to lay down the Brambles. Then, you know, you're going to get caught up in those when you're trying to make a charge through happen. You're a natural Yule Scepter Builder, which of course feels great against the Bulldoze. And it's a pretty strong kill lane as well, especially even once the lanes do break down, just to be able to layer out the Bedlam onto the Dawnbreaker who wants to be in and amongst it. It's just way too much damage to be able to overcome. And then again, if it gets to the late game, we know that Q is no stranger to being able to buy the Midas on that position four. We know how capable a Dark Willow can be if it gets to super late. It's uh, six most picked hero, 52% win weight at the moment for the Dark Willow. I think another support to mention who isn't having as good of a showing percentage-wise is the Shadow Demon, but of course is um, is a pretty good matchup as well versus Spirit Breaker with the, the Purge always being a, a pretty big nuisance. So um, yeah. I would much prefer the Dark Willow though, but of course that is something we've seen Talon run in the past as well. I'm really considering Gaiman picking up the silencer for themselves. We saw it absolutely ruin a Dawnbreaker's life whenever it was being played. They do end up getting the Shadow Demon. I, I just think it's a little too passive for Q style, right? He needs to be in there and amongst it. It might very well be Ollie that ends up playing it, but I know both you and I really do prefer it being played as a position four, uh, just because you're so much closer to the ancient stacks, being able to, you know, really start to build them up as we see the Divine Rapier from Ollie look to come through. Look at it, no cares in the world. But uh, yeah, it gets the Spirit Break even if he's able to get into the Aghanim Scepter and the BKB, SD is just so effective. But just now do you just flex this Spirit Breaker to a support, you know, and you've committed a Shadow Demon, which Demon we've seen hasn't had the greatest win rate. That's not an amazing lane with the Dawn. Uh, and, well, okay. You, you mean you could set up for, you know, defensive saves with the uh, disruption into, like, an Ice Path Macro Pyre. Feels pretty nice. So... And this is the hero that we saw banned out in the last phase of the previous game, mentioning that Celery has played it just once so far in the road to the international. I will check now how many other games we've seen now. Only three games on the Jakira so far, so this will be the fourth. And we've got the Moetsa as well. So again, this is pretty much all... Well, it has only been Tofu playing it so far. Mm -hmm. See if that's going to continue to be the case. 
I think it will. Again, and, and again, these are heroes that are easy to kill, right? And Shadow Demon not necessarily notorious for being the highest damage dealer early on in terms of burst Five potential, right? But remaining. you think of a Spirit Breaker, you think of a Muerta, you think of a Chikira, there's just so much control, AoE damage, silence, stuns, various types of damage, not just magical or physical, that it really just starts to become a little bit of an issue to be able to deal with as we even get an Earthshaker coming through. So maybe feeling like they need to address that burst issue a little bit, make sure that they can find the pickoff, find the stuns for the uh, Spirit Breaker if he does want to commit heavily in. Well, you'd have to imagine this is going to be Makoto playing the Earthshaker. He's played it two times so far, zero yep. wins. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, you know, I was going to say maybe those, you know, two games, zero wins, maybe you're not feeling as confident on the high stakes because we have also seen this hero like fall a little bit out of popularity, but you also don't know your mid matchup, which can be scary. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. Throwback. I Feels mean, pretty good into the Spirit Breaker, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, it does. We do not yet... How many Morphling games have we seen? I think Savage has played it once so far. So this is the first time that he's going to have uh, being played it again. Four games, 75% win rate. Five seconds mm -hmm. remaining. I'm just thinking what Quinn wants to play into this. Like, you've kind of protected yourself against the Necro with the Shadow Demon pick as well. So yeah. kind of next level stuff coming through there from uh, Talon. They would have absolutely loved to play that into a, both a Morphling and an Earthshaker. And honestly, even the Dawn. Um, maybe they just look to try and outrange. Never mind. <laughs> Faceless Void coming through, making sure that they are able to get that initial lockdown. Again, it is going to be into the uh, the Dawn potential save, but we know that where Jabs really does thrive is when he's a damage dealer, not so much in the utility-oriented style. Turn to ban. This Morphling Void matchup is so interesting. You can go mm. back and forth for quite some time. I know with the strength of that Scepter previously, when Morphling was really strong, it felt like he was a little bit more favored with the like bash on time walk when he was able to get on top of the void and just blow him up from like four to zero. Can go back and forth. Of course, Morphling has Agshard to protect himself in Chrono. Five seconds remaining. I don't know. I, don't, I think, I think you're many looking better at... Morphlings in the world than Savage, by no. the way. I'd say no, this no, no, is no. The, the hero that's really Sports made his name. Maybe Ame. Ame's pretty good on it. Yeah, there's a couple that are close, but like really it is by I, his best hero. You know, potentially some others there. So let's see. And I think Dorachio is a very good faceless void and a lot of damage to bump inside that Chronosphere as well. So we are going to be looking for our Quinn hero in the mid lane. Of course, you're more than likely... They're actually even banning up the Pox still, so potentially thinking this could be a Shadow Demon 5, like you mentioned, Q playing the Earthshaker, so still trying to cover their tracks. Mm -hmm. Does feel a lot more Ollie-ish, the, uh, the Shadow Demon 5 versus Q, and being able to you know, make a lot of these plays happen. I suppose just wanting to be able to withstand that early game, right? They revolve so much around mobility. They're not even going to worry about considering the Necro. I mentioned that the Shadow Demon is a pseudo counter to it, but it's just something that Quinn has gone back to time and time again. And I'd be a little worried if Quinn goes into something like a Sniper here, just because I feel like it's potentially a bit too passive, right? A little bit too farm oriented, not a ton of team fight. Of course, you have a ton of stuff to be able to layer into the Chronosphere if that was the case, but... Uh, I just feel like, you know, it would be too much of the same, you know? What are your thoughts on something like a Queen of Pain for Quinn? Like minimal control on a Talon? Queen of Pain, you say? Queen of Pain, indeed. A pretty good matchup versus the Earthshaker mid lane, if that is going to be the case, and some damage in the Chrono. Puck, Ben definitely maybe signals that. Puck's a pretty good matchup versus the Quat. We haven't seen, like, a mid to before, but I wouldn't hate that. I mean, it's not horrible against the Shaker. Do get a lot of those early levels as well. Um... You really don't want a Huskar against the Earthshaker. There's, the base damage is just too overwhelming, I think, for the Shaker to have to, to worry about. Um, what else can we really see? Like, is it going to be something like maybe a Quinn OD or something like that, just to be able to deal even more of that burst damage? I mean, it is a very old-fashioned counter to the Morphling. Pure damage against the armor, Hex Builder, which is always nice. Be interesting if that's the route you want to go down here for Gladiators. Because what, what are they lacking? In my opinion, they're lacking a little bit of tower push, right? The Jakiro provides it, the Spirit Breaker allows the creeps to do the work with just being able to, like, one-shot creep waves, but it's once again going to be a little bit more of that passive game, right? We know that Morphling yeah. takes a bit of time to come online. It's going to be accelerated Game somewhat because of the stacks that are going to be picked up, but uh, oh, even getting rid of a Lone Druid and going the Lena instead. Okay, I mean, it's one of those classic Lenas that's just able to, you know, stay back, stay away from the strong base damage of the Earthshaker. 
Of course, plenty of that new potential as well, as well as damage into the Chronosphere. So, you know what? I like it. The Queen doesn't seem massively satisfied with it, though. Well, he's had an interesting track record with this hero at uh, previous oh, internationals. If I remember correctly, one of his NA teams where he sold, I believe it was a Bloodstone for some mm -hmm. item on Alina. Fire, oh, that's a long time ago, but he's played this hero too on the big stage, and it is not one we get to often, but let's see what the response is going to be for Talon. I want to see more lockdown from them. That is one area that I think they're severely lacking. You can't put everything on the back of the Earthshaker, and you can't allow a Faceless Void or a, a <laughs> Alina to be able to do it. I like this. You know, this is this is what they needed. I'm not sure if it's going to be... Yeah, there we go. It's a mid-tiny. That's what I was kind of expecting. I think they really needed this to be a lot more aggressive. You've still got the potential to be able to, of course, secure a bunch of the, uh, the creeps with both the avalanche as well as the tree grab. And you've even got some ganking potential as well, right? If there's one area that Alina really does suffer in, it's her survivability, lack of mobility as well. So if there is ever any sort of time where you can get a, a solid start to the lane out with a Dawnbreaker, one of the strongest laners out there, so probably is going to be the case, then a rotation through from Q could be pretty devastating if you're allowing Makoto to start that snowball. It is a very volatile hero, hero though, right? Like, we do not see the tiny often at all. So, let's see. The let's see what Makoto... Though. Yes, it is, it is the talent tiny. Not only can Q play it at a high level, but Makoto can as well. So, it's going to be another game where we need to put a lot of emphasis on these power runes to be able to help, you know, Quinn's potential burst potential with Lena, uh, Laguna, I should say, and Makoto's rotations as well. A game three is everything... We would want between these two teams, you know, some of the best out of their region. You say, of course, Talon, without a doubt in Southeast Asia, this is probably the best team we have seen. In fact, it is the best Southeast Asian team we have seen since the likes of T1 when they're able to it's have the that. only Southeast Asian team all year to be able to make it out yeah. of group stage. You know, for that, that's there how much they are holding the flag of the entire region. I mean, when you think about all the regions so far at this road to the international, NA, 100% advance rate, China, 100% advance rate, and Eastern Europe, 100% advance rate, SA, 50%. SEA 50% and I think Western Europe has 80% with only Quest going home so far. So really just the, the weight of a region on their shoulders. And uh, you know what? I, I think they've got what it takes to be able to take this one out. You know, the, the late game when you saw how affected Duraccio was by that loss, he really felt like the Bloodseeker didn't have too much of a game to be able to play around. And it was a full team performance coming through from the rest of the boys to be able to get him across the line. Yeah, to continue on with the success rate of the regions. Uh, so far this year, Western Europe, they've had four teams at every single major. And the only time that they didn't have a top six finish was Tundra at Lima, which is wild to say. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, this has been a region who has been at the top for this year, last year, quite some time. And let's see if it's going to slow down anytime soon. They instantly dip Duraccio as soon as they get into the game. Also, his positioning going to get popped a little bit, maybe expecting that he might be holding an, uh, an Observer Ward, but who honestly expects the Faceless Void to be the one holding that sort of thing? So Quinn, looks like he should still be able to get his off. Also, cosplaying a little bit of Muerta there on the Lena. Wonder if the... Is there any confusion there between the two? I want what a prediction out of you. Uh, I don't know. I feel like 30 seconds to battle. I think gaming are more consistent and talent more volatile. And I think they have a lineup that is very hit or miss. Are they going to hit or are they going to miss? Call that's, it. That's the big question. It's a big question. Um, what is the big answer? <laughs> answer the question. I think, I think, game, I think everyone will hit this game. All right. All right. You're just a Western Europe enjoyer. <laughs> what the hell? A region betrayer, <laughs> that's what you are. <laughs> I'm not a region betrayer. The battle begins. I'm a Dota enjoyer, and hopefully we get just as crazy for game three as we did prior. Nothing too crazy to start. We are two for two in the bounties. I'm glad we get a bit of a different dynamic in the mid lane. There's no more invokers that we have to worry about. No more tanks. That tiny... well, that's the big one, man. Come on. <laughs> it's good to see him you know, on the ban list the for a little bit. Yeah, that's... Uh... Let's see. Let's see what your Q's going to be up to his shenanigans, of course, with the fissures, just to be able to hopefully get this crit wave under the tower. Duracho is going to make sure he meets the wave 
to... Oh, I mean, it's very difficult to be able to drag it out regardless. So this will help out a lot with Talon's equilibrium. But really, I want to see how mid lane goes. Lino is such a dominant hero in this lane. What can Makoto do with the tree throw early? I mean, it really just comes, does come down to the skill element, doesn't it? Of course, Quinn, one of the better skilled players, but Makoto has been carrying the torch for SCA for quite some time. A little sad, we haven't... I think he's played it once alongside the Pugna, but we haven't gotten to see too much Makoto Storm Spirit coming out yet. Basically solo carrying Boom when he was uh, back as a member of that roster. He, he's been best mid laner for quite some time in C, right? I, I mean, Armel hasn't been gone for two. I think he's been the most two. improved player overall this entire year. I mean, this boy is looking incredible when he can get online and when he's got the confidence as well mm -hmm. to be able to make those plays. He is a very scary person to verse. Oh, for sure. So how do we feel like we'll this see. top lane's going to go? I mean, Chikiro is a support we really haven't seen in quite some time, but it's very similar to the Undying where you are a super strong laner. We saw previously, like, Talon, so far they have had some concerns. Game 1 in particular with Jabs as Wraith King wasn't able to get off to a good start. Do we think he can this game with the Dawnbreaker Earthshaker lane? Uh, I think Dorachio can get off to a pretty nice lane. I think it's really just going to be on the back of Celery, right? We saw that he went the Liquid Fire level 1, just wanted a lot of free harass coming out there, and you never really want to be pushing the wave all that much against the Dawnbreaker. That's where you can get punished and start potentially feeding away to those first bloods. <laughs> Oh, Quinn, you're so annoying. That's the strength of the leader, man. What can you yeah. do? What can you do? Also, just wondering what the uh, the item build is going to be like on Makoto, but I think both you and I agree that... Celery, oh. yeah, in some danger with the Fissure placement. Jab's going to be able to land the Starbreaker, and this will be our first blood in Thuraccio. We force the Time Walk away, so tell him to strike first in our final game. Just having enough regen as well to be able to uh, to withstand themselves, and we've got a salve coming out here on the bottom side. This will be much more passive coming out from Talon, right? Twenty three Savage, he knows that there really isn't too much kill threat happening down here, and that's the one area that I'm a little worried about for Talon, right? Of course, late game morphling, scary as hell, especially considering all of the heroes that you have the potential to morph into. But the thing is, like. Spirit Breaker at this really early timing is super scary, and we've seen how effective Tofu can be on the Muerta. Not going for just one cookie cutter item build, he really has that true ability to be able to flex so that no matter what the game requires, he's just going to be able to pick up what he needs. And I would have to assume that this game is probably going to be something along the lines of the Spirit Vessel, right? Up against the Morphling, feels pretty good. Be able to have that percent damage, same sort of thing with the Dawn, both for her high HP as well as healing, and it's a core tiny as well. Even just the potential to layer it in onto an Earthshaker and prevent any side, uh, any sort of blink reinitiation coming through. We are Winning really, really well in this yes. mid lane. <laughs> really well. It's just the lane I was going to highlight. Top lane Thiracha, he's going to be chilling. So yeah, the the no armor on Makoto is proving to be a little bit of an issue at the moment with some of the spells you can spam to be able to get the Fiery Soul Charges. Not going to be able to get another Water Rune as well, which is very important in regards to how he's going to be able to play this fine line in the resource spam in the mid lane. So we'll need to eventually start to see some supports looking at rotating. Of course, Q has, hasn't even thought about that just yet with wanting to try yeah. and secure Jabs' lane. I mean, he's trying to secure the lane, but this is the thing, right? Look, have a look up on the top side with Q. He's basically needing to put his body on the line. He doesn't even get the block. It's a half pull, probably the best thing that they could have asked for on Gaming Gladiators. And you don't really feel all that confident with leaving Jabs up here solo as well, mm -hmm. considering the fact that the hard camp is still blocked. So if he, you know, it, maybe if he was able to pull that camp and get it right back next to the tower, you could make this sort of movement. But without that, the possibility just isn't there. Yeah, and you see, as a result, Makoto, he's going to have to go all the way back to base because of the spam from Quinn. So you kind of pick this, you re have a chance to respond to the leaner. And still, his last hits are okay, but Quinn is starting to get a little bit more out of control in that area. And all the other lanes are going quite well for, for gaming gladiators too. Mm-hmm. Only Savage, Grandmaster on the Morphling, having a pretty decent start to this one. Denied. As expected. Might have even just seen them go down and place an Observer what there on the bottom side with the uh, Observer that just expired. And you can see Tofu starting to make the movement towards there to be able to take that one out. There we go. Celery instant D-Ward. Very nicely done. 
Also, just understanding that this is the period of time when that siege creep is starting to come along too. So the fact that they've been able to pull this wave might not be the best. It'll be a little bit of damage being pumped into this tower and a full wraparound coming from the Jakiro here. What a scary position for them. It's going to be able to bounce them back into the Phantoms. Great positioning out of the Spirit Breaker charge. I mean, Q's going to come down, down, but what can he really do with this rotation? Maybe Celery is in some trouble. Nah, no damage. No mana on Ollie. There's no chance. Yeah. So we should be able to go through the portal. There they want. They're going to go for kills instead. Why not? They see some freebies and they'll be rewarded. A great rotation through the portal from Celery. You deal with the ward, you stick around, get a couple of big kills. Meanwhile, you do not have to worry. Almost half damage done to that tier one tower as well, just with how long and when they made that play. Siege creep coming in. This is a really, really good early game from Gaming Gladiators. It's honestly what they needed, right? We know how scary a late game Morphling can be. Then again, so can a, uh, a Faceless Void. But I mean, I feel like a core tiny is probably one of the better heroes at being able to address these heroes that all they need is a couple of seconds to get off their full kit of spells, whether it be, you know, time walk for safety or aggressively plus the Chronosphere or the new Lena build, which is much more inclined to be that magic oriented style with the Laguna Blade. I'm just really concerned now on what Talon's going to be able to do to with their supports to secure the side lanes, because now you're going to have both Celery along with Tofu rotating. Quinn's always going to have the potential if he wants to. So you probably don't even need him just with how strong the cores are with their kill threat. And, and you compare that to an Earthshaker, compare it to a Shadow Demon, it is very limited. Yeah, and speaking of the Earthshaker and the Shadow Demon, I'm not seeing any stacks starting to be built up as well. So this is the sort of thing that both... Uh, they're not amazing at taking it on Talon, but they do have the potential. It's not like they're completely incapable of taking stacks with uh, all three of their cores. That's, uh, again... Thing... Sorry, you go. I was just about to say, like, one thing that I was going to mention was you and I, we cast a lot of Eastern European Dota, right? And we saw as Makoto, is he going to make a play happen? Not quite. Um, GPK, one of the best tinies in the world, and his yep. item build is like the power treads then into the blink dagger and starting to scale off the back of that. Makoto, oh. as he looks to go for a kill, gets uh, dead shotted back with the haste root, so he gets the hell out of there. He's gone for the phase boots route, so this is much more of like less of a farming build, more of a kill build. That's fancy Great placements. Silence. Solar Guardian's gonna be in the fish. It's a little bit awkward though. Jabs is on the other side, but Makoto will struggle to follow up. Dude, everyone from Gladiators recognize the importance of this fight. Duracho is ready with a Krona, but the instant Delta split away from Talon, he'll still get an opportunity to use it onto Both the offlaner. But now 23 Savage, he's ready to go for the 10v10. They should be able to deal with Tofu. Gonna be cautious. Q's gonna be able to buy him some time. Attribute shift at the ready, so Savage will not be blown up. It's just that level one of the time dilation. So last of the eight seconds, the one that was stolen over as Duraccio, he's going to have to take the illusion route. Nice little turnaround, though, by uh, by Tala. Getting a little Ooh, bit of clarity. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was watching the illusions just chase down Q to try and pop the clarity. The real important things. No, I completely understand. <laughs> Uh, with the Solar Guardian coming in, I was expecting that to be able to land in the middle of the ice path that Celery had laid down, but somehow it just lands slightly off to the side, and because of that, you get the additional little bit of damage that uh, ends up being the end of Quinn. And Double Midas has been worked on for Gladiators. Ace is so farmed and potentially going to be rewarded uh, with another kill. Savage blown up from 4-0 to zero. mid lane now, though. Are they not even going to have the damage? You serious, Ace? everywhere across the map with the early spirit breaker involvement ollie will get Easy the kill <laughs> onto salary but this is getting to some dangerous territory already with the fact that they are 2k ahead and you're gonna have a great midas timing on the Raja along with ace yeah you will indeed and again I, i've said it time and time again all you need is level nine on the spirit breaker and he's already seven and a half pre 10 minutes is this another kill Oh, perfect. Oh, can't walk through it, though. Oh, the calling. Just doing that damage to be able to take him out. This I... is a ridiculously farmed Spirit Breaker. And it's going to be Quinn as well, who's ridiculously farmed after the kill onto Q. Oli, nothing he can really do. We'll chuck out a banishment, but it does not matter. And you are in dire straits now for Talon. You desperately need to somehow get kills onto Makoto's tiny. That's the thing I was mentioning before, right? If you choose to go this phase boots instead of the power treads and 
don't opt for something that, sure, you're still rushing the Blink Dagger, but something that's going to allow you to rush that Blink Dagger a little quicker, and then eventually, when you know, when you're getting into your next items, whether it be Crit, Aghanim Scepter, whatever it might be, it, it just feels Blaine? like... Oh, oh, they're just baiting jabs. He's gonna to step too far, and they're gonna be able to get the kill onto the Dawnbreaker. They might even get oh, Earthshaker silence. as well. Once again, Tofu spell casting. Such pivotal factor you them being able to swear to man. You have to. Like he's just way too good. Three, one, and four. Pretty much the exact same start we saw from him in game one. So he's gonna be able to itemize accordingly with whatever is required out of him in this game. Koto at least is relishing this small amount of time that he's got solo in the mid lane. Able to put a little bit of pressure on that tier one tower as this well. This is a gigantic kill. I think he does, especially oh, with, with Ola first, here. Yeah. That is a much needed kill. Savage, I'm going to bring down Ace, who was off to an incredible start this game on the offlane Spirit Breaker. I would just slow him down whenever possible. It really feels like it's about the time that he's going to start becoming a bit more of a menace, right? You can look to play a little bit more team fight oriented now on the Spirit Breaker, considering you've finished up that Midas. You're always going to have that little bit of a recovery mechanism and just target Makoto, basically. Like, he does not have his Blink Dagger yet. He's still running around, not too much active net worth that he's looking to play around with. And if you can just look to hinder that further and further, it means that the Faceless Void gets more usages out of the Midas. The Faceless Void gets to start building into his farm. And I've seen that's exactly Dude, where Quinn. the charges are coming mid once again. What is that double LSA? Now they're going to get Makoto as well. Yep. And it's just, it's the same recipe always. Gladiators, so much emphasis on securing power runes, telling them they bring two, and they're going to be punished for that. If you're going to go for these runes, you need to bring more members. Yeah. Tale as old as time, Gaming Gladiators playing around those power runes, and for a good reason. We saw, uh, granted, he's got the hero for it, but Quinn able to outskill Makoto in the laning stage. And uh, really, they're just doing everything to make sure that that continues into this early mid game. 4K net worth advantage. Savage at least has been given the role to be able to carry this game with this late pick morphling, but I'm still a little scared about their prospects moving forward. You need that initiation. You need that damage output coming from Jabs. And I mean, he's gone a little bit more conservative with his items, not the highest net worth and just a couple of races so that he at least survives that little bit further. Yeah, and that means he's going to have a difficult time at scaling, so we might not see like that Echo Saber Desso. Might have to look at the Blade Mail. There is a decent chunk of uncontrollable damage from Gladiators. See what the decision is going to be for the offlane Dawnbreaker. You need to also eventually consider about how you give Q a lane. So he's going to need a blink as well, only level 6, 13 minutes in. Might be around the time that Makoto is looking to try and start making some of these plays, right? He's getting close towards the uh, the Blink Dagger for himself, 250 gold away. And maybe that's the sort of time that you, alongside the uh, the Shadow Demon with the Disseminate, plus the Dawnbreaker, is able to make a lot of these kills happen. Well, they may wake the attempt. And are replicating Gaming Gladiator's play. If they're not quick, though, Dyer's going to smoke and go through the portal. Yeah. It has to be perfect, because Duracho has the boys shortly, and if they group up for the chrono, he's got this the could be grip. devastating. Jabs, he's just going to run up and meet them all, and you can't take a fight here with the calling. It's going to be disastrous. They'll still try, though. Tofu's falling low. All the AoE control proving to be an issue. Jabs oh. tries to get the ultimate up, but just to no avail. And they just are all mincemeat running into the grinder as now gaming gladiators. They'll find Oli as well in no man's land. Savage considers about showing up, but he is far too late. I feel like that's the sort of play that you make when you've got the 5k advantage, not when you're playing from behind, right? It just felt a little bit slow. You know how much emphasis Gaming Gladiators put on specifically this Twin Gate area control. We saw it five minutes in the laning stage and we saw it right then. Really nice play, good coordination coming through. I'm a little surprised with how long Jabs was able to survive through that one, to be honest. Eventually started channeling the Solar Guardian, but just ran out of juice at the very end. Makoto again might die. Another strike to face. Got the blink dagger. Such a delayed blink timing for Makoto again. This hero is so volatile. You see the Lena matchup and you pick it right into it, you have the, the confidence to be able to pull it out, but four deaths to start the game. And this is a hero that you need, you need to snowball. There is just no other way around it. If this hero is going to be able to scale, going to have a good mid game, you need to be getting kills. He has his blink now, so see what he can do with it though. 
Q's fishes have been pretty on point as well. I mean, we, I think that's something that we do need to highlight from Talon's perspective, that they're doing the best with the situation that's been given to them, but it's just not enough, right? You need to give him a little bit of this extra farm, and I mean, he's getting it up on this top side. It's a ballsy play to be sitting that far forward, and someone needs to be given up for it, and it looks like it's going to be Ollie. 7,000 net worth lead at the 16 minute mark and it is not going to stop anytime soon. Gaming Gladiators firm control should set up whatever they would like it. Billet is at the ready just in case a fight breaks out for Talon. What is the what is the play going to be? I mean, you've got a pretty nice ward deep inside the north jungle. Maybe you smoke, try and connect there. Radiance Koto gets lucky, the fact that there's a bounty rune up on this top hand side, he should pop it. I mean, that's the difference between having and not having the uh, the echo, uh, sorry, the sorry blink dagger for Q. Speaking of Q, he's the one getting charged as it's about to see. flip it through to him. Yeah, I think they saw coming through, Makoto could set up for it and yeah, he's actually going to stop the charge anyway. Double blink, you got to go. Radiance Savage Double probably going to look to get involved too. Smoke as well. Tofu's in a, such a good position with this invis. Oh my god, Tofu this game. MVP by far. Roger baiting? Can they pull him up 4-0? to zero? Let's see. I don't know, man. Maybe if he continued to stay on that creep wave, there was a small possibility for it. Even just using the dead shot to see if anyone was moving forward. And yeah, you're pretty capable of just getting your own farm with the calling as well. So that's the first smoke. Ineffective by Talon. Also weren't farming during it all. It's very interesting as well, the dynamic we're going to see out of these two offlaners. They both kind of play a very similar role where Dawnbreaker plays away from the team and can sometimes have an advantage of being able to shove the map out. I mean, Spiritbreaker does the exact same thing of being able to connect globally. So I think maybe there's a little bit easier of a time for Dai to, because you also now have kill threat onto Dawn whenever he's doing that. Yep, and it's you can see I was... I was talking about those natural Yule Scepter builders. I mentioned the Dark Willow in the uh, in the draft as a potential for Talon. They haven't ended up going for it, but they're still going the Yule Scepter on the Earthshaker. They realize how big of a threat uh, the Spirit Breaker is going to be. And Spirit Breaker, Ace has recognized that he doesn't have anyone that's building any sort of percent base damage. So he knows that he can get away with going for something like this heart and be basically unkillable. Yeah. What a wild hero. Very versatile in regards to the item build. Like you said, it's a very strong hero at the moment as well. We've seen a lot of people, in particular, Claps take over games with this or something. Teams are going to continue to put attention on as we get further into this tournament. How can you be allowed to, go to one shot rooms at level nine, man? <laughs> it's just not right. I mean, they've got, they've got the stuff to be able to make a counter initiation happen. Duraccio is not too far away. Instant teepees. Get one. Oh, Quinn, that long-range stun, can he blow up Savage? Right, Rachio's still hungry for it, but doesn't look like they'll be able to convert, so waste some TPs, and of course we know that, you know, as soon as I saw that Dawnbreaker picked up, I was considering maybe they go for the Silencer, but there's nothing really that's going to disrupt this uh, Solar Guardian coming in. Jabs is the one that's had the biggest benefit of a lot of these aggressive plays. Quinn, double stun. a bit blocked from the Fissure. This could be a pretty good opportunity. Oh, oh the Echo just Slam, though, just too late. Quinn slides out of trouble. The wards from Talon was a big opportunity. Get a kill onto the lean, and nonetheless, you got to use some ultimates, but when you're this far behind, you'll take it. Two kills, and maybe a tower just to slightly open up the map. Yeah. Obviously, could have been a lot better. That would have been eh, not even a kill streak from Quinn, but the important thing is he's really starting to get a lot closer towards that Aghanim Scepter for himself. So much burst damage that you've got, and I mean, you've got great heroes to be playing in front of you as well. Both the Faceless Void and the Spirit Breaker just set up amazingly for this mid leader. Do you want to bring it up with the item progression out of Makoto? I do really like this Midas. I mean, I think that's probably the only route you can really go for at this stage. Hold on, I'm just having a quick look over at Q, making sure he's not going for a Midas yeah, no. again, but this isn't the game for the Shaker, I don't think. Oh, you reckon? Midas Shaker? Are you sure? Seems pretty I'm good, pretty though. Sure. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> They're really right there to be able to instantly claim this Tormentor as well. They want to make sure that they can get the Demonic Cleanse pretty good against the Jakiro, against the Time Dilation, against the Silence coming uh, through as well from the Muerta. Can they do it without one person dying? I think so. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, it's a big one. 
He gets it, got flushed with stone, but now with lead, it's slowly being clawed back, man. 6,000, but still, slow. gaming gladiators, like, scale incredibly well. Darachio has BKB, level 15. You, you almost have heart on ace. You it's level 16, man. Yeah. Like, we've been talking a lot about Talon and seeing what they can do to get back in this game, but really, Dyer are doing everything right to be able to, to cement the lead and, and put themselves in a commanding position to be able to win that next fight and you know, look for Roche or look for some T2 towers. Yeah. No one hang around to be able to secure the uh, the Wisdom Rune at 21 minutes. They would love to be able to get that one over to Q, just get him some of those levels so that he's not tempted to go for the Midas once again. Uh, but, I mean, it is a, a big comeback that they're having to make happen. 5k net worth lead, so like you said, slowly shrinking, but I'm still not that concerned if I'm a Game of Gladiators fan, just with being able to farm multiple waves at once and securing a couple of bounty runes. If you, and these guys are nerds, right? They'll know the angles yep. of exactly when and where Ace needs to charge to get maximum benefit out of this uh, Charge of Darkness. I think this is going to be the ultimate test for Savage. His Morphling is very, very farmed, keeping up with Duracho, but can he put the boys on his back and get them in There's position? This is exact, this is the perfect item for them where to, to be able to make a lot of these plays. They would love to be able to take out jabs to be able to start things off similar to a Spectre, just go on them instead, but looks like it'll have to be Ollie. Yeah. And he'll, they I mean, he'll just go. They yeah. can skew. Oh, Makoto. You also get more fish. He's going to stop the charge. All right, nicely done by Q. Still ends up costing them a couple, but could have been much worse. But that is big now. Like, finally, you've been able to get the tower. Probably one of the weaknesses on Dyer. Like, one point liquid fire. Their objective taking is not the greatest. But this tier one gives you so much more access inside Radiance Jungle and really just helping to continue to secure some of the power runes for Quinn. Double damage rune for the Lena. Very close to the Scepter. Feels like they're wanting to be fighting pretty soon on Talon, I would imagine, right? You've nearly got the Manta style available for the Morphling. You were able to get that Aghanim Shard for the Tiny. And uh, Jabs, I believe, has a BKB coming out to a full BKB. So he can really look to be acting as that frontliner and set up for a lot of this teamfight disruption that's really going to enable this double Blink Dagger from Makoto and Q to really have a greatest amount of impact. They have a pretty good ward that's scouting out multiple members on Dai. I think they were just in range to see the smoke. Yep, they were indeed. So everything is at the ready from Dio. Tofu and Ace gonna lead the charge. Only once Ollie again. once Poor again. Guy. Be able to pop this. Q will give him some separation. Should still be able to get the kill. Makoto with the counter so over well. the echo. It's a pretty good combo. Can they blow up Quinn? And they will. That is a great start. Duracho. Can he find the angle for the corner sphere though? Over the right side, the waveform. Savage toying with gaming gladiators. And now the fish on to two. The perfect start is Makoto's gonna jump over the top of the chain control. Duracho protected for the moment for the BKB, but they can continue to chase him down. Ace is gonna charge through from downtown. You might need the Krona protecting Duraccio. In fact, it won't be required, but Ace in some He's danger. Like in still, fact, it's actually it. Celery that is the one in trouble and talent somehow, some way, find a incredible team fight. They take three, and that is all thanks to Ollie's positioning. Ollie's positioning and Q spell casting. That was perfect use out of that early Aghanim Shard, right? You get the Fissure to get the original block off, then you uh, look to follow it up with just even further stuns. Make sure you delay the Shadow Demon's death for as long as possible. He had the Demonic Purge onto them as well, so they didn't really have that same level. And that was the disruption that I'm talking about, right? It allows you to come in with these heroes like the Earthshaker, like the Tiny, and uh, really have that big teamfight impact. And this has got to give them a bit of a pep in their step now, the confidence for Talon. Incredible waveform from Savage to be able to dodge that time walk jump from Duracho when he was looking for the Chrono, just everyone playing the fights perfectly. But you are still not out of that dark territory just yet. Gaming Gladiators with all the map control can continue to hunt. We are seeing this game slowly, slowly be clawed back. I legitimately don't know how they kill Ace. <laughs> yeah. I... It's getting to that point. Maybe later on, if like Tiny gets giga farmed and he has, you know, Daedalus plus the tree volley. Yeah. But I think you still need a, uh, a spirit vessel on top of that. I think Daedalus Savage as well. And until then, just, yeah, have fun dealing with Ace, who is mm -hmm. dude, stupidly so farmed. farmed. Yeah. Like, what is his net worth? Are you serious? 
The Spirit Breaker thinks it's why I labeled him Hero of the Tournament. I... Probably one of the more farm Spirit Breakers. I mean, I haven't really seen many others, at least that we were covering. I don't know, again, if anyone's topping that at the moment. That is a ridiculous net worth that Ace is playing with, though. Mm-hmm. Dude, the fact that we actually have somewhat of an even game, like you are getting value out of these Midas, it is stacking up. Makoto, Echo Shot, sorry, Echo Saber into the BKB. And this scan as well, like you're able to scout, potentially sniff out this movement down to the bottom. And they are stalling. Hmm. I think at 20 minutes, Ace had the highest net worth on Spirit Break uh, in all games since TI5. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, very cool. Eight years. It's been that long. I guess there's more farm on the map. I'd, I'd probably say the TI5 one was a little more impressive. But anyway, he is playing a phenomenal game. His wards from Talon. Really good position. I mean, one will get dewarded inside the top jungle from Gladys. We see they are really starting to huddle up together, though. Not playing as loosely as we saw before. What are some items we're getting out of them? And Celia is Solar Crest, so they can definitely look for Roshan. You're going to need some kills, though, to be able to find that Tofu with the Aethlins. But, of course, they are still farming. I mean, it's not just for the Roshan, right? It's also for the movement speed for the Spirit Breaker, make him deal even more damage. Speaking of SB, he's nearly got the Lincoln Sphere uh, finished up as well, so that's really going to give you a solution to this damn Shadow Demon. So now it's a matter of, well, we, uh, we're going to need to put some other spells, some priority on other heroes, and getting a lot of that targeted uh, spells off. Uh -oh. Make sure that the Spirit Breaker gets a little bit of safety. Who's getting charged? They right might get baited. Yeah, I'm Ace going to stop it instantly. Oh, they're coming though. <laughs> it's like they know there's a ward. Yep, the sentry already dropped. Ace is going to be able to deal with it. And yeah, they're looking to try and control around Roche. Still a very scary position for Talon to be able to take a fight in this close proximity area. Twin get control once again. That's all they really want. They want that that close area. We know how effective a Muerta could be. We know how effective a Faceless Void and a Jakiro could be around those real choke points. But then again, I guess you could say the same for Talon. Dyer's middle Gonna take some of that map control. Net worth lead has shrunk from 8k down to 3 while all of these kill attempts are potentially happening. And while well, they're choosing to commit right now, they do not have a scan available though. Is, is this the fight you're wanting for for Talon? Oh, a loss here could see. give a big opportunity. They gotta go soon. This Roche is down to half health. It'd be such a big initiation if you're able to get all three. They're clumping off for a potential echo. They need the vision. Shadow Demon no, will provide that. Could Makoto lead the charge as well? Look at the calling. Tofu in a close area. Could Lincoln. be devastating. They're going to be able to get the jump in. Roche is down. Makoto gets Makoto the ages. It. It's a great start for Talon. Duracho used an early BKB as well. Talon kiting over to the right side. Okay, momentarily, we need to see what Duracho can do with his ult. He's savage. He's going to charge over the north side. Duracho doesn't even get to play this team fight. As Talon now can potentially get some more kills. Makoto stops the charge. Ace, 4,200 health. But when he has no heroes to play around him, it doesn't matter how long it takes to kill him off. As Talon... Somehow they've got the net worth lead. They were down 7,000, but they are back in this game and in a commanding position. How did they do it, man? I do not know. Ollie was just able to kite out that giga farm spirit breaker. So the net worth lead in all reality was absolutely nothing because they weren't able to get kills off that initiation. They got a great usage out of the spells early on into the piece so they could break that Lincoln Sphere and it just enabled that little bit of a delay coming through from Ollie. And now with that, with the Philosopher's Stone as well, I mean, that's not even to mention the Age of Steel as well, which he's still holding on to here on Makoto. He needed to pop that BKB super early just to survive Duraccio, so you can't really fault him too much for that, but it really is the fight for 23 Savage, wasn't it? Dude, the positioning and the spell casting, the in and out for Talon, just everyone playing for each other. It's... You had to play nothing but flawless to get back to this position. And now,
this could be a repeat previous game we saw gladiators they had the lead all of a sudden talon's the one there again i'm, I'm mentioning it a lot at riyadh we went the distance in that series with talon knocking out gladiators that could be a repeat as well like how do you and settle yourselves now for dire it's a good question, and now Makoto is going to be doing a good amount of right-click damage as well. I mean, he's got the BKB finished up, he's got an Echo Saber finished, he's got, I believe, a, a Tier 3 neutral item and level 18 to be able to play around with as well. So that is a lot of additional bonus burst damage as well as sustain from the right-clicks coming through and a lot of instant prioritization towards the Tormentors as well. Sure, it's great for all the reasons that we mentioned, both for Q on his Earthshaker getting it originally. Now Ollie's got that extra demonic cleanse, that uh, extra layer of survival ability against a lot of the silences and slows that they have on gaming gladiators but if you can get away with not having to have makoto buy an aghanim shard that's really significant yeah. just giving him that extra little bit of farm so that you can turn into this legitimate second hard carry effectively we've we've spoken a lot about what Teller needed to do to get back into this game now now the topic needs to flip it what what do we look for for gladiators like i suppose in these fights we should say how do you start for them? Who is that prime target that needs to go? To me, it's still Ollie, right? Like, if Ollie is not alive, then Ace's game is freed up so much. You know, once he gets into this Aghanim Scepter, he's going to have that uh, debuff immunity during the Charge of Darkness. He's, going to, he's already got the Octarine core, so he's just going to be charging left, right, center, everywhere. And the only hero that stops it is the Shadow Demon. Ollie's positioning has been pretty good so far, and he's got the Blink Dagger to be able to help with that. But uh, maybe you need to commit, for example, on Quinn with the Flame Cloak to go for a little bit of a wraparound and just burst him with the Laguna Blade. Very interesting decision as well. We're, we're getting a Wind Waker, dude, from Q. So this is your very expensive luxury item to deal with the Chrono. Yep. I, you, there could be an argument. Late game jabs, considering something like a Scepter. He's got a Lincoln's currently queued up. We don't really see you buying a Scepter, but hopefully late game he can get lucky with Roche. This is the first real time that we've seen Talon actually entering Dai's side of the map off the back of a smoke. Mm-hmm. It's with the ages, it gives you that confidence to be able to make these sorts of plays. Maybe thinking that he's a little safe here, Durachu, on the right-hand side. Koto careful not to pop his smoke on the towers, and ooh, how quick is he on the fingers? Yeah. He's still pretty satisfied with that, though. They're really Koto. split. They're going for their own kill. Jabs is isolated. Gonna be able to blink closer back to the T2 tower. Meanwhile, I mean, there's a straight chrono as well, so everyone else is stuck from being able to join, and Duracho just gets the time walk away. Savage wants to Savage. jump on forward, though, but the BKB stops the, the dead shot. Bed. Has he got the damage? He does. Waveform to he confirm the kill, and Savage is not done just yet. Your high ground will not stop me. The Savage finds a double further to the south. Ice. Ace is isolated. We saw Pryor when he doesn't have any boys to play with. He can be vulnerable. Quinn's going to TP him. Has to jump over the right side as the Acro Slam Ace. He'll find an opportunity to charge away, Quinn. but Quinn, he doesn't have the same capability. Tries to fly up to the oh, high, high ground, but he's going to be for. cut down. Just what is going on? Gleaming Gladiators, they are crumbling. They are indeed. They won't be able to take any towers off the back of it. Ace immediately looking to shove out that mid wave in the bottom lane off the back of that previous gank attempt onto Jabs. He's not really in a position to be able to take tier two towers, but this is what we were waiting to see from the SEA crowd. They were really wanting that Morphling from 23 Savage's most comfortable hero by far, and well, they're even going to yoink away even more of that control. I think the big difference that I'm really seeing from Gaming Gladiators is that previously they prioritized buying a really early gem, and I feel like uh, Talon have gotten away with a lot of additional vision on the map that they just didn't have prior. Here we go. Another tier two tower going down right before that uh, that wisdom rune is about to spawn as well. Just a little bit of extra value. Tofu moving forward just to try and remove a lot of that vision. Again, they, they don't have the chronosphere though to be able to make these sorts of plays and looks like they'll be able to still uh, at least get the deny, but uh, they'll get a tier two tower. So some more map control for talent. It looks like they're just going to go back and try and farm this side of the map as well. Wind Waker, Lincoln's completed. Some really, really big items. It's crazy the fact that 23 Savages somehow usurped Ace in the net worth. Again, we're, we're saying this Spirit Breaker might be the most farmed in quite some time, but Savage, a Morphling that we do not see often. His best here, without a doubt. He had to put the team on the back. He's done that nine, two, and three. You could not have asked for a better performance from him, and he's in a position 
to get them over the finish line and put themselves in the upper bracket. He was the only one left alone, pretty much, at the, the start of all of that. And, uh, well, th there's little silver linings coming through from Game and Gladiators, right? You've got Quinn, who's level 20 now. Big damage buff coming through for this Magic Lena. 11% spell amplification coming through. I believe Ace has the Shadow Blade completed, so it's another thing that's just going to enable to... They see Tofu. He shows himself, yeah. Time with Tainus jumps to the right and left. Both supports blown up from four to zero. Ooh. They're not messing around, Talon. They're looking for more as well. Right under the cover of the Shadow Blade. Ace is going to charge into the middle as well. You, got you still have the Chronosphere. Savage with the Replicant's going to be able to prevent Duracho. They, they split away. Duracho doesn't have a good opportunity for his ultimate. will finally use it, but it's a wasted Chrono. He'll get no value out of it. And now Makoto can hunt. Tofu stuck in no man's land. As Talon just have their number, Gladiators cannot take these fights anymore. Man, I was watching 23 that entire time. He's using those Zuma reflexes to perfection. He was still like full agi walk, and until he sees the Faceless Void actually use the animation of the Chronosphere, he stays there. He stays a legitimate threat. As soon as he starts to do the animation, that's when he starts morphing, and even the Spirit Vessel isn't enough to be able to get the full effectiveness out of it. Eh, at least they got the Courier, but it's a full lane of racks gone, and potentially two. Wow. They will look for the hold, of course. Charge in. They're going to try and take a fight 3v5s. You've got the buyback out of Quinn. Ace might get blown up with the crit, so they've got to be cautious. A lot of damage onto the Morphling. Savage is in some danger. Finds the waveform out of the base, and what's the call from Talon? If you look for a retreat, maybe set a formation up. They won't even double back. They're happy with that. Somehow, they'll find a way to retreat without losing anyone. You're over the moon about this. I mean, the Tier 3 tower is basically dead as well. And a buyback being expended from Quinn means it's going to be so much longer. We talked about that big power spike coming from the level 20. It's really the E-Blade that he was waiting for, both for safety, if you ever do get caught by, uh, you know, the right-clicking 23 Savage, but also just for your own burst potential. And now it's going to be so much later that it comes online. Is Observe what's He's still long. up down bottom, which they killed Jabs with prior. And they are starting... Respawn. The Jabs is a lot tankier as well. He's... 23 has the they KP as well. They don't have the Chrono to stop those TPs, which you saw prior. Oh, oh the didn't... star break. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> that timing. Oh, instant use of the voice line. <laughs> Sometimes it is just your lucky day. Mm -hmm. Just can't wait for him to get to the neutral camp, I guess. And this is going to give Talon now an opportunity to set up they see around this top Hillary. side. Instant jump. Chrono still on cooldown for another five seconds. Tofu gets blown up without remorse. Duracho is going to try and put a little bit of damage into Makoto. Charge from the other side oh, of the map as well. Ace going to try and deal with Oli. Once again, 23 Savage looking to try and play around with the Spirit Breaker. Replicate. Ace is in some danger with the Purge. Great reaction out of the BKP from the Morphling. And again, yes, Duracho again. will have zero damage inside the bubble. It is an all-out retreat. They've got to cut their losses. Quinn will juke up to the north. TP still down for a couple of seconds. Looks like he'll be okay. Yeah, they'll be able to get rid of this vision. That's uh, two observable ones that they've removed now, Quinn. This would be a dieback. Dude. Who ended up going down and he just ends up getting away. Or does he? We're going to hunt for a little bit more. Again, you've got that invisibility on the tiny from the Silver Edge, but they're just going to be looking to play around that Roshan, one would assume. Maybe they think they're confident enough to be able to go up onto this high ground. It goes away from the steady, composed Talon that we know. Maybe even looking to try and find a quick pick up onto Duraccio here. They've got the Solar Guardian available. What a pick this would be. They're hunting. Oh, they're even TPing into the outpost. But they look to find it. Doesn't look like they'll be able to do so. I want to come back. Oh my god, just saw the banishment again. <laughs> are you serious? Yep. Dude, Ollie's SD. The value that you are getting out of this hero. The mm. purges, the banishments. This is one of the better supports. If you're able to get net worth, you can create so much chaos in these late game fights. He has to go. There is probably no other more valuable member out of Talon that needs to be killed first. I've been, I've been stating it like a broken record, man, but they just can't do it, man. He's, his positioning is just way too good. He's got tanky heroes to be able to play in front of him, so he can, he can afford to be sitting that far back. And 
And we saw there Quinn trying to go for that kill attempt, but it just took him way too long that the team fight was basically done by that stage. 23 Savage had done all the jobs that he could have possibly wanted, just taking out multiple heroes. What happens if we get one good corner out of Durashio? Just just one. Onto two, potentially three. The, the, still down 19,000 gold. Maybe four, <laughs> who knows? Maybe all five, but let's just say two. One good chrono with a macro pie, with Lena on the outside, even down 19k gold. Is that all they need on dial? I don't think that's all they need. I think they need like that into a Roshan that ends up giving them a really highly valuable thing like an Aghanim Scepter or a Refresher, right? Like imagine having two Chronospheres, for example, if they're able to secure top uh, Roshan after this one goes down. They will smirk up. We're gonna Savage. be too late though. And, and Makoto is level 25 as well. He's got the Aghanim Shard as well, so I was talking about that threat of being a legitimate right clicker. Well, Makoto's reached that point. Smirk on smirk. Harpoon as well. Doesn't want to let them get away, particularly Quinn. He's been pretty sneaky Savage, with that Savage, Savage. Let's see how true shift to be able to work with. Not going to be able to blow him up from four to zeros. Ace spies the shadow demon, but doesn't commit with the charge. Got the Going to be cautious. They group up instantly. They split away once again. Duraccio doesn't find an opportunity for the corner, but everyone is isolated. Makoto's away from the boys. They're going to need to find some way to protect him. The corner this time will clip two heroes, and that gives him the opportunity to kill off jabs as well. Savage against the world. Can he do it for the instant buybacks? Solid Guardian back into the middle. Savage, of course, you has that set. So much. Down to the southern side, though, Ace gets some time to charge away, but the Fissure stops him from escaping. The Rancho gets blown up as well. And now Quinn, looking like it might be a dieback, finds the blink at the last second. Gaming Gladiator is not done. A seller will also be killed off inside. The river is up the high ground. Savage goes. He knows that there's no backdoor protection. He knows that you're going to need to use a buyback for this. Otherwise, you're losing your entire base. But with no Chronosphere to be able to play around, can they 100 to 0 him? I don't think you can. 3,500 health and... You got the, the Wind Waker out of Q and now Quinn as well. Jumped on He's the back line from Makoto. Tossed into the double fissure. Quinn's, Quinn's down for over two minutes. And now the building's under siege. No chrono for the defense. They can go for the end if they want. Talon knocking one of the favorites down to start in the lower bracket. More buybacks being used. They don't want to give this one up without a fight. This is starting in that lower bracket. A single series enough to be able to wipe you out. They would love to be able to pick up here. Duraccio, Savage, refresher used for the double waveform. That they still can't is all in. she wrote. Talon and Savage take a freaking bow. What a comeback performance from the Southeast Asian boys. They are never out of any game. And they are in to the upper bracket as well. Can the real 23 Savage please stand up? Because he was the reason that Tal were able to get back into this game and then get across the line. What a way to be able to finish off this last day of day one of the playoffs. What a performance. And I want to see the reactions out of Talon. Let's throw it over to Sax to see how they are. Hello, guys. Let's take a peek. They've locked the door. I'm knocking on the door. The door is locked. Hello. Oh, no. Oh. Hello. How are they feeling? Oh, guys, congratulations, you did it! Woo! Pretty good stuff there. Oh, okay, they are very, very serious right now. Trying to be calm, all right? But uh, we're gonna go do something very, very quick, okay? All right. Guys, I'm sorry to interrupt, a hu huge moment there. Congratulations, everybody. Well done, well done. Are you feeling good? Are you feeling high energy? All right, all right, very good. Any words out there? I mean, what a serious game too. That was crazy, man. Yeah, it's it's a good game. Yeah, absolutely. Were you scared? Jabs, the man, the myth, the legend, the bristle bat. Yeah, yeah. You feel it? It was pretty fun. Like at that fight, uh, the last fight, mm -hmm. and Mikoto was ratting, and we don't even know what we are doing anymore. It's just like everything is silence. Yeah. It's oh. just like we're just playing. I w would have to say, guys, that was like the game of the tournament for me. Uh, very exciting stuff. So thank you guys so much for an incredible show out there. And uh, yeah, I was hype as hell. You guys are so calm and collected. What's going on, man? It's just another day in the office for you? You're in the zone. You're in the zone. Well, get out of the zone, boys. You just kick some ass. Well done. Well done. Everyone shut off your computers. What is it? You guys are done. The computers are off. They're, you guys are just done. Shoes are off here, too. Well done there. All right. Well, I'll let you guys rest. 
Great job. Congratulations, guys. Go get some food. You earned it. Well done. Enjoy the upper bracket. That's it for us over with Talon. Thank you. Back to you. For the Talon Esports crew, the reason it's another day at the office because another Morphling game, another comeback, and another situation where a team finds out what happens when you let 23 Savage cook. Gentlemen, gods, lizard, big boys, what a game, what a comeback. But Lizard, you kept telling us time and time again throughout this group stage that you never count talent out. The moment you do, you've pretty much lost yourself. Yeah, I, I kept on telling that. I was like that 1%. <laughs> you know, you, you look like a fool 99% of the time, but this 1%. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, talent, obviously, they had a really rocky start. And I never believed that they're a team that should be 0-4 at the beginning of the tournament. Mm. And that's something that they have proven today. Yeah. One of the things that they also, how they played this game are also interesting, Gods, is because they did two things which I find phenomenal, right? Firstly, 23 Savage Morphling. Yes, it's good in terms of the hero player matchup. But here at the group stages on the road to the international, this is only the fifth game of the Morphling. This is only the sixth game of the Tiny, right? Shadow Demon has a 23% win rate over 22 games. The confidence to go for these hero picks, despite nobody else doing them, despite knowing that some of these heroes are terrible in other people's hands, that shows you a caliber of team that can go generally quite far in a tournament. Yeah, and I, I think it's always a good sign when it's like you're kind of, your back's against the wall, but even when it's game three or even footing, but you know, it's end of the day, you've just played this like really stressful, long drawn out game. And you're like, all right, we're going to go to our heroes. We believe in this, even if these heroes haven't been the most successful. Um, and particularly, you mentioned the Morphling, like a hero that hasn't been picked up that much and hasn't looked amazing. But this matchup against Spirit Breaker, this may be the Spirit Breaker counter because mm -hmm. Spirit Breaker just looks unstoppable. Once you get this minus Octarine, it's like, what do you do? It just stuns everything, mm -hmm. goes through BKB. Um, but it seems like the answer is just being a better spirit breaker because you're morphling with replicate. Yeah, it's one of those combos that was very popular a long time ago, right? Like you had the spirit breaker combo with the morphling on the same team back mm -hmm. when you can replicate allies, and you had the earth shaker combo with the morphling. And I believe we have seen a morphling against the shaker recently, and it also did uh, really damn well. So why not use the same thing against the spirit breaker? But honestly, like in game two, we were talking about how carries felt kind of useless. Mm -hmm. They were just there, like this like a king in chess he's the most important piece but he doesn't really do a lot right in this game three it was completely different like mm. the the amount of work that was on both of them to do was insane morphing however and 23 savage he just managed to do a little bit more just cooked up a little bit higher, made a better meal of the situation, and that means that Talent Esports will begin the playoffs on the road to TI in the upper bracket. Incredible result for them. A lot of incredible results today. I'm glad about this one because it was our only 2-1 game of the entire day, the only one that went the distance. Gods, everything else was a stomp. Tell me what you think about the results here. Anything that stood out to you as a bit of a surprise? Uh, I think the only maybe upset you could say was the VP taking the two over TSM. I, you know, most of the odds and most people had, I think, TSM winning that series. But VP stepped it up since the group stage. They really had kind of figured out what heroes work well for them. Every individual player was stepping up, playing better. Uh, and they really took it to TSM in that series. So that's definitely the team to kind of look out for a bit for me because, yeah, in the group stage, they just didn't look all that impressive. But they looked amazing today. Yep, VP indeed looked incredible. Unfortunately, sometimes here, Lizard, your reward for being excellent sucks. Your reward for being a great team, recovering from a shaky start at the beginning of the group stages, is now in the playoffs. Gotta play team spirit, mm -hmm. not just the best team in the world, in my opinion, but also a regional matchup. And those are tough, man. That's just so difficult to yeah, get. Yeah, those are tough. But at the same time, when you're like a team that's the underdog in a regional matchup, you always want to take down the king, right, gods? I agree so much. The, the regional matchups, I think, favor the underdogs, if anything, because it's actually like a team you know really well. They probably, you know, you scrim a lot. And often, like, you see it even during the DPC leagues um, in the online phase is often those teams, like, who are maybe the second or third best team in the region will take games off that number one team. So... Mm -hmm. As far as you know, tough matchups go, it's probably better that they're playing a regional team. Well, of course, they're going to be having a difficult time, a difficult matchup against a regional opponent. But as Gods are saying, it'll probably help them out a little bit. Of course, Talent Esports, their reward for victory means taking on Team Liquid again. Well, this time around, though, they'll probably be a bit more disciplined than at their last outing at the Riyadh Masters. Cannot wait to see how that matchup unfolds. And I'm sure you saw that the bracket was still a little bit empty, which means we need to populate the rest of those teams in the upper and lower bracket. And we'll do so with a set of games tomorrow. 
which also have very high potential for some upsets, but definitely for some massive entertainment. We begin the day with LGD taking on Key stars, and you know, Key has been one of their positive surprises so far throughout the international, or the road to the international rather, and I'm hoping to see that continue into tomorrow. We of course follow that up with our first regional matchup, Betboom taking on Nine Pandas. Tundra versus Nouns is going to be interesting to watch because Nouns always does something to cook things up. And then we end the day with Entity versus Azure Ray. Somnus going to be out here on the main stage. Uh, looking at these matchups here, Liz, which one is excites you the most? Where's the hype yeah. coming from? You were talking about cooking. I don't know how long they have to cook. Nouns and Keed, uh, for them it's going to be an uphill battle to say the least. The last matchup, however, Entity versus Azure, I think that's probably the most interesting series mm. because the, these two teams, in my opinion, are very evenly matched. And Entity is bringing something new to this TI. I feel like they're also on a really good roll. Mm. And final thoughts, guys, anything that stood out to you today as something that we should be considering and thinking about moving forward in the tournament? Uh, I think it's just interesting to see kind of some of the meta evolve. I mean, particularly like a lot of this bristleback being really prioritized and becoming a bit of a problem. But um, as far as some of the teams go, I mean, Liquid Spirit continue to dominate. Those two teams look really scary and like teams that we're almost certain they're going to be seeing on that main stage. Well, the main stage is beckoning in a couple of days. We still have that final day of the groups to wrap up. But remember, all the teams you're seeing before you now, we will be seeing yet again next week in the playoff portion on the road to the international. We still have a couple of more teams to populate. But in the meantime, get some water, go get some sleep. Play a game or two before you do, though. But when you're playing your Dota, remember, be positive. PMA, if nothing else, right now it's TI season, which means it's all about celebrating this game that we all love so much and celebrating why we come together this one time in a year to celebrate the best game ever made. Thank you very much, everybody. We will see you tomorrow for some more action here on the road to the international and for some more Dota 2. He's all by himself right now. I wish I had friends, but all your friends are dead. Fuck in the ass. He does get off the thunder, but what difference is it gonna make? He's being beaten backwards and forwards like a ragdoll through the fight. Lined up the supernova correctly. Oh, it's just a touch early, and here comes the turnaround. They needed a miracle, and they may have just found it. Curse of the old growth, sprouting him off. The control is there. Focus fire and putting Matthew back in the grave that he crawled out of. He oh, already lost vision. his gem, so can't lose it twice. Oh my God, the post from the sidelines up, easy is gone. Team Spirit, they get the carry. What am I looking <laughs> at? What is this? And it's going through the back line, and a beautiful cut from Kieran Tech as well. And TSM is out with a powerful kick to the face. Squadix with a double, Squadix with a triple. Talon and Savage, take a freaking bow. What? A comeback performance. Very good, very good. Very good is how they're feeling.